LXI, Greek Emperors of Nice and Constantinople The Greek Emperors of Nice and Constantinople did, elevation and reign of Michael Paleologus. his false union with the Pope and the Latin Church. Hostile designs of Charles of Anjou. Revolt of Sicily. War of the Catalans in Asia and Greece. Revolutions and present state of Athens. The loss of Constantinople restored a momentary vigor to the Greeks. From their palaces, the princes and nobles were driven into the field. And the fragments of the falling monarchy were grasped by the hands of the most vigorous or the most skillful candidates. In the long and barren pages of the Byzantine Annals 7590 it would not be an easy task to equal the two characters of Theodore Lascaris and John Ducas Vadaces 7591 who replanted and upheld the Roman standard at Nice in Bithynia. The difference of their virtues was happily suited to the diversity of their situation. In his first efforts, the fugitive Lascaris commanded only three cities and two thousand soldiers, his reign was the season of generous and active despair, in every military operation he staked his life and crown. And his enemies of the Hellespont and the Meander, were surprised by his celerity and subdued by his boldness. A victorious reign of eighteen years expanded the principality of Nice to the magnitude of an empire. The throne of his successor and son-in-law Vataces was founded on a more solid basis, a larger scope, and more plentiful resources. And it was the temper, as well as the interest, of Vataces to calculate the risk, to expect the moment, and to ensure the success, of his ambitious designs. In the decline of the Latins, I have briefly exposed the progress of the Greeks. The prudent and gradual advances of a conqueror, who, in a reign of thirty-three years, rescued the provinces from national and foreign usurpers, till he pressed on all sides the imperial city, a leafless and sapless trunk, which must fall at the first stroke of the axe. But his interior and peaceful administration is still more deserving of notice and praise. 7592 The calamities of the times had wasted the numbers and the substance of the Greeks, the motives and the means of agriculture were extirpated and the most fertile lands were left without cultivation or inhabitants. A portion of this vacant property was occupied and improved by the command, and for the benefit, of the emperor, a powerful hand and a vigilant eye supplied and surpassed, by a skillful management. The minute diligence of a private farmer, the royal domain became the garden and granary of Asia. And without impoverishing the people, the sovereign acquired a fund of innocent and productive wealth. According to the nature of the soil, his lands were sown with corn or planted with vines. The pastures were filled with horses and oxen, with sheep and hogs. And when Vadaces presented to the empress a crown of diamonds and pearls, he informed her, with a smile, that this precious ornament arose from the sale of the eggs of his innumerable poultry. The produce of his domain was applied to the maintenance of his palace and hospitals, the calls of dignity and benevolence the lesson was still more useful than the revenue, the plough was restored to its ancient security and honour. And the nobles were taught to seek a sure and independent revenue from their estates, instead of adorning their splendid beggary by the oppression of the people, or, what is almost the same, by the favours of the court. The superfluous stock of corn and cattle was eagerly purchased by the Turks, with whom that aces preserved a strict and sincere alliance. But he discouraged the importation of foreign manufactures, the costly silks of the East, and the curious labours of the Italian looms. The demands of nature and necessity, was he accustomed to say, are indispensable. But the influence of fashion may rise and sink at the breath of a monarch, and both his precept and example recommended simplicity of manners and the use of domestic industry. The education of youth and the revival of learning were the most serious objects of his care, and, without deciding the precedency, he pronounced with truth, that a prince and a philosopher 7593 are the two most eminent characters of human society. His first wife was Irene, the daughter of Theodore Lascaris, a woman more illustrious by her personal merit, the milder virtues of her sex, than by the blood of the Angeline Comnene that flowed in her veins, and transmitted the inheritance of the empire. After her death he was contracted to Anne, or Constance, a natural daughter of the Emperor Frederick 7594 II, but as the bride had not attained the years of puberty, 
bad aces placed in his solitary bed an Italian damsel of her train. And his amorous weakness bestowed on the concubine the honors, though not the title, of a lawful empress. His frailty was censured as a flagitious and damnable sin by the monks. And their rude invectives exercised and displayed the patience of the royal lover. A philosophic age may excuse a single vice, which was redeemed by a crowd of virtues. And in the review of his faults, and the more intemperate passions of Lascaris, the judgment of their contemporaries was softened by gratitude to the second founders of the empire. 7595 The slaves of the Latins, without law or peace, applauded the happiness of their brethren who had resumed their national freedom. And Vataces employed the laudable policy of convincing the Greeks of every dominion that it was their interest to be enrolled in the number of his subjects. A strong shade of degeneracy is visible between John Vataces and his son Theodore. Between the founder who sustained the weight, and the heir who enjoyed the splendor, of the imperial crown. 7596 Yet the character of Theodore was not devoid of energy. He had been educated in the school of his father, in the exercise of war and hunting, Constantinople was yet spared, but in the three years of a short reign, he thrice led his armies into the heart of Bulgaria. His virtues were sullied by a choleric and suspicious temper, the first of these may be ascribed to the ignorance of control, and the second might naturally arise from a dark and imperfect view of the corruption of mankind. On a march in Bulgaria, he consulted on a question of policy his principal ministers, and the Greek logothete, George Acropolita, presumed to offend him by the declaration of a free and honest opinion. The emperor half unsheathed his scimitar. But his more deliberate rage reserved Acropolita for a baser punishment. One of the first officers of the empire was ordered to dismount, stripped of his robes, and extended on the ground in the presence of the prince and army. In this posture he was chastised with so many and such heavy blows from the clubs of two guards or executioners, that when Theodore commanded them to cease, the great logothete was scarcely able to rise and crawl away to his tent. After a seclusion of some days, he was recalled by a peremptory mandate to his seat in council. And so dead were the Greeks to the sense of honor and shame, that it is from the narrative of the sufferer himself that we acquire the knowledge of his disgrace. 7597 The cruelty of the emperor was exasperated by the pangs of sickness, the approach of a premature end, and the suspicion of poison and magic. The lives and fortunes, the eyes and limbs, of his kinsmen and nobles, were sacrificed to each sally of passion, and before he died, the son of Vataces might deserve from the people, or at least from the court, the appellation of tyrant. A matron of the family of the Paleology had provoked his anger by refusing to bestow her beauteous daughter on the vile plebeian who was recommended by his caprice. Without regard to her birth or age, her body, as high as the neck, was enclosed in a sack with several cats, who were pricked with pins to irritate their fury against their unfortunate fellow captive. In his last hours the emperor testified a wish to forgive and be forgiven, a just anxiety for the fate of John his son and successor, who, at the age of eight years, was condemned to the dangers of a long minority. His last choice entrusted the office of guardian to the sanctity of the patriarch Arsenius, and to the courage of George Musilin, the great domestic, who was equally distinguished by the royal favor and the public hatred. Since their connection with the Latins, the names and privileges of hereditary rank had insinuated themselves into the Greek monarchy. And the noble family 7598 were provoked by the elevation of a worthless favorite, to whose influence they imputed the errors and calamities of the late reign. In the first council, after the emperor's death, Musilin, from a lofty throne, pronounced a labored apology of his conduct and intentions, his modesty was subdued by a unanimous assurance of esteem and fidelity. And his most inveterate enemies were the loudest to salute him as the guardian and savior of the Romans. Eight days were sufficient to prepare the execution of the conspiracy. On the ninth, the obsequies of the deceased monarch were solemnized in the Cathedral of Magnesia 7599 in Asiatic City, where he expired, on the banks of the Hermus, and at the foot of Mount Sipolis. The holy rites were interrupted by a sedition of the guards, Musilin, his brothers, and his adherents, were massacred at the foot of the altar. And the absent patriarch was associated with a new colleague, 
with Michael Paleologus, the most illustrious, in birth and merit, of the Greek nobles. 7600. Of those who are proud of their ancestors, the far greater part must be content with local or domestic renown, and few there are who dare trust the memorials of their family to the public annals of their country. As early as the middle of the 11th century, the noble race of the Paleology 7601 stands high and conspicuous in the Byzantine history, it was the valiant George Paleologus who placed the father of the Komnene on the throne. And his kinsmen or descendants continue, in each generation, to lead the armies and councils of the state. The purple was not dishonored by their alliance, and had the law of succession, and female succession, been strictly observed, the wife of Theodore Lascaris must have yielded to her elder sister, the mother of Michael Paleologus, who afterwards raised his family to the throne. In his person, the splendor of birth was dignified by the merit of the soldier and statesman, in his early youth he was promoted to the office of constable or commander of the French mercenaries. The private expense of a day never exceeded three pieces of gold, but his ambition was rapacious and profuse, and his gifts were doubled by the graces of his conversation and manners. The love of the soldiers and people excited the jealousy of the court, and Michael thrice escaped from the dangers in which he was involved by his own imprudence or that of his friends. I. Under the reign of justice and that aces, a dispute arose 7602 between two officers, one of whom accused the other of maintaining the hereditary right of the paleology the cause was decided, according to the new jurisprudence of the Latins. By single combat. The defendant was overthrown, but he persisted in declaring that himself alone was guilty, and that he had uttered these rash or treasonable speeches without the approbation or knowledge of his patron. Yet a cloud of suspicion hung over the innocence of the constable, he was still pursued by the whispers of malevolence, and a subtle courtier, the Archbishop of Philadelphia, urged him to accept the judgment of God in the fiery proof of the ordeal. 7603 Three days before the trial, the patient's arm was enclosed in a bag, and secured by the royal signet. And it was incumbent on him to bear a red-hot ball of iron three times from the altar to the rails of the sanctuary, without artifice and without injury. Paleologus eluded the dangerous experiment with sense and pleasantry. I am a soldier, said he, and will boldly enter the lists with my accusers, but a layman, a sinner like myself, is not endowed with the gift of miracles. Your piety, most holy prelate, may deserve the interposition of heaven, and from your hands I will receive the fiery globe, the pledge of my innocence. The archbishop started, the emperor smiled. And the absolution or pardon of Michael was approved by new rewards and new services. 2. In the succeeding reign, as he held the government of Nice, he was secretly informed, that the mind of the absent prince was poisoned with jealousy. And that death, or blindness, would be his final reward. Instead of awaiting the return and sentence of Theodore, the constable, with some followers, escaped from the city and the empire. And though he was plundered by the Turkmens of the desert, he found a hospitable refuge in the court of the Sultan. In the ambiguous state of an exile, Michael reconciled the duties of gratitude and loyalty, drawing his sword against the Tartars. Admonishing the garrisons of the Roman limit, and promoting, by his influence, the restoration of peace, in which his pardon and recall were honorably included. 3. While he guarded the West against the despot of Epirus, Michael was again suspected and condemned in the palace, and such was his loyalty or weakness, that he submitted to be led in chains above six hundred miles from Durazzo to Nice. The civility of the messenger alleviated his disgrace, the emperor's sickness dispelled his danger, and the last breath of Theodore, which recommended his infant son, at once acknowledged the innocence and the power of Paleologus. But his innocence had been too unworthily treated, and his power was too strongly felt, to curb an aspiring subject in the fair field that was open to his ambition. 7604 In the council, after the death of Theodore, he was the first to pronounce, and the first to violate, the oath of allegiance to Musilin. And so dexterous was his conduct, that he reaped the benefit, without incurring the guilt, or at least the reproach, of the subsequent massacre. In the choice of a regent, he balanced the interests and passions of the candidates. 
turned their envy and hatred from himself against each other, and forced every competitor to own, that after his own claims, those of Paleologus were best entitled to the preference. Under the title of Great Duke, he accepted or assumed, during a long minority, the active powers of government, the Patriarch was a venerable name, and the factious nobles were seduced, or oppressed, by the ascendant of his genius. The fruits of the economy of Vataces were deposited in a strong castle on the banks of the Hermus, in the custody of the faithful Varangians, the constable retained his command or influence over the foreign troops. He employed the guards to possess the treasure, and the treasure to corrupt the guards, and whatsoever might be the abuse of the public money, his character was above the suspicion of private avarice. By himself, or by his emissaries, he strove to persuade every rank of subjects, that their own prosperity would rise in just proportion to the establishment of his authority. The weight of taxes was suspended, the perpetual theme of popular complaint, and he prohibited the trials by the ordeal and judicial combat. These barbaric institutions were already abolished or undermined in France 7605 and England. 7606 and the appeal to the sword offended the sense of a civilized 7607 in the temper of an unwarlike people. For the future maintenance of their wives and children, the veterans were grateful, the priests and the philosophers applauded his ardent zeal for the advancement of religion and learning. And his vague promise of rewarding merit was applied by every candidate to his own hopes. Conscious of the influence of the clergy, Michael successfully labored to secure the suffrage of that powerful order. Their expensive journey from Nice to Magnesia afforded a decent and ample pretense, the leading prelates were tempted by the liberality of his nocturnal visits. And the incorruptible patriarch was flattered by the homage of his new colleague, who led his mule by the bridle into the town, and removed to a respectful distance the importunity of the crowd. Without renouncing his title by royal descent, Paleologus encouraged a free discussion into the advantages of elective monarchy. And his adherents asked, with the insolence of triumph, what patient would trust his health, or what merchant would abandon his vessel, to the hereditary skill of a physician or a pilot. The youth of the emperor, and the impending dangers of a minority, required the support of a mature and experienced guardian, of an associate raised above the envy of his equals, and invested with the name and prerogatives of royalty. For the interest of the prince and people, without any selfish views for himself or his family, the great duke consented to guard and instruct the son of Theodore. But he sighed for the happy moment when he might restore to his firmer hands the administration of his patrimony, and enjoy the blessings of a private station. He was first invested with the title and prerogatives of despot, which bestowed the purple ornaments and the second place in the Roman monarchy. It was afterwards agreed that John and Michael should be proclaimed as joint emperors, and raised on the buckler, but that the preeminence should be reserved for the birthright of the former. A mutual league of amity was pledged between the royal partners, and in case of a rupture, the subjects were bound, by their oath of allegiance, to declare themselves against the aggressor, an ambiguous name, the seed of discord and civil war. Paleologus was content, but, on the day of the coronation, and in the cathedral of Nice, his zealous adherents most vehemently urged the just priority of his age and merit. The unseasonable dispute was eluded by postponing to a more convenient opportunity the coronation of John Lascaris. And he walked with a slight diadem in the train of his guardian, who alone received the imperial crown from the hands of the patriarch. It was not without extreme reluctance that Arsenius abandoned the cause of his pupil. Out the Varangians brandished their battle axes, a sign of assent was extorted from the trembling youth, and some voices were heard, that the life of a child should no longer impede the settlement of the nation. A full harvest of honors and employments was distributed among his friends by the grateful Paleologus. In his own family he created a despot and two Sebastocrators, Alexius Stratagopulus was decorated with the title of Caesar. And that veteran commander soon repaid the obligation, by restoring Constantinople to the Greek emperor. It was in the second year of his reign, while he resided in the palace and gardens of Nymphium 7608 near Smyrna, that the first messenger arrived at the dead of night. And the stupendous intelligence was imparted to Michael, after he had been gently waked by the tender precaution of his sister Eulogia. The man was unknown or obscure, 
he produced no letters from the victorious Caesar. Nor could it easily be credited, after the defeat of Vataces and the recent failure of Paleologus himself, that the capital had been surprised by a detachment of eight hundred soldiers. As a hostage, the doubtful author was confined, with the assurance of death or an ample recompense. And the court was left some hours in the anxiety of hope and fear, till the messengers of Alexius arrived with the authentic intelligence, and displayed the trophies of the conquest, the sword and scepter 7609 the buskins and bonnet. 7610 of the usurper Baldwin, which he had dropped in his precipitate flight. A general assembly of the bishops, senators, and nobles, was immediately convened, and never perhaps was an event received with more heartfelt and universal joy. In a studied oration, the new sovereign of Constantinople congratulated his own and the public fortune. There was a time, said he, a far distant time, when the Roman Empire extended to the Adriatic, the Tigris, and the confines of Ethiopia. After the loss of the provinces, our capital itself, in these last and calamitous days, has been wrested from our hands by the barbarians of the West. From the lowest ebb, the tide of prosperity has again returned in our favor. But our prosperity was that of fugitives and exiles, and when we were asked, which was the country of the Romans, we indicated with a blush the climate of the globe, and the quarter of the heavens. The divine providence has now restored to our arms the city of Constantine, the sacred seat of religion and empire, and it will depend on our valor and conduct to render this important acquisition the pledge and omen of future victories. So eager was the impatience of the prince and people, that Michael made his triumphal entry into Constantinople only twenty days after the expulsion of the Latins. The golden gate was thrown open at his approach. The devout conqueror dismounted from his horse, and a miraculous image of Mary the Conductress was borne before him, that the Divine Virgin in person might appear to conduct him to the temple of her son, the Cathedral of Saint Sophia. But after the first transport of devotion and pride, he sighed at the dreary prospect of solitude and ruin. The palace was defiled with smoke and dirt, and the gross intemperance of the Franks. Whole streets had been consumed by fire, or were decayed by the injuries of time. The sacred and profane edifices were stripped of their ornaments, and, as if they were conscious of their approaching exile, the industry of the Latins had been confined to the work of pillage and destruction. Trade had expired under the pressure of anarchy and distress, and the numbers of inhabitants had decreased with the opulence of the city. It was the first care of the Greek monarch to reinstate the nobles in the palaces of their fathers. And the houses or the ground which they occupied were restored to the families that could exhibit a legal right of inheritance. But the far greater part was extinct or lost, the vacant property had devolved to the Lord. He repeopled Constantinople by a liberal invitation to the provinces, and the brave volunteers were seated in the capital which had been recovered by their arms. The French barons and the principal families had retired with their emperor. But the patient and humble crowd of Latins was attached to the country, and indifferent to the change of masters. Instead of banishing the factories of the Pisans, Venetians, and Genoese, the prudent conqueror accepted their oaths of allegiance, encouraged their industry, confirmed their privileges, and allowed them to live under the jurisdiction of their proper magistrates. Of these nations, the Pisans and Venetians preserved their respective quarters in the city, but the services and power of the Genoese deserved at the same time the gratitude and the jealousy of the Greeks. Their independent colony was first planted at the seaport town of Heraclea in Thrace. They were speedily recalled, and settled in the exclusive possession of the suburb of Galata, an advantageous post, in which they revived the commerce, and insulted the majesty, of the Byzantine Empire. 7611. The recovery of Constantinople was celebrated as the era of a new empire, the conqueror, alone, and by the right of the sword, renewed his coronation in the Church of Saint Sophia. And the name and honours of John Lascaris, his pupil and lawful sovereign, were insensibly abolished. But his claim still lived in the minds of the people, and the royal youth must speedily attain the years of manhood and ambition. By fear or conscience, Paleologus was restrained from dipping his hands in innocent and royal blood, 
but the anxiety of a usurper and apparent urged him to secure his throne by one of those imperfect crimes so familiar to the modern Greeks. The loss of sight incapacitated the young prince for the active business of the world. Instead of the brutal violence of tearing out his eyes, the visual nerve was destroyed by the intense glare of a red-hot basin, 7612 and John Lascaris was removed to a distant castle, where he spent many years in privacy and oblivion. Such cool and deliberate guilt may seem incompatible with remorse, but if Michael could trust the mercy of heaven, he was not inaccessible to the reproaches and vengeance of mankind, which he had provoked by cruelty and treason. His cruelty imposed on a servile court the duties of applause or silence, but the clergy had a right to speak in the name of their invisible master. And their holy legions were led by a prelate, whose character was above the temptations of hope or fear. After a short abdication of his dignity, Arsenia 7613 had consented to ascend the ecclesiastical throne of Constantinople, and to preside in the restoration of the church. His pious simplicity was long deceived by the arts of Paleologus. And his patience and submission might suit the usurper, and protect the safety of the young prince. On the news of his inhuman treatment, the patriarch unsheathed the spiritual sword. And superstition, on this occasion, was enlisted in the cause of humanity and justice. In a synod of bishops, who were stimulated by the example of his zeal, the patriarch pronounced a sentence of excommunication. Though his prudence still repeated the name of Michael in the public prayers. The Eastern prelates had not adopted the dangerous maxims of ancient Rome. Nor did they presume to enforce their censures, by deposing princes, or absolving nations from their oaths of allegiance. But the Christian, who had been separated from God and the Church, became an object of horror. And, in a turbulent and fanatic capital, that horror might arm the hand of an assassin, or inflame a sedition of the people. Paleologus felt his danger, confessed his guilt, and deprecated his judge, the act was irretrievable. The prize was obtained, and the most rigorous penance, which he solicited, would have raised the sinner to the reputation of a saint. The unrelenting patriarch refused to announce any means of atonement or any hopes of mercy. And condescended only to pronounce, that for so great a crime, great indeed must be the satisfaction. Do you require, said Michael, that I should abdicate the empire, and at these words, he offered, or seemed to offer, the sword of state. Arsenius eagerly grasped this pledge of sovereignty, but when he perceived that the emperor was unwilling to purchase absolution at so dear a rate, he indignantly escaped to his cell, and left the royal sinner kneeling and weeping before the door. 7614 The danger and scandal of this excommunication subsisted above three years, till the popular clamor was assuaged by time and repentance. Till the brethren of Arsenius condemned his inflexible spirit, so repugnant to the unbounded forgiveness of the gospel. The emperor had artfully insinuated, that, if he were still rejected at home, he might seek, in the Roman pontiff, a more indulgent judge, but it was far more easy and effectual to find or to place that judge at the head of the Byzantine church. Arsenius was involved in a vague rumor of conspiracy and disaffection, 7615 Some irregular steps in his ordination and government were liable to censure, a synod deposed him from the episcopal office. And he was transported under a guard of soldiers to a small island of the Propontis. Before his exile, he sullenly requested that a strict account might be taken of the treasures of the church. Boasted, that his sole riches, three pieces of gold, had been earned by transcribing the Psalms, continued to assert the freedom of his mind, and denied, with his last breath, the pardon which was implored by the royal sinner. 7616 After some delay, Gregory, 7617 Bishop of Adrianople, was translated to the Byzantine throne, but his authority was found insufficient to support the absolution of the emperor. And Joseph, a reverend monk, was substituted to that important function. This edifying scene was represented in the presence of the Senate and the people, at the end of six years the humble penitent was restored to the communion of the faithful. And humanity will rejoice, that a milder treatment of the captive Lascaris was stipulated as a proof of his remorse. But the spirit of Arsenius still survived in a powerful faction of the monks and clergy, who persevered about forty-eight years in an obstinate schism. 
their scruples were treated with tenderness and respect by Michael and his son. And the reconciliation of the Arsenites was the serious labor of the church and state. In the confidence of fanaticism, they had proposed to try their cause by a miracle. And when the two papers, that contained their own and the adverse cause, were cast into a fiery brazier, they expected that the Catholic verity would be respected by the flames. Alas! The two papers were indiscriminately consumed, and this unforeseen accident produced the union of a day, and renewed the quarrel of an age. 7618 The final treaty displayed the victory of the Arsenites, the clergy abstained during forty days from all ecclesiastical functions, a slight penance was imposed on the laity, the body of Arsenius was deposited in the sanctuary. And, in the name of the departed saint, the prince and people were released from the sins of their fathers. 7619. The establishment of his family was the motive, or at least the pretense, of the crime of Paleologus. And he was impatient to confirm the succession, by sharing with his eldest son the honors of the purple. Andronicus, afterwards surnamed the Elder, was proclaimed and crowned emperor of the Romans, in the fifteenth year of his age. And, from the first era of a prolix and inglorious reign, he held that august title nine years as the colleague, and fifty as the successor, of his father. Michael himself, had he died in a private station, would have been thought more worthy of the empire, and the assaults of his temporal and spiritual enemies left him few moments to labor for his own fame or the happiness of his subjects. He wrested from the Franks several of the noblest islands of the archipelago, Lesbos, Chios, and Rhodes, his brother Constantine was sent to command in Malvasia and Sparta. And the eastern side of the Moria, from Argos and Napoli to Cape Thinners, was repossessed by the Greeks. This effusion of Christian blood was loudly condemned by the Patriarch. And the insolent priest presumed to interpose his fears and scruples between the arms of princes. But in the prosecution of these western conquests, the countries beyond the Hellespont were left naked to the Turks. And their depredations verified the prophecy of a dying senator, that the recovery of Constantinople would be the ruin of Asia. The victories of Michael were achieved by his lieutenants, his sword rusted in the palace. And, in the transactions of the emperor with the popes and the king of Naples, his political acts were stained with cruelty and fraud. 7620. I, the Vatican was the most natural refuge of a Latin emperor, who had been driven from his throne. And Pope Urban IV appeared to pity the misfortunes, and vindicate the cause, of the fugitive Baldwin. A crusade, with plenary indulgence, was preached by his command against the schismatic Greeks, he excommunicated their allies and adherents, solicited Louis IX in favor of his kinsmen, and demanded a tenth of the ecclesiastical revenues of France and England for the service of the Holy War. 7621 The subtle Greek, who watched the rising tempest of the West, attempted to suspend or soothe the hostility of the Pope, by suppliant embassies and respectful letters. But he insinuated that the establishment of peace must prepare the reconciliation and obedience of the Eastern Church. The Roman court could not be deceived by so gross an artifice. And Michael was admonished, that the repentance of the Son should precede the forgiveness of the Father, and that faith, an ambiguous word, was the only basis of friendship and alliance. After a long and affected delay, the approach of danger, and the importunity of Gregory X, compelled him to enter on a more serious negotiation, he alleged the example of the great Vataces. And the Greek clergy, who understood the intentions of their prince, were not alarmed by the first steps of reconciliation and respect. But when he pressed the conclusion of the treaty, they strenuously declared, that the Latins, though not in name, were heretics in fact, and that they despised those strangers as the vilest and most despicable portion of the human race. 7622 It was the task of the emperor to persuade, to corrupt, to intimidate the most popular ecclesiastics, to gain the vote of each individual, and alternately to urge the arguments of Christian charity and the public welfare. The texts of the fathers and the arms of the Franks were balanced in the theological and political scale. And without approving the addition to the Nicene Creed, the most moderate were taught to confess, that the two hostile propositions of proceeding from the Father by the Son, and of proceeding from the Father and the Son, 
might be reduced to a safe and Catholic sense. 7623 The supremacy of the Pope was a doctrine more easy to conceive, but more painful to acknowledge, yet Michael represented to his monks and prelates, that they might submit to name the Roman bishop as the first of the patriarchs. And that their distance and discretion would guard the liberties of the Eastern Church from the mischievous consequences of the right of appeal. He protested that he would sacrifice his life and empire rather than yield the smallest point of Orthodox faith or national independence, and this declaration was sealed and ratified by a golden bull. The Patriarch Joseph withdrew to a monastery, to resign or resume his throne, according to the event of the treaty, the letters of union and obedience were subscribed by the Emperor, his son Andronicus, and thirty-five archbishops and metropolitans. With their respective synods. And the episcopal list was multiplied by many dioceses which were annihilated under the yoke of the infidels. An embassy was composed of some trusty ministers and prelates, they embarked for Italy, with rich ornaments and rare perfumes for the altar of St. Peter, and their secret orders authorized and recommended a boundless compliance. They were received in the General Council of Lyons, by Pope Gregory X, at the head of 500 bishops. 7624 He embraced with tears his long lost and repentant children. Accepted the oath of the ambassadors, who abjured the schism in the name of the two emperors, adorned the prelates with the ring and mitre, chanted in Greek and Latin the Nicene Creed with the addition of Filioque, and rejoiced in the union of the East and West, which had been reserved for his reign. To consummate this pious work, the Byzantine deputies were speedily followed by the Pope's nuncios. And their instruction discloses the policy of the Vatican, which could not be satisfied with the vain title of supremacy. After viewing the temper of the prince and people, they were enjoined to absolve the schismatic clergy, who should subscribe and swear their abjuration and obedience, to establish in all the churches the use of the perfect creed. To prepare the entrance of a cardinal legate, with the full powers and dignity of his office, and to instruct the emperor in the advantages which he might derive from the temporal protection of the Roman pontiff. 7625. But they found a country without a friend, a nation in which the names of Rome and Union were pronounced with abhorrence. The patriarch Joseph was indeed removed, his place was filled by Vecus, an ecclesiastic of learning and moderation. And the emperor was still urged by the same motives, to persevere in the same professions. But in his private language Paleologus affected to deplore the pride, and to blame the innovations, of the Latins. And while he debased his character by this double hypocrisy, he justified and punished the opposition of his subjects. By the joint suffrage of the new and the ancient Rome, a sentence of excommunication was pronounced against the obstinate schismatics, the censures of the church were executed by the sword of Michael. On the failure of persuasion, he tried the arguments of prison and exile, of whipping and mutilation, those touchstones, says an historian, of cowards and the brave. Two Greeks still reigned in Aetolia, Epirus, and Thessaly, with the appellation of despots, they had yielded to the sovereign of Constantinople, but they rejected the chains of the Roman pontiff, and supported their refusal by successful arms. Under their protection, the fugitive monks and bishops assembled in hostile synods, and retorted the name of heretic with the galling addition of apostate, the prince of Trebizond was tempted to assume the forfeit title of emperor. 7626 And even the Latins of Negropont, Thebes, Athens, and the Moria, forgot the merits of the convert, to join, with open or clandestine aid, the enemies of Paleologus. His favorite generals, of his own blood, and family, successively deserted, or betrayed, the sacrilegious trust. His sister Eulogia, a niece, and two female cousins, conspired against him. Another niece, Mary Queen of Bulgaria, negotiated his ruin with the Sultan of Egypt, and, in the public eye, their treason was consecrated as the most sublime virtue. 7627 To the Pope's nuncios, who urged the consummation of the work, Paleologus exposed a naked recital of all that he had done and suffered for their sake. They were assured that the guilty sectaries, of both sexes and every rank, had been deprived of their honors, their fortunes, and their liberty. A spreading list of confiscation and punishment, which involved many persons, the dearest to the emperor, or the best deserving of his favor. 
They were conducted to the prison, to behold four princes of the royal blood chained in the four corners, and shaking their fetters in an agony of grief and rage. Two of these captives were afterwards released. The one by submission, the other by death, but the obstinacy of their two companions was chastised by the loss of their eyes, and the Greeks, the least adverse to the Union, deplored that cruel and inauspicious tragedy. 7628 persecutors must expect the hatred of those whom they oppress, but they commonly find some consolation in the testimony of their conscience, the applause of their party, and, perhaps, the success of their undertaking. But the hypocrisy of Michael, which was prompted only by political motives, must have forced him to hate himself, to despise his followers, and to esteem and envy the rebel champions by whom he was detested and despised. While his violence was abhorred at Constantinople, at Rome his slowness was arraigned, and his sincerity suspected. Till at length Pope Martin IV excluded the Greek emperor from the pale of a church, into which he was striving to reduce a schismatic people. No sooner had the tyrant expired, than the union was dissolved, and abjured by unanimous consent. The churches were purified, the penitents were reconciled, and his son Andronicus, after weeping the sins and errors of his youth most piously denied his father the burial of a prince and a Christian. 7629. 2. In the distress of the Latins, the walls and towers of Constantinople had fallen to decay, they were restored and fortified by the policy of Michael, who deposited a plenteous store of corn and salt provisions. To sustain the siege which he might hourly expect from the resentment of the Western powers. Of these, the sovereign of the two Sicilies was the most formidable neighbor, but as long as they were possessed by Mainfroy, the bastard of Frederick II, his monarchy was the bulwark, rather than the annoyance, of the Eastern Empire. The usurper, though a brave and active prince, was sufficiently employed in the defense of his throne, his proscription by successive popes had separated Mainfroy from the common cause of the Latins and the forces that might have besieged Constantinople were detained in a crusade against the domestic enemy of Rome. The prize of her avenger, the crown of the two Sicilies, was won and worn by the brother of St. Louis, by Charles Count of Anjou and Provence, who led the chivalry of France on this holy expedition. 7630 The disaffection of his Christian subjects compelled Mainfroy to enlist a colony of Saracens whom his father had planted in Apulia, and this odious succor will explain the defiance of the Catholic hero, who rejected all terms of accommodation. Bear this message, said Charles, to the Sultan of Nasera, that God and the sword are umpire between us, and that he shall either send me to paradise, or I will send him to the pit of hell. The armies met, and though I am ignorant of Mainfroy's doom in the other world, in this he lost his friends, his kingdom, and his life, in the bloody battle of Benevento. Naples and Sicily were immediately peopled with a warlike race of French nobles, and their aspiring leader embraced the future conquest of Africa, Greece, and Palestine. The most specious reasons might point his first arms against the Byzantine Empire, and Palaeologus, diffident of his own strength, repeatedly appealed from the ambition of Charles to the humanity of Esti. Louis, who still preserved a just ascendant over the mind of his ferocious brother. For a while the attention of that brother was confined at home by the invasion of Conradin, the last heir to the imperial house of Swabia. But the hapless boy sunk in the unequal conflict, and his execution on a public scaffold taught the rivals of Charles to tremble for their heads as well as their dominions. A second respite was obtained by the last crusade of Esti. Louis to the African coast, and the double motive of interest and duty urged the king of Naples to assist, with his powers and his presence, the holy enterprise. The death of Esti. Louis released him from the importunity of a virtuous censor, the king of Tunis confessed himself the tributary and vassal of the crown of Sicily, and the boldest of the French knights were free to enlist under his banner against the Greek Empire. A treaty and a marriage united his interest with the house of Courtney, his daughter Beatrice was promised to Philip, son and heir of the Emperor Baldwin a pension of six hundred ounces of gold was allowed for his maintenance. And his generous father distributed among his aliens the kingdoms and provinces of the east, reserving only Constantinople, and one day's journey round the city for the imperial domain. 7631 In this perilous moment, Palaeologus was the most eager to subscribe the creed, and implore the protection, of the Roman pontiff, 
who assumed, with propriety and weight, the character of an angel of peace, the common father of the Christians. By his voice, the sword of Charles was chained in the scabbard. And the Greek ambassadors beheld him, in the Pope's antechamber, biting his ivory scepter in a transport of fury, and deeply resenting the refusal to enfranchise and consecrate his arms. He appears to have respected the disinterested mediation of Gregory X, but Charles was insensibly disgusted by the pride and partiality of Nicholas III. And his attachment to his kindred, the Ursini family, alienated the most strenuous champion from the service of the Church. The hostile league against the Greeks, of Philip the Latin Emperor, the King of the Two Sicilies, and the Republic of Venice, was ripened into execution, and the election of Martin IV, a French Pope, gave a sanction to the cause. Of the Allies, Philip supplied his name, Martin, a bull of excommunication, the Venetians, a squadron of forty galleys. And the formidable powers of Charles consisted of forty counts, ten thousand men at arms, a numerous body of infantry, and a fleet of more than three hundred ships and transports. A distant day was appointed for assembling this mighty force in the harbour of Brindisi, and a previous attempt was risked with a detachment of three hundred knights, who invaded Albania, and besieged the fortress of Belgrade. Their defeat might amuse with a triumph the vanity of Constantinople, but the more sagacious Michael, despairing of his arms, depended on the effects of a conspiracy. On the secret workings of a rat, who gnawed the bowstring 7632 of the Sicilian tyrant. Among the proscribed adherents of the House of Swabia, John of Procida forfeited a small island of that name in the Bay of Naples. His birth was noble, but his education was learned, and in the poverty of exile, he was relieved by the practice of physic, which he had studied in the school of Salerno. Fortune had left him nothing to lose, except life. And to despise life is the first qualification of a rebel. Precida was endowed with the art of negotiation, to enforce his reasons and disguise his motives. And in his various transactions with nations and men, he could persuade each party that he labored solely for their interest. The new kingdoms of Charles were afflicted by every species of fiscal and military oppression. 7633 and the lives and fortunes of his Italian subjects were sacrificed to the greatness of their master and the licentiousness of his followers. The hatred of Naples was repressed by his presence. But the looser government of his vicegerents excited the contempt, as well as the aversion, of the Sicilians, the island was roused to a sense of freedom by the eloquence of Precida. And he displayed to every baron his private interest in the common cause. In the confidence of foreign aid, he successively visited the courts of the Greek emperor, and of Peter King of Aragon 7634 who possessed the maritime countries of Valencia and Catalonia. To the ambitious Peter a crown was presented, which he might justly claim by his marriage with the sister 7635 of Mainfroy, and by the dying voice of Conradin, who from the scaffold had cast a ring to his heir and avenger. Paleologus was easily persuaded to divert his enemy from a foreign war by a rebellion at home. And a Greek subsidy of 25,000 ounces of gold was most profitably applied to arm a Catalan fleet, which sailed under a holy banner to the specious attack of the Saracens of Africa. In the disguise of a monk or beggar, the indefatigable missionary of revolt flew from Constantinople to Rome, and from Sicily to Saragossa, the treaty was sealed with the signet of Pope Nicholas himself, the enemy of Charles. And his deed of gift transferred the fiefs of St. Peter from the house of Anjou to that of Aragon. So widely diffused and so freely circulated, the secret was preserved above two years with impenetrable discretion. And each of the conspirators imbibed the maxim of Peter, who declared that he would cut off his left hand if it were conscious of the intentions of his right. The mine was prepared with deep and dangerous artifice. But it may be questioned, whether the instant explosion of Palermo were the effect of accident or design. On the vigil of Easter, a procession of the disarmed citizens visited a church without the walls. And a noble damsel was rudely insulted by a French soldier. 7636 The ravisher was instantly punished with death, and if the people was at first scattered by a military force, their numbers and fury prevailed, the conspirators seized the opportunity. The flame spread over the island, and 8,000 French were exterminated in a promiscuous massacre, 
which has obtained the name of the Sicilian Vespers. 7637 From every city the banners of freedom and the church were displayed, the revolt was inspired by the presence or the soul of Prachita and Peter of Aragon, who sailed from the African coast to Palermo. Was saluted as the king and saviour of the isle. By the rebellion of a people on whom he had so long trampled with impunity, Charles was astonished and confounded, and in the first agony of grief and devotion, he was heard to exclaim, O God! If thou hast decreed to humble me, grant me at least a gentle and gradual descent from the pinnacle of greatness. His fleet and army, which already filled the seaports of Italy, were hastily recalled from the service of the Grecian War. And the situation of Messina exposed that town to the first storm of his revenge. Feeble in themselves, and yet hopeless of foreign succor, the citizens would have repented, and submitted on the assurance of full pardon and their ancient privileges. But the pride of the monarch was already rekindled. And the most fervent entreaties of the legate could extort no more than a promise, that he would forgive the remainder, after a chosen list of eight hundred rebels had been yielded to his discretion. The despair of the Messinese renewed their courage, Peter of Aragon approached to their relief, 7638 and his rival was driven back by the failure of provision and the terrors of the equinox to the Calabrian shore. At the same moment, the Catalan admiral, the famous Roger de Loria, swept the channel with an invincible squadron, the French fleet, more numerous in transports than in galleys, was either burnt or destroyed. And the same blow assured the independence of Sicily and the safety of the Greek Empire. A few days before his death, the Emperor Michael rejoiced in the fall of an enemy whom he hated and esteemed. And perhaps he might be content with the popular judgment, that had they not been matched with each other, Constantinople and Italy must speedily have obeyed the same master. 7639 From this disastrous moment, the life of Charles was a series of misfortunes, his capital was insulted, his son was made prisoner, and he sunk into the grave without recovering the Isle of Sicily, which, after a war of twenty years, was finally severed from the throne of Naples, and transferred, as an independent kingdom, to a younger branch of the House of Aragon. 7640. I shall not, I trust, be accused of superstition, but I must remark that, even in this world, the natural order of events will sometimes afford the strong appearances of moral retribution. The first Paleologus had saved his empire by involving the kingdoms of the West in rebellion and blood, and from these scenes of discord uprose a generation of iron men, who assaulted and endangered the empire of his son. In modern times our debts and taxes are the secret poison which still corrodes the bosom of peace, but in the weak and disorderly government of the Middle Ages, it was agitated by the present evil of the disbanded armies. Too idle to work, too proud to beg, the mercenaries were accustomed to a life of rapine, they could rob with more dignity in effect under a banner and a chief. And the sovereign, to whom their service was useless, and their presence importunate, endeavoured to discharge the torrent on some neighbouring countries. After the peace of Sicily, many thousands of Genoese, Catalans 7641 and who had fought, by sea and land, under the standard of Anjou or Aragon, were blended into one nation by the resemblance of their manners and interest. They heard that the Greek provinces of Asia were invaded by the Turks, they resolved to share the harvest of pay and plunder, and Frederick King of Sicily most liberally contributed the means of their departure. In a warfare of twenty years, a ship, or a camp, was become their country, Arms were their sole profession and property, valor was the only virtue which they knew. Their women had imbibed the fearless temper of their lovers and husbands, it was reported, that, with a stroke of their broadsword, the Catalans could cleave a horseman and a horse, and the report itself was a powerful weapon. Roger de Flore 7642 was the most popular of their chiefs, and his personal merit overshadowed the dignity of his proud arrivals of Aragon. The offspring of a marriage between a German gentleman of the court of Frederick II and a damsel of Brindisi, Roger was successively a Templar, an apostate, a pirate, and at length the richest and most powerful admiral of the Mediterranean. He sailed from Messina to Constantinople, with eighteen galleys, four great ships, and eight thousand adventurers. 7643 and his previous treaty was faithfully accomplished by Andronicus the Elder, 
who accepted with joy and terror this formidable succor. A palace was allotted for his reception, and a niece of the emperor was given in marriage to the valiant stranger, who was immediately created great duke or admiral of Romania. After a decent repose, he transported his troops over the Propontis, and boldly led them against the Turks, in two bloody battles thirty thousand of the Moslems were slain, he raised the siege of Philadelphia. And deserved the name of the Deliverer of Asia. But after a short season of prosperity, the cloud of slavery and ruin again burst on that unhappy province. The inhabitants escaped, says a Greek historian, from the smoke into the flames. And the hostility of the Turks was less pernicious than the friendship of the Catalans. 7644 The lives and fortunes which they had rescued they considered as their own, the willing or reluctant maid was saved from the race of circumcision for the embraces of a Christian soldier, the exaction of fines and supplies was enforced by licentious rapine and arbitrary executions. And, on the resistance of Magnesia, the great duke besieged a city of the Roman Empire. 7645 These disorders he excused by the wrongs and passions of a victorious army. Nor would his own authority or person have been safe, had he dared to punish his faithful followers, who were defrauded of the just and covenanted price of their services. The threats and complaints of Andronicus disclosed the nakedness of the empire. His golden bull had invited no more than five hundred horse and a thousand foot soldiers. Yet the crowds of volunteers, who migrated to the east, had been enlisted and fed by his spontaneous bounty. While his bravest allies were content with three bizants or pieces of gold, for their monthly pay, an ounce, or even two ounces, of gold were assigned to the Catalans, whose annual pension would thus amount to near a hundred pounds sterling, one of their chiefs had modestly rated at three hundred thousand crowns the value of his future merits. And above a million had been issued from the treasury for the maintenance of these costly mercenaries. A cruel tax had been imposed on the corn of the husbandman, one third was retrenched from the salaries of the public officers. And the standard of the coin was so shamefully debased, that of the four and twenty parts only five were of pure gold. 7646 At the summons of the emperor, Roger evacuated a province which no longer supplied the materials of rapine. 7647 But he refused to disperse his troops, and while his style was respectful, his conduct was independent and hostile. He protested, that if the emperor should march against him, he would advance forty paces to kiss the ground before him. But in rising from this prostrate attitude Roger had a life and sword at the service of his friends. The great Duke of Romania condescended to accept the title and ornaments of Caesar. But he rejected the new proposal of the government of Asia with a subsidy of corn and money 7648 on condition that he should reduce his troops to the harmless number of three thousand men. Assassination is the last resource of cowards. The Caesar was tempted to visit the royal residence of Adrianople, in the apartment, and before the eyes, of the empress he was stabbed by the Alani guards. And though the deed was imputed to their private revenge, 7649 his countrymen, who dwelt at Constantinople in the security of peace, were involved in the same proscription by the prince or people. The loss of their leader intimidated the crowd of adventurers, who hoisted the sails of flight, and were soon scattered round the coasts of the Mediterranean. But a veteran band of fifteen hundred Catalans, or French, stood firm in the strong fortress of Gallipoli on the Hellespont, displayed the banners of Aragon, and offered to revenge and justify their chief. By an equal combat of ten or a hundred warriors. Instead of accepting this bold defiance, the Emperor Michael, the son and colleague of Andronicus, resolved to oppress them with the weight of multitudes every nerve was strained to form an army of thirteen thousand horse and thirty thousand foot. And the Propontis was covered with the ships of the Greeks and Genoese. In two battles by sea and land, these mighty forces were encountered and overthrown by the despair and discipline of the Catalans, the young emperor fled to the palace. And an insufficient guard of light horse was left for the protection of the open country. Victory renewed the hopes and numbers of the adventures, Every nation was blended under the name and standard of the great company. And three thousand Turkish proselytes deserted from the imperial service to join this military association. In the possession of Gallipoli, 7650 the Catalans intercepted the trade of Constantinople and the Black Sea, 
while they spread their devastation on either side of the Hellespont over the confines of Europe and Asia. To prevent their approach, the greatest part of the Byzantine territory was laid waste by the Greeks themselves, the peasants and their cattle retired into the city. And myriads of sheep and oxen, for which neither place nor food could be procured, were unprofitably slaughtered on the same day. For times the Emperor Andronicus sued for peace, and four times he was inflexibly repulsed, till the want of provisions, and the discord of the chiefs, compelled the Catalans to evacuate the banks of the Hellespont and the neighborhood of the capital. After their separation from the Turks, the remains of the great company pursued their march through Macedonia and Thessaly, to seek a new establishment in the heart of Greece. 7651 After some ages of oblivion, Greece was awakened to new misfortunes by the arms of the Latins. In the 250 years between the first and the last conquest of Constantinople, that venerable land was disputed by a multitude of petty tyrants. Without the comforts of freedom and genius, her ancient cities were again plunged in foreign and intestine war, and, if servitude be preferable to anarchy, they might repose with joy under the Turkish yoke. I shall not pursue the obscure and various dynasties, that rose and fell on the continent or in the isles, but our silence on the fate of Athens 7652 would argue a strange ingratitude to the first and purest school of liberal science and amusement. In the partition of the empire, the principality of Athens and Thebes was assigned to Otho de la Roche, a noble warrior of Burgundy 7653 with the title of Great Duke 7654 which the Latins understood in their own sense. And the Greeks more foolishly derived from the age of Constantine. 7655 Otho followed the standard of the Marquis of Montferrat, the ample state which he acquired by a miracle of conduct or fortune 7656 was peaceably inherited by his son and two grandsons, till the family, though not the nation, was changed. By the marriage of an heiress into the elder branch of the house of Brienne. The son of that marriage, Walter de Brienne, succeeded to the Duchy of Athens, and, with the aid of some Catalan mercenaries, whom he invested with fiefs, reduced above thirty castles of the vassal or neighboring lords. But when he was informed of the approach and ambition of the great company, he collected a force of seven hundred knights, six thousand four hundred horse, and eight thousand foot, and boldly met them on the banks of the river Cephasus in Boeotia. The Catalans amounted to no more than three thousand five hundred horse, and four thousand foot, but the deficiency of numbers was compensated by stratagem and order. They formed round their camp an artificial inundation. The duke and his knights advanced without fear or precaution on the verdant meadow, their horses plunged into the bog, and he was cut in pieces, with the greatest part of the French cavalry. His family and nation were expelled. And his son Walter de Brienne, the titular duke of Athens, the tyrant of Florence, and the constable of France, lost his life in the field of Poitiers Attica and Boeotia were the rewards of the victorious Catalans. They married the widows and daughters of the slain, and during fourteen years, the great company was the terror of the Grecian states. Their factions drove them to acknowledge the sovereignty of the House of Aragon. And during the remainder of the fourteenth century, Athens, as a government or an uppunage, was successively bestowed by the kings of Sicily. After the French and Catalans, the third dynasty was that of the Achaeli, a family, plebeian at Florence, potent at Naples, and sovereign in Greece. Athens, which they embellished with new buildings, became the capital of a state, that extended over Thebes, Argos, Corinth, Delphi, and a part of Thessaly. And their reign was finally determined by Mohammed II, who strangled the last duke, and educated his sons in the discipline and religion of the Seraglio. Athens 7657 though no more than the shadow of her former self, still contains about eight or ten thousand inhabitants, of these, three-fourths are Greeks in religion and language. And the Turks, who compose the remainder, have relaxed, in their intercourse with the citizens, somewhat of the pride and gravity of their national character. The olive tree, the gift of Minerva, flourishes in Attica. Nor has the honey of Mount Hymettus lost any part of its exquisite flavor, 7658 But the languid trade is monopolized by strangers, and the agriculture of a barren land is abandoned to the vagrant Wallachians. 
the Athenians are still distinguished by the subtlety and acuteness of their understandings. But these qualities, unless ennobled by freedom, and enlightened by study, will degenerate into a low and selfish cunning, and it is a proverbial saying of the country, from the Jews of Thessalonica, the Turks of Negropont. And the Greeks of Athens, good Lord deliver us. This artful people has eluded the tyranny of the Turkish Bashaws, by an expedient which alleviates their servitude and aggravates their shame. About the middle of the last century, the Athenians chose for their protector the Kisler Aga, or chief black eunuch of the Siralio. This Ethiopian slave, who possesses the sultan's ear, condescends to accept the tribute of thirty thousand crowns, his lieutenant, the Waywode, whom he annually confirms, may reserve for his own about five or six thousand more. And such is the policy of the citizens, that they seldom fail to remove and punish an oppressive governor. Their private differences are decided by the archbishop, one of the richest prelates of the Greek church, since he possesses a revenue of one thousand pounds sterling. And by a tribunal of the eight geronti or elders, chosen in the eight quarters of the city, the noble families cannot trace their pedigree above three hundred years. But their principal members are distinguished by a grave demeanor, a fur cap, and the lofty appellation of Archon. By some, who delight in the contrast, the modern language of Athens is represented as the most corrupt and barbarous of the seventy dialects of the vulgar Greek, 7659 This picture is too darkly colored, but it would not be easy. In the country of Plato and Demosthenes, to find a reader or a copy of their works. The Athenians walk with supine indifference among the glorious ruins of antiquity, and such is the debasement of their character, that they are incapable of admiring the genius of their predecessors. 7660. LXI, Civil Wars and the Ruin of the Greek Empire. Civil Wars and Ruin of the Greek Empire. Reigns of Andronicus, the Elder and Younger, and John Paleologus. Regency, Revolt, Reign, and Abdication of John Cantacuzene. Establishment of a Genoese colony at Pera or Galata. Their wars with the Empire and city of Constantinople. The long reign of Andronicus 7661 The Elder is chiefly memorable by the disputes of the Greek Church, the invasion of the Catalans, and the rise of the Ottoman power. He is celebrated as the most learned and virtuous prince of the age. But such virtue, and such learning, contributed neither to the perfection of the individual, nor to the happiness of society. A slave of the most abject superstition, he was surrounded on all sides by visible and invisible enemies. Nor were the flames of hell less dreadful to his fancy, than those of a Catalan or Turkish war. Under the reign of the Paleology, the choice of the patriarch was the most important business of the state. The heads of the Greek church were ambitious and fanatic monks, and their vices or virtues, their learning or ignorance, were equally mischievous or contemptible. By his intemperate discipline, the patriarch Athanasius 7662 excited the hatred of the clergy and people, he was heard to declare, that the sinner should swallow the last dregs of the cup of penance. And the foolish tale was propagated of his punishing a sacrilegious ass that had tasted the lettuce of a convent garden. Driven from the throne by the universal clamor, Athanasius composed before his retreat two papers of a very opposite cast. His public testament was in the tone of charity and resignation, the private codicil breathed the direst anathemas against the authors of his disgrace, whom he excluded forever from the communion of the Holy Trinity, the angels, and the saints. This last paper he enclosed in an earthen pot, which was placed, by his order, on the top of one of the pillars, in the dome of Saint Sophia, in the distant hope of discovery and revenge. At the end of four years, some youths, climbing by a ladder in search of pigeons' nests, detected the fatal secret. And, as Andronicus felt himself touched and bound by the excommunication, he trembled on the brink of the abyss which had been so treacherously dug under his feet. A synod of bishops was instantly convened to debate this important question, the rashness of these clandestine anathemas was generally condemned. But as the knot could be untied only by the same hand, as that hand was now deprived of the crozier, it appeared that this posthumous decree was irrevocable by any earthly power. Some faint testimonies of repentance and pardon were extorted from the author of the mischief. But the conscience of the emperor was still wounded, and he desired, 
with no less ardor than Athanasius himself, the restoration of a patriarch, by whom alone he could be healed. At the dead of night, a monk rudely knocked at the door of the royal bedchamber, announcing a revelation of plague and famine, of inundations and earthquakes. Andronicus started from his bed, and spent the night in prayer, till he felt, or thought that he felt, a slight motion of the earth. The emperor on foot led the bishops and monks to the cell of Athanasius. And, after a proper resistance, the saint, from whom this message had been sent, consented to absolve the prince, and govern the church of Constantinople. Untamed by disgrace, and hardened by solitude, the shepherd was again odious to the flock, and his enemies contrived a singular, and as it proved, a successful, mode of revenge. In the night, they stole away the footstool or footcloth of his throne, which they secretly replaced with the decoration of a satirical picture. The emperor was painted with a bridle in his mouth, and Athanasius leading the tractable beast to the feet of Christ. The authors of the libel were detected and punished. But as their lives had been spared, the Christian priest in sullen indignation retired to his cell, and the eyes of Andronicus, which had been opened for a moment, were again closed by his successor. If this transaction be one of the most curious and important of a reign of fifty years, I cannot at least accuse the brevity of my materials, since I reduce into some few pages the enormous folios of Pacomer 7663 Cantacuzine. 7664 and Nicephorus Gregorus 7665 who have composed the prolix and languid story of the times. The name and situation of the Emperor John Cantacuzine might inspire the most lively curiosity. His memorials of forty years extend from the revolt of the younger Andronicus to his own abdication of the empire. And it is observed, that, like Moses and Caesar, he was the principal actor in the scenes which he describes. But in this eloquent work we should vainly seek the sincerity of a hero or a penitent. Retired in a cloister from the vices and passions of the world, he presents not a confession, but an apology, of the life of an ambitious statesman. Instead of unfolding the true counsels and characters of men, he displays the smooth and specious surface of events, highly varnished with his own praises and those of his friends. Their motives are always pure. Their ends always legitimate, they conspire and rebel without any views of interest, and the violence which they inflict or suffer is celebrated as the spontaneous effect of reason and virtue. After the example of the first of the Paleology, the elder Andronicus associated his son Michael to the honours of the purple. And from the age of eighteen to his premature death, that prince was acknowledged, above twenty-five years, as the second emperor of the Greeks. 7666 at the head of an army, he excited neither the fears of the enemy, nor the jealousy of the court. His modesty and patience were never tempted to compute the years of his father, nor was that father compelled to repent of his liberality either by the virtues or vices of his son. The son of Michael was named Andronicus from his grandfather, to whose early favor he was introduced by that nominal resemblance. The blossoms of wit and beauty increased the fondness of the elder Andronicus. And, with the common vanity of age, he expected to realize in the second, the hope which had been disappointed in the first, generation. The boy was educated in the palace as an heir and a favorite. And in the oaths and acclamations of the people, the August Triad was formed by the names of the father, the son, and the grandson. But the younger Andronicus was speedily corrupted by his infant greatness, while he beheld with puerile impatience the double obstacle that hung, and might long hang, over his rising ambition. It was not to acquire fame, or to diffuse happiness, that he so eagerly aspired, wealth and impunity were in his eyes the most precious attributes of a monarch. And his first indiscreet demand was the sovereignty of some rich and fertile island, where he might lead a life of independence and pleasure. The emperor was offended by the loud and frequent intemperance which disturbed his capital. The sums which his parsimony denied were supplied by the Genoese usurers of Para, and the oppressive debt, which consolidated the interest of a faction, could be discharged only by a revolution. A beautiful female, a matron in rank, a prostitute in manners, had instructed the younger Andronicus in the rudiments of love, but he had reason to suspect the nocturnal visits of a rival. And a stranger passing through the street was pierced by the arrows of his guards, who were placed in ambush at her door. 
That stranger was his brother, Prince Manuel, who languished and died of his wound. And the Emperor Michael, their common father, whose health was in a declining state, expired on the eighth day, lamenting the loss of both his children. 7667 However guiltless in his intention, the younger Andronicus might impute a brother's and a father's death to the consequence of his own vices. And deep was the sigh of thinking and feeling men, when they perceived, instead of sorrow and repentance, his ill-dissembled joy on the removal of two odious competitors. By these melancholy events, and the increase of his disorders, the mind of the elder emperor was gradually alienated, and, after many fruitless reproofs, he transferred on another grandson 7668 his hopes and affection. The change was announced by the new oath of allegiance to the reigning sovereign, and the person whom he should appoint for his successor. And the acknowledged heir, after a repetition of insults and complaints, was exposed to the indignity of a public trial. Before the sentence, which would probably have condemned him to a dungeon or a cell, the emperor was informed that the palace courts were filled with the armed followers of his grandson, the judgment was softened to a treaty of reconciliation. And the triumphant escape of the prince encouraged the ardor of the younger faction. Yet the capital, the clergy, and the senate, adhered to the person, or at least to the government, of the old emperor. And it was only in the provinces, by flight, and revolt, and foreign succor, that the male contents could hope to vindicate their cause and subvert his throne. The soul of the enterprise was the great domestic John Cantacuzene. The sally from Constantinople is the first date of his actions and memorials. And if his own pen be most descriptive of his patriotism, an unfriendly historian has not refused to celebrate the zeal and ability which he displayed in the service of the young emperor. 7669 That prince escaped from the capital under the pretense of hunting, erected his standard at Adrianople, and, in a few days, assembled fifty thousand horse and foot, whom neither honor or duty could have armed against the barbarians. Such a force might have saved or commanded the empire, but their counsels were discordant, their motions were slow and doubtful, and their progress was checked by intrigue and negotiation. The quarrel of the two Andronici was protracted, and suspended, and renewed, during a ruinous period of seven years. In the first treaty, the relics of the Greek Empire were divided, Constantinople, Thessalonica, and the islands, were left to the elder, while the younger acquired the sovereignty of the greatest part of Thrace, from Philippi to the Byzantine limit. By the second treaty, he stipulated the payment of his troops, his immediate coronation, and an adequate share of the power and revenue of the state. The third civil war was terminated by the surprise of Constantinople, the final retreat of the old emperor, and the sole reign of his victorious grandson. The reasons of this delay may be found in the characters of the men and of the times. When the heir of the monarchy first pleaded his wrongs and his apprehensions, he was heard with pity and applause, and his adherents repeated on all sides the inconsistent promise. That he would increase the pay of the soldiers and alleviate the burdens of the people. The grievances of forty years were mingled in his revolt, and the rising generation was fatigued by the endless prospect of a reign, whose favorites and maxims were of other times. The youth of Andronicus had been without spirit, his age was without reverence, his taxes produced an unusual revenue of five hundred thousand pounds. Yet the richest of the sovereigns of Christendom was incapable of maintaining three thousand horse and twenty galleys, to resist the destructive progress of the Turks. 7670 How different, said the younger Andronicus, is my situation from that of the son of Philip. Alexander might complain, that his father would leave him nothing to conquer, alas! My grandsire will leave me nothing to lose. But the Greeks were soon admonished, that the public disorders could not be healed by a civil war, and that their young favorite was not destined to be the savior of a falling empire. On the first repulse, his party was broken by his own levity, their intestine discord, and the intrigues of the ancient court, which tempted each male content to desert or betray the cause of the rebellion. Andronicus the younger was touched with remorse, or fatigued with business, or deceived by negotiation, pleasure rather than power was his aim. And the license of maintaining a thousand hounds, a thousand hawks, and a thousand huntsmen, was sufficient to sully his fame and disarm his ambition. Let us now survey the catastrophe of this busy plot, 
and the final situation of the principal actors. 7671 The age of Andronicus was consumed in civil discord. And, amidst the events of war and treaty, his power and reputation continually decayed, till the fatal night in which the gates of the city and palace were opened without resistance to his grandson. His principal commander scorned the repeated warnings of danger, and retiring to rest in the vain security of ignorance, abandoned the feeble monarch, with some priests and pages, to the terrors of a sleepless night. These terrors were quickly realized by the hostile shouts, which proclaimed the titles and victory of Andronicus the Younger. And the aged emperor, falling prostrate before an image of the Virgin, dispatched a suppliant message to resign the scepter, and to obtain his life at the hands of the conqueror. The answer of his grandson was decent and pious. At the prayer of his friends, the younger Andronicus assumed the sole administration. But the elder still enjoyed the name and preeminence of the first emperor, the use of the great palace, and a pension of twenty-four thousand pieces of gold, one half of which was assigned on the royal treasury, and the other on the fishery of Constantinople. But his impotence was soon exposed to contempt and oblivion. The vast silence of the palace was disturbed only by the cattle and poultry of the neighborhood 7672 which roved with impunity through the solitary courts. And a reduced allowance of 10,000 pieces of gold 7673 was all that he could ask, and more than he could hope. His calamities were embittered by the gradual extinction of sight, his confinement was rendered each day more rigorous. And during the absence and sickness of his grandson, his inhuman keepers, by the threats of instant death, compelled him to exchange the purple for the monastic habit and profession. The monk Antony had renounced the pomp of the world. Yet he had occasion for a coarse fur in the winter season, and as wine was forbidden by his confessor, and water by his physician, the sherbet of Egypt was his common drink. It was not without difficulty that the late emperor could procure three or four pieces to satisfy these simple wants. And if he bestowed the gold to relieve the more painful distress of a friend, the sacrifice is of some weight in the scale of humanity and religion. For years after his abdication, Andronicus or Antony expired in a cell, in the seventy-fourth year of his age, and the last strain of adulation could only promise a more splendid crown of glory in heaven than he had enjoyed upon earth. 7674-7675 nor was the reign of the younger, more glorious or fortunate than that of the elder, Andronicus.7676 He gathered the fruits of ambition. But the taste was transient and bitter, in the supreme station he lost the remains of his early popularity, and the defects of his character became still more conspicuous to the world. The public reproach urged him to march in person against the Turks, nor did his courage fail in the hour of trial, but a defeat and a wound were the only trophies of his expedition in Asia, which confirmed the establishment of the Ottoman monarchy. The abuses of the civil government attained their full maturity and perfection, his neglect of forms, and the confusion of national dresses, are deplored by the Greeks as the fatal symptoms of the decay of the empire. Andronicus was old before his time, the intemperance of youth had accelerated the infirmities of age. And after being rescued from a dangerous malady by nature, or physic, or the virgin, he was snatched away before he had accomplished his forty-fifth year. He was twice married. And, as the progress of the Latins in arms and arts had softened the prejudices of the Byzantine court, his two wives were chosen in the princely houses of Germany and Italy. The first, Agnes at home, Irene in Greece, was daughter of the Duke of Brunswick. Her father 7677 was a petty lord 7678 in the poor and savage regions of the north of Germany 7679 yet he derived some revenue from his silver mines. 7618 his family is celebrated by the Greeks as the most ancient and noble of the Teutonic name. 7681 after the death of this childish princess, Andronicus sought in marriage Jane, the sister of the Count of Savoy. 7682 and his suit was preferred to that of the French king. 7683 the count respected in his sister the superior majesty of a Roman empress, her retinue was composed of knights and ladies, she was regenerated and crowned in a stee. Sophia, under the more orthodox appellation of Anne, and, at the nuptial feast, the Greeks and Italians vied with each other in the martial exercises of tilts and tournaments. 
The Empress Anne of Savoy survived her husband, their son, John Paleologus, was left an orphan and an emperor in the ninth year of his age, and his weakness was protected by the first and most deserving of the Greeks. The long and cordial friendship of his father for John Cantacuzene is alike honorable to the prince and the subject. It had been formed amidst the pleasures of their youth, their families were almost equally noble. 7684 and the recent luster of the purple was amply compensated by the energy of a private education. We have seen that the young emperor was saved by Cantacuzene from the power of his grandfather. And, after six years of civil war, the same favorite brought him back in triumph to the palace of Constantinople. Under the reign of Andronicus the Younger, the great domestic ruled the emperor and the empire. And it was by his valor and conduct that the Isle of Lesbos and the Principality of Aetolia were restored to their ancient allegiance. His enemies confess, that, among the public robbers, Cantacuzene alone was moderate and abstemious. And the free and voluntary account which he produces of his own wealth 7685 may sustain the presumption that he was devolved by inheritance, and not accumulated by rapine. He does not indeed specify the value of his money, plate, and jewels. Yet, after a voluntary gift of two hundred vases of silver, after much had been secreted by his friends and plundered by his foes, his forfeit treasures were sufficient for the equipment of a fleet of seventy galleys. He does not measure the size and number of his estates, but his granaries were heaped with an incredible store of wheat and barley. And the labor of a thousand yoke of oxen might cultivate, according to the practice of antiquity, about 62,500 acres of arable land. 7686 His pastures were stocked with 2,500 brood mares, 200 camels, 300 mules, 500 asses, 5,000 horned cattle, 50,000 hogs, and 70,000 sheep. 7687 A precious record of rural opulence, in the last period of the empire, and in a land, most probably in Thrace, so repeatedly wasted by foreign and domestic hostility. The favor of Cantacuzene was above his fortune. In the moments of familiarity, in the hour of sickness, the emperor was desirous to level the distance between them and pressed his friend to accept the diadem and purple. The virtue of the great domestic, which is attested by his own pen, resisted the dangerous proposal. But the last testament of Andronicus the Younger named him the guardian of his son, and the regent of the empire. Had the regent found a suitable return of obedience and gratitude, perhaps he would have acted with pure and zealous fidelity in the service of his pupil. 7688 A guard of five hundred soldiers watched over his person and the palace. The funeral of the late emperor was decently performed, the capital was silent and submissive, and five hundred letters, which Cantacuzene dispatched in the first month, informed the provinces of their loss and their duty. The prospect of a tranquil minority was blasted by the great duke or admiral Apicacus, and to exaggerate his perfidy, the imperial historian is pleased to magnify his own imprudence. In raising him to that office against the advice of his more sagacious sovereign. Bold and subtle, rapacious and profuse, the avarice and ambition of Apicacus were by turns subservient to each other, and his talents were applied to the ruin of his country. His arrogance was heightened by the command of a naval force and an impregnable castle, and under the mask of oaths and flattery he secretly conspired against his benefactor. The female court of the empress was bribed and directed. He encouraged and of Savoy to assert, by the law of nature, the tutelage of her son. The love of power was disguised by the anxiety of maternal tenderness and the founder of the paleology had instructed his posterity to dread the example of a perfidious guardian. The patriarch John of Apri was a proud and feeble old man, encompassed by a numerous and hungry kindred. He produced an obsolete epistle of Andronicus, which bequeathed the prince and people to his pious care, the fate of his predecessor Arsenius prompted him to prevent, rather than punish, the crimes of a usurper. And Apicacus smiled at the success of his own flattery, when he beheld the Byzantine priest assuming the state and temporal claims of the Roman pontiff. 7689 Between three persons so different in their situation and character, a private league was concluded, a shadow of authority was restored to the Senate, and the people was tempted by the name of freedom. By this powerful confederacy, the great domestic was assaulted at first with clandestine, at length with open, arms. 
His prerogatives were disputed, his opinions slighted, his friends persecuted. And his safety was threatened both in the camp and city. In his absence on the public service, he was accused of treason, proscribed as an enemy of the church and state. And delivered with all his adherence to the sword of justice, the vengeance of the people, and the power of the devil, his fortunes were confiscated, his aged mother was cast into prison, 7690 all his past services were buried in oblivion. And he was driven by injustice to perpetrate the crime of which he was accused. 7691 from the review of his preceding conduct, Cantacuzian appears to have been guiltless of any treasonable designs. And the only suspicion of his innocence must arise from the vehemence of his protestations, and the sublime purity which he ascribes to his own virtue. While the Empress and the Patriarch still affected the appearances of harmony, he repeatedly solicited the permission of retiring to a private, and even a monastic, life. After he had been declared a public enemy, it was his fervent wish to throw himself at the feet of the young emperor. And to receive without a murmur the stroke of the executioner, it was not without reluctance that he listened to the voice of reason, which inculcated the sacred duty of saving his family and friends. And proved that he could only save them by drawing the sword and assuming the imperial title. In the strong city of Demotica, his peculiar domain, the Emperor John Cantacuzanus was invested with the purple buskins, his right leg was clothed by his noble kinsmen, the left by the Latin chiefs, on whom he conferred the order of knighthood. But even in this act of revolt, he was still studious of loyalty, and the titles of John Paleologus and N. of Savoy were proclaimed before his own name and that of his wife Irene. Such vain ceremony is a thin disguise of rebellion, nor are there perhaps any personal wrongs that can authorize a subject to take arms against his sovereign, but the want of preparation and success may confirm the assurance of the usurper. That this decisive step was the effect of necessity rather than of choice. Constantinople adhered to the young emperor, the king of Bulgaria was invited to the relief of Adrianople, the principal cities of Thrace and Macedonia, after some hesitation, renounced their obedience to the great domestic. And the leaders of the troops and provinces were induced, by their private interest, to prefer the loose dominion of a woman and a priest. 7692 The army of Cantacuzene, in sixteen divisions, was stationed on the banks of the Melas to tempt or to intimidate the capital, it was dispersed by treachery or fear. And the officers, more especially the mercenary Latins, accepted the bribes, and embraced the service, of the Byzantine court. After this loss, the rebel emperor, he fluctuated between the two characters, took the road of Thessalonica with a chosen remnant, but he failed in his enterprise on that important place. And he was closely pursued by the great duke, his enemy Apicacus, at the head of a superior power by sea and land. Driven from the coast, in his march, or rather flight, into the mountains of Servia, Cantacuzene assembled his troops to scrutinize those who were worthy and willing to accompany his broken fortunes. A base majority bowed and retired. And his trusty band was diminished to two thousand, and at last to five hundred, volunteers. The Kral, seventy-six ninety-three or despot of the Servians received him with general hospitality, but the ally was insensibly degraded to a suppliant, a hostage, a captive. And in this miserable dependence, he waited at the door of the barbarian, who could dispose of the life and liberty of a Roman emperor. The most tempting offers could not persuade the Kral to violate his trust. But he soon inclined to the stronger side, and his friend was dismissed without injury to a new vicissitude of hopes and perils. Near six years the flame of discord burnt with various success and unabated rage, the cities were distracted by the faction of the nobles and the plebeians. The Cantacuzini in Paleology, and the Bulgarians, the Servians, and the Turks, were invoked on both sides as the instruments of private ambition and the common ruin. The regent deplored the calamities, of which he was the author and victim, and his own experience might dictate a just and lively remark on the different nature of foreign and civil war. The former, said he, is the external warmth of summer, always tolerable, and often beneficial, the latter is the deadly heat of a fever, which consumes without a remedy the vitals of the constitution. 7694 
the introduction of barbarians and savages into the contests of civilized nations, is a measure pregnant with shame and mischief. Which the interest of the moment may compel, but which is reprobated by the best principles of humanity and reason. It is the practice of both sides to accuse their enemies of the guilt of the first alliances. And those who fail in their negotiations are loudest in their censure of the example which they envy and would gladly imitate. The Turks of Asia were less barbarous perhaps than the shepherds of Bulgaria and Serbia. But their religion rendered them implacable foes of Rome and Christianity. To acquire the friendship of their emirs. The two factions vied with each other in baseness and profusion, the dexterity of Cantacuzene obtained the preference, but the succor and victory were dearly purchased by the marriage of his daughter with an infidel. The captivity of many thousand Christians, and the passage of the Ottomans into Europe, the last and fatal stroke in the fall of the Roman Empire. The inclining scale was decided in his favor by the death of Apicacus, the just though singular retribution of his crimes. A crowd of nobles or plebeians, whom he feared or hated, had been seized by his orders in the capital and the provinces. And the old palace of Constantine was assigned as the place of their confinement. Some alterations in raising the walls, and narrowing the cells, had been ingeniously contrived to prevent their escape, and aggravate their misery. And the work was incessantly pressed by the daily visits of the tyrant. His guards watched at the gate, and as he stood in the inner court to overlook the architects, without fear or suspicion, he was assaulted and laid breathless on the ground, by two seventy-six ninety-five resolute prisoners of the Paleologian race. Seventy-six ninety-six who were armed with sticks, and animated by despair. On the rumor of revenge and liberty, the captive multitude broke their fetters, fortified their prison, and exposed from the battlements the tyrant's head, presuming on the favor of the people and the clemency of the empress. And of Savoy might rejoice in the fall of a haughty and ambitious minister, but while she delayed to resolve or to act, the populace, more especially the mariners, were excited by the widow of the great duke to a sedition, an assault, and a massacre. The prisoners, of whom the far greater part were guiltless or inglorious of the deed, escaped to a neighboring church, they were slaughtered at the foot of the altar, and in his death the monster was not less bloody and venomous than in his life. Yet his talents alone upheld the cause of the young emperor, and his surviving associates, suspicious of each other, abandoned the conduct of the war, and rejected the fairest terms of accommodation. In the beginning of the dispute, the empress felt, and complained, that she was deceived by the enemies of Cantacuzene, the patriarch was employed to preach against the forgiveness of injuries. And her promise of immortal hatred was sealed by an oath, under the penalty of excommunication. 7697 But and soon learned to hate without a teacher, she beheld the misfortunes of the empire with the indifference of a stranger, her jealousy was exasperated by the competition of a rival empress. And on the first symptoms of a more yielding temper, she threatened the patriarch to convene a synod, and degrade him from his office. Their incapacity in discord would have afforded the most decisive advantage. But the civil war was protracted by the weakness of both parties, and the moderation of Cantacuzene has not escaped the reproach of timidity and indolence. He successively recovered the provinces and cities. And the realm of his pupil was measured by the walls of Constantinople, but the metropolis alone counterbalanced the rest of the empire. Nor could he attempt that important conquest till he had secured in his favor the public voice and a private correspondence. An Italian, of the name of Facciolati, 7698 had succeeded to the office of Great Duke, the ships, the guards, and the Golden Gate, were subject to his command, but his humble ambition was bribed to become the instrument of treachery. And the revolution was accomplished without danger or bloodshed. Destitute of the powers of resistance, or the hope of relief, the inflexible and would have still defended the palace, and have smiled to behold the capital in flames, rather than in the possession of a rival. She yielded to the prayers of her friends and enemies, and the treaty was dictated by the conqueror, who professed a loyal and zealous attachment to the son of his benefactor. The marriage of his daughter with John Paleologus was at length consummated, the hereditary right of the pupil was acknowledged but the sole administration during ten years was vested in the guardian. 
Two emperors and three empresses were seated on the Byzantine throne, and a general amnesty quieted the apprehensions, and confirmed the property, of the most guilty subjects. The festival of the coronation and nuptials was celebrated with the appearances of concord and magnificence, and both were equally fallacious. During the late troubles, the treasures of the state, and even the furniture of the palace, had been alienated or embezzled, the royal banquet was served in pewter or earthenware. And such was the proud poverty of the times, that the absence of gold and jewels was supplied by the paltry artifices of glass and gilt leather. 7699. I hasten to conclude the personal history of John Cantacuzene. 7700 He triumphed and reigned. But his reign and triumph were clouded by the discontent of his own and the adverse faction. His followers might style the general amnesty an act of pardon for his enemies, and of oblivion for his friends, 7701 in his cause their estates had been forfeited or plundered. And as they wandered naked and hungry through the streets, they cursed the selfish generosity of a leader, who, on the throne of the empire, might relinquish without merit his private inheritance. The adherents of the empress blushed to hold their lives and fortunes by the precarious favor of a usurper, and the thirst of revenge was concealed by a tender concern for the succession, and even the safety, of her son. They were justly alarmed by a petition of the friends of Cantacuzene, that they might be released from their oath of allegiance to the Paleology, and entrusted with the defense of some cautionary towns. A measure supported with argument and eloquence, and which was rejected, says the imperial historian, by my sublime, and almost incredible virtue. His repose was disturbed by the sound of plots and seditions. And he trembled lest the lawful prince should be stolen away by some foreign or domestic enemy, who would inscribe his name and his wrongs in the banners of rebellion. As the son of Andronicus advanced in the years of manhood, he began to feel and to act for himself, and his rising ambition was rather stimulated than checked by the imitation of his father's vices. If we may trust his own professions, Cantacuzene labored with honest industry to correct these sordid and sensual appetites, and to raise the mind of the young prince to a level with his fortune. In the Servian expedition, the two emperors showed themselves in cordial harmony to the troops and provinces, and the younger colleague was initiated by the elder in the mysteries of war and government. After the conclusion of the peace, Paleologus was left at Thessalonica, a royal residence, and a frontier station, to secure by his absence the peace of Constantinople, and to withdraw his youth from the temptations of a luxurious capital. But the distance weakened the powers of control, and the son of Andronicus was surrounded with artful or unthinking companions, who taught him to hate his guardian, to deplore his exile, and to vindicate his rights. A private treaty with the Kral or despot of Servia was soon followed by an open revolt, and Cantacuzene, on the throne of the elder Andronicus, defended the cause of age and prerogative, which in his youth he had so vigorously attacked. At his request the Empress Mother undertook the voyage of Thessalonica, and the office of mediation, she returned without success, and unless and of Savoy was instructed by adversity, we may doubt the sincerity, or at least the fervor, of her zeal. While the regent grasped the scepter with a firm and vigorous hand, she had been instructed to declare, that the ten years of his legal administration would soon elapse. And that, after a full trial of the vanity of the world, the emperor Cantacuzene sighed for the repose of a cloister, and was ambitious only of a heavenly crown. Had these sentiments been genuine, his voluntary abdication would have restored the peace of the empire, and his conscience would have been relieved by an act of justice. Paleologus alone was responsible for his future government. And whatever might be his vices, they were surely less formidable than the calamities of a civil war, in which the barbarians and infidels were again invited to assist the Greeks in their mutual destruction. By the arms of the Turks, who now struck a deep and everlasting root in Europe, Cantacuzene prevailed in the third contest in which he had been involved. And the young emperor, driven from the sea and land, was compelled to take shelter among the Latins of the Isle of Tenedos. His insolence and obstinacy provoked the victor to a step which must render the quarrel irreconcilable. And the association of his son Matthew, whom he invested with the purple, established the succession in the family of the Cantacuzini. But Constantinople was still attached to the blood of her ancient princes. And this last injury accelerated the restoration of the rightful heir. 
A noble Genoese espoused the cause of Paleologus, obtained a promise of his sister, and achieved the revolution with two galleys and two thousand five hundred auxiliaries. Under the pretense of distress, they were admitted into the lesser port, a gate was opened, and the Latin shout of, Long life and victory to the emperor, John Paleologus, was answered by a general rising in his favor. A numerous and loyal party yet adhered to the standard of Cantacuzene, but he asserts in his history, does he hope for belief, that his tender conscience rejected the assurance of conquest. That, in free obedience to the voice of religion and philosophy, he descended from the throne and embraced with pleasure the monastic habit and profession. 7702 So soon as he ceased to be a prince, his successor was not unwilling that he should be a saint, the remainder of his life was devoted to piety and learning. In the cells of Constantinople and Mount Athos, the monk Joseph was respected as the temporal and spiritual father of the emperor. And if he issued from his retreat, it was as the minister of peace, to subdue the obstinacy, and solicit the pardon, of his rebellious son. 7703. Yet in the cloister, the mind of Cantacuzene was still exercised by theological war. He sharpened a controversial pen against the Jews and Mohammedans, 7704 and in every state he defended with equal zeal the divine light of Mount Thabor, a memorable question which consummates the religious follies of the Greeks. The fakirs of India, 7705 and the monks of the Oriental Church, were alike persuaded, that in the total abstraction of the faculties of the mind and body, the purer spirit may ascend to the enjoyment and vision of the deity. The opinion and practice of the monasteries of Mount Athos 7706 will be best represented in the words of an abbot, who flourished in the eleventh century. When thou art alone in thy cell, says the ascetic teacher, shut thy door, and seat thyself in a corner, raise thy mind above all things vain and transitory, recline thy beard and chin on thy breast. Turn thy eyes and thy thoughts toward the middle of thy belly, the region of the navel, and search the place of the heart, the seat of the soul. At first, all will be dark and comfortless. But if you persevere day and night, you will feel an ineffable joy, and no sooner has the soul discovered the place of the heart, than it is involved in a mystic and ethereal light. This light, the production of a distempered fancy, the creature of an empty stomach and an empty brain, was adored by the quietists as the pure and perfect essence of God Himself. And as long as the folly was confined to Mount Athos, the simple solitaries were not inquisitive how the divine essence could be a material substance, or how an immaterial substance could be perceived by the eyes of the body. But in the reign of the younger Andronicus, these monasteries were visited by Barlam, 7707 a Calabrian monk, who was equally skilled in philosophy and theology, who possessed the language of the Greeks and Latins and whose versatile genius could maintain their opposite creeds, according to the interest of the moment. The indiscretion of an ascetic revealed to the curious traveller the secrets of mental prayer and Barlam embraced the opportunity of ridiculing the quietists, who placed the soul in the navel. Of accusing the monks of Mount Athos of heresy and blasphemy. His attack compelled the more learned to renounce or dissemble the simple devotion of their brethren and Gregory Palamas introduced a scholastic distinction between the essence and operation of God. His inaccessible essence dwells in the midst of an uncreated and eternal light. And this beatific vision of the saints had been manifested to the disciples on Mount Thabor, in the transfiguration of Christ. Yet this distinction could not escape the reproach of polytheism, the eternity of the light of Thabor was fiercely denied. And Barlam still charged the Palamites with holding two eternal substances, a visible and an invisible God. From the rage of the monks of Mount Athos, who threatened his life, the Calabrian retired to Constantinople, where his smooth and specious manners introduced him to the favor of the great domestic and the emperor. The court and the city were involved in this theological dispute, which flamed amidst the civil war, but the doctrine of Barlam was disgraced by his flight and apostasy, the Palamites triumphed. And their adversary, the Patriarch John of Apri, was deposed by the consent of the adverse factions of the state. In the character of emperor and theologian, Cantacuzene presided in the synod of the Greek Church, which established, as an article of faith, the uncreated light of Mount Thabor. And, after so many insults, the reason of mankind was slightly wounded by the addition of a single absurdity. 
many rolls of paper or parchment have been blotted. And the impenitent sectaries, who refused to subscribe the Orthodox creed, were deprived of the honors of Christian burial, but in the next age the question was forgotten. Nor can I learn that the axe or the faggot were employed for the extirpation of the Barlamite heresy. 7708. For the conclusion of this chapter, I have reserved the Genoese War, which shook the throne of Cantacuzene, and betrayed the debility of the Greek Empire. The Genoese, who, after the recovery of Constantinople, were seated in the suburb of Pera or Galata, received that honorable fief from the bounty of the emperor. They were indulged in the use of their laws and magistrates. But they submitted to the duties of vassals and subjects, the forcible word of liegeman 7709 was borrowed from the Latin jurisprudence. And their podesta, or chief, before he entered on his office, saluted the emperor with loyal acclamations and vows of fidelity. Genoa sealed a firm alliance with the Greeks. And, in case of a defensive war, a supply of fifty empty galleys and a succor of fifty galleys, completely armed and manned, was promised by the Republic to the Empire. In the revival of a naval force, it was the aim of Michael Paleologus to deliver himself from a foreign aid. And his vigorous government contained the Genoese of Galata within those limits which the insolence of wealth and freedom provoked them to exceed. A sailor threatened that they should soon be masters of Constantinople, and slew the Greek who resented this national affront, and an armed vessel, after refusing to salute the palace, was guilty of some acts of piracy in the Black Sea. Their countrymen threatened to support their cause, but the long and open village of Galata was instantly surrounded by the imperial troops, till, in the moment of the assault, the prostrate Genoese implored the clemency of their sovereign. The defenseless situation which secured their obedience exposed them to the attack of their Venetian rivals, who, in the reign of the elder Andronicus, presumed to violate the majesty of the throne. On the approach of their fleets, the Genoese, with their families and effects, retired into the city, their empty habitations were reduced to ashes. And the feeble prince, who had viewed the destruction of his suburb, expressed his resentment, not by arms, but by ambassadors. This misfortune, however, was advantageous to the Genoese, who obtained, and imperceptibly abused, the dangerous license of surrounding Galata with a strong wall, of introducing into the ditch the waters of the sea, of erecting lofty turrets, and of mounting a train of military engines on the rampart. The narrow bounds in which they had been circumscribed were insufficient for the growing colony, each day they acquired some addition of landed property. And the adjacent hills were covered with their villas and castles, which they joined and protected by new fortifications. 7710 The navigation and trade of the Euxine was the patrimony of the Greek emperors, who commanded the narrow entrance, the gates, as it were, of that inland sea. In the reign of Michael Paleologus, their prerogative was acknowledged by the Sultan of Egypt, who solicited and obtained the liberty of sending an annual ship for the purchase of slaves in Circassia and the Lesser Tartary, a liberty pregnant with mischief to the Christian cause. Since these youths were transformed by education and discipline into the formidable Mamelukes.7711 from the colony of Pera, the Genoese engaged with superior advantage in the lucrative trade of the Black Sea. And their industry supplied the Greeks with fish and corn, two articles of food almost equally important to a superstitious people. The spontaneous bounty of nature appears to have bestowed the harvests of Ukraine, the produce of a rude and savage husbandry. And the endless exportation of salt fish and caviar is annually renewed by the enormous sturgeons that are caught at the mouth of the Don or Tanais, in their last station of the rich mud and shallow water of the Meotis. 77.12 The waters of the Oxus, the Caspian, the Volga, and the Don, opened a rare and laborious passage for the gems and spices of India, and after three months march the caravans of Chorism met the Italian vessels in the harbours of Crimea. 7713 These various branches of trade were monopolized by the diligence and power of the Genoese. Their rivals of Venice and Pisa were forcibly expelled. The natives were awed by the castles and cities, which arose on the foundations of their humble factories, and their principal establishment of Kaffa 7714 was besieged without effect by the Tartar powers. Destitute of a navy, 
the Greeks were oppressed by these haughty merchants, who fed, or famished, Constantinople, according to their interest. They proceeded to usurp the customs, the fishery, and even the toll, of the Bosphorus. And while they derived from these objects a revenue of 200,000 pieces of gold, a remnant of 30,000 was reluctantly allowed to the Emperor. 7715 The colony of Para or Galata acted, in peace and war, as an independent state. And, as it will happen in distant settlements, the Genoese Podesta too often forgot that he was the servant of his own masters. These usurpations were encouraged by the weakness of the elder Andronicus, and by the civil wars that afflicted his age and the minority of his grandson. The talents of Cantacuzene were employed to the ruin, rather than the restoration, of the empire, and after his domestic victory, he was condemned to an ignominious trial, whether the Greeks or the Genoese should reign in Constantinople. The merchants of Pera were offended by his refusal of some contiguous land, some commanding heights, which they proposed to cover with new fortifications. And in the absence of the emperor, who was detained at Demotica by sickness, they ventured to brave the debility of a female reign. A Byzantine vessel, which had presumed to fish at the mouth of the harbor, was sunk by these audacious strangers. The fishermen were murdered. Instead of suing for pardon, the Genoese demanded satisfaction, required, in a haughty strain, that the Greeks should renounce the exercise of navigation. And encountered with regular arms the first sallies of the popular indignation. They instantly occupied the debatable land. And by the labor of a whole people, of either sex and of every age, the wall was raised, and the ditch was sunk, with incredible speed. At the same time, they attacked and burnt two Byzantine galleys. While the three others, the remainder of the imperial navy, escaped from their hands, the habitations without the gates, or along the shore, were pillaged and destroyed. And the care of the regent, of the Empress Irene, was confined to the preservation of the city. The return of Cantacuzene dispelled the public consternation, the emperor inclined to peaceful counsels. But he yielded to the obstinacy of his enemies, who rejected all reasonable terms, and to the ardor of his subjects, who threatened, in the style of scripture, to break them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Yet they reluctantly paid the taxes, that he imposed for the construction of ships, and the expenses of the war. And as the two nations were masters, the one of the land, the other of the sea, Constantinople and Pera were pressed by the evils of a mutual siege. The merchants of the colony, who had believed that a few days would terminate the war, already murmured at their losses, the succors from their mother country were delayed by the factions of Genoa. And the most cautious embraced the opportunity of a Rhodian vessel to remove their families and effects from the scene of hostility. In the spring, the Byzantine fleet, seven galleys and a train of smaller vessels, issued from the mouth of the harbour, and steered in a single line along the shore of Pera, unskillfully presenting their sides to the beaks of the adverse squadron. The crews were composed of peasants and mechanics, nor was their ignorance compensated by the native courage of barbarians, the wind was strong, the waves were rough. And no sooner did the Greeks perceive a distant and inactive enemy, than they leaped headlong into the sea, from a doubtful, to an inevitable peril. The troops that marched to the attack of the lines of Pera were struck at the same moment with a similar panic, and the Genoese were astonished, and almost ashamed, at their double victory. Their triumphant vessels, crowned with flowers, and dragging after them the captive galleys, repeatedly passed and repassed before the palace, the only virtue of the emperor was patience, and the hope of revenge his sole consolation. Yet the distress of both parties interposed a temporary agreement, and the shame of the empire was disguised by a thin veil of dignity and power. Summoning the chiefs of the colony, Cantacuzene affected to despise the trivial object of the debate. And, after a mild reproof, most liberally granted the lands, which had been previously resigned to the seeming custody of his officers. 7716. But the emperor was soon solicited to violate the treaty, and to join his arms with the Venetians, the perpetual enemies of Genoa and her colonies. While he compared the reasons of peace and war, his moderation was provoked by a wanton insult of the inhabitants of Pera, who discharged from their rampart a large stone that fell in the midst of Constantinople. On his just complaint, 
They coldly blamed the imprudence of their engineer, but the next day the insult was repeated, and they exulted in a second proof that the royal city was not beyond the reach of their artillery. Cantacuzene instantly signed his treaty with the Venetians, but the weight of the Roman Empire was scarcely felt in the balance of these opulent and powerful republics. 7717 From the Straits of Gibraltar to the mouth of the Tanais, their fleets encountered each other with various success, and a memorable battle was fought in the narrow sea, under the walls of Constantinople. It would not be an easy task to reconcile the accounts of the Greeks, the Venetians, and the Genoese. 7718 And while I depend on the narrative of an impartial historian, 7719 I shall borrow from each nation the facts that redound to their own disgrace, and the honor of their foes. The Venetians, with their allies the Catalans, had the advantage of number, and their fleet, with the poor addition of eight Byzantine galleys, amounted to seventy-five sail, the Genoese did not exceed sixty-four. But in those times their ships of war were distinguished by the superiority of their size and strength. The names and families of their naval commanders, Pisani and Doria, are illustrious in the annals of their country. But the personal merit of the former was eclipsed by the fame and abilities of his rival. They engaged in tempestuous weather, and the tumultuary conflict was continued from the dawn to the extinction of light. The enemies of the Genoese applaud their prowess, the friends of the Venetians are dissatisfied with their behavior. But all parties agree in praising the skill and boldness of the Catalans 7720 who, with many wounds, sustained the brunt of the action. On the separation of the fleets, the event might appear doubtful. But the thirteen Genoese galleys, that had been sunk or taken, were compensated by a double loss of the allies, of fourteen Venetians, ten Catalans, and two Greeks. 7721 And even the grief of the conquerors expressed the assurance and habit of more decisive victories. Pisani confessed his defeat, by retiring into a fortified harbour, from whence, under the pretext of the orders of the Senate, he steered with a broken and flying squadron for the Isle of Candia. And abandoned to his rivals the sovereignty of the sea. In a public epistle, 7722 addressed to the Doge and Senate, Petrarch employs his eloquence to reconcile the maritime powers, the two luminaries of Italy. The orator celebrates the valor and victory of the Genoese, the first of men in the exercise of naval war, he drops a tear on the misfortunes of their Venetian brethren. But he exhorts them to pursue with fire and sword the base and perfidious Greeks, to purge the metropolis of the East from the heresy with which it was infected. Deserted by their friends, the Greeks were incapable of resistance. And three months after the battle, the Emperor Cantacuzene solicited and subscribed a treaty, which forever banished the Venetians and Catalans, and granted to the Genoese a monopoly of trade, and almost a right of dominion. The Roman Empire, I smile in transcribing the name, might soon have sunk into a province of Genoa, if the ambition of the Republic had not been checked by the ruin of her freedom and naval power. A long contest of 130 years was determined by the triumph of Venice, and the factions of the Genoese compelled them to seek for domestic peace under the protection of a foreign lord, the Duke of Milan, or the French king. Yet the spirit of commerce survived that of conquest, and the colony of Pera still awed the capital and navigated the Euxine, till it was involved by the Turks in the final servitude of Constantinople itself. LXIV, Mughals, Ottoman Turks Conquests of Zingis Khan and the Mughals from China to Poland. Dot, escape of Constantinople and the Greeks. Dot, origin of the Ottoman Turks in Bithynia. Reigns and victories of Othman, Orkin, Amurath I, and Bajazet I. Dot, foundation and progress of the Turkish monarchy in Asia and Europe. Dot, danger of Constantinople and the Greek Empire. From the petty quarrels of a city in her suburbs, from the cowardice and discord of the falling Greeks, I shall now ascend to the victorious Turks. Whose domestic slavery was ennobled by martial discipline, religious enthusiasm, and the energy of the national character. The rise and progress of the Ottomans, the present sovereigns of Constantinople, are connected with the most important scenes of modern history, but they are founded on a previous knowledge of the great eruption of the Mughals 7723 and Tartars whose rapid conquests may be compared with the primitive convulsions of nature, which have agitated and altered the surface of the globe. 
I have long since asserted my claim to introduce the nations, the immediate or remote authors of the fall of the Roman Empire. Nor can I refuse myself to those events, which, from their uncommon magnitude, will interest a philosophic mind in the history of blood. 7724. From the spacious highlands between China, Siberia, and the Caspian Sea, the tide of emigration and war has repeatedly been poured. These ancient seats of the Huns and Turks were occupied in the 12th century by many pastoral tribes, of the same descent and similar manners, which were united and led to conquest by the formidable Zingis. 7725 In his ascent to greatness, that barbarian, whose private appellation was Temujin, had trampled on the necks of his equals. His birth was noble. But it was the pride of victory, that the prince or people deduced his seventh ancestor from the immaculate conception of a virgin. His father had reigned over thirteen hordes, which composed about thirty or forty thousand families, above two-thirds refused to pay tithes or obedience to his infant son. And at the age of thirteen, Temujin fought a battle against his rebellious subjects. The future conqueror of Asia was reduced to fly and to obey. But he rose superior to his fortune, and in his fortieth year he had established his fame and dominion over the circumjacent tribes. In a state of society, in which policy is rude and valor is universal, the ascendant of one man must be founded on his power and resolution to punish his enemies and recompense his friends. His first military league was ratified by the simple rites of sacrificing a horse and tasting of a running stream, Temujin pledged himself to divide with his followers the sweets and the bitters of life. And when he had shared among them his horses and apparel, he was rich in their gratitude and his own hopes. After his first victory, he placed seventy cauldrons on the fire, and seventy of the most guilty rebels were cast headlong into the boiling water. The sphere of his attraction was continually enlarged by the ruin of the proud and the submission of the prudent, and the boldest chieftains might tremble, when they beheld, and chased in silver, the skull of the Khan of Karates. 7726 who, under the name of Prester John, had corresponded with the Roman Pontiff and the Princes of Europe. The ambition of Temujin condescended to employ the arts of superstition. And it was from a naked prophet, who could ascend to heaven on a white horse, that he accepted the title of Zingis 7727 the most great, and a divine right to the conquest and dominion of the earth. In a general kurultai, or diet, he was seated on a felt, which was long afterwards revered as a relic, and solemnly proclaimed Great Khan, or Emperor of the Mughals 7728 and Tartars. 7729 of these kindred, though rival, names, the former had given birth to the imperial race, and the latter has been extended by accident or error over the spacious wilderness of the north. The code of laws which Zingis dictated to his subjects was adapted to the preservation of a domestic peace, and the exercise of foreign hostility. The punishment of death was inflicted on the crimes of adultery, murder, perjury, and the capital thefts of a horse or ox, and the fiercest of men were mild and just in their intercourse with each other. The future election of the great Khan was vested in the princes of his family and the heads of the tribes, and the regulations of the chase were essential to the pleasures and plenty of a Tartar camp. The victorious nation was held sacred from all servile labors, which were abandoned to slaves and strangers, and every labor was servile except the profession of arms. The service and discipline of the troops, who were armed with bows, scimitars, and iron maces, and divided by hundreds, thousands, and ten thousands, were the institutions of a veteran commander. Each officer and soldier was made responsible, under pain of death, for the safety and honor of his companions, and the spirit of conquest breathed in the law, that peace should never be granted unless to a vanquished and suppliant enemy. But it is the religion of Zingis that best deserves our wonder and applause. 7730 The Catholic inquisitors of Europe, who defended nonsense by cruelty, might have been confounded by the example of a barbarian, who anticipated the lessons of philosophy. 7731 And established by his laws a system of pure theism and perfect toleration. His first and only article of faith was the existence of one God, the author of all good, who fills by his presence the heavens and earth, which he has created by his power. The Tartars and Mughals were addicted to the idols of their peculiar tribes. 
and many of them had been converted by the foreign missionaries to the religions of Moses, of Muhammad, and of Christ. These various systems in freedom and concord were taught and practiced within the precincts of the same camp. And the Bonze, the Imam, the Rabbi, the Nestorian, and the Latin priest, enjoyed the same honorable exemption from service and tribute, in the mosque of Bakra, the insolent victor might trample the Quran under his horse's feet. But the calm legislator respected the prophets and pontiffs of the most hostile sects. The reason of Zingis was not informed by books, the Khan could neither read nor write, and, except the tribe of the Igurs, the greatest part of the Mughals and Tartars were as illiterate as their sovereign. 7732 The memory of their exploits was preserved by tradition, 68 years after the death of Zingis, these traditions were collected and transcribed. 7733 The brevity of their domestic annals may be supplied by the Chinese, 7734 Persians, 7735 Armenians, 7736 Syrians, 7737 Arabians, 7738 Greeks, 7739 Russians, 7740 Poles, 7741 Hungarians, 7742 and Latins. 7743 And each nation will deserve credit in the relation of their own disasters and defeats. 7744. The arms of Zingis and his lieutenants successively reduced the hordes of the desert, who pitched their tents between the wall of China and the Volga. And the Mughal emperor became the monarch of the pastoral world, the lord of many millions of shepherds and soldiers, who felt their united strength, and were impatient to rush on the mild and wealthy climates of the south. His ancestors had been the tributaries of the Chinese emperors, and Temujin himself had been disgraced by a title of honor and servitude. The court of Pekin was astonished by an embassy from its former vassal, who, in the tone of the king of nations, exacted the tribute and obedience which he had paid, and who affected to treat the Son of Heaven as the most contemptible of mankind. A haughty answer disguised their secret apprehensions, and their fears were soon justified by the march of innumerable squadrons, who pierced on all sides the feeble rampart of the Great Wall. Ninety cities were stormed, or starved, by the Mughals. Ten only escaped, and Zingis, from a knowledge of the filial piety of the Chinese, covered his vanguard with their captive parents, an unworthy, and by degrees a fruitless, abuse of the virtue of his enemies. His invasion was supported by the revolt of a hundred thousand chitons, who guarded the frontier, yet he listened to a treaty. And a princess of China, three thousand horses, five hundred youths, and as many virgins, and a tribute of gold and silk, were the price of his retreat. In his second expedition, he compelled the Chinese emperor to retire beyond the Yellow River to a more southern residence. The siege of Pekin 7745 was long and laborious, the inhabitants were reduced by famine to decimate and devour their fellow citizens when their ammunition was spent, they discharged ingots of gold and silver from their engines. But the Mughals introduced a mine to the center of the capital, and the conflagration of the palace burnt above thirty days. China was desolated by Tartar war and domestic faction, and the five northern provinces were added to the empire of Zingis. In the west, he touched the dominions of Muhammad, Sultan of Khorizm, who reigned from the Persian Gulf to the borders of India and Turkestan and who, in the proud imitation of Alexander the Great, forgot the servitude and ingratitude of his fathers to the house of Seljuk. It was the wish of Zingis to establish a friendly and commercial intercourse with the most powerful of the Moslem princes, nor could he be tempted by the secret solicitations of the Caliph of Baghdad, who sacrificed to his personal wrongs the safety of the church and state. A rash and inhuman deed provoked and justified the Tartar arms in the invasion of the southern Asia. 7746 A caravan of three ambassadors and 150 merchants were arrested and murdered at Otrar, by the command of Muhammad. Nor was it till after a demand and denial of justice, till he had prayed and fasted three nights on a mountain, that the Mughal emperor appealed to the judgment of God and his sword. Our European battles, says a philosophic writer, 7747 are petty skirmishes, if compared to the numbers that have fought and fallen in the fields of Asia. 700,000 Mughals and Tartars are said to have marched under the standard of Zingis and his four sons. In the vast plains that extend to the north of the Sion or Jaxarts, they were encountered by 400,000 soldiers of the Sultan. 
And in the first battle, which was suspended by the night, 160,000 Charismians were slain. Muhammad was astonished by the multitude and valor of his enemies, he withdrew from the scene of danger, and distributed his troops in the frontier towns. Trusting that the barbarians, invincible in the field, would be repulsed by the length and difficulty of so many regular sieges. But the prudence of Zingis had formed a body of Chinese engineers, skilled in the mechanic arts. Informed perhaps of the secret of gunpowder, and capable, under his discipline, of attacking a foreign country with more vigor and success than they had defended their own. The Persian historians will relate the sieges and reduction of Otrur, Kojand, Bakra, Samarkand, Khorizm, Herat, Maru, Nisabur, Balch, and Kandahar, and the conquest of the rich and populous countries of Transoxiana, Khorizm, and Khorasan. 7748 The destructive hostilities of Attila and the Huns have long since been elucidated by the example of Zingis and the Mughals. And in this more proper place I shall be content to observe, that, from the Caspian to the Indus, they ruined a tract of many hundred miles, which was adorned with the habitations and labors of mankind. And that five centuries have not been sufficient to repair the ravages of four years. The Mughal emperor encouraged or indulged the fury of his troops the hope of future possession was lost in the ardor of rapine and slaughter, and the cause of the war exasperated their native fierceness by the pretense of justice and revenge. The downfall and death of the Sultan Muhammad, who expired, unpitied and alone, in a desert island of the Caspian Sea, is a poor atonement for the calamities of which he was the author. Could the Charismian Empire have been saved by a single hero, it would have been saved by his son Jalaleddin, whose active valor repeatedly checked the Mughals in the career of victory. Retreating, as he fought, to the banks of the Indus, he was oppressed by their innumerable host, till, in the last moment of despair, Jalaleddin spurred his horse into the waves, swam one of the broadest and most rapid rivers of Asia, and extorted the admiration and applause of Zingis himself. It was in this camp that the Mughal conqueror yielded with reluctance to the murmurs of his weary and wealthy troops, who sighed for the enjoyment of their native land. You cumbered with the spoils of Asia, he slowly measured back his footsteps, betrayed some pity for the misery of the vanquished, and declared his intention of rebuilding the cities which had been swept away by the tempest of his arms. After he had repassed the Oxus and Jaxarts, he was joined by two generals, whom he had detached with thirty thousand horse, to subdue the western provinces of Persia. They had trampled on the nations which opposed their passage, penetrated through the gates of Derbent, traversed the Volga and the desert, and accomplished the circuit of the Caspian Sea, by an expedition which had never been attempted, and has never been repeated. The return of Zingis was signalized by the overthrow of the rebellious or independent kingdoms of Tartary. And he died in the fullness of years and glory, with his last breath exhorting and instructing his sons to achieve the conquest of the Chinese Empire. 7749. The harem of Zingis was composed of five hundred wives and concubines. And of his numerous progeny, for sons, illustrious by their birth and merit, exercised under their father the principal offices of peace and war. Tushar was his great huntsman, Zagatai 7750 his judge, Octai his minister, and Tuli his general. And their names and actions are often conspicuous in the history of his conquests. Firmly united for their own and the public interest, the three brothers and their families were content with dependent scepters. And Octai, by general consent, was proclaimed Great Khan, or Emperor of the Mughals and Tartars. He was succeeded by his son Gayuk, after whose death the empire devolved to his cousins Mangu and Kublai, the sons of Tuli, and the grandsons of Zingis. In the sixty-eight years of his four first successors, the Mughals subdued almost all Asia, and a large portion of Europe. Without confining myself to the order of time, without expatiating on the detail of events, I shall present a general picture of the progress of their arms, I. In the east, two. In the south, three. In the west, and four. In the north, I. Before the invasion of Zingis, China was divided into two empires or dynasties of the north and south, 7751 and the difference of origin and interest was smoothed by a general conformity of laws, language, and national manners. 
The Northern Empire, which had been dismembered by Zingis, was finally subdued seven years after his death. After the loss of Pekin, the emperor had fixed his residence at Kaifang, a city many leagues in circumference, and which contained, according to the Chinese annals, 1400,000 families of inhabitants and fugitives. He escaped from thence with only seven horsemen, and made his last stand in a third capital, till at length the hopeless monarch, protesting his innocence and accusing his fortune, ascended a funeral pile, and gave orders, that as soon as he had stabbed himself, the fire should be kindled by his attendants. The dynasty of the Song, the native and ancient sovereigns of the whole empire, survived about forty-five years the fall of the northern usurpers, and the perfect conquest was reserved for the arms of Kublai. During this interval, the Mughals were often diverted by foreign wars, and, if the Chinese seldom dared to meet their victors in the field, their passive courage presented an endless succession of cities to storm and of millions to slaughter. In the attack and defense of places, the engines of antiquity and the Greek fire were alternately employed, the use of gunpowder in cannon and bombs appears as a familiar practice. 7752 and the sieges were conducted by the Mohammedans and Franks, who had been liberally invited into the service of Kublai. After passing the Great River, the troops and artillery were conveyed along a series of canals, till they invested the royal residence of Hamchu, or Quinsei, in the country of Silk, the most delicious climate of China. The emperor, a defenseless youth, surrendered his person and scepter, and before he was sent in exile into Tartary, he struck nine times the ground with his forehead, to adore in prayer or thanksgiving the mercy of the great Khan. Yet the war, it was now styled a rebellion, was still maintained in the southern provinces from Hamcho to Canton, and the obstinate remnant of independence and hostility was transported from the land to the sea. But when the fleet of the Song was surrounded and oppressed by a superior armament, their last champion leaped into the waves with his infant emperor in his arms. It is more glorious, he cried, to die a prince, than to live a slave. A hundred thousand Chinese imitated his example, and the whole empire, from Tonkin to the Great Wall, submitted to the dominion of Kublai. His boundless ambition aspired to the conquest of Japan, his fleet was twice shipwrecked. And the lives of a hundred thousand Mughals and Chinese were sacrificed in the fruitless expedition. But the circumjacent kingdoms, Korea, Tonkin, Cochinchina, Pegu, Bengal, and Thibet, were reduced in different degrees of tribute and obedience by the effort or terror of his arms. He explored the Indian Ocean with a fleet of a thousand ships, they sailed in sixty-eight days, most probably to the Isle of Borneo, under the equinoctial line. And though they returned not without spoil or glory, the emperor was dissatisfied that the savage king had escaped from their hands. 2. The conquest of Hindustan by the Mughals was reserved in a later period for the House of Timur. But that of Iran, or Persia, was achieved by Halagu Khan 7753 the grandson of Zingis, the brother and lieutenant of the two successive emperors, Mangu and Kublai. I shall not enumerate the crowd of sultans, emirs, and adabeks, whom he trampled into dust, but the extirpation of the assassins, or Ismaili in 7754 of Persia, may be considered as a service to mankind. Among the hills to the south of the Caspian, these odious sectaries had reigned with impunity above a hundred and sixty years. And their prince, or imam, established his lieutenant to lead and govern the colony of Mount Libanus, so famous and formidable in the history of the Crusades. 7755 With the fanaticism of the Quran the Ismailians had blended the Indian transmigration, and the visions of their own prophets, and it was their first duty to devote their souls and bodies in blind obedience to the Vicar of God. The daggers of his missionaries were felt both in the East and West, the Christians and the Moslems enumerate, and persons multiply, the illustrious victims that were sacrificed to the zeal, avarice, or resentment of the old man, as he was corruptly styled, of the mountain. But these daggers, his only arms, were broken by the sword of Halagu, and not a vestige is left of the enemies of mankind, except the word assassin, which, in the most odious sense, has been adopted in the languages of Europe. The extinction of the Abbasides cannot be indifferent to the spectators of their greatness and decline. Since the fall of their Seljukian tyrants the caliphs had recovered their lawful dominion of Baghdad and the Arabian Iraq. 
but the city was distracted by theological factions, and the commander of the faithful was lost in a harem of seven hundred concubines. The invasion of the Mughals he encountered with feeble arms and haughty embassies. On the divine decree, said the Caliph Mostasim, is founded the throne of the sons of Abbas, and their foes shall surely be destroyed in this world and in the next. Who is this Halagu that dares to rise against them? If he be desirous of peace, let him instantly depart from the sacred territory, and perhaps he may obtain from our clemency the pardon of his fault. This presumption was cherished by a perfidious vizier, who assured his master, that, even if the barbarians had entered the city, the women and children, from the terraces, would be sufficient to overwhelm them with stones. But when Halagud touched the phantom, it instantly vanished into smoke. After a siege of two months, Baghdad was stormed and sacked by the Mughals. 7756 and their savage commander pronounced the death of the Caliph Mostasim, the last of the temporal successors of Muhammad, whose noble kinsmen, of the race of Abbas, had reigned in Asia above five hundred years. Whatever might be the designs of the conqueror, the holy cities of Mecca and Medina 7757 were protected by the Arabian desert. But the Mughals spread beyond the Tigris and Euphrates, pillaged Aleppo and Damascus, and threatened to join the Franks in the deliverance of Jerusalem. Egypt was lost, had she been defended only by her feeble offspring. But the Mamelukes had breathed in their infancy the keenness of a Scythian heir, equal in valor, superior in discipline, they met the Mughals in many a well-fought field, and drove back the stream of hostility to the eastward of the Euphrates. 7758 But it overflowed with resistless violence the kingdoms of Armenia 7759 and Anatolia, of which the former was possessed by the Christians, and the latter by the Turks. The sultans of Iconium opposed some resistance to the Mughal arms, till Azadan sought a refuge among the Greeks of Constantinople, and his feeble successors, the last of the Seljukian dynasty, were finally extirpated by the Khans of Persia. 7760 3. No sooner had Octai subverted the northern empire of China, than he resolved to visit with his arms the most remote countries of the west. Fifteen hundred thousand Mughals and Tartars were inscribed on the military roll, of these the great Khan selected a third, which he entrusted to the command of his nephew Batu, the son of Tuli. Who reigned over his father's conquests to the north of the Caspian Sea. 7761 After a festival of forty days, Batu set forwards on this great expedition. And such was the speed and ardor of his innumerable squadrons, that in less than six years they had measured a line of ninety degrees of longitude, a fourth part of the circumference of the globe. The great rivers of Asia and Europe, the Volga and Kama, the Don and Burasthenes, the Vistula and Danube, they either swam with their horses or passed on the ice, or traversed in leathern boats, which followed the camp, and transported their wagons and artillery. By the first victories of Batu, the remains of national freedom were eradicated in the immense plains of Turkestan and Kipzak. 7762 In his rapid progress, he overran the kingdoms, as they are now styled, of Astrakhan and Kazan. And the troops which he detached towards Mount Caucasus explored the most secret recesses of Georgia and Circassia. The civil discord of the great dukes, or princes, of Russia, betrayed their country to the Tartars. They spread from Livonia to the Black Sea, and both Moscow and Cairo, the modern and the ancient capitals, were reduced to ashes. A temporary ruin, less fatal than the deep, and perhaps indelible, mark, which a servitude of two hundred years has imprinted on the character of the Russians. The Tartars ravaged with equal fury the countries which they hoped to possess, and those which they were hastening to leave. From the permanent conquest of Russia they made a deadly, though transient, inroad into the heart of Poland, and as far as the borders of Germany. The cities of Lublin and Krakow were obliterated, 7763 they approached the shores of the Baltic. And in the Battle of Lignitz they defeated the Dukes of Silesia, the Polish Palatines, and the great master of the Teutonic Order, and filled nine sacks with the right ears of the slain. From Lignitz, the extreme point of their western march, they turned aside to the invasion of Hungary. And the presence or spirit of Batu inspired the host of five hundred thousand men, the Carpathian hills could not be long impervious to their divided columns, 
and their approach had been fondly disbelieved till it was irresistibly felt. The king, Bella IV, assembled the military force of his counts and bishops. But he had alienated the nation by adopting a vagrant horde of forty thousand families of Comans, and these savage guests were provoked to revolt by the suspicion of treachery and the murder of their prince. The whole country north of the Danube was lost in a day, and depopulated in a summer, and the ruins of cities and churches were overspread with the bones of the natives, who expiated the sins of their Turkish ancestors. An ecclesiastic, who fled from the sack of Waradin, describes the calamities which he had seen, or suffered. And the sanguinary rage of sieges and battles is far less atrocious than the treatment of the fugitives who had been allured from the woods under a promise of peace and pardon and who were coolly slaughtered as soon as they had performed the labours of the harvest and vintage. In the winter the Tartars passed the Danube on the ice, and advanced to Gran or Strigonium, a German colony, and the metropolis of the kingdom. Thirty engines were planted against the walls. The ditches were filled with sacks of earth and dead bodies, and after a promiscuous massacre, three hundred noble matrons were slain in the presence of the Khan. Of all the cities and fortresses of Hungary, three alone survived the Tartar invasion, and the unfortunate Bata hid his head among the islands of the Adriatic. The Latin world was darkened by this cloud of savage hostility, a Russian fugitive carried the alarm to Sweden. And the remote nations of the Baltic and the ocean trembled at the approach of the Tartars 7764 whom their fear and ignorance were inclined to separate from the human species. Since the invasion of the Arabs in the 8th century, Europe had never been exposed to a similar calamity, and if the disciples of Muhammad would have oppressed her religion and liberty, it might be apprehended that the shepherds of Scythia would extinguish her cities, her arts, and all the institutions of civil society. The Roman pontiff attempted to appease and convert these invincible pagans by a mission of Franciscan and Dominican friars. But he was astonished by the reply of the Khan, that the sons of God and of Zingis were invested with a divine power to subdue or extirpate the nations. And that the Pope would be involved in the universal destruction, unless he visited in person, and as a suppliant, the royal horde. The Emperor Frederick II embraced a more generous mode of defense. And his letters to the kings of France and England, and the princes of Germany, represented the common danger, and urged them to arm their vassals in this just and rational crusade. 7765 The Tartars themselves were awed by the fame and valor of the Franks, the town of Neustadt in Austria was bravely defended against them by fifty knights and twenty crossbows, and they raised the siege on the appearance of a German army. After wasting the adjacent kingdoms of Serbia, Bosnia, and Bulgaria, Badis slowly retreated from the Danube to the Volga to enjoy the rewards of victory in the city and palace of Sarai, which started at his command from the midst of the desert. 7766. For, even the poor and frozen regions of the north attracted the arms of the Mughals, Shaibani Khan, the brother of the great Batu, led a horde of fifteen thousand families into the wilds of Siberia. And his descendants reigned at Tobolskoy above three centuries, till the Russian conquest. The spirit of enterprise which pursued the course of the Obi and Yenisei must have led to the discovery of the ICC. After brushing away the monstrous fables, of men with dogs' heads and cloven feet, we shall find, that, fifteen years after the death of Zingis, the Mughals were informed of the name and manners of the Samoyeds in the neighborhood of the Polar Circle, who dwelt in subterraneous huts, and derived their furs and their food from the sole occupation of hunting. 7767. While China, Syria, and Poland, were invaded at the same time by the Mughals and Tartars, the authors of the mighty mischief were content with the knowledge and declaration, that their word was the sword of death. Like the first caliphs, the first successors of Zingis seldom appeared in person at the head of their victorious armies. On the banks of the Onan and Salinga, the royal or golden horde exhibited the contrast of simplicity and greatness. Of the roasted sheep and mare's milk which composed their banquets, and of a distribution in one day of five hundred wagons of gold and silver. The ambassadors and princes of Europe and Asia were compelled to undertake this distant and laborious pilgrimage. And the life and reign of the great dukes of Russia, the kings of Georgia and Armenia, the sultans of Iconium, and the emirs of Persia, 
were decided by the frown or smile of the great Khan. The sons and grandsons of Zingis had been accustomed to the pastoral life, but the village of Karakoram 7768 was gradually ennobled by their election and residence. A change of manners is implied in the removal of Oktai and Mangu from a tent to a house, and their example was imitated by the princes of their family and the great officers of the empire. Instead of the boundless forest, the enclosure of a park afforded the more indolent pleasures of the chase, their new habitations were decorated with painting and sculpture. Their superfluous treasures were cast in fountains, and basins, and statues of massy silver, and the artists of China and Paris vied with each other in the service of the great Khan. 7769 Karakoram contained two streets, the one of Chinese mechanics, the other of Mahometan traders. And the places of religious worship, one Nestorian church, two mosques, and twelve temples of various idols, may represent in some degree the number and division of inhabitants. Yet a French missionary declares, that the town of Esti. Denis, near Paris, was more considerable than the Tartar capital, and that the whole palace of Mangu was scarcely equal to a tenth part of that Benedictine abbey. The conquests of Russia and Syria might amuse the vanity of the great Khans. But they were seated on the borders of China, the acquisition of that empire was the nearest and most interesting object. And they might learn from their pastoral economy, that it is for the advantage of the shepherd to protect and propagate his flock. I have already celebrated the wisdom and virtue of a Mandarin who prevented the desolation of five populous and cultivated provinces. In a spotless administration of thirty years, this friend of his country and of mankind continually labored to mitigate, or suspend, the havoc of war, to save the monuments, and to rekindle the flame, of science. To restrain the military commander by the restoration of civil magistrates, and to instill the love of peace and justice into the minds of the Mughals. He struggled with the barbarism of the first conquerors. But his salutary lessons produced a rich harvest in the second generation. 7770 The Northern, and by degrees the Southern, Empire acquiesced in the government of Kublai, the lieutenant, and afterwards the successor, of Mangu. And the nation was loyal to a prince who had been educated in the manners of China. He restored the forms of her venerable constitution, and the victors submitted to the laws, the fashions, and even the prejudices, of the vanquished people. This peaceful triumph, which has been more than once repeated, may be ascribed, in a great measure, to the numbers and servitude of the Chinese. The Mughal army was dissolved in a vast and populous country. And their emperors adopted with pleasure a political system, which gives to the prince the solid substance of despotism, and leaves to the subject the empty names of philosophy, freedom, and filial obedience. 7771 Under the reign of Kublai, letters and commerce, peace and justice, were restored, the great canal, of five hundred miles, was opened from Nanking to the capital, he fixed his residence at Pekin. And displayed in his court the magnificence of the greatest monarch of Asia. Yet this learned prince declined from the pure and simple religion of his great ancestor, he sacrificed to the idol F.O. And his blind attachment to the lamas of Thibet and the bonzes of China 7772 provoked the censure of the disciples of Confucius. His successors polluted the palace with a crowd of eunuchs, physicians, and astrologers, while thirteen millions of their subjects were consumed in the provinces by famine. 140 years after the death of Zingis, his degenerate race, the dynasty of the Yuan, was expelled by a revolt of the native Chinese, and the Mughal emperors were lost in the oblivion of the desert. Before this revolution, they had forfeited their supremacy over the dependent branches of their house, the Khans of Kipzak and Russia, the Khans of Zagatai, or Transoxiana, and the Khans of Iran or Persia. By their distance and power, these royal lieutenants had soon been released from the duties of obedience, and after the death of Kublai, they scorned to accept a scepter or a title from his unworthy successors. According to their respective situations, they maintained the simplicity of the pastoral life, or assumed the luxury of the cities of Asia, but the princes and their hordes were alike disposed for the reception of a foreign worship. After some hesitation between the Gospel and the Quran, they conformed to the religion of Muhammad, 
and while they adopted for their brethren the Arabs and Persians, they renounced all intercourse with the ancient Mughals, the idolaters of China. In this shipwreck of nations, some surprise may be excited by the escape of the Roman Empire, whose relics, at the time of the Mughal invasion, were dismembered by the Greeks and Latins. Less potent than Alexander, they were pressed, like the Macedonian, both in Europe and Asia, by the shepherds of Scythia, and had the Tartars undertaken the siege, Constantinople must have yielded to the fate of Pekin, Samarkand, and Baghdad. The glorious and voluntary retreat of Badu from the Danube was insulted by the vain triumph of the Franks and Greeks, 7773, and in a second expedition death surprised him in full march to attack the capital of the Caesars. His brother Borga carried the Tartar arms into Bulgaria and Thrace, but he was diverted from the Byzantine War by a visit to Novogorod, in the 57th degree of latitude, where he numbered the inhabitants and regulated the tributes of Russia. The Mughal Khan formed an alliance with the Mamluks against his brethren of Persia, 300,000 horse penetrated through the gates of Derbend, and the Greeks might rejoice in the first example of domestic war. After the recovery of Constantinople, Michael Paleologus, 7774 at a distance from his court and army, was surprised and surrounded in a Thracian castle, by 20,000 Tartars. But the object of their march was a private interest, they came to the deliverance of Azadin, the Turkish sultan, and were content with his person and the treasure of the emperor. Their general Noga, whose name is perpetuated in the hordes of Astrakhan, raised a formidable rebellion against Mengo Timur, the third of the Khans of Kipzak, obtained in marriage Maria, the natural daughter of Paleologus, and guarded the dominions of his friend and father. The subsequent invasions of a Scythian caste were those of outlaws and fugitives, and some thousands of Alani and Comans, who had been driven from their native seats, were reclaimed from a vagrant life, and enlisted in the service of the empire. Such was the influence in Europe of the invasion of the Mughals. The first terror of their arms secured, rather than disturbed, the peace of the Roman Asia. The Sultan of Iconium solicited a personal interview with John Vatases. And his artful policy encouraged the Turks to defend their barrier against the common enemy. 7775 That barrier indeed was soon overthrown, and the servitude and ruin of the Seljukians exposed the nakedness of the Greeks. The formidable Holigu threatened to march to Constantinople at the head of 400,000 men, and the groundless panic of the citizens of Nice will present an image of the terror which he had inspired. The accident of a procession, and the sound of a doleful litany, from the fury of the Tartars, good lord, deliver us, had scattered the hasty report of an assault and massacre. In the blind credulity of fear, the streets of Nice were crowded with thousands of both sexes, who knew not from what or to whom they fled. And some hours elapsed before the firmness of the military officers could relieve the city from this imaginary foe. But the ambition of Holigu and his successors was fortunately diverted by the conquest of Baghdad, and a long vicissitude of Syrian wars, their hostility to the Moslems inclined them to unite with the Greeks and Franks. 7776 and their generosity or contempt had offered the kingdom of Anatolia as the reward of an Armenian vassal. The fragments of the Seljukian monarchy were disputed by the emirs who had occupied the cities or the mountains. But they all confessed the supremacy of the Khans of Persia, and he often interposed his authority, and sometimes his arms, to check their depredations, and to preserve the peace and balance of his Turkish frontier. The death of Kazan, 7777 one of the greatest and most accomplished princes of the House of Zingis, removed this salutary control, and the decline of the Mughals gave a free scope to the rise and progress of the Ottoman Empire. 7778 after the retreat of Zingis, the Sultan Jalaleddin of Khorizm had returned from India to the possession and defense of his Persian kingdoms. In the space of eleven years, that hero fought in person fourteen battles. And such was his activity, that he led his cavalry in seventeen days from Teflis to Kerman, a march of a thousand miles. Yet he was oppressed by the jealousy of the Moslem princes, and the innumerable armies of the Mughals. And after his last defeat, Jalaleddin perished ignobly in the mountains of Kurdistan. His death dissolved a veteran and adventurous army, which included under the name of Khorizmians or Khorizmans many Turkmen hordes, that had attached themselves to the Sultan's fortune. 
the bolder and more powerful chiefs invaded Syria, and violated the holy sepulchre of Jerusalem, the more humble engaged in the service of Aladdin, Sultan of Iconium, and among these were the obscure fathers of the Ottoman line. They had formerly pitched their tents near the southern banks of the Oxus, in the plains of Mahan and Nessa, and it is somewhat remarkable, that the same spot should have produced the first authors of the Parthian and Turkish empires. At the head, or in the rear, of a Charismian army, Solomon Shah was drowned in the passage of the Euphrates, his son Orthogrel became the soldier and subject of Aladdin, and established at Surgut, on the banks of the Sangar. A camp of four hundred families or tents, whom he governed fifty-two years both in peace and war. He was the father of Thaman, or Athman, whose Turkish name has been melted into the appellation of the Caliph Othman. And if we describe that pastoral chief as a shepherd and a robber, we must separate from those characters all idea of ignominy and baseness. Othman possessed, and perhaps surpassed, the ordinary virtues of a soldier. And the circumstances of time and place were propitious to his independence and success. The Seljukian dynasty was no more, and the distance and decline of the Mughal Khans soon enfranchised him from the control of a superior. He was situate on the verge of the Greek Empire, the Quran sanctified his Ghazi, or holy war, against the infidels, and their political errors unlocked the passes of Mount Olympus, and invited him to descend into the plains of Bithynia. Till the reign of Paleologus, these passes had been vigilantly guarded by the militia of the country, who were repaid by their own safety and an exemption from taxes. The emperor abolished their privilege and assumed their office. But the tribute was rigorously collected, the custody of the passes was neglected, and the hardy mountaineers degenerated into a trembling crowd of peasants without spirit or discipline. It was on the 27th of July, in the year 1299 of the Christian era, that Othman first invaded the territory of Nicomedia. 7779 and the singular accuracy of the date seems to disclose some foresight of the rapid and destructive growth of the monster. The annals of the twenty-seven years of his reign would exhibit a repetition of the same inroads. And his hereditary troops were multiplied in each campaign by the accession of captives and volunteers. Instead of retreating to the hills, he maintained the most useful and defensive posts. Fortified the towns and castles which he had first pillaged, and renounced the pastoral life for the baths and palaces of his infant capitals. But it was not till Othman was oppressed by age and infirmities, that he received the welcome news of the conquest of Prusa, which had been surrendered by famine or treachery to the arms of his son Orkan. The glory of Othman is chiefly founded on that of his descendants, but the Turks have transcribed or composed a royal testament of his last counsels of justice and moderation. 7780. From the conquest of Prusa, we may date the true era of the Ottoman Empire. The lives and possessions of the Christian subjects were redeemed by a tribute or ransom of thirty thousand crowns of gold. And the city, by the labors of Orkin, assumed the aspect of a Mahometan capital, Prusa was decorated with a mosque, a college, and a hospital, of royal foundation. The Seljukian coin was changed for the name and impression of the new dynasty, and the most skillful professors, of human and divine knowledge, attracted the Persian and Arabian students from the ancient schools of Oriental learning. The office of vizier was instituted for Aladdin, the brother of Orkin, 7781 and a different habit distinguished the citizens from the peasants, the Moslems from the infidels. All the troops of Othman had consisted of loose squadrons of Turkmen cavalry, who served without pay and fought without discipline but a regular body of infantry was first established and trained by the prudence of his son. A great number of volunteers was enrolled with a small stipend, but with the permission of living at home, unless they were summoned to the field, their rude manners, and seditious temper. Disposed Orkin to educate his young captives as his soldiers and those of the Prophet. But the Turkish peasants were still allowed to mount on horseback, and follow his standard, with the appellation and the hopes of freebooters. 7782 By these arts he formed an army of 25,000 Moslems, a train of battering engines was framed for the use of sieges, and the first successful experiment was made on the cities of Nice and Nicomedia. Orkin granted a safe conduct to all who were desirous of departing with their families and effects, 
but the widows of the slain were given in marriage to the conquerors. And the sacrilegious plunder, the books, the vases, and the images, were sold or ransomed at Constantinople. The Emperor Andronicus the Younger was vanquished and wounded by the son of Othman, 7783-7784 he subdued the whole province or kingdom of Bithynia, as far as the shores of the Bosphorus and Hellespont. And the Christians confessed the justice and clemency of a reign which claimed the voluntary attachment of the Turks of Asia. Yet Orkin was content with the modest title of Emir. And in the list of his compeers, the princes of Rome or Anatolia, 7785 his military forces were surpassed by the emirs of Germian and Karamania, each of whom could bring into the field an army of 40,000 men. Their domains were situate in the heart of the Seljukian kingdom, but the holy warriors, though of inferior note, who formed new principalities on the Greek empire, are more conspicuous in the light of history. The maritime country from the Propontis to the Meander and the Isle of Rhodes, so long threatened and so often pillaged, was finally lost about the thirteenth year of Andronicus the Elder. 7786 Two Turkish chieftains, Sarukan and Aden, left their names to their conquests, and their conquests to their posterity. The captivity or ruin of the seven churches of Asia was consummated and the barbarous lords of Ionia and Lydia still trample on the monuments of classic and Christian antiquity. In the loss of Ephesus, the Christians deplored the fall of the first angel, the extinction of the first candlestick, of the revelations. 7787 The desolation is complete, and the Temple of Diana, or the Church of Mary, will equally elude the search of the curious traveller. The circus and three stately theatres of Laodicea are now peopled with wolves and foxes. Sards is reduced to a miserable village, the god of Muhammad, without a rival or a son, is invoked in the mosques of Thyatira and Pergamus, and the populousness of Smyrna is supported by the foreign trade of the Franks and Armenians. Philadelphia alone has been saved by prophecy, or courage. At a distance from the sea, forgotten by the emperors, encompassed on all sides by the Turks, her valiant citizens defended their religion and freedom above fourscore years. And at length capitulated with the proudest of the Ottomans. Among the Greek colonies and churches of Asia, Philadelphia is still erect, a column in a scene of ruins, a pleasing example, that the paths of honor and safety may sometimes be the same. The servitude of Rhodes was delayed about two centuries by the establishment of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, 7788 under the discipline of the order, that island emerged into fame and opulence. The noble and warlike monks were renowned by land and sea, and the bulwark of Christendom provoked, and repelled, the arms of the Turks and Saracens. The Greeks, by their intestine divisions, were the authors of their final ruin. During the civil wars of the elder and younger Andronicus, the son of Othman achieved, almost without resistance, the conquest of Bithynia. And the same disorders encouraged the Turkish emirs of Lydia and Ionia to build a fleet, and to pillage the adjacent islands and the sea coast of Europe. In the defense of his life and honor, Cantacuzene was tempted to prevent, or imitate, his adversaries, by calling to his aid the public enemies of his religion and country. Amir, the son of Aden, concealed under a Turkish garb the humanity and politeness of a Greek, he was united with the great domestic by mutual esteem and reciprocal services. And their friendship is compared, in the vain rhetoric of the times, to the perfect union of Orestes and Pylades. 7789 On the report of the danger of his friend, who was persecuted by an ungrateful court, the prince of Ionia assembled at Smyrna a fleet of three hundred vessels, with an army of twenty-nine thousand men. Sailed in the depth of winter, and cast anchor at the mouth of the Hebrus. From thence, with a chosen band of two thousand Turks, he marched along the banks of the river, and rescued the Empress, who was besieged in Demotica by the wild Bulgarians. At that disastrous moment, the life or death of his beloved Cantacuzene was concealed by his flight into Serbia, but the grateful Irene, impatient to behold her deliverer, invited him to enter the city. And accompanied her message with a present of rich apparel and a hundred horses. By a peculiar strain of delicacy, the gentle barbarian refused, in the absence of an unfortunate friend, to visit his wife, or to taste the luxuries of the palace, sustained in his tent the rigor of the winter. 
and rejected the hospitable gift, that he might share the hardships of two thousand companions, all as deserving as himself of that honour and distinction. Necessity and revenge might justify his predatory excursions by sea and land, he left nine thousand five hundred men for the guard of his fleet. And persevered in the fruitless search of Cantacuzene, till his embarkation was hastened by a fictitious letter, the severity of the season, the clamours of his independent troops, and the weight of his spoil and captives. In the prosecution of the civil war, the Prince of Ionia twice returned to Europe, joined his arms with those of the Emperor, besieged Thessalonica, and threatened Constantinople. Calamy might affix some reproach on his imperfect aid, his hasty departure, and a bribe of ten thousand crowns, which he accepted from the Byzantine court, but his friend was satisfied. And the conduct of Amir is excused by the more sacred duty of defending against the Latins his hereditary dominions. The maritime power of the Turks had united the Pope, the King of Cyprus, the Republic of Venice, and the Order of Asti. John, in a laudable crusade, their galleys invaded the coast of Ionia, and Amir was slain with an arrow, in the attempt to wrest from the Rhodian knights the citadel of Smyrna. 7790 Before his death, he generously recommended another ally of his own nation, not more sincere or zealous than himself, but more able to afford a prompt and powerful succor, by his situation along the Propontis and in the front of Constantinople. By the prospect of a more advantageous treaty, the Turkish prince of Bithynia was detached from his engagements with and of Savoy. And the pride of Orkin dictated the most solemn protestations, that if he could obtain the daughter of Cantacuzene, he would invariably fulfill the duties of a subject and a son. Parental tenderness was silenced by the voice of ambition, the Greek clergy connived at the marriage of a Christian princess with a sectary of Mahomet, and the father of Theodora describes, with shameful satisfaction, the dishonor of the purple. 7791 A body of Turkish cavalry attended the ambassadors, who disembarked from thirty vessels, before his camp of Salibria. A stately pavilion was erected, in which the Empress Irene passed the night with her daughters. In the morning, Theodora ascended a throne, which was surrounded with curtains of silk and gold, the troops were under arms, but the emperor alone was on horseback. At a signal the curtains were suddenly withdrawn to disclose the bride, or the victim, encircled by kneeling eunuchs and hymeneal torches, the sound of flutes and trumpets proclaimed the joyful event. And her pretended happiness was the theme of the nuptial song, which was chanted by such poets as the age could produce. Without the rites of the church, Theodora was delivered to her barbarous lord, but it had been stipulated, that she should preserve her religion in the harem of Bursa, and her father celebrates her charity and devotion in this ambiguous situation. After his peaceful establishment on the throne of Constantinople, the Greek emperor visited his Turkish ally, who with four sons, by various wives, expected him at Scutari, on the Asiatic shore. The two princes partook, with seeming cordiality, of the pleasures of the banquet and the chase, and Theodora was permitted to repass the Bosphorus, and to enjoy some days in the society of her mother. But the friendship of Orkin was subservient to his religion and interest, and in the Genoese war he joined without a blush the enemies of Cantacuzene. In the treaty with the Empress Anne, the Ottoman prince had inserted a singular condition, that it should be lawful for him to sell his prisoners at Constantinople, or transport them into Asia. A naked crowd of Christians of both sexes and every age, of priests and monks, of matrons and virgins, was exposed in the public market, the whip was frequently used to quicken the charity of redemption. And the indigent Greeks deplored the fate of their brethren, who were led away to the worst evils of temporal and spiritual bondage 7792 Cantacuzene was reduced to subscribe the same terms. And their execution must have been still more pernicious to the empire, a body of ten thousand Turks had been detached to the assistance of the Empress Anne, but the entire forces of Orkin were exerted in the service of his father. Yet these calamities were of a transient nature, as soon as the storm had passed away, the fugitives might return to their habitations, and at the conclusion of the civil and foreign wars, Europe was completely evacuated by the Moslems of Asia. It was in his last quarrel with his pupil that Cantacuzene inflicted the deep and deadly wound, which could never be healed by his successors, and which is poorly expiated by his theological dialogues against the Prophet Muhammad. Ignorant of their own history, 
the modern Turks confound their first and their final passage of the Hellespont, 7793 and describe the son of Orkin as a nocturnal robber, who, with eighty companions, explores by stratagem a hostile and unknown shore. Solomon, at the head of ten thousand horse, was transported in the vessels, and entertained as the friend, of the Greek emperor. In the civil wars of Romania, he performed some service and perpetrated more mischief. But the Chersonesus was insensibly filled with a Turkish colony, and the Byzantine court solicited in vain the restitution of the fortresses of Thrace. After some artful delays between the Ottoman prince and his son, their ransom was valued at sixty thousand crowns, and the first payment had been made when an earthquake shook the walls and cities of the provinces. The dismantled places were occupied by the Turks, and Gallipoli, the key of the Hellespont, was rebuilt and repeopled by the policy of Solomon. The abdication of Cantacuzene dissolved the feeble bands of domestic alliance. And his last advice admonished his countrymen to decline a rash contest, and to compare their own weakness with the numbers and valor, the discipline and enthusiasm, of the Moslems. His prudent counsels were despised by the headstrong vanity of youth, and soon justified by the victories of the Ottomans. But as he practiced in the field the exercise of the Jared, Solomon was killed by a fall from his horse. And the aged Orkin wept and expired on the tomb of his valiant son. 7794. But the Greeks had not time to rejoice in the death of their enemies. And the Turkish scimitar was wielded with the same spirit by Amurath I, the son of Orkin, and the brother of Solomon. By the pale and fainting light of the Byzantine annals 7795 we can discern, that he subdued without resistance the whole province of Romania or Thrace, from the Hellespont to Mount Hemus, and the verge of the capital. And that Adrianople was chosen for the royal seat of his government and religion in Europe. Constantinople, whose decline is almost coeval with her foundation, had often, in the lapse of a thousand years, been assaulted by the barbarians of the East and West. But never till this fatal hour had the Greeks been surrounded, both in Asia and Europe, by the arms of the same hostile monarchy. Yet the prudence or generosity of Amurath postponed for a while this easy conquest. And his pride was satisfied with the frequent and humble attendance of the Emperor John Paleologus and his four sons, who followed at his summons the court and camp of the Ottoman prince. He marched against the Sclavonian nations between the Danube and the Adriatic, the Bulgarians, Servians, Bosnians, and Albanians. And these warlike tribes, who had so often insulted the majesty of the empire, were repeatedly broken by his destructive inroads. Their countries did not abound either in gold or silver. Nor were their rustic hamlets and townships enriched by commerce or decorated by the arts of luxury. But the natives of the soil have been distinguished in every age by their hardiness of mind and body. And they were converted by a prudent institution into the firmest and most faithful supporters of the Ottoman greatness. 7796 The vizier of Amurath reminded his sovereign that, according to the Mahometan law, he was entitled to a fifth part of the spoil and captives. And that the duty might easily be levied, if vigilant officers were stationed in Gallipoli, to watch the passage, and to select for his use the stoutest and most beautiful of the Christian youth. The advice was followed the edict was proclaimed. Many thousands of the European captives were educated in religion and arms, and the new militia was consecrated and named by a celebrated dervis. Standing in the front of their ranks, he stretched the sleeve of his gown over the head of the foremost soldier, and his blessing was delivered in these words, let them be called Janizaries, Yenji Sheri, or new soldiers winky face. May their countenance be ever bright. Their hand victorious their sword keen. May their spear always hang over the heads of their enemies. And wheresoever they go, may they return with a white face. 7797-7798 Such was the origin of these haughty troops, the terror of the nations, and sometimes of the sultans themselves. Their valor has declined, their discipline is relaxed, and their tumultuary array is incapable of contending with the order and weapons of modern tactics but at the time of their institution, they possessed a decisive superiority in war. Since a regular body of infantry, in constant exercise and pay, was not maintained by any of the princes of Christendom. 
the Janissaries fought with the zeal of proselytes against their idolatrous countrymen. And in the Battle of Kosova, the League and Independence of the Sclavonian tribes was finally crushed. As the conqueror walked over the field, he observed that the greatest part of the slain consisted of beardless youths. And listened to the flattering reply of his vizier, that age and wisdom would have taught them not to oppose his irresistible arms. But the sword of his Janissaries could not defend him from the dagger of despair. A Servian soldier started from the crowd of dead bodies, and Amurath was pierced in the belly with a mortal wound. 7799 The grandson of Othman was mild in his temper, modest in his apparel, and a lover of learning and virtue. But the Moslems were scandalized at his absence from public worship, and he was corrected by the firmness of the Mufti, who dared to reject his testimony in a civil cause, a mixture of servitude and freedom not unfrequent in Oriental history. 7800. The character of Bajazay, the son and successor of Amurath, is strongly expressed in his surname of Ilderim, or the Lightning. And he might glory in an epithet, which was drawn from the fiery energy of his soul and the rapidity of his destructive march. In the fourteen years of his reign, 7801 he incessantly moved at the head of his armies, from Bursa to Adrianople, from the Danube to the Euphrates. And, though he strenuously labored for the propagation of the law, he invaded, with impartial ambition, the Christian and Mahometan princes of Europe and Asia. From Angora to Amasia and Erzurum, the northern regions of Anatolia were reduced to his obedience, he stripped of their hereditary possessions his brother emirs of Germian and Karamania, of Aden and Sarukan. And after the conquest of Iconium the ancient kingdom of the Seljukians again revived in the Ottoman dynasty. Nor were the conquests of Bajazay less rapid or important in Europe. No sooner had he imposed a regular form of servitude on the Serbians and Bulgarians, then he passed the Danube to seek new enemies and new subjects in the heart of Moldavia. 7802 Whatever yet adhered to the Greek Empire in Thrace, Macedonia, and Thessaly, acknowledged a Turkish master, an obsequious bishop led him through the gates of Thermopylae into Greece. And we may observe, as a singular fact, that the widow of a Spanish chief, who possessed the ancient seat of the Oracle of Delphi, deserved his favor by the sacrifice of a beauteous daughter. The Turkish communication between Europe and Asia had been dangerous and doubtful, till he stationed at Gallipoli a fleet of galleys, to command the Hellespont and intercept the Latin suckers of Constantinople. While the monarch indulged his passions in a boundless range of injustice and cruelty, he imposed on his soldiers the most rigid laws of modesty and abstinence, and the harvest was peaceably reaped and sold within the precincts of his camp. Provoked by the loose and corrupt administration of justice, he collected in a house the judges and lawyers of his dominions, who expected that in a few moments the fire would be kindled to reduce them to ashes. His ministers trembled in silence, but an Ethiopian buffoon presumed to insinuate the true cause of the evil, and future venality was left without excuse, by annexing an adequate salary to the office of Qadi. 7803 The humble title of Amir was no longer suitable to the Ottoman greatness. And Bajazay condescended to accept a patent of sultan from the caliphs who served in Egypt under the yoke of the Mamluks, 7804 a last and frivolous homage that was yielded by force to opinion. By the Turkish conquerors to the house of Abbas and the successors of the Arabian prophet. The ambition of the sultan was inflamed by the obligation of deserving this august title. And he turned his arms against the kingdom of Hungary, the perpetual theater of the Turkish victories and defeats. Sigismund, the Hungarian king, was the son and brother of the emperors of the West, his cause was that of Europe and the Church. And, on the report of his danger, the bravest knights of France and Germany were eager to march under his standard and that of the cross. In the Battle of Nicopolis, Bajazay defeated a confederate army of a hundred thousand Christians, who had proudly boasted, that if the sky should fall, they could uphold it on their lances. The far greater part were slain or driven into the Danube. And Sigismund, escaping to Constantinople by the river and the Black Sea, returned after a long circuit to his exhausted kingdom. 7805 In the pride of victory, Bajazay threatened that he would besiege Buddha. That he would subdue the adjacent countries of Germany and Italy, and that he would feed his horse with a bushel of oats on the altar of St. Peter at Rome. 
His progress was checked, not by the miraculous interposition of the Apostle, not by a crusade of the Christian powers, but by a long and painful fit of the gout. The disorders of the moral, are sometimes corrected by those of the physical, world. And an acrimonious humor falling on a single fiber of one man, may prevent or suspend the misery of nations. Such is the general idea of the Hungarian War. But the disastrous adventure of the French has procured us some memorials which illustrate the victory and character of Bajazet. 7806 The Duke of Burgundy, sovereign of Flanders, and uncle of Charles VI, yielded to the ardor of his son, John Count of Nevers, and the fearless youth was accompanied by four princes, his cousins, and those of the French monarch. Their inexperience was guided by the sire de Cousy, one of the best and oldest captain of Christendom, 7807 but the constable, admiral, and marshal of France 7808 commanded an army which did not exceed the number of a thousand knights and squires. 7809 These splendid names were the source of presumption and the bane of discipline. So many might aspire to command, that none were willing to obey, their national spirit despised both their enemies and their allies. And in the persuasion that Bajazet would fly, or must fall, they began to compute how soon they should visit Constantinople and deliver the Holy Sepulchre. When their scouts announced the approach of the Turks, the gay and thoughtless youths were at table, already heated with wine. They instantly clasped their armor, mounted their horses, rode full speed to the vanguard, and resented as an affront the advice of Sigismund, which would have deprived them of the right and honor of the foremost attack. The Battle of Nicopolis would not have been lost, if the French would have obeyed the prudence of the Hungarians, but it might have been gloriously won, had the Hungarians imitated the valor of the French. They dispersed the first line, consisting of the troops of Asia, forced a rampart of stakes, which had been planted against the cavalry, broke, after a bloody conflict, the Janissaries themselves. And were at length overwhelmed by the numerous squadrons that issued from the woods, and charged on all sides this handful of intrepid warriors. In the speed and secrecy of his march, in the order and evolutions of the battle, his enemies felt and admired the military talents of Bajazet. They accuse his cruelty in the use of victory. After reserving the Count of Nevers, and four and twenty lords, seventy-eight ten whose birth and riches were attested by his Latin interpreters, the remainder of the French captives, who had survived the slaughter of the day, were led before his throne. And, as they refused to abjure their faith, were successively beheaded in his presence. The Sultan was exasperated by the loss of his bravest Janissaries. And if it be true, that, on the eve of the engagement, the French had massacred their Turkish prisoners, 7811 they might impute to themselves the consequences of a just retaliation. 7812 a knight, whose life had been spared, was permitted to return to Paris, that he might relate the deplorable tale, and solicit the ransom of the noble captives. In the meanwhile, the Count of Nevers, with the princes and barons of France, were dragged along in the marches of the Turkish camp, exposed as a grateful trophy to the Moslems of Europe and Asia, and strictly confined at Bursa. As often as Bajazet resided in his capital, the Sultan was pressed each day to expiate with their blood the blood of his martyrs, but he had pronounced that they should live, and either for mercy or destruction his word was irrevocable. He was assured of their value and importance by the return of the messenger, and the gifts and intercessions of the kings of France and of Cyprus. Lusignan presented him with a gold salt cellar of curious workmanship, and of the price of ten thousand ducats. And Charles the Sixth dispatched by the way of Hungary a cast of Norwegian hawks, and six horse loads of scarlet cloth, of fine linen of Reims, and of Arras tapestry, representing the battles of the great Alexander. After much delay, the effect of distance rather than of art, Bajazet agreed to accept a ransom of two hundred thousand ducats for the Count of Nevers and the surviving princes and barons, the Marshal Boussicault, a famous warrior, was of the number of the fortunate. But the Admiral of France had been slain in battle, and the constable, with the sire de Cousy, died in the prison of Bursa. This heavy demand, which was doubled by incidental costs, fell chiefly on the Duke of Burgundy, or rather on his Flemish subjects, who were bound by the feudal laws to contribute for the knighthood and captivity of the eldest son of their lord. For the faithful discharge of the debt, 
some merchants of Genoa gave security to the amount of five times the sum, a lesson to those warlike times, that commerce and credit are the links of the society of nations. It had been stipulated in the treaty, that the French captives should swear never to bear arms against the person of their conqueror, but the ungenerous restraint was abolished by Bajazet himself. I despise, said he to the heir of Burgundy, thy oaths and thy arms. Thou art young, and mayest be ambitious of effacing the disgrace or misfortune of thy first chivalry. Assemble thy powers, proclaim thy design, and be assured that Bajazet will rejoice to meet thee a second time in a field of battle. Before their departure, they were indulged in the freedom and hospitality of the court of Bursa. The French princes admired the magnificence of the Ottoman, whose hunting and hawking equipage was composed of seven thousand huntsmen and seven thousand falconers. Seventy-eight thirteen in their presence, and at his command, the belly of one of his chamberlains was cut open, on a complaint against him for drinking the goat's milk of a poor woman. The strangers were astonished by this act of justice. But it was the justice of a sultan who disdains to balance the weight of evidence, or to measure the degrees of guilt. After his enfranchisement from an oppressive guardian, John Paleologus remained thirty-six years, the helpless, and, as it should seem, the careless spectator of the public ruin. Point seventy-eight fourteen love, or rather lust, was his only vigorous passion. And in the embraces of the wives and virgins of the city, the Turkish slave forgot the dishonor of the emperor of the Romans Andronicus, his eldest son, had formed, at Adrianople, an intimate and guilty friendship with Sazas, the son of Amurath. And the two youths conspired against the authority and lives of their parents. The presence of Amurath in Europe soon discovered and dissipated their rash counsels. And, after depriving Sazas of his sight, the Ottoman threatened his vassal with the treatment of an accomplice and an enemy, unless he inflicted a similar punishment on his own son. Paleologus trembled and obeyed. And a cruel precaution involved in the same sentence the childhood and innocence of John, the son of the criminal. But the operation was so mildly, or so unskillfully, performed, that the one retained the sight of an eye, and the other was afflicted only with the infirmity of squinting. Thus excluded from the succession, the two princes were confined in the tower of Anima, and the piety of Manuel, the second son of the reigning monarch, was rewarded with the gift of the imperial crown. But at the end of two years, the turbulence of the Latins and the levity of the Greeks, produced a revolution, 7815 and the two emperors were buried in the tower from whence the two prisoners were exalted to the throne. Another period of two years afforded Paleologus and Manuel the means of escape, it was contrived by the magic or subtlety of a monk, who was alternately named the angel or the devil, they fled to Scutari, their adherents armed in their cause. And the two Byzantine factions displayed the ambition and animosity with which Caesar and Pompey had disputed the empire of the world. The Roman world was now contracted to a corner of Thrace, between the Propontis and the Black Sea, about fifty miles in length and thirty in breadth. A space of ground not more extensive than the lesser principalities of Germany or Italy, if the remains of Constantinople had not still represented the wealth and populousness of a kingdom. To restore the public peace, it was found necessary to divide this fragment of the empire. And while Paleologus and Manuel were left in possession of the capital, almost all that lay without the walls was ceded to the blind princes, who fixed their residence at Rodasto and Salibria. In the tranquil slumber of royalty, the passions of John Paleologus survived his reason and his strength, he deprived his favorite and heir of a blooming princess of Trebizond. And while the feeble emperor labored to consummate his nuptials, Manuel, with a hundred of the noblest Greeks, was sent on a peremptory summons to the Ottoman port. They served with honor in the wars of Bajazet. But a plan of fortifying Constantinople excited his jealousy, he threatened their lives, the new works were instantly demolished. And we shall bestow a praise, perhaps above the merit of Paleologus, if we impute this last humiliation as the cause of his death. The earliest intelligence of that event was communicated to Manuel, who escaped with speed and secrecy from the palace of Bursa to the Byzantine throne. Bajazet affected a proud indifference at the loss of this valuable pledge. And while he pursued his conquests in Europe and Asia, 
he left the emperor to struggle with his blind cousin John of Celebria, who, in eight years of civil war, asserted his right of primogeniture. At length, the ambition of the victorious sultan pointed to the conquest of Constantinople. But he listened to the advice of his vizier, who represented that such an enterprise might unite the powers of Christendom in a second and more formidable crusade. His epistle to the emperor was conceived in these words, By the divine clemency, our invincible scimitar has reduced to our obedience almost all Asia, with many and large countries in Europe, excepting only the city of Constantinople. For beyond the walls thou hast nothing left. Resign that city, stipulate thy reward, or tremble, for thyself and thy unhappy people, at the consequences of a rash refusal. But his ambassadors were instructed to soften their tone, and to propose a treaty, which was subscribed with submission and gratitude. A truce of ten years was purchased by an annual tribute of thirty thousand crowns of gold. The Greeks deplored the public toleration of the law of Muhammad, and Bajazay enjoyed the glory of establishing a Turkish Qadi, and founding a royal mosque in the metropolis of the Eastern Church. 7816 Yet this truce was soon violated by the restless Sultan, in the cause of the Prince of Celebria, the lawful emperor, an army of Ottomans again threatened Constantinople, and the distress of Manuel implored the protection of the King of France. His plaintive embassy obtained much pity and some relief, and the conduct of the succor was entrusted to the Marshal Boussicault, 7817 whose religious chivalry was inflamed by the desire of revenging his captivity on the infidels. He sailed with four ships of war, from Aigues-Mortes to the Hellespont, forced the passage, which was guarded by seventeen Turkish galleys, landed at Constantinople a supply of six hundred men-at-arms and sixteen hundred archers, and reviewed them in the adjacent plain, without condescending to number or array the multitude of Greeks. By his presence, the blockade was raised both by sea and land, the flying squadrons of Bajazay were driven to a more respectful distance. And several castles in Europe and Asia were stormed by the emperor and the marshal, who fought with equal valor by each other's side. But the Ottomans soon returned with an increase of numbers. And the intrepid Boussicault, after a year's struggle, resolved to evacuate a country which could no longer afford either pay or provisions for his soldiers. The marshal offered to conduct Manuel to the French court, where he might solicit in person a supply of men and money, and advised, in the meanwhile, that, to extinguish all domestic discord, he should leave his blind competitor on the throne. The proposal was embraced, the Prince of Celebria was introduced to the capital, and such was the public misery, that the lot of the exile seemed more fortunate than that of the sovereign. Instead of applauding the success of his vassal, the Turkish Sultan claimed the city as his own, and on the refusal of the Emperor John, Constantinople was more closely pressed by the calamities of war and famine. Against such an enemy prayers and resistance were alike unavailing, and the savage would have devoured his prey, if, in the fatal moment, he had not been overthrown by another savage stronger than himself. By the victory of Timur or Tamerlane, the fall of Constantinople was delayed about fifty years, and this important, though accidental, service may justly introduce the life and character of the Mughal conqueror. LXV, Elevation of Timur or Tamerlane, and His Death Elevation of Timur or Tamerlane to the throne of Samarkand. His conquests in Persia, Georgia, Tartary Russia, India, Syria, and Anatolia. His Turkish war. Defeat and captivity of Bajazay. Death of Timur. Civil war of the sons of Bajazay. Restoration of the Turkish monarchy by Muhammad I. Siege of Constantinople by Amurath II. The conquest and monarchy of the world was the first object of the ambition of Timur. To live in the memory and esteem of future ages was the second wish of his magnanimous spirit. All the civil and military transactions of his reign were diligently recorded in the journals of his secretaries, 7818 The authentic narrative was revised by the persons best informed of each particular transaction. And it is believed in the empire and family of Timur, that the monarch himself composed the commentary 7819 of his life, and the institution 7820 of his government. 7821 But these cares were ineffectual for the preservation of his fame, and these precious memorials in the Mughal or Persian language were concealed from the world, or, at least, from the knowledge of Europe. 
The nations which he vanquished exercised a base and impotent revenge, and ignorance has long repeated the tale of calumny 7822 which had disfigured the birth and character, the person, and even the name, of Tamerlane. 7823 Yet his real merit would be enhanced, rather than debased, by the elevation of a peasant to the throne of Asia, nor can his lameness be a theme of reproach, unless he had the weakness to blush at a natural, or perhaps an honorable, infirmity. 7824 In the eyes of the Mughals, who held the indefeasible succession of the House of Zingis, he was doubtless a rebel subject. Yet he sprang from the noble tribe of Berlas his fifth ancestor, Karashar Nevian, had been the vizier 7825 of Zagatai, in his new realm of Transoxiana. And in the ascent of some generations, the branch of Timur is confounded, at least by the females 7826 with the imperial stem. 7827 he was born forty miles to the south of Samarkand in the village of Sebzer, in the fruitful territory of Kash, of which his fathers were the hereditary chiefs, as well as of a Toman of ten thousand horse. 7828 his birth 7829 was cast on one of those periods of anarchy, which announced the fall of the Asiatic dynasties, and opened a new field to adventurous ambition. The Khans of Zagatai were extinct, the emirs aspired to independence and their domestic feuds could only be suspended by the conquest and tyranny of the Khans of Kashgar, who, with an army of Getz or Kalmuks, 7830 invaded the Transoxian kingdom. From the twelfth year of his age, Timur had entered the field of action, in the 25th 7831 he stood forth as the deliverer of his country, and the eyes and wishes of the people were turned towards a hero who suffered in their cause. The chiefs of the law and of the army had pledged their salvation to support him with their lives and fortunes, but in the hour of danger they were silent and afraid. And, after waiting seven days on the hills of Samarkand, he retreated to the desert with only sixty horsemen. The fugitives were overtaken by a thousand gets, whom he repulsed with incredible slaughter, and his enemies were forced to exclaim, Timur is a wonderful man, fortune and the divine favor are with him. But in this bloody action his own followers were reduced to ten, a number which was soon diminished by the desertion of three Charismians. 7832 he wandered in the desert with his wife, seven companions, and four horses. And sixty-two days was he plunged in a loathsome dungeon, from whence he escaped by his own courage and the remorse of the oppressor. After swimming the broad and rapid steam of the Jehun, or Oxus, he led, during some months, the life of a vagrant and outlaw, on the borders of the adjacent states. But his fame shone brighter in adversity. He learned to distinguish the friends of his person, the associates of his fortune, and to apply the various characters of men for their advantage, and, above all, for his own. On his return to his native country, Timur was successively joined by the parties of his confederates, who anxiously sought him in the desert, nor can I refuse to describe, in his pathetic simplicity, one of their fortunate encounters. He presented himself as a guide to three chiefs, who were at the head of seventy horse. When their eyes fell upon me, says Timur, they were overwhelmed with joy, and they alighted from their horses, and they came and kneeled. And they kissed my stirrup. I also came down from my horse, and took each of them in my arms. And I put my turban on the head of the first chief, and my girdle, rich in jewels and wrought with gold, I bound on the loins of the second and the third I clothed in my own coat. And they wept, and I wept also, and the hour of prayer was arrived, and we prayed. And we mounted our horses, and came to my dwelling, and I collected my people, and made a feast. His trusty bands were soon increased by the bravest of the tribes, he led them against a superior foe, and, after some vicissitudes of war the Gets were finally driven from the kingdom of Transoxiana. He had done much for his own glory. But much remained to be done, much art to be exerted, and some blood to be spilt, before he could teach his equals to obey him as their master. The birth and power of Amir Hausin compelled him to accept a vicious and unworthy colleague, whose sister was the best beloved of his wives. Their union was short and jealous. But the policy of Timur, in their frequent quarrels, exposed his rival to the reproach of injustice and perfidy. And, after a final defeat, 
Housin was slain by some sagacious friends, who presumed, for the last time, to disobey the commands of their lord. 7833 At the age of 34, 7834 and in a general diet or kurultai, he was invested with imperial command, but he affected to revere the house of Zingis. And while the Emir Timur reigned over Zagatai and the East, a nominal Khan served as a private officer in the armies of his servant. A fertile kingdom, 500 miles in length and in breadth, might have satisfied the ambition of a subject. But Timur aspired to the dominion of the world, and before his death, the crown of Zagatai was one of the 27 crowns which he had placed on his head. Without expatiating on the victories of 35 campaigns, Without describing the lines of march which he repeatedly traced over the continent of Asia, I shall briefly represent his conquests in, I, Persia, 2. Tartary, and, 3. India, 7835 and from thence proceed to the more interesting narrative of his Ottoman war. I, for every war, a motive of safety or revenge, of honour or zeal, of right or convenience, may be readily found in the jurisprudence of conquerors. No sooner had Timur reunited to the patrimony of Zagatai the dependent countries of Khorizm and Kandahar, than he turned his eyes towards the kingdoms of Iran or Persia. From the Oxus to the Tigris, that extensive country was left without a lawful sovereign since the death of Abu Said, the last of the descendants of the great Holoku. Peace and justice had been banished from the land above forty years. And the Mughal invader might seem to listen to the cries of an oppressed people. Their petty tyrants might have opposed him with confederate arms, they separately stood, and successively fell. And the difference of their fate was only marked by the promptitude of submission or the obstinacy of resistance. Ibrahim, Prince of Sherwin, or Albania, kissed the footstool of the imperial throne. His peace offerings of silks, horses, and jewels, were composed, according to the Tartar fashion, each article of nine pieces, but a critical spectator observed, that there were only eight slaves. I myself am the ninth, replied Ibrahim, who was prepared for the remark, and his flattery was rewarded by the smile of Timur. 7836 Shah Mansur, Prince of Fars, or the proper Persia, was one of the least powerful, but most dangerous, of his enemies. In a battle under the walls of Shiraz, he broke, with three or four thousand soldiers, the cowl or main body of thirty thousand horse, where the emperor fought in person. No more than fourteen or fifteen guards remained near the standard of Timur, he stood firm as a rock, and received on his helmet two weighty strokes of a scimitar, 7837 the Mughals rallied, the head of Mansur was thrown at his feet. And he declared his esteem of the valour of a foe, by extirpating all the males of so intrepid a race. From Shiraz, his troops advanced to the Persian Gulf. And the richness and weakness of Orma's 7838 were displayed in an annual tribute of 600,000 dinars of gold. Baghdad was no longer the city of peace, the seat of the caliphs. But the noblest conquest of Holoku could not be overlooked by his ambitious successor. The whole course of the Tigris and Euphrates, from the mouth to the sources of those rivers, was reduced to his obedience, he entered Edessa. And the Turkmens of the black sheep were chastised for the sacrilegious pillage of a caravan of Mecca. In the mountains of Georgia, the native Christians still braved the law and the sword of Muhammad, by three expeditions he obtained the merit of the Gezi, or Holy War, and the Prince of Teflis became his proselyte and friend. 2. A just retaliation might be urged for the invasion of Turkestan, or the eastern Tartary. The dignity of Timur could not endure the impunity of the Getz, he passed the Sihun, subdued the kingdom of Kashgar, and marched seven times into the heart of their country. His most distant camp was two months' journey, or 480 leagues to the northeast of Samarkand, and his emirs, who traversed the river Irtish, engraved in the forests of Siberia a rude memorial of their exploits. The conquest of Kipzak, or the Western Tartary, 7839 was founded on the double motive of aiding the distressed, and chastising the ungrateful. Toktamish, a fugitive prince, was entertained and protected in his court, the ambassadors of Oris Khan were dismissed with a haughty denial, and followed on the same day by the armies of Zagatai. And their success established Toktamish in the Mughal Empire of the North. 
But, after a reign of ten years, the new Khan forgot the merits and the strength of his benefactor. The base usurper, as he deemed him, of the sacred rites of the House of Zingis. Through the gates of Derbend, he entered Persia at the head of ninety thousand horse, with the innumerable forces of Kipzak, Bulgaria, Circassia, and Russia, he passed the Sihun, burnt the palaces of Timur, and compelled him. Amidst the winter snows, to contend for Samarkand and his life. After a mild expostulation, and a glorious victory, the emperor resolved on revenge. And by the east, and the west, of the Caspian, and the Volga, he twice invaded Kipsak with such mighty powers, that thirteen miles were measured from his right to his left wing. In a march of five months, they rarely beheld the footsteps of man. And their daily subsistence was often trusted to the fortune of the chase. At length the armies encountered each other. But the treachery of the standard-bearer, who, in the heat of action, reversed the imperial standard of Kipsak, determined the victory of the Zagades. And Tokhtamish, I speak the language of the institutions, gave the tribe of Tushar to the wind of desolation. 7840 He fled to the Christian Duke of Lithuania, again returned to the banks of the Volga. And, after fifteen battles with a domestic rival, at last perished in the wilds of Siberia. The pursuit of a flying enemy carried Timur into the tributary provinces of Russia, a duke of the reigning family was made prisoner amidst the ruins of his capital. And Yelets, by the pride and ignorance of the Orientals, might easily be confounded with the genuine metropolis of the nation. Moscow trembled at the approach of the Tartar, and the resistance would have been feeble, since the hopes of the Russians were placed in a miraculous image of the Virgin, to whose protection they ascribed the casual and voluntary retreat of the conqueror. Ambition and prudence recalled him to the south, the desolate country was exhausted, and the Mughal soldiers were enriched with an immense spoil of precious furs, of linen of Antioch 7841 and of ingots of gold and silver. 7842 On the banks of the Don, or Tanais, he received an humble deputation from the consuls and merchants of Egypt, 7843 Venice, Genoa, Catalonia, and Biscay, who occupied the commerce and city of Tana, or Azov, at the mouth of the river. They offered their gifts, admired his magnificence, and trusted his royal word. But the peaceful visit of an emir, who explored the state of the magazines and harbor, was speedily followed by the destructive presence of the Tartars. The city was reduced to ashes, the Moslems were pillaged and dismissed, but all the Christians, who had not fled to their ships, were condemned either to death or slavery. 7844 Revenge prompted him to burn the cities of Sarai and Astrakhan, the monuments of rising civilization. And his vanity proclaimed, that he had penetrated to the region of perpetual daylight, a strange phenomenon, which authorized his Mahometan doctors to dispense with the obligation of evening prayer. 7845. 3. When Timur first proposed to his princes and emirs the invasion of India or Hindostan, 7846, he was answered by a murmur of discontent, the rivers, and the mountains and deserts, and the soldiers clad in armor, and the elephants, destroyers of men. But the displeasure of the emperor was more dreadful than all these terrors, and his superior reason was convinced, that an enterprise of such tremendous aspect was safe and easy in the execution. He was informed by his spies of the weakness and anarchy of Hindostan, the Subas of the provinces had erected the standard of rebellion, and the perpetual infancy of Sultan Mahmud was despised even in the harem of Delhi. The Mughal army moved in three great divisions, and Timur observes with pleasure, that the ninety-two squadrons of a thousand horse most fortunately corresponded with the ninety-two names or epithets of the Prophet Muhammad. 7847 Between the Jehun and the Indus they crossed one of the ridges of mountains, which are styled by the Arabian geographers the stony girdles of the earth. The highland robbers were subdued or extirpated. But great numbers of men and horses perished in the snow, the emperor himself was let down a precipice on a portable scaffold, the ropes were 150 cubits in length. And before he could reach the bottom, this dangerous operation was five times repeated. Timur crossed the Indus at the ordinary passage of a talk. And successively traversed, in the footsteps of Alexander, the Punjab, 
or five rivers 7848 that fall into the master stream. From Atak to Delhi, the high road measures no more than 600 miles. But the two conquerors deviated to the southeast, and the motive of Timur was to join his grandson, who had achieved by his command the conquest of Moulton. On the eastern bank of the Hyphasis, on the edge of the desert, the Macedonian hero halted and wept, the Mughal entered the desert, reduced the fortress of Batmir, and stood in arms before the gates of Delhi, a great and flourishing city, which had subsisted three centuries under the dominion of the Mahometan kings. 7849 The siege, more especially of the castle, might have been a work of time. But he tempted, by the appearance of weakness, the Sultan Mahmud and his vizier to descend into the plain, with ten thousand cuirassiers, forty thousand of his foot guards, and one hundred and twenty elephants, whose tusks are said to have been armed with sharp and poisoned daggers. Against these monsters, or rather against the imagination of his troops, he condescended to use some extraordinary precautions of fire in a ditch, of iron spikes and a rampart of bucklers. But the event taught the moguls to smile at their own fears, and as soon as these unwieldy animals were routed, the inferior species, the men of India, disappeared from the field. Timur made his triumphal entry into the capital of Hindostan. And admired, with a view to imitate, the architecture of the stately mosque, but the order or license of a general pillage and massacre polluted the festival of his victory. He resolved to purify his soldiers in the blood of the idolaters, or gentus, who still surpass, in the proportion of ten to one, the numbers of the Moslems. 7850 In this pious design, he advanced one hundred miles to the northeast of Delhi, passed the Ganges, fought several battles by land and water, and penetrated to the famous rock of Kupele, the statue of the cow. 7851 That seems to discharge the mighty river, whose source is far distant among the mountains of Thibet. 7852 His return was along the skirts of the northern hills, nor could this rapid campaign of one year justify the strange foresight of his emirs, that their children in a warm climate would degenerate into a race of Hindus. It was on the banks of the Ganges that Timur was informed, by his speedy messengers, of the disturbances which had arisen on the confines of Georgia and Anatolia, of the revolt of the Christians, and the ambitious designs of the Sultan Bajazay. His vigor of mind and body was not impaired by sixty-three years, and innumerable fatigues, and, after enjoying some tranquil months in the palace of Samarkand, he proclaimed a new expedition of seven years into the western countries of Asia. 7853 To the soldiers who had served in the Indian War he granted the choice of remaining at home, or following their prince. But the troops of all the provinces and kingdoms of Persia were commanded to assemble at Ispahan, and wait the arrival of the imperial standard. It was first directed against the Christians of Georgia, who were strong only in their rocks, their castles, and the winter season. But these obstacles were overcome by the zeal and perseverance of Timur, the rebels submitted to the tribute or the Quran. And if both religions boasted of their martyrs, that name is more justly due to the Christian prisoners, who were offered the choice of abjuration or death. On his descent from the hills, the emperor gave audience to the first ambassadors of Bajazay, and opened the hostile correspondence of complaints and menaces, which fermented two years before the final explosion. Between two jealous and haughty neighbors, the motives of quarrel will seldom be wanting. The Mughal and Ottoman conquests now touched each other in the neighborhood of Erzurum, and the Euphrates. Nor had the doubtful limit been ascertained by time and treaty. Each of these ambitious monarchs might accuse his rival of violating his territory, of threatening his vassals, and protecting his rebels. And, by the name of rebels, each understood the fugitive princes, whose kingdoms he had usurped, and whose life or liberty he implacably pursued. The resemblance of character was still more dangerous than the opposition of interest. And in their victorious career, Timur was impatient of an equal, and Bajazay was ignorant of a superior. The first epistle 7854 of the Mughal emperor must have provoked, instead of reconciling, the Turkish sultan, whose family and nation he affected to despise. 7855 Dost thou not know, that the greatest part of Asia is subject to our arms and our laws? That our invincible forces extend from one sea to the other? That the potentates of the earth form a line before our gate? 
and that we have compelled fortune herself to watch over the prosperity of our empire. What is the foundation of thy insolence and folly? Thou hast fought some battles in the woods of Anatolia, contemptible trophies. Thou hast obtained some victories over the Christians of Europe, thy sword was blessed by the Apostle of God. And thy obedience to the precept of the Quran, in waging war against the infidels, is the sole consideration that prevents us from destroying thy country, the frontier and bulwark of the Moslem world. Be wise in time, reflect, repent. And avert the thunder of our vengeance, which is yet suspended over thy head. Thou art no more than a pismire, why wilt thou seek to provoke the elephants? Alas! They will trample thee under their feet. In his replies, Bajazay poured forth the indignation of a soul which was deeply stung by such unusual contempt. After retorting the basest reproaches on the thief and rebel of the desert, the Ottoman recapitulates his boasted victories in Iran, Turan, and the Indies. And labors to prove, that Timur had never triumphed unless by his own perfidy and the vices of his foes. Thy armies are innumerable, be they so. But what are the arrows of the flying Tartar against the scimitars and battle axes of my firm and invincible Janissaries? I will guard the princes who have implored my protection, seek them in my tents. The cities of Arzingan and Erzurum are mine. And unless the tribute be duly paid, I will demand the arrears under the walls of Taurus and Sultania. The ungovernable rage of the Sultan at length betrayed him to an insult of a more domestic kind. If I fly from thy arms, said he, may my wives be thrice divorced from my bed, but if thou hast not courage to meet me in the field, mayest thou again receive thy wives after they have thrice endured the embraces of a stranger. 7856 Any violation by word or deed of the secrecy of the harem is an unpardonable offence among the Turkish nations, 7857 and the political quarrel of the two monarchs was embittered by private and personal resentment. Yet in his first expedition, Timur was satisfied with the siege and destruction of Siwas or Sebaste, a strong city on the borders of Anatolia. And he revenged the indiscretion of the Ottoman, on a garrison of four thousand Armenians, who were buried alive for the brave and faithful discharge of their duty. 7858 As a Muslim, he seemed to respect the pious occupation of Bajazay, who was still engaged in the blockade of Constantinople. And after this salutary lesson, the Mughal conqueror checked his pursuit, and turned aside to the invasion of Syria and Egypt. In these transactions, the Ottoman prince, by the Orientals, and even by Timur, is styled the Caesar of Rome, the Caesar of the Romans. A title which, by a small anticipation, might be given to a monarch who possessed the provinces, and threatened the city, of the successors of Constantine. 7859 the military republic of the Mamluks still reigned in Egypt and Syria, but the dynasty of the Turks was overthrown by that of the Circassians, 7860 and their favorite Barkok, from a slave and a prisoner, was raised and restored to the throne. In the midst of rebellion and discord, he braved the menaces, corresponded with the enemies, and detained the ambassadors, of the Mughal, who patiently expected his decease, to revenge the crimes of the father on the feeble reign of his son Faraj. The Syrian emirs 7861 were assembled at Aleppo to repel the invasion, they confided in the fame and discipline of the Mamluks, in the temper of their swords and lances of the purest steel of Damascus, in the strength of their walled cities. And in the populousness of sixty thousand villages. And instead of sustaining a siege, they threw open their gates, and arrayed their forces in the plain. But these forces were not cemented by virtue and union, and some powerful emirs had been seduced to desert or betray their more loyal companions. Timur's front was covered with a line of Indian elephants, whose turrets were filled with archers and Greek fire, the rapid evolutions of his cavalry completed the dismay and disorder. The Syrian crowds fell back on each other, many thousands were stifled or slaughtered in the entrance of the Great Street, the Mughals entered with the fugitives. And after a short defense, the citadel, the impregnable citadel of Aleppo, was surrendered by cowardice or treachery. Among the suppliants and captives, Timur distinguished the doctors of the law, whom he invited to the dangerous honor of a personal conference. 7862 The Mughal prince was a zealous Muslim. 
But his Persian schools had taught him to revere the memory of Ali and Hossein, and he had imbibed a deep prejudice against the Syrians, as the enemies of the son of the daughter of the Apostle of God. To these doctors he proposed a captious question, which the casuists of Bakra, Samarkand, and Herat, were incapable of resolving. Who are the true martyrs, of those who are slain on my side, or on that of my enemies? But he was silenced, or satisfied, by the dexterity of one of the Kadhis of Aleppo, who replied in the words of Muhammad himself, that the motive, not the ensign, constitutes the martyr. And that the Moslems of either party, who fight only for the glory of God, may deserve that sacred appellation. The true succession of the caliphs was a controversy of a still more delicate nature. And the frankness of a doctor, too honest for his situation, provoked the emperor to exclaim, Ye are as false as those of Damascus, Moiyah was a usurper, Yezid a tyrant, and Ali alone is the lawful successor of the prophet. A prudent explanation restored his tranquility, and he passed to a more familiar topic of conversation. What is your age? said he to the Qadi. Fifty years. It would be the age of my eldest son, you see me here, continued to moor, a poor lame, decrepit mortal. Yet by my arm has the Almighty been pleased to subdue the kingdoms of Iran, Turan, and the Indies. I am not a man of blood. And God is my witness, that in all my wars I have never been the aggressor, and that my enemies have always been the authors of their own calamity. During this peaceful conversation the streets of Aleppo streamed with blood, and re-echoed with the cries of mothers and children, with the shrieks of violated virgins. The rich plunder that was abandoned to his soldiers might stimulate their avarice. But their cruelty was enforced by the peremptory command of producing an adequate number of heads, which, according to his custom, were curiously piled in columns and pyramids, the Mughals celebrated the Feast of Victory, while the surviving Moslems passed the night in tears and in chains. I shall not dwell on the march of the destroyer from Aleppo to Damascus, where he was rudely encountered, and almost overthrown, by the armies of Egypt. A retrograde motion was imputed to his distress and despair, one of his nephews deserted to the enemy. And Syria rejoiced in the tale of his defeat, when the Sultan was driven by the revolt of the Mamluks to escape with precipitation and shame to his palace of Cairo. Abandoned by their prince, the inhabitants of Damascus still defended their walls. And Timur consented to raise the siege, if they would adorn his retreat with a gift or ransom, each article of nine pieces. But no sooner had he introduced himself into the city, under color of a truce, than he perfidiously violated the treaty. Imposed a contribution of ten millions of gold, and animated his troops to chastise the posterity of those Syrians who had executed, or approved, the murder of the grandson of Muhammad. A family which had given honorable burial to the head of Hossein, and a colony of artificers, whom he sent to labor at Samarkand, were alone reserved in the general massacre, and after a period of seven centuries, Damascus was reduced to ashes. Because a Tartar was moved by religious zeal to avenge the blood of an Arab. The losses and fatigues of the campaign obliged Timur to renounce the conquest of Palestine and Egypt, but in his return to the Euphrates he delivered Aleppo to the flames. And justified his pious motive by the pardon and reward of two thousand sectaries of Ali, who were desirous to visit the tomb of his son. I have expatiated on the personal anecdotes which mark the character of the Mughal hero. But I shall briefly mention 7863 that he erected on the ruins of Baghdad a pyramid of 90,000 heads, again visited Georgia, encamped on the banks of Araxes, and proclaimed his resolution of marching against the Ottoman Emperor. Conscious of the importance of the war, he collected his forces from every province, 800,000 men were enrolled on his military list. 7864 But the splendid commands of five, and ten, thousand horse, may be rather expressive of the rank and pension of the chiefs, than of the genuine number of effective soldiers. 7865 In the pillage of Syria, the Mughals had acquired immense riches, but the delivery of their pay and arrears for seven years more firmly attached them to the imperial standard. During this diversion of the Mughal arms, Bajazay had two years to collect his forces for a more serious encounter. They consisted of 400,000 horse and foot, 7866 whose merit and fidelity were of an unequal complexion. 
we may discriminate the Janizaries, who have been gradually raised to an establishment of 40,000 men, a national cavalry, the Spahis of modern times, 20,000 cuirassiers of Europe, clad in black and impenetrable armor. The troops of Anatolia, whose princes had taken refuge in the camp of Timur, and a colony of Tartars, whom he had driven from Kipzak, and to whom Bajazay had assigned a settlement in the plains of Adrianople. The fearless confidence of the Sultan urged him to meet his antagonist, and, as if he had chosen that spot for revenge, he displayed his banner near the ruins of the unfortunate Suvas. In the meanwhile, Timur moved from the Araxes through the countries of Armenia and Anatolia, his boldness was secured by the wisest precautions, his speed was guided by order and discipline. And the woods, the mountains, and the rivers, were diligently explored by the flying squadrons, who marked his road and preceded his standard. Firm in his plan of fighting in the heart of the Ottoman kingdom, he avoided their camp. Dexterously inclined to the left, occupied Caesarea, traversed the salt desert and the river Halles, and invested Angora, while the sultan, immovable and ignorant in his post, compared the Tartar swiftness to the crawling of a snail. 7867 He returned on the wings of indignation to the relief of Angora, and as both generals were alike impatient for action, the plains round that city were the scene of a memorable battle, which has immortalized the glory of Timur and the shame of Bajazay. For this signal victory the Mughal emperor was indebted to himself, to the genius of the moment, and the discipline of thirty years. He had improved the tactics, without violating the manners, of his nation, 7868 whose force still consisted in the missile weapons, and rapid evolutions, of a numerous cavalry. From a single troop to a great army, the mode of attack was the same, a foremost line first advanced to the charge, and was supported in a just order by the squadrons of the great vanguard. The generals I watched over the field, and at his command the front and rear of the right and left wings successively moved forwards in their several divisions, and in a direct or oblique line, the enemy was pressed by eighteen or twenty attacks. And each attack afforded a chance of victory. If they all proved fruitless or unsuccessful, the occasion was worthy of the emperor himself, who gave the signal of advancing to the standard and main body, which he led in person. 7869 But in the Battle of Angora, the main body itself was supported, on the flanks and in the rear, by the bravest squadrons of the reserve, commanded by the sons and grandsons of Timur. The conqueror of Hindostan ostentatiously showed a line of elephants, the trophies, rather than the instruments, of victory, the use of the Greek fire was familiar to the Mughals and Ottomans. But had they borrowed from Europe the recent invention of gunpowder and cannon, the artificial thunder, in the hands of either nation, must have turned the fortune of the day. 7870 In that day Bajazay displayed the qualities of a soldier and a chief, but his genius sunk under a stronger ascendant, and, from various motives, the greatest part of his troops failed him in the decisive moment. His rigor and avarice 7871 had provoked a mutiny among the Turks, and even his son Solomon too hastily withdrew from the field. The forces of Anatolia, loyal in their revolt, were drawn away to the banners of their lawful princes. His Tartar allies had been tempted by the letters and emissaries of Timur, 7872 who reproached their ignoble servitude under the slaves of their fathers, and offered to their hopes the dominion of their new, or the liberty of their ancient, country. In the right wing of Bajazay the cuirassiers of Europe charged, with faithful hearts and irresistible arms, but these men of iron were soon broken by an artful flight and headlong pursuit. And the Janizaries, alone, without cavalry or missile weapons, were encompassed by the circle of the Mughal hunters. Their valor was at length oppressed by heat, thirst, and the weight of numbers. And the unfortunate sultan, afflicted with the gout in his hands and feet, was transported from the field on the fleetest of his horses. He was pursued and taken by the titular Khan of Zagatai. And, after his capture, and the defeat of the Ottoman powers, the kingdom of Anatolia submitted to the conqueror, who planted his standard at Kiotahia, and dispersed on all sides the ministers of rapine and destruction. Mirza Mihem Sultan, the eldest and best beloved of his grandsons, was dispatched to Bursa, with thirty thousand horse. And such was his youthful ardor, that he arrived with only four thousand at the gates of the capital, 
after performing in five days a march of 230 miles. Yet fear is still more rapid in its course. And Solomon, the son of Bajaze, had already passed over to Europe with the royal treasure. The spoil, however, of the palace and city was immense, the inhabitants had escaped, but the buildings, for the most part of wood, were reduced to ashes. From Bursa, the grandson of Timur advanced to Nice, ever yet a fair and flourishing city, and the Mughal squadrons were only stopped by the waves of the Propontis. The same success attended the other Mirzas and Emirs in their excursions. And Smyrna, defended by the zeal and courage of the Rhodian knights, alone deserved the presence of the emperor himself. After an obstinate defense, the place was taken by storm, all that breathed was put to the sword. And the heads of the Christian heroes were launched from the engines, on board of two carracks, or great ships of Europe, that rode at anchor in the harbor. The Moslems of Asia rejoiced in their deliverance from a dangerous and domestic foe. And a parallel was drawn between the two rivals, by observing that Timur, in fourteen days, had reduced a fortress which had sustained seven years the siege, or at least the blockade, of Bajazay. 7873. The iron cage in which Bajazay was imprisoned by Tamerlane, so long and so often repeated as a moral lesson, is now rejected as a fable by the modern writers, who smile at the vulgar credulity. 7874 They appeal with confidence to the Persian history of Sherfeddin Ali, which has been given to our curiosity in a French version, and from which I shall collect and abridge a more specious narrative of this memorable transaction. No sooner was Timur informed that the captive Ottoman was at the door of his tent, than he graciously stepped forwards to receive him, seated him by his side, and mingled with just reproaches a soothing pity for his rank and misfortune. Alas! said the emperor, the decree of fate is now accomplished by your own fault, it is the web which you have woven, the thorns of the tree which yourself have planted. I wish to spare, and even to assist, the champion of the Moslems. You braved our threats, you despised our friendship, you forced us to enter your kingdom with our invincible armies. Behold the event. Had you vanquished, I am not ignorant of the fate which you reserved for myself and my troops. But I disdain to retaliate, your life and honor are secure, and I shall express my gratitude to God by my clemency to man. The royal captive showed some signs of repentance, accepted the humiliation of a robe of honor, and embraced with tears his son Musa, who, at his request, was sought and found among the captives of the field. The Ottoman princes were lodged in a splendid pavilion, and the respect of the guards could be surpassed only by their vigilance. On the arrival of the harem from Bursa, Timur restored the Queen Despina and her daughter to their father and husband. But he piously required, that the Serbian princess, who had hitherto been indulged in the profession of Christianity, should embrace without delay the religion of the Prophet. In the Feast of Victory, to which Bajazay was invited, the Mughal emperor placed a crown on his head and a scepter in his hand, with a solemn assurance of restoring him with an increase of glory to the throne of his ancestors. But the effect of his promise was disappointed by the sultan's untimely death, amidst the care of the most skillful physicians, he expired of an apoplexy at Akshar, the Antioch of Pisidia, about nine months after his defeat. The victor dropped a tear over his grave, his body, with royal pomp, was conveyed to the mausoleum which he had erected at Bursa. And his son Musa, after receiving a rich present of gold and jewels, of horses and arms, was invested by a patent in red ink with the kingdom of Anatolia. Such is the portrait of a generous conqueror, which has been extracted from his own memorials, and dedicated to his son and grandson, nineteen years after his decease. 78-75 And, at a time when the truth was remembered by thousands, a manifest falsehood would have implied a satire on his real conduct. Weighty indeed is this evidence, adopted by all the Persian histories. 78-76 Yet flattery, more especially in the East, is base and audacious, and the harsh and ignominious treatment of Bajazay is attested by a chain of witnesses, some of whom shall be produced in the order of their time and country. 1. The reader has not forgot the garrison of French, whom the Marshal Boussicault left behind him for the defense of Constantinople. 
they were on the spot to receive the earliest and most faithful intelligence of the overthrow of their great adversary. And it is more than probable, that some of them accompanied the Greek embassy to the camp of Tamerlane. From their account, the hardships of the prison and death of Bajazay are affirmed by the martial servant and historian, within the distance of seven years. 78772. The name of Pagius the Italian 7878 is deservedly famous among the revivers of learning in the 15th century. His elegant dialogue on the vicissitudes of fortune 7879 was composed in his 50th year, 28 years after the Turkish victory of Tamerlane, 7880 whom he celebrates as not inferior to the illustrious barbarians of antiquity. Of his exploits and discipline Pagius was informed by several ocular witnesses. Nor does he forget an example so apposite to his theme as the Ottoman monarch, whom the Scythian confined like a wild beast in an iron cage, and exhibited a spectacle to Asia. I might add the authority of two Italian chronicles, perhaps of an earlier date, which would prove at least that the same story, whether false or true, was imported into Europe with the first tidings of the Revolution. 78813. At the time when Pagius flourished at Rome, Ahmed Ibn Arab Shah composed at Damascus the florid and malevolent history of Timur, for which he had collected materials in his journeys over Turkey in Tartary. 7882 Without any possible correspondence between the Latin and the Arabian writer, they agree in the fact of the iron cage, and their agreement is a striking proof of their common veracity. Ahmed Arab Shah likewise relates another outrage, which Bajazay endured, of a more domestic and tender nature. His indiscreet mention of women and divorces was deeply resented by the jealous Tartar, in the feast of victory the wine was served by female cupbearers, and the sultan beheld his own concubines and wives confounded among the slaves. And exposed without a veil to the eyes of intemperance. To escape a similar indignity, it is said that his successors, except in a single instance, have abstained from legitimate nuptials. And the Ottoman practice and belief, at least in the 16th century, is asserted by the observing Busbequius 7883 ambassador from the court of Vienna to the great Solomon. 4. Such is the separation of language, that the testimony of a Greek is not less independent than that of a Latin or an Arab. I suppress the names of Calcondiles and Ducas, who flourished in the latter period, and who speak in a less positive tone. But more attention is due to George Franza, 7884 Protovestiaire of the Last Emperors, and who was born a year before the Battle of Angora. Twenty-two years after that event, he was sent ambassador to Amurath II. And the historian might converse with some veteran Janissaries, who had been made prisoners with the Sultan, and had themselves seen him in his iron cage. 5. The last evidence, in every sense, is that of the Turkish annals, which have been consulted or transcribed by Lunclavius, Pocock, and Cantemir. 7885 They unanimously deplore the captivity of the Iron Cage. And some credit may be allowed to national historians, who cannot stigmatize the Tartar without uncovering the shame of their king and country. From these opposite premises, a fair and moderate conclusion may be deduced. I am satisfied that Sherfeddin Ali has faithfully described the first ostentatious interview, in which the conqueror, whose spirits were harmonized by success, affected the character of generosity. But his mind was insensibly alienated by the unseasonable arrogance of Bajazay, the complaints of his enemies, the Anatolian princes, were just and vehement, and Timur betrayed a design of leading his royal captive in triumph to Samarkand. An attempt to facilitate his escape, by digging a mine under the tent, provoked the Mughal emperor to impose a harsher restraint. And in his perpetual marches, an iron cage on a wagon might be invented, not as a wanton insult, but as a rigorous precaution. Timur had read in some fabulous history a similar treatment of one of his predecessors, a king of Persia. And Bajazay was condemned to represent the person, and expiate the guilt, of the Roman Caesar 7886-7887 but the strength of his mind and body fainted under the trial, and his premature death might, without injustice, be ascribed to the severity of Timur. He warred not with the dead, a tear and a sepulchre were all that he could bestow on a captive who was delivered from his power. And if Musa, the son of Bajazay, was permitted to reign over the ruins of Bursa, 
the greatest part of the province of Anatolia had been restored by the conqueror to their lawful sovereigns. From the Irtish and Volga to the Persian Gulf, and from the Ganges to Damascus and the archipelago, Asia was in the hand of Timur, his armies were invincible, his ambition was boundless. And his zeal might aspire to conquer and convert the Christian kingdoms of the West, which already trembled at his name. He touched the utmost verge of the land, but an insuperable, though narrow, sea rolled between the two continents of Europe and Asia, 7888 and the lord of so many Tomans, or myriads, of horse, was not master of a single galley. The two passages of the Bosphorus and Hellespont, of Constantinople and Gallipoli, were possessed, the one by the Christians, the other by the Turks. On this great occasion, they forgot the difference of religion, to act with union and firmness in the common cause, the double straits were guarded with ships and fortifications. And they separately withheld the transports which Timur demanded of either nation, under the pretense of attacking their enemy. At the same time, they soothed his pride with tributary gifts and suppliant embassies, and prudently tempted him to retreat with the honours of victory. Solomon, the son of Bajaze, implored his clemency for his father and himself. Accepted, by a red patent, the investiture of the kingdom of Romania, which he already held by the sword, and reiterated his ardent wish, of casting himself in person at the feet of the king of the world. The Greek emperor 7889, either John or Manuel, submitted to pay the same tribute which he had stipulated with the Turkish sultan, and ratified the treaty by an oath of allegiance. From which he could absolve his conscience so soon as the Mughal arms had retired from Anatolia. But the fears and fancy of nations ascribed to the ambitious Tamerlane a new design of vast and romantic compass. A design of subduing Egypt and Africa, marching from the Nile to the Atlantic Ocean, entering Europe by the Straits of Gibraltar, and, after imposing his yoke on the kingdoms of Christendom, of returning home by the deserts of Russia and Tartary. This remote, and perhaps imaginary, danger was averted by the submission of the Sultan of Egypt, the honours of the prayer and the coin attested at Cairo the supremacy of Timur. And a rare gift of a giraffe, or camelopard, and nine ostriches, represented at Samarkand the tribute of the African world. Our imagination is not less astonished by the portrait of a mogul, who, in his camp before Smyrna, meditates, and almost accomplishes, the invasion of the Chinese Empire. 7890 Timur was urged to this enterprise by national honour and religious seal. The torrents which he had shed of Mussulman blood could be expiated only by an equal destruction of the infidels. And as he now stood at the gates of paradise, he might best secure his glorious entrance by demolishing the idols of China, founding mosques in every city, and establishing the profession of faith in one God, and his prophet Muhammad. The recent expulsion of the House of Zingis was an insult on the Mughal name, and the disorders of the empire afforded the fairest opportunity for revenge. The illustrious Hongvu, founder of the dynasty of Ming, died four years before the Battle of Angora, and his grandson, a weak and unfortunate youth, was burnt in his palace, after a million of Chinese had perished in the civil war. 7891 Before he evacuated Anatolia, Timur dispatched beyond the Sihun a numerous army, or rather colony, of his old and new subjects, to open the road, to subdue the pagan Kalmucks and Mongols, and to found cities and magazines in the desert. And, by the diligence of his lieutenant, he soon received a perfect map and description of the unknown regions, from the source of the Irtish to the wall of China. During these preparations, the emperor achieved the final conquest of Georgia. Passed the winter on the banks of the Araxes, appeased the troubles of Persia, and slowly returned to his capital, after a campaign of four years and nine months. On the throne of Samarkand 7892 he displayed, in a short repose, his magnificence and power, listened to the complaints of the people, distributed a just measure of rewards and punishments. Employed his riches in the architecture of palaces and temples. And gave audience to the ambassadors of Egypt, Arabia, India, Tartary, Russia, and Spain, the last of whom presented a suit of tapestry which eclipsed the pencil of the Oriental artists. The marriage of six of the emperor's grandsons was esteemed an act of religion as well as of paternal tenderness, and the pomp of the ancient caliphs was revived in their nuptials. They were celebrated in the gardens of Canigal, 
decorated with innumerable tents and pavilions, which displayed the luxury of a great city and the spoils of a victorious camp. Whole forests were cut down to supply fuel for the kitchens. The plain was spread with pyramids of meat and vases of every liquor, to which thousands of guests were courteously invited, the orders of the state, and the nations of the earth, were marshalled at the royal banquet. Nor were the ambassadors of Europe, says the haughty Persian, excluded from the feast, since even the casas, the smallest of fish, find their place in the ocean. Point seventy eight ninety three. The public joy was testified by illuminations and masquerades. The trades of Samarkand passed in review, and every trade was emulous to execute some quaint device, some marvelous pageant, with the materials of their peculiar art. After the marriage contracts had been ratified by the cadhis, the bridegrooms, and their brides retired to the nuptial chambers, nine times, according to the Asiatic fashion, they were dressed and undressed. And at each change of apparel, pearls and rubies were showered on their heads, and contemptuously abandoned to their attendants. A general indulgence was proclaimed, every law was relaxed, every pleasure was allowed. The people was free, the sovereign was idle, and the historian of Timur may remark, that, after devoting fifty years to the attainment of empire, the only happy period of his life were the two months in which he ceased to exercise his power. But he was soon awakened to the cares of government and war. The standard was unfurled for the invasion of China, the emirs made their report of two hundred thousand, the select and veteran soldiers of Iran and Turan, their baggage and provisions were transported by five hundred great wagons. And an immense train of horses and camels. And the troops might prepare for a long absence, since more than six months were employed in the tranquil journey of a caravan from Samarkand to Pekin. Neither age, nor the severity of the winter, could retard the impatience of Timur. He mounted on horseback, passed the Sihun on the ice, marched seventy-six parasangs, three hundred miles, from his capital, and pitched his last camp in the neighborhood of Otra, where he was expected by the angel of death. Fatigue, and the indiscreet use of iced water, accelerated the progress of his fever, and the conqueror of Asia expired in the seventieth year of his age, thirty-five years after he had ascended the throne of Zagatai. His designs were lost. His armies were disbanded, China was saved, and fourteen years after his decease, the most powerful of his children sent an embassy of friendship and commerce to the court of Pekin. 7894. The fame of Timur has pervaded the East and West, his posterity is still invested with the imperial title. And the admiration of his subjects, who revered him almost as a deity, may be justified in some degree by the praise or confession of his bitterest enemies. 7895 Although he was lame of a hand and foot, his form and stature were not unworthy of his rank, and his vigorous health, so essential to himself and to the world, was corroborated by temperance and exercise. In his familiar discourse he was grave and modest, and if he was ignorant of the Arabic language, he spoke with fluency and elegance the Persian and Turkish idioms. It was his delight to converse with the learned on topics of history and science. And the amusement of his leisure hours was the game of chess, which he improved or corrupted with new refinements. 7896 In his religion he was a zealous, though not perhaps an orthodox, Muslim. 7897 But his sound understanding may tempt us to believe that a superstitious reverence for omens and prophecies, for saints and astrologers, was only affected as an instrument of policy. In the government of a vast empire, he stood alone and absolute without a rebel to oppose his power, a favorite to seduce his affections, or a minister to mislead his judgment. It was his firmest maxim, that whatever might be the consequence, the word of the prince should never be disputed or recalled. But his foes have maliciously observed, that the commands of anger and destruction were more strictly executed than those of beneficence and favor. His sons and grandsons, of whom Timur left six and thirty at his decease, were his first and most submissive subjects. And whenever they deviated from their duty, they were corrected, according to the laws of Zingis, with the bastinade, and afterwards restored to honor and command. Perhaps his heart was not devoid of the social virtues. Perhaps he was not incapable of loving his friends and pardoning his enemies, but the rules of morality are founded on the public interest.
and it may be sufficient to applaud the wisdom of a monarch, for the liberality by which he is not impoverished, and for the justice by which he is strengthened and enriched. To maintain the harmony of authority in obedience, to chastise the proud, to protect the weak, to reward the deserving, to banish vice and idleness from his dominions, to secure the traveller and merchant. To restrain the depredations of the soldier, to cherish the labours of the husbandman, to encourage industry and learning, and, by an equal and moderate assessment, to increase the revenue, without increasing the taxes. Are indeed the duties of a prince. But, in the discharge of these duties, he finds an ample and immediate recompense. Timur might boast, that, at his accession to the throne, Asia was the prey of anarchy and rapine, whilst under his prosperous monarchy a child, fearless and unhurt, might carry a purse of gold from the east to the west. Such was his confidence of merit, that from this reformation he derived an excuse for his victories, and a title to universal dominion. The four following observations will serve to appreciate his claim to the public gratitude. And perhaps we shall conclude, that the Mughal emperor was rather the scourge than the benefactor of mankind. 1. If some partial disorders, some local oppressions, were healed by the sword of Timur, the remedy was far more pernicious than the disease. By their rapine, cruelty, and discord, the petty tyrants of Persia might afflict their subjects. But whole nations were crushed under the footsteps of the reformer. The ground which had been occupied by flourishing cities was often marked by his abominable trophies, by columns, or pyramids, of human heads. Astrakhan, Khorizm, Delhi, Ispahan, Baghdad, Aleppo, Damascus, Bursa, Smyrna, and a thousand others, were sacked, or burnt, or utterly destroyed, in his presence, and by his troops, and perhaps his conscience would have been startled. If a priest or philosopher had dared to number the millions of victims whom he had sacrificed to the establishment of peace and order. 7898 2. His most destructive wars were rather inroads than conquests. He invaded Turkestan, Kipzak, Russia, Hindustan, Syria, Anatolia, Armenia, and Georgia, without a hope or a desire of preserving those distant provinces. From thence he departed laden with spoil but he left behind him neither troops to awe the contumacious, nor magistrates to protect the obedient, natives. When he had broken the fabric of their ancient government, he abandoned them to the evils which his invasion had aggravated or caused, nor were these evils compensated by any present or possible benefits. 3. The kingdoms of Transoxiana and Persia were the proper field which he labored to cultivate and adorn, as the perpetual inheritance of his family. But his peaceful labors were often interrupted, and sometimes blasted, by the absence of the conqueror. While he triumphed on the Volga or the Ganges, his servants, and even his sons, forgot their master and their duty. The public and private injuries were poorly redressed by the tardy rigor of inquiry and punishment. And we must be content to praise the institutions of Timur, as the specious idea of a perfect monarchy. For, Whatsoever might be the blessings of his administration, they evaporated with his life. To reign, rather than to govern, was the ambition of his children and grandchildren, 7899 the enemies of each other and of the people. A fragment of the empire was upheld with some glory by Sharok, his youngest son. But after his decease, the scene was again involved in darkness and blood, and before the end of a century, Transoxiana and Persia were trampled by the Uzbeks from the north, and the Turkmens of the black and white sheep. The race of Timur would have been extinct, if a hero, his descendant in the fifth degree, had not fled before the Uzbek arms to the conquest of Hindustan. His successors, the great Mughal 7900, extended their sway from the mountains of Kashmir to Cape Comorin, and from Kandahar to the Gulf of Bengal. Since the reign of Aurangzeb, their empire had been dissolved. Their treasures of Delhi have been rifled by a Persian robber, and the richest of their kingdoms is now possessed by a company of Christian merchants, of a remote island in the northern ocean. Far different was the fate of the Ottoman monarchy. The massy trunk was bent to the ground, but no sooner did the hurricane pass away, than it again rose with fresh vigor and more lively vegetation. When Timur, in every sense, had evacuated Anatolia, 
he left the cities without a palace, a treasure, or a king. The open country was overspread with hordes of shepherds and robbers of Tartar or Turkmen origin. The recent conquests of Bajazay were restored to the emirs, one of whom, in base revenge, demolished his sepulchre, and his five sons were eager, by civil discord, to consume the remnant of their patrimony. I shall enumerate their names in the order of their age and actions.79011. It is doubtful whether I relate the story of the true Mustafa, or of an impostor who personated that lost prince. He fought by his father's side in the Battle of Angora, but when the captive sultan was permitted to inquire for his children, Musa alone could be found. And the Turkish historians, the slaves of the triumphant faction, are persuaded that his brother was confounded among the slain. If Mustafa escaped from that disastrous field, he was concealed twelve years from his friends and enemies. Till he emerged in Thessaly, and was hailed by a numerous party, as the son and successor of Bajazay. His first defeat would have been his last, had not the true, or false, Mustafa been saved by the Greeks, and restored, after the decease of his brother Muhammad, to liberty and empire. A degenerate mind seemed to argue his spurious birth. And if, on the throne of Adrianople, he was adored as the Ottoman Sultan, his flight, his fetters, and an ignominious gibbet, delivered the impostor to popular contempt. A similar character and claim was asserted by several rival pretenders, thirty persons are said to have suffered under the name of Mustafa. And these frequent executions may perhaps insinuate, that the Turkish court was not perfectly secure of the death of the lawful prince. 2. After his father's captivity, ISA 7902 reigned for some time in the neighborhood of Angora, Sinope, and the Black Sea, and his ambassadors were dismissed from the presence of Timur with fair promises and honorable gifts. But their master was soon deprived of his province and life, by a jealous brother, the sovereign of Amasia, and the final event suggested a pious illusion, that the law of Moses and Jesus, of ISA and Musa, had been abrogated by the greater Muhammad. 3. Solomon is not numbered in the list of the Turkish emperors, yet he checked the victorious progress of the Mughals, and after their departure, united for a while the thrones of Adrianople and Bursa. In war he was brave, active, and fortunate. His courage was softened by clemency, but it was likewise inflamed by presumption, and corrupted by intemperance and idleness. He relaxed the nerves of discipline, in a government where either the subject or the sovereign must continually tremble, his vices alienated the chiefs of the army and the law. And his daily drunkenness, so contemptible in a prince and a man, was doubly odious in a disciple of the Prophet. In the slumber of intoxication he was surprised by his brother Musa. And as he fled from Adrianople towards the Byzantine capital, Solomon was overtaken and slain in a bath, 7903 after a reign of seven years and ten months. 4. The investiture of Musa degraded him as the slave of the Mughals, his tributary kingdom of Anatolia was confined within a narrow limit. Nor could his broken militia and empty treasury contend with the hardy and veteran bands of the sovereign of Romania. Musa fled in disguise from the palace of Bursa, traversed the Propontis in an open boat, wandered over the Wallachian and Servian hills, and after some vain attempts ascended the throne of Adrianople, so recently stained with the blood of Solomon. In a reign of three years and a half, his troops were victorious against the Christians of Hungary and the Moria, but Musa was ruined by his timorous disposition and unseasonable clemency. After resigning the sovereignty of Anatolia, he fell a victim to the perfidy of his ministers, and the superior ascendant of his brother Muhammad. 5. The final victory of Muhammad was the just recompense of his prudence and moderation. Before his father's captivity, the royal youth had been entrusted with the government of Amasia, thirty days' journey from Constantinople, and the Turkish frontier against the Christians of Trebizond in Georgia. The castle, in Asiatic warfare, was esteemed impregnable, and the city of Amasia 7904 which is equally divided by the river Iris, rises on either side in the form of an amphitheater, and represents on a smaller scale the image of Baghdad. In his rapid career, Timur appears to have overlooked this obscure and contumacious angle of Anatolia. And Muhammad, without provoking the conqueror, maintained his silent independence, 
and chased from the province the last stragglers of the Tartar host. 7905 He relieved himself from the dangerous neighborhood of ISA. But in the contests of their more powerful brethren, his firm neutrality was respected, till, after the triumph of Musa, he stood forth the heir and avenger of the unfortunate Solomon. Muhammad obtained Anatolia by treaty, and Romania by arms. And the soldier who presented him with the head of Musa was rewarded as the benefactor of his king and country. The eight years of his soul and peaceful reign were usefully employed in banishing the vices of civil discord, and restoring on a firmer basis the fabric of the Ottoman monarchy. His last care was the choice of two viziers, Bajazay and Ibrahim 7906 who might guide the youth of his son Amurath. And such was their union and prudence, that they concealed above forty days the emperor's death, till the arrival of his successor in the palace of Bursa. A new war was kindled in Europe by the prince, or impostor, Mustafa. The first vizier lost his army in his head, but the more fortunate Ibrahim, whose name and family are still revered, extinguished the last pretender to the throne of Bajazay, and closed the scene of domestic hostility. In these conflicts, the wisest Turks, and indeed the body of the nation, were strongly attached to the unity of the empire. And Romania and Anatolia, so often torn asunder by private ambition, were animated by a strong and invincible tendency of cohesion. Their efforts might have instructed the Christian powers. And had they occupied, with a confederate fleet, the Straits of Gallipoli, the Ottomans, at least in Europe, must have been speedily annihilated. But the schism of the West, and the factions and wars of France and England, diverted the Latins from this generous enterprise, they enjoyed the present respite, without a thought of futurity. And were often tempted by a momentary interest to serve the common enemy of their religion. A colony of Genoese 7907 which had been planted at Phocia 7908 on the Ionian coast, was enriched by the lucrative monopoly of Alum. 7909 and their tranquillity, under the Turkish Empire, was secured by the annual payment of tribute. In the last civil war of the Ottomans, the Genoese governor, Adorno, a bold and ambitious youth, embraced the party of Amurath. And undertook, with seven stout galleys, to transport him from Asia to Europe. The Sultan and five hundred guards embarked on board the Admiral's ship, which was manned by eight hundred of the bravest Franks. His life and liberty were in their hands nor can we, without reluctance, applaud the fidelity of Adorno, who, in the midst of the passage, knelt before him, and gratefully accepted a discharge of his arrears of tribute. They landed in sight of Mustafa and Gallipoli, two thousand Italians, armed with lances and battle-axes, attended Amurath to the conquest of Adrianople, and this venal service was soon repaid by the ruin of the commerce and colony of Phocia. If Timur had generously marched at the request, and to the relief, of the Greek emperor, he might be entitled to the praise and gratitude of the Christians. 7910 But a Muslim, who carried into Georgia the sword of persecution, and respected the holy warfare of Bajazay, was not disposed to pity or succor the idolaters of Europe. The Tartar followed the impulse of ambition. And the deliverance of Constantinople was the accidental consequence. When Manuel abdicated the government, it was his prayer, rather than his hope, that the ruin of the church and state might be delayed beyond his unhappy days. And after his return from a western pilgrimage, he expected every hour the news of the sad catastrophe. On a sudden, he was astonished and rejoiced by the intelligence of the retreat, the overthrow, and the captivity of the Ottoman. Manuel 7911 immediately sailed from Moden in the Moria, ascended the throne of Constantinople, and dismissed his blind competitor to an easy exile in the Isle of Lesbos. The ambassadors of the son of Bajazay were soon introduced to his presence. But their pride was fallen, their tone was modest, they were awed by the just apprehension, lest the Greeks should open to the Mughals the gates of Europe. Solomon saluted the emperor by the name of father. Solicited at his hands the government or gift of Romania, and promised to deserve his favor by inviolable friendship, and the restitution of Thessalonica, with the most important places along the Strymon, the Propontis, and the Black Sea. The alliance of Solomon exposed the emperor to the enmity and revenge of Musa, the Turks appeared in arms before the gates of Constantinople, but they were repulsed by sea and land. 
And unless the city was guarded by some foreign mercenaries, the Greeks must have wondered at their own triumph. But, instead of prolonging the division of the Ottoman powers, the policy or passion of Manuel was tempted to assist the most formidable of the sons of Bajazay. He concluded a treaty with Muhammad, whose progress was checked by the insuperable barrier of Gallipoli, the Sultan and his troops were transported over the Bosphorus, he was hospitably entertained in the capital. And his successful sally was the first step to the conquest of Romania. The ruin was suspended by the prudence and moderation of the conqueror, he faithfully discharged his own obligations and those of Solomon, respected the laws of gratitude and peace. And left the emperor guardian of his two younger sons, in the vain hope of saving them from the jealous cruelty of their brother Amurath. But the execution of his last testament would have offended the national honor and religion. And the divan unanimously pronounced, that the royal youths should never be abandoned to the custody and education of a Christian dog. On this refusal, the Byzantine councils were divided. But the age and caution of Manuel yielded to the presumption of his son John. And they unsheathed a dangerous weapon of revenge, by dismissing the true or false Mustafa, who had long been detained as a captive and hostage, and for whose maintenance they received an annual pension of 300,000 aspers. 79-12 At the door of his prison, Mustafa subscribed to every proposal, and the keys of Gallipoli, or rather of Europe, were stipulated as the price of his deliverance. But no sooner was he seated on the throne of Romania, than he dismissed the Greek ambassadors with a smile of contempt, declaring, in a pious tone, that, at the day of judgment, he would rather answer for the violation of an oath, than for the surrender of a Muslim city into the hands of the infidels. The emperor was at once the enemy of the two rivals, from whom he had sustained, and to whom he had offered, an injury, and the victory of Amurath was followed, in the ensuing spring, by the siege of Constantinople. 7913 The religious merit of subduing the city of the Caesars attracted from Asia a crowd of volunteers, who aspired to the crown of martyrdom, their military ardor was inflamed by the promise of rich spoils and beautiful females. And the Sultan's ambition was consecrated by the presence and prediction of Said Beecher, a descendant of the Prophet 7914 who arrived in the camp, on a mule, with a venerable train of five hundred disciples. But he might blush, if a fanatic could blush, at the failure of his assurances. The strength of the walls resisted an army of two hundred thousand Turks, their assaults were repelled by the sallies of the Greeks and their foreign mercenaries. The old resources of defense were opposed to the new engines of attack. And the enthusiasm of the dervis, who was snatched to heaven in visionary converse with Muhammad, was answered by the credulity of the Christians, who beheld the Virgin Mary, in a violet garment, walking on the rampart and animating their courage. 7915 After a siege of two months, Amurath was recalled to Bursa by a domestic revolt, which had been kindled by Greek treachery, and was soon extinguished by the death of a guiltless brother. While he led his Janissaries to new conquests in Europe and Asia, the Byzantine Empire was indulged in a servile and precarious respite of thirty years. Manuel sank into the grave. And John Paleologus was permitted to reign, for an annual tribute of three hundred thousand aspers, and the dereliction of almost all that he held beyond the suburbs of Constantinople. In the establishment and restoration of the Turkish Empire, the first merit must doubtless be assigned to the personal qualities of the sultans, since, in human life, the most important scenes will depend on the character of a single actor. By some shades of wisdom and virtue, they may be discriminated from each other. But, except in a single instance, a period of nine reigns, and 265 years, is occupied, from the elevation of Othman to the death of Solomon, by a rare series of warlike and active princes, who impressed their subjects with obedience and their enemies with terror. Instead of the slothful luxury of the Siralio, the heirs of royalty were educated in the council and the field, from early youth they were entrusted by their fathers with the command of provinces and armies. And this manly institution, which was often productive of civil war, must have essentially contributed to the discipline and vigor of the monarchy. The Ottomans cannot style themselves, like the Arabian caliphs, the descendants or successors of the Apostle of God. 
and the kindred which they claim with the Tartar Khans of the House of Zingis appears to be founded in flattery rather than in truth. 7916 Their origin is obscure. But their sacred and indefeasible right, which no time can erase, and no violence can infringe, was soon and unalterably implanted in the minds of their subjects. A weak or vicious sultan may be deposed and strangled. But his inheritance devolves to an infant or an idiot nor has the most daring rebel presumed to ascend the throne of his lawful sovereign. 7917. While the transient dynasties of Asia have been continually subverted by a crafty vizier in the palace, or a victorious general in the camp, the Ottoman succession has been confirmed by the practice of five centuries. And is now incorporated with the vital principle of the Turkish nation. To the spirit and constitution of that nation, a strong and singular influence may, however, be ascribed. The primitive subjects of Othman were the four hundred families of wandering Turkmens, who had followed his ancestors from the Oxus to the Sangar, and the plains of Anatolia are still covered with the white and black tents of their rustic brethren. But this original drop was dissolved in the mass of voluntary and vanquished subjects, who, under the name of Turks, are united by the common ties of religion, language, and manners. In the cities, from Erzurum to Belgrade, that national appellation is common to all the Moslems, the first and most honorable inhabitants. But they have abandoned, at least in Romania, the villages, and the cultivation of the land, to the Christian peasants. In the vigorous age of the Ottoman government, the Turks were themselves excluded from all civil and military honors. And a servile class, an artificial people, was raised by the discipline of education to obey, to conquer, and to command. 7918 From the time of Orkin and the first Amurath, the sultans were persuaded that a government of the sword must be renewed in each generation with new soldiers. And that such soldiers must be sought, not in effeminate Asia, but among the hardy and warlike natives of Europe. The provinces of Thrace, Macedonia, Albania, Bulgaria, and Serbia, became the perpetual seminary of the Turkish army. And when the royal fifth of the captives was diminished by conquest, an inhuman tax of the fifth child, or of every fifth year, was rigorously levied on the Christian families. At the age of twelve or fourteen years, the most robust youths were torn from their parents, their names were enrolled in a book, and from that moment they were clothed, taught, and maintained, for the public service. According to the promise of their appearance, they were selected for the royal schools of Bursa, Pera, and Adrianople, entrusted to the care of the Bashas, or dispersed in the houses of the Anatolian peasantry. It was the first care of their masters to instruct them in the Turkish language, their bodies were exercised by every labor that could fortify their strength. They learned to wrestle, to leap, to run, to shoot with the bow, and afterwards with the musket, till they were drafted into the chambers and companies of the Janissaries, and severely trained in the military or monastic discipline of the order. The youths most conspicuous for birth, talents, and beauty, were admitted into the inferior class of Aegeomoglans, or the more liberal rank of Ikiglans, of whom the former were attached to the palace, and the latter to the person, of the prince. In four successive schools, under the rod of the white eunuchs, the arts of horsemanship and of darting the javelin were their daily exercise, while those of a more studious caste applied themselves to the study of the Quran. And the knowledge of the Arabic and Persian tongues. As they advanced in seniority and merit, they were gradually dismissed to military, civil, and even ecclesiastical employments, the longer their stay, the higher was their expectation. Till, at a mature period, they were admitted into the number of the forty Agas, who stood before the Sultan, and were promoted by his choice to the government of provinces and the first honours of the empire. 7919 Such a mode of institution was admirably adapted to the form and spirit of a despotic monarchy. The ministers and generals were, in the strictest sense, the slaves of the emperor, to whose bounty they were indebted for their instruction and support. When they left the Siralio, and suffered their beards to grow as the symbol of enfranchisement, they found themselves in an important office, without faction or friendship, without parents and without heirs. Dependent on the hand which had raised them from the dust, and which, on the slightest displeasure, could break in pieces these statues of glass, as they were aptly termed by the Turkish proverb. 
7920 in the slow and painful steps of education, their characters and talents were unfolded to a discerning eye, the man, naked and alone, was reduced to the standard of his personal merit. And, if the sovereign had wisdom to choose, he possessed a pure and boundless liberty of choice. The Ottoman candidates were trained by the virtues of abstinence to those of action, by the habits of submission to those of command. A similar spirit was diffused among the troops, and their silence and sobriety, their patience and modesty, have extorted the reluctant praise of their Christian enemies. 7921 Nor can the victory appear doubtful, if we compare the discipline and exercise of the Janissaries with the pride of birth, the independence of chivalry, the ignorance of the new levies, the mutinous temper of the veterans, and the vices of intemperance and disorder, which so long contaminated the armies of Europe. The only hope of salvation for the Greek Empire, and the adjacent kingdoms, would have been some more powerful weapon, some discovery in the art of war, that would give them a decisive superiority over their Turkish foes. Such a weapon was in their hands, such a discovery had been made in the critical moment of their fate. The chemists of China or Europe had found, by casual or elaborate experiments, that a mixture of saltpetri, sulfur, and charcoal, produces, with a spark of fire, a tremendous explosion. It was soon observed, that if the expansive force were compressed in a strong tube, a ball of stone or iron might be expelled with irresistible and destructive velocity. The precise era of the invention and application of gunpowder 7922 is involved in doubtful traditions and equivocal language, yet we may clearly discern, that it was known before the middle of the 14th century. And that before the end of the same, the use of artillery in battles and sieges, by sea and land, was familiar to the states of Germany, Italy, Spain, France, and England. 7923 The priority of nations is of small account. None could derive any exclusive benefit from their previous or superior knowledge, and in the common improvement, they stood on the same level of relative power and military science. Nor was it possible to circumscribe the secret within the pale of the Church, it was disclosed to the Turks by the treachery of apostates and the selfish policy of rivals. And the sultans had sense to adopt, and wealth to reward, the talents of a Christian engineer. The Genoese, who transported Amurath into Europe, must be accused as his preceptors. And it was probably by their hands that his cannon was cast and directed at the siege of Constantinople. 7924 The first attempt was indeed unsuccessful. But in the general warfare of the age, the advantage was on their side, who were most commonly the assailants, for a while the proportion of the attack and defense was suspended. And this thundering artillery was pointed against the walls and towers which had been erected only to resist the less potent engines of antiquity. By the Venetians, the use of gunpowder was communicated without reproach to the sultans of Egypt and Persia, their allies against the Ottoman power, the secret was soon propagated to the extremities of Asia. And the advantage of the European was confined to his easy victories over the savages of the New World. If we contrast the rapid progress of this mischievous discovery with the slow and laborious advances of reason, science, and the arts of peace, a philosopher, according to his temper, will laugh or weep at the folly of mankind. LXV, Union of the Greek and Latin Churches Applications of the Eastern Emperors to the Pope's the Visits to the West, of John I, Manuel, and John II, Paleologus Union of the Greek and Latin Churches, promoted by the Council of Basel, and concluded at Ferrara and Florence. State of literature at Constantinople. Its revival in Italy by the Greek fugitives. Curiosity in emulation of the Latins. In the four last centuries of the Greek emperors, their friendly or hostile aspect towards the Pope and the Latins may be observed as the thermometer of their prosperity or distress, as the scale of the rise and fall of the barbarian dynasties. When the Turks of the House of Seljuk pervaded Asia, and threatened Constantinople, we have seen, at the Council of Placentia, the suppliant ambassadors of Alexius imploring the protection of the common father of the Christians. No sooner had the arms of the French pilgrims removed the Sultan from Nice to Iconium, than the Greek princes resumed, or avowed, their genuine hatred and contempt for the schismatics of the West. Which precipitated the first downfall of their empire. 
The date of the Mughal invasion is marked in the soft and charitable language of John Vathases. After the recovery of Constantinople, the throne of the first Paleologus was encompassed by foreign and domestic enemies. As long as the sword of Charles was suspended over his head, he basely courted the favor of the Roman pontiff, and sacrificed to the present danger his faith, his virtue, and the affection of his subjects. On the decease of Michael, the prince and people asserted the independence of their church, and the purity of their creed, the elder Andronicus neither feared nor loved the Latins, in his last distress, pride was the safeguard of superstition. Nor could he decently retract in his age the firm and orthodox declarations of his youth. His grandson, the younger Andronicus, was less a slave in his temper and situation. And the conquest of Bithynia by the Turks admonished him to seek a temporal and spiritual alliance with the Western princes. After a separation and silence of fifty years, a secret agent, the monk Barlam, was dispatched to Pope Benedict XII, and his artful instructions appear to have been drawn by the master hand of the great domestic. 7925, Most Holy Father, was he commissioned to say, The Emperor is not less desirous than yourself of a union between the two churches but in this delicate transaction, he is obliged to respect his own dignity and the prejudices of his subjects. The ways of union are twofold, force and persuasion. Of force, the inefficacy has been already tried, since the Latins have subdued the empire, without subduing the minds, of the Greeks. The method of persuasion, though slow, is sure and permanent. A deputation of thirty or forty of our doctors would probably agree with those of the Vatican, in the love of truth and the unity of belief, but on their return, what would be the use, the recompense, of such an agreement? The scorn of their brethren, and the reproaches of a blind and obstinate nation. Yet that nation is accustomed to reverence the general councils, which have fixed the articles of our faith. And if they reprobate the decrees of lions, it is because the eastern churches were neither heard nor represented in that arbitrary meeting. For this salutary end, it will be expedient, and even necessary, that a well-chosen legate should be sent into Greece, to convene the patriarchs of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. And, with their aid, to prepare a free and universal synod. But at this moment, continued the subtle agent, the empire is assaulted and endangered by the Turks, who have occupied four of the greatest cities of Anatolia. The Christian inhabitants have expressed a wish of returning to their allegiance and religion. But the forces and revenues of the emperor are insufficient for their deliverance, and the Roman legate must be accompanied, or preceded, by an army of Franks, to expel the infidels, and open a way to the holy sepulchre. If the suspicious Latins should require some pledge, some previous effect of the sincerity of the Greeks, the answers of Barlam were perspicuous and rational. 1. A general synod can alone consummate the union of the churches. Nor can such a synod be held till the three oriental patriarchs, and a great number of bishops, are enfranchised from the Mahometan yoke. 2. The Greeks are alienated by a long series of oppression and injury, they must be reconciled by some act of brotherly love, some effectual succor, which may fortify the authority and arguments of the emperor, and the friends of the union. 3. If some difference of faith or ceremonies should be found incurable, the Greeks, however, are the disciples of Christ, and the Turks are the common enemies of the Christian name. The Armenians, Cyprians, and Rhodians, are equally attacked. And it will become the piety of the French princes to draw their swords in the general defense of religion. 4. Should the subjects of Andronicus be treated as the worst of schismatics, of heretics, of pagans, a judicious policy may yet instruct the powers of the West to embrace a useful ally, to uphold a sinking empire, to guard the confines of Europe. And rather to join the Greeks against the Turks, than to expect the union of the Turkish arms with the troops and treasures of captive Greece. The reasons, the offers, and the demands, of Andronicus were eluded with cold and stately indifference. The kings of France and Naples declined the dangers and glory of a crusade, the Pope refused to call a new synod to determine old articles of faith. 
and his regard for the obsolete claims of the Latin emperor and clergy engaged him to use an offensive superscription, to the moderator 7926 of the Greeks, and the persons who style themselves the patriarchs of the Eastern churches. For such an embassy, a time and character less propitious could not easily have been found. Benedict XII 7927 was a dull peasant, perplexed with scruples, and immersed in sloth and wine, his pride might enrich with a third crown the papal tiara, but he was alike unfit for the regal and the pastoral office. After the decease of Andronicus, while the Greeks were distracted by intestine war, they could not presume to agitate a general union of the Christians. But as soon as Cantacuzene had subdued and pardoned his enemies, he was anxious to justify, or at least to extenuate, the introduction of the Turks into Europe, and the nuptials of his daughter with a Mussulman prince. Two officers of state, with a Latin interpreter, were sent in his name to the Roman court, which was transplanted to Avignon, on the banks of the Rhone. During a period of seventy years, they represented the hard necessity which had urged him to embrace the alliance of the miscreants, and pronounced by his command the specious and edifying sounds of union and crusade. Pope Clement VI, 7928 the successor of Benedict, received them with hospitality and honor, acknowledged the innocence of their sovereign, excused his distress, applauded his magnanimity, and displayed a clear knowledge of the state and revolutions of the Greek Empire, which he had imbibed from the honest accounts of a Savoyard lady, an attendant of the Empress Anne. 7929 If Clement was ill endowed with the virtues of a priest, he possessed, however, the spirit and magnificence of a prince, whose liberal hand distributed benefices and kingdoms with equal facility. Under his reign Avignon was the seat of pomp and pleasure, in his youth he had surpassed the licentiousness of a baron, and the palace, nay, the bedchamber of the Pope, was adorned, or polluted, by the visits of his female favorites. The wars of France and England were adverse to the holy enterprise, but his vanity was amused by the splendid idea, and the Greek ambassadors returned with two Latin bishops, the ministers of the pontiff. On their arrival at Constantinople, the emperor and the nuncios admired each other's piety and eloquence, and their frequent conferences were filled with mutual praises and promises, by which both parties were amused, and neither could be deceived. I am delighted, said the devout Cantacuzene, with the project of our holy war, which must redound to my personal glory, as well as to the public benefit of Christendom. My dominions will give a free passage to the armies of France, my troops, my galleys, my treasures, shall be consecrated to the common cause, and happy would be my fate, could I deserve and obtain the crown of martyrdom. Words are insufficient to express the ardor with which I sigh for the reunion of the scattered members of Christ. If my death could avail, I would gladly present my sword and my neck, if the spiritual phoenix could arise from my ashes, I would erect the pile, and kindle the flame with my own hands. Yet the Greek emperor presumed to observe, that the articles of faith which divided the two churches had been introduced by the pride and precipitation of the Latins, he disclaimed the servile and arbitrary steps of the first Paleologus, and firmly declared, that he would never submit his conscience unless to the decrees of a free and universal synod. The situation of the times, continued he, will not allow the Pope and myself to meet either at Rome or Constantinople. But some maritime city may be chosen on the verge of the two empires, to unite the bishops, and to instruct the faithful, of the East and West. The nuncios seemed content with the proposition. And Cantacuzene affects to deplore the failure of his hopes, which were soon overthrown by the death of Clement, and the different temper of his successor. His own life was prolonged, but it was prolonged in a cloister. And, except by his prayers, the humble monk was incapable of directing the counsels of his pupil or the state. 7930. Yet of all the Byzantine princes, that pupil, John Paleologus, was the best disposed to embrace, to believe, and to obey, the shepherd of the West. His mother, Anne of Savoy, was baptized in the bosom of the Latin Church, her marriage with Andronicus imposed a change of name, of apparel, and of worship. But her heart was still faithful to her country and religion, she had formed the infancy of her son, and she governed the emperor, after his mind, or at least his stature, was enlarged to the size of man. In the first year of his deliverance and restoration, the Turks were still masters of the Hellespont, 
the son of Cantacuzene was in arms at Adrianople, and Paleologus could depend neither on himself nor on his people. By his mother's advice, and in the hope of foreign aid, he abjured the rights both of the church and state, and the Act of Slavery 7931 subscribed in purple ink and sealed with the golden bull, was privately entrusted to an Italian agent. The first article of the treaty is an oath of fidelity and obedience to Innocent VI and his successors, the supreme pontiffs of the Roman and Catholic Church. The emperor promises to entertain with due reverence their legates and nuncios. To assign a palace for their residence, and a temple for their worship, and to deliver his second son Manuel as the hostage of his faith. For these condescensions he requires a prompt succor of fifteen galleys, with five hundred men at arms, and a thousand archers, to serve against his Christian and Mussulman enemies. Paleologus engages to impose on his clergy and people the same spiritual yoke, but as the resistance of the Greeks might be justly foreseen, he adopts the two effectual methods of corruption and education. The legate was empowered to distribute the vacant benefices among the ecclesiastics who should subscribe the Creed of the Vatican, three schools were instituted to instruct the youth of Constantinople in the language and doctrine of the Latins. And the name of Andronicus, the heir of the empire, was enrolled as the first student. Should he fail in the measures of persuasion or force, Paleologus declares himself unworthy to reign, transferred to the Pope all regal and paternal authority and invests Innocent with full power to regulate the family, the government, and the marriage, of his son and successor. But this treaty was neither executed or published, the Roman galleys were as vain and imaginary as the submission of the Greeks, and it was only by the secrecy that their sovereign escaped the dishonor of this fruitless humiliation. The tempest of the Turkish arms soon burst on his head, and after the loss of Adrianople and Romania, he was enclosed in his capital, the vassal of the haughty Amurath, with the miserable hope of being the last devoured by the savage. In this abject state, Paleologus embraced the resolution of embarking for Venice, and casting himself at the feet of the Pope, he was the first of the Byzantine princes who had ever visited the unknown regions of the West. Yet in them alone he could seek consolation or relief. And with less violation of his dignity he might appear in the sacred college than at the Ottoman port. After a long absence, the Roman pontiffs were returning from Avignon to the banks of the Tiber, Urban V, 7932 of a mild and virtuous character, encouraged or allowed the pilgrimage of the Greek prince. And, within the same year, enjoyed the glory of receiving in the Vatican the two imperial shadows who represented the majesty of Constantine and Charlemagne. In this suppliant visit, the Emperor of Constantinople, whose vanity was lost in his distress, gave more than could be expected of empty sounds and formal submissions. A previous trial was imposed. And, in the presence of four cardinals, he acknowledged, as a true Catholic, the supremacy of the Pope, and the double procession of the Holy Ghost. After this purification, he was introduced to a public audience in the Church of Esti. Peter, Urban, in the midst of the cardinals, was seated on his throne. The Greek monarch, after three genuflections, devoutly kissed the feet, the hands, and at length the mouth, of the Holy Father, who celebrated high mass in his presence, allowed him to lead the bridle of his mule, and treated him with a sumptuous banquet in the Vatican. The entertainment of Paleologus was friendly and honorable, yet some difference was observed between the emperors of the East and West, 7933 nor could the former be entitled to the rare privilege of chanting the gospel in the rank of a deacon. 7934 in favor of his proselyte, Bourbon strove to rekindle the zeal of the French king and the other powers of the West, but he found them cold in the general cause, and active only in their domestic quarrels. The last hope of the emperor was in an English mercenary, John Hawkwood, 7935 or Akuto, who, with a band of adventurers, the White Brotherhood, had ravaged Italy from the Alps to Calabria, sold his services to the hostile states, and incurred a just excommunication by shooting his arrows against the papal residence. A special license was granted to negotiate with the outlaw, but the forces, or the spirit, of Hawkwood, were unequal to the enterprise, and it was for the advantage, perhaps, of Paleologus to be disappointed of succor, that must have been costly. That could not be effectual, and which might have been dangerous. 
7936 The disconsolate Greek 7937 prepared for his return, but even his return was impeded by a most ignominious obstacle. On his arrival at Venice, he had borrowed large sums at exorbitant usury. But his coffers were empty, his creditors were impatient, and his person was detained as the best security for the payment. His eldest son, Andronicus, the regent of Constantinople, was repeatedly urged to exhaust every resource. And even by stripping the churches, to extricate his father from captivity and disgrace. But the unnatural youth was insensible of the disgrace, and secretly pleased with the captivity of the emperor, the state was poor, the clergy were obstinate. Nor could some religious scruple be wanting to excuse the guilt of his indifference and delay. Such undutiful neglect was severely reproved by the piety of his brother Manuel, who instantly sold or mortgaged all that he possessed, embarked for Venice, relieved his father, and pledged his own freedom to be responsible for the debt. On his return to Constantinople, the parent and king distinguished his two sons with suitable rewards, but the faith and manners of the slothful Paleologus had not been improved by his Roman pilgrimage. And his apostasy or conversion, devoid of any spiritual or temporal effects, was speedily forgotten by the Greeks and Latins. 7938. Thirty years after the return of Paleologus, his son and successor, Manuel, from a similar motive, but on a larger scale, again visited the countries of the West. In a preceding chapter one have related his treaty with Bajazay, the violation of that treaty, the siege or blockade of Constantinople, and the French succor under the command of the gallant Boussicault. 7939 By his ambassadors, Manuel had solicited the Latin powers, but it was thought that the presence of a distressed monarch would draw tears and supplies from the hardest barbarians. 7940 And the marshal who advised the journey prepared the reception of the Byzantine prince. The land was occupied by the Turks. But the navigation of Venice was safe and open, Italy received him as the first, or, at least, as the second, of the Christian princes, Manuel was pitted as the champion and confessor of the faith. And the dignity of his behavior prevented that pity from sinking into contempt. From Venice he proceeded to Padua and Pavia, and even the Duke of Milan, a secret ally of Bajazay, gave him safe and honorable conduct to the verge of his dominions. 7941 On the confines of France 7942 The royal officers undertook the care of his person, journey, and expenses. And two thousand of the richest citizens, in arms and on horseback, came forth to meet him as far as Charenton, in the neighborhood of the capital. At the gates of Paris, he was saluted by the Chancellor and the Parliament. And Charles VI, attended by his princes and nobles, welcomed his brother with a cordial embrace. The successor of Constantine was clothed in a robe of white silk, and mounted on a milk-white steed, a circumstance, in the French ceremonial, of singular importance, the white color is considered as the symbol of sovereignty. And, in a late visit, the German Emperor, after a haughty demand and a peevish refusal, had been reduced to content himself with a black courser. Manuel was lodged in the Louvre. A succession of feasts and balls, the pleasures of the banquet and the chase, were ingeniously varied by the politeness of the French, to display their magnificence, and amuse his grief, he was indulged in the liberty of his chapel. And the doctors of the Sorbonne were astonished, and possibly scandalized, by the language, the rites, and the vestments, of his Greek clergy. But the slightest glance on the state of the kingdom must teach him to despair of any effectual assistance. The unfortunate Charles, though he enjoyed some lucid intervals, continually relapsed into furious or stupid insanity, the reins of government were alternately seized by his brother and uncle, the Dukes of Orleans and Burgundy, whose factious competition prepared the miseries of civil war. The former was a gay youth, dissolved in luxury and love, the latter was the father of John Count of Nevers, who had so lately been ransomed from Turkish captivity. And, if the fearless son was ardent to revenge his defeat, the more prudent Burgundy was content with the cost and peril of the first experiment. When Manuel had satiated the curiosity, and perhaps fatigued the patience, of the French, he resolved on a visit to the adjacent island. In his progress from Dover, he was entertained at Canterbury with due reverence by the prior and monks of Esti. 
Austin, and, on Blackheath, King Henry IV, with the English court, saluted the Greek hero, I copy our old historian, who, during many days, was lodged and treated in London as Emperor of the East. 7943 But the state of England was still more adverse to the design of the Holy War. In the same year, the hereditary sovereign had been deposed and murdered, the reigning prince was a successful usurper. Whose ambition was punished by jealousy and remorse, nor could Henry of Lancaster withdraw his person or forces from the defense of a throne incessantly shaken by conspiracy and rebellion. He pitted, he praised, he feasted, the Emperor of Constantinople, but if the English monarch assumed the cross, it was only to appease his people, and perhaps his conscience, by the merit or semblance of his pious intention. 7944 Satisfied, however, with gifts and honors, Manuel returned to Paris. And, after a residence of two years in the West, shaped his course through Germany and Italy, embarked at Venice, and patiently expected, in the Moria, the moment of his ruin or deliverance. Yet he had escaped the ignominious necessity of offering his religion to public or private sale. The Latin Church was distracted by the Great Schism. The kings, the nations, the universities, of Europe were divided in their obedience between the popes of Rome and Avignon. And the emperor, anxious to conciliate the friendship of both parties, abstained from any correspondence with the indigent and unpopular rivals. His journey coincided with the year of the Jubilee. But he passed through Italy without desiring, or deserving, the plenary indulgence which abolished the guilt or penance of the sins of the faithful. The Roman Pope was offended by this neglect, accused him of irreverence to an image of Christ, and exhorted the princes of Italy to reject and abandon the obstinate schismatic. 7945. During the period of the Crusades, the Greeks beheld with astonishment and terror the perpetual stream of emigration that flowed, and continued to flow, from the unknown climates of their West. The visits of their last emperors removed the veil of separation, and they disclosed to their eyes the powerful nations of Europe, whom they no longer presumed to brand with the name of barbarians. The observations of Manuel, and his more inquisitive followers, have been preserved by a Byzantine historian of the times, 7946 his scattered ideas I shall collect and abridge. And it may be amusing enough, perhaps instructive, to contemplate the rude pictures of Germany, France, and England, whose ancient and modern state are so familiar to our minds. I. Germany, says the Greek Calcondyles, is of ample latitude from Vienna to the ocean, and it stretches, a strange geography, from Prague in Bohemia to the river Tartessus, and the Pyrenean mountains. 7947 The soil, except in figs and olives, is sufficiently fruitful, the air is salubrious, the bodies of the natives are robust and healthy, and these cold regions are seldom visited with the calamities of pestilence, or earthquakes. After the Scythians or Tartars, the Germans are the most numerous of nations, they are brave and patient, and were they united under a single head, their force would be irresistible. By the gift of the Pope, they have acquired the privilege of choosing the Roman Emperor, 7948 Nor is any people more devoutly attached to the faith and obedience of the Latin Patriarch. The greatest part of the country is divided among the princes and prelates. But Strasbourg, Cologne, Hamburg, and more than two hundred free cities, are governed by sage and equal laws, according to the will, and for the advantage, of the whole community. The use of duels, or single combats on foot, prevails among them in peace and war, their industry excels in all the mechanic arts. And the Germans may boast of the invention of gunpowder and cannon, which is now diffused over the greatest part of the world. 2. The Kingdom of France is spread above fifteen or twenty days' journey from Germany to Spain, and from the Alps to the British Ocean. Containing many flourishing cities, and among these Paris, the seat of the king, which surpasses the rest in riches and luxury. Many princes and lords alternately wait in his palace, and acknowledge him as their sovereign, the most powerful are the Dukes of Britannia and Burgundy of whom the latter possesses the wealthy province of Flanders, whose harbours are frequented by the ships and merchants of our own, and the more remote, seas. The French are an ancient and opulent people. And their language and manners, though somewhat different, 
are not dissimilar from those of the Italians. Vain of the imperial dignity of Charlemagne, of their victories over the Saracens, and of the exploits of their heroes, Oliver and Roland 7949 they esteem themselves the first of the Western nations. But this foolish arrogance has been recently humbled by the unfortunate events of their wars against the English, the inhabitants of the British island. 3. Britain, in the ocean, and opposite to the shores of Flanders, may be considered either as one, or as three islands, but the whole is united by a common interest, by the same manners, and by a similar government. The measure of its circumference is five thousand stadia, the land is overspread with towns and villages, though destitute of wine, and not abounding in fruit trees, it is fertile in wheat and barley, in honey and wool. And much cloth is manufactured by the inhabitants. In populousness and power, in richness and luxury, London, 7950 the metropolis of the Isle, may claim a preeminence over all the cities of the West. It is situate on the Thames, a broad and rapid river, which at the distance of thirty miles falls into the Gallic Sea, and the daily flow and ebb of the tide affords a safe entrance and departure to the vessels of commerce. The king is head of a powerful and turbulent aristocracy, his principal vassals hold their estates by a free and unalterable tenure, and the laws define the limits of his authority and their obedience. The kingdom has been often afflicted by foreign conquest and domestic sedition, but the natives are bold and hardy, renowned in arms and victorious in war. The form of their shields or targets is derived from the Italians, that of their swords from the Greeks, the use of the long bow is the peculiar and decisive advantage of the English. Their language bears no affinity to the idioms of the continent, in the habits of domestic life. They are not easily distinguished from their neighbors of France, but the most singular circumstance of their manners is their disregard of conjugal honor and of female chastity. In their mutual visits, as the first act of hospitality, the guest is welcomed in the embraces of their wives and daughters, among friends they are lent and borrowed without shame. Nor are the islanders offended at this strange commerce, and its inevitable consequences. 7951 Informed as we are of the customs of old England and assured of the virtue of our mothers, we may smile at the credulity, or resent the injustice, of the Greek, who must have confounded a modest salute 7952 with a criminal embrace. But his credulity and injustice may teach an important lesson, to distrust the accounts of foreign and remote nations, and to suspend our belief of every tale that deviates from the laws of nature and the character of man. 7953. After his return, and the victory of Timur, Manuel reigned many years in prosperity and peace. As long as the sons of Bajazay solicited his friendship and spared his dominions, he was satisfied with the national religion and his leisure was employed in composing twenty theological dialogues for its defense. The appearance of the Byzantine ambassadors at the Council of Constance 7954 announces the restoration of the Turkish power, as well as of the Latin Church, the conquest of the sultans, Muhammad and Amurath, reconciled the emperor to the Vatican. And the siege of Constantinople almost tempted him to acquiesce in the double procession of the Holy Ghost. When Martin V ascended without a rival the chair of St. Peter, a friendly intercourse of letters and embassies was revived between the East and West. Ambition on one side, and distress on the other, dictated the same decent language of charity and peace, the artful Greek expressed a desire of marrying his six sons to Italian princesses. And the Roman, not less artful, dispatched the daughter of the Marquis of Montferrat, with a company of noble virgins, to soften, by their charms, the obstinacy of the schismatics. Yet under this mask of zeal, a discerning eye will perceive that all was hollow and insincere in the court and church of Constantinople. According to the vicissitudes of danger and repose, the emperor advanced or retreated. Alternately instructed and disavowed his ministers. And escaped from the importunate pressure by urging the duty of inquiry, the obligation of collecting the sense of his patriarchs and bishops, and the impossibility of convening them at a time when the Turkish arms were at the gates of his capital. From a review of the public transactions it will appear that the Greeks insisted on three successive measures, a succor, a council, and a final reunion, while the Latins eluded the second, and only promised the first. As a consequential and voluntary reward of the third. 
but we have an opportunity of unfolding the most secret intentions of Manuel, as he explained them in a private conversation without artifice or disguise. In his declining age, the emperor had associated John Paleologus, the second of the name, and the eldest of his sons, on whom he devolved the greatest part of the authority and weight of government. One day, in the presence only of the historian Franza, 7955 his favorite chamberlain, he opened to his colleague and successor the true principle of his negotiations with the Pope. 7956, our last resource, said Manuel, against the Turks, is their fear of our union with the Latins, of the warlike nations of the West, who may arm for our relief and for their destruction. As often as you are threatened by the miscreants, present this danger before their eyes. Propose a council, consult on the means. But ever delay and avoid the convocation of an assembly, which cannot tend either to our spiritual or temporal emolument. The Latins are proud, the Greeks are obstinate, neither party will recede or retract. And the attempt of a perfect union will confirm the schism, alienate the churches, and leave us, without hope or defense, at the mercy of the barbarians. Impatient of this salutary lesson, the royal youth arose from his seat and departed in silence, and the wise monarch, continued Franza, casting his eyes on me, thus resumed his discourse, my son deems himself a great and heroic prince, but, alas! Our miserable age does not afford scope for heroism or greatness. His daring spirit might have suited the happier times of our ancestors, but the present state requires not an emperor, but a cautious steward of the last relics of our fortunes. Well do I remember the lofty expectations which he built on our alliance with Mustafa, and much do I fear, that this rash courage will urge the ruin of our house, and that even religion may precipitate our downfall. Yet the experience and authority of Manuel preserved the peace, and eluded the council. Till, in the seventy-eighth year of his age, and in the habit of a monk, he terminated his career, dividing his precious movables among his children and the poor, his physicians and his favorite servants. Of his six sons, 7957 Andronicus II was invested with the Principality of Thessalonica, and died of a leprosy soon after the sale of that city to the Venetians and its final conquest by the Turks. Some fortunate incidents had restored Peloponnesus, or the Moria, to the empire, and in his more prosperous days, Manuel had fortified the narrow isthmus of 6 miles 7958 with a stone wall and 153 towers. The wall was overthrown by the first blast of the Ottomans, the fertile peninsula might have been sufficient for the four younger brothers, Theodore and Constantine, Demetrius and Thomas. But they wasted in domestic contests the remains of their strength, and the least successful of the rivals were reduced to a life of dependence in the Byzantine palace. The eldest of the sons of Manuel, John Paleologus II, was acknowledged, after his father's death, as the sole emperor of the Greeks. He immediately proceeded to repudiate his wife, and to contract a new marriage with the princess of Trebizond, beauty was in his eyes the first qualification of an empress. And the clergy had yielded to his firm assurance, that unless he might be indulged in a divorce, he would retire to a cloister, and leave the throne to his brother Constantine. The first, and in truth the only, victory of Paleologus, was over a Jew, 7959 whom, after a long and learned dispute, he converted to the Christian faith, and this momentous conquest is carefully recorded in the history of the times. But he soon resumed the design of uniting the East and West, and, regardless of his father's advice, listened, as it should seem with sincerity, to the proposal of meeting the Pope in a general council beyond the Adriatic. This dangerous project was encouraged by Martin V, and coldly entertained by his successor Eugenius, till, after a tedious negotiation, the emperor received a summons from the Latin assembly of a new character. The independent prelates of Basil, who styled themselves the representatives and judges of the Catholic Church. The Roman pontiff had fought and conquered in the cause of ecclesiastical freedom, but the victorious clergy were soon exposed to the tyranny of their deliverer. And his sacred character was invulnerable to those arms which they found so keen and effectual against the civil magistrate. Their great charter, the right of election, was annihilated by appeals, evaded by trusts or commendums, disappointed by reversionary grants, and superseded by previous and arbitrary reservations. 
7960 a public auction was instituted in the court of Rome, the cardinals and favorites were enriched with the spoils of nations. And every country might complain that the most important and valuable benefices were accumulated on the heads of aliens and absentees. During their residence at Avignon, the ambition of the Pope subsided in the meaner passions of avarice 7961 and luxury, they rigorously imposed on the clergy the tributes of first fruits and tenths. But they freely tolerated the impunity of vice, disorder, and corruption. These manifold scandals were aggravated by the great schism of the West, which continued above fifty years. In the furious conflicts of Rome and Avignon, the vices of the rivals were mutually exposed, and their precarious situation degraded their authority, relaxed their discipline, and multiplied their wants and exactions. To heal the wounds, and restore the monarchy, of the Church, the synods of Pisa and Constance 7962 were successively convened, but these great assemblies, conscious of their strength, resolved to vindicate the privileges of the Christian aristocracy. From a personal sentence against two pontiffs, whom they rejected, and a third, their acknowledged sovereign, whom they deposed, the fathers of Constance proceeded to examine the nature and limits of the Roman supremacy. Nor did they separate till they had established the authority, above the Pope, of a general council. It was enacted, that, for the government and reformation of the Church, such assemblies should be held at regular intervals. And that each synod, before its dissolution, should appoint the time and place of the subsequent meeting. By the influence of the Court of Rome, the next convocation at Siena was easily eluded. But the bold and vigorous proceedings of the Council of Basil 7963 had almost been fatal to the reigning pontiff, Eugenius IV. A just suspicion of his design prompted the fathers to hasten the promulgation of their first decree, that the representatives of the Church militant on earth were invested with a divine and spiritual jurisdiction over all Christians. Without accepting the Pope. And that a general council could not be dissolved, prorogued, or transferred, unless by their free deliberation and consent. On the notice that Eugenius had fulminated a bull for that purpose, they ventured to summon, to admonish, to threaten, to censure the contumacious successor of St. Peter. After many delays, to allow time for repentance, they finally declared, that, unless he submitted within the term of sixty days, he was suspended from the exercise of all temporal and ecclesiastical authority. And to mark their jurisdiction over the prince as well as the priest, they assumed the government of Avignon, annulled the alienation of the sacred patrimony, and protected Rome from the imposition of new taxes. Their boldness was justified, not only by the general opinion of the clergy, but by the support and power of the first monarchs of Christendom, the Emperor Sigismund declared himself the servant and protector of the Synod. Germany and France adhered to their cause, the Duke of Milan was the enemy of Eugenius, and he was driven from the Vatican by an insurrection of the Roman people. Rejected at the same time by temporal and spiritual subjects, submission was his only choice, by a most humiliating bull, the Pope repealed his own acts, and ratified those of the Council. Incorporated his legates and cardinals with that venerable body, and seemed to resign himself to the decrees of the Supreme Legislature. Their fame pervaded the countries of the East, and it was in their presence that Sigismund received the ambassadors of the Turkish Sultan 7964 who laid at his feet twelve large vases, filled with robes of silk and pieces of gold. The fathers of Basil aspired to the glory of reducing the Greeks, as well as the Bohemians, within the pale of the Church. And their deputies invited the Emperor and Patriarch of Constantinople to unite with an assembly which possessed the confidence of the Western nations. Paleologus was not averse to the proposal. And his ambassadors were introduced with due honors into the Catholic Senate. But the choice of the place appeared to be an insuperable obstacle, since he refused to pass the Alps, or the Sea of Sicily, and positively required that the Synod should be adjourned to some convenient city in Italy, or at least on the Danube. The other articles of this treaty were more readily stipulated, it was agreed to defray the traveling expenses of the Emperor, with a train of seven hundred persons. 7965 to remit an immediate sum of 8,000 ducats 7966 for the accommodation of the Greek clergy. And in his absence to grant a supply of 10,000 ducats, with 300 archers and some galleys, for the protection of Constantinople. 
the city of Avignon advanced the funds for the preliminary expenses. And the embarkation was prepared at Marseilles with some difficulty and delay. In his distress, the friendship of Paleologus was disputed by the ecclesiastical powers of the West. But the dexterous activity of a monarch prevailed over the slow debates and inflexible temper of a republic. The decrees of Basil continually tended to circumscribe the despotism of the Pope, and to erect a supreme and perpetual tribunal in the Church. Eugenius was impatient of the yoke. And the union of the Greeks might afford a decent pretense for translating a rebellious synod from the Rhine to the Pau. The independence of the fathers was lost if they passed the Alps, Savoy or Avignon, to which they acceded with reluctance, were described at Constantinople as situate far beyond the pillars of Hercules. 7967 The emperor and his clergy were apprehensive of the dangers of a long navigation, they were offended by a haughty declaration, that after suppressing the new heresy of the Bohemians, the council would soon eradicate the old heresy of the Greeks. 7968 On the side of Eugenius, all was smooth, and yielding, and respectful, and he invited the Byzantine monarch to heal by his presence the schism of the Latin, as well as of the Eastern, Church. Ferrara, near the coast of the Adriatic, was proposed for their amicable interview, and with some indulgence of forgery and theft, a surreptitious decree was procured, which transferred the synod, with its own consent, to that Italian city. Nine galleys were equipped for the service at Venice, and in the Isle of Candia, their diligence anticipated the slower vessels of Basil, the Roman admiral was commissioned to burn, sink, and destroy. 7969 and these priestly squadrons might have encountered each other in the same seas where Athens and Sparta had formerly contended for the preeminence of glory. Assaulted by the importunity of the factions, who were ready to fight for the possession of his person, Paleologus hesitated before he left his palace and country on a perilous experiment. His father's advice still dwelt on his memory. And reason must suggest, that since the Latins were divided among themselves, they could never unite in a foreign cause. Sigismund dissuaded the unreasonable adventure, his advice was impartial, since he adhered to the council. And it was enforced by the strange belief, that the German Caesar would nominate a Greek his heir and successor in the Empire of the West. 7970 Even the Turkish Sultan was a counsellor whom it might be unsafe to trust, but whom it was dangerous to offend. Amurath was unskilled in the disputes, but he was apprehensive of the union, of the Christians. From his own treasures, he offered to relieve the wants of the Byzantine court, yet he declared with seeming magnanimity, that Constantinople should be secure and inviolate, in the absence of her sovereign. 7971 The resolution of Paleologus was decided by the most splendid gifts and the most specious promises, he wished to escape for a while from a scene of danger and distress and after dismissing with an ambiguous answer the messengers of the council. He declared his intention of embarking in the Roman galleys. The age of the patriarch Joseph was more susceptible of fear than of hope. He trembled at the perils of the sea, and expressed his apprehension, that his feeble voice, with thirty perhaps of his orthodox brethren, would be oppressed in a foreign land by the power and numbers of a Latin synod. He yielded to the royal mandate, to the flattering assurance, that he would be heard as the oracle of nations, and to the secret wish of learning from his brother of the West, to deliver the church from the yoke of kings. 7972 The five crossbearers, or dignitaries, of Saint Sophia, were bound to attend his person, and one of these, the great ecclesiarch or preacher, Sylvester Serapulus, 7973 has composed a free and curious history 7974 of the false union. 7975 of the clergy that reluctantly obeyed the summons of the emperor and the patriarch, submission was the first duty, and patience the most useful virtue. In a chosen list of twenty bishops, we discover the metropolitan titles of Heraclii and Cyzicus, Nice and Nicomedia, Ephesus and Trebizond, and the personal merit of Mark and Bessarion who, in the confidence of their learning and eloquence, were promoted to the episcopal rank. Some monks and philosophers were named to display the science and sanctity of the Greek Church, and the service of the choir was performed by a select band of singers and musicians. The patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, appeared by their genuine or fictitious deputies, 
the primate of Russia represented a national church, and the Greeks might contend with the Latins in the extent of their spiritual empire. The precious vases of Saint Sophia were exposed to the winds and waves, that the patriarch might officiate with becoming splendor, whatever gold the emperor could procure, was expended in the massy ornaments of his bed and chariot. 7976 And while they affected to maintain the prosperity of their ancient fortune, they quarreled for the division of fifteen thousand ducats, the first alms of the Roman pontiff. After the necessary preparations, John Paleologus, with a numerous train, accompanied by his brother Demetrius, and the most respectable persons of the church and state, embarked in eight vessels with sails and oars which steered through the Turkish Straits of Gallipoli to the archipelago, the Moria, and the Adriatic Gulf. 7977. After a tedious and troublesome navigation of seventy-seven days, this religious squadron cast anchor before Venice, and their reception proclaimed the joy and magnificence of that powerful republic. In the command of the world, the modest Augustus had never claimed such honors from his subjects as were paid to his feeble successor by an independent state. Seated on the poop on a lofty throne, he received the visit, or, in the Greek style, the adoration of the doge and senators. 7978 They sailed in the Bucentaur, which was accompanied by twelve stately galleys, the sea was overspread with innumerable gondolas of pomp and pleasure, the air resounded with music and acclamations. The mariners, and even the vessels, were dressed in silk and gold, and in all the emblems and pageants, the Roman eagles were blended with the lions of St. Mark. The triumphal procession, ascending the great canal, passed under the bridge of the Rialto, and the eastern strangers gazed with admiration on the palaces, the churches, and the populousness of a city, that seems to float on the bosom of the waves. 7979 They sighed to behold the spoils and trophies with which it had been decorated after the sack of Constantinople. After a hospitable entertainment of fifteen days, Paleologus pursued his journey by land and water from Venice to Ferrara. And on this occasion the pride of the Vatican was tempered by policy to indulge the ancient dignity of the Emperor of the East. He made his entry on a black horse. But a milk-white steed, whose trappings were embroidered with golden eagles, was led before him. And the canopy was borne over his head by the princes of Este, the sons or kinsmen of Nicholas, Marquis of the city, and a sovereign more powerful than himself. 7980 Paleologus did not alight till he reached the bottom of the staircase, the Pope advanced to the door of the apartment, refused his proffered genuflection, and, after a paternal embrace, conducted the Emperor to a seat on his left hand. Nor would the Patriarch descend from his galley, till a ceremony almost equal, had been stipulated between the bishops of Rome and Constantinople. The latter was saluted by his brother with a kiss of union and charity. Nor would any of the Greek ecclesiastics submit to kiss the feet of the Western primate. On the opening of the synod, the place of honor in the center was claimed by the temporal and ecclesiastical chiefs. And it was only by alleging that his predecessors had not assisted in person at Nice or Chalcedon, that Eugenius could evade the ancient precedents of Constantine and Martian. After much debate, it was agreed that the right and left sides of the church should be occupied by the two nations, that the solitary chair of St. Peter should be raised the first of the Latin line. And that the throne of the Greek emperor, at the head of his clergy, should be equal and opposite to the second place, the vacant seat of the emperor of the West. 7981. But as soon as festivity and form had given place to a more serious treaty, the Greeks were dissatisfied with their journey, with themselves, and with the Pope. The artful pencil of his emissaries had painted him in a prosperous state. At the head of the princes and prelates of Europe, obedient at his voice, to believe and to arm. The thin appearance of the Universal Synod of Ferrara betrayed his weakness, and the Latins opened the first session with only five archbishops, eighteen bishops, and ten abbots. The greatest part of whom were the subjects or countrymen of the Italian pontiff. Except the Duke of Burgundy, none of the potentates of the West condescended to appear in person, or by their ambassadors. Nor was it possible to suppress the judicial acts of Basil against the dignity and person of Eugenius, which were finally concluded by a new election. Under these circumstances, a truce or delay was asked and granted, 
till Paleologus could expect from the consent of the Latins some temporal reward for an unpopular union. And after the first session, the public proceedings were adjourned above six months. The emperor, with a chosen band of his favorites and Janissaries, fixed his summer residence at a pleasant, spacious monastery, six miles from Ferrara. Forgot, in the pleasures of the chase, the distress of the church and state, and persisted in destroying the game, without listening to the just complaints of the marquis or the husbandman. 7982 In the meanwhile, his unfortunate Greeks were exposed to all the miseries of exile and poverty, for the support of each stranger, a monthly allowance was assigned of three or four gold florins. And although the entire sum did not amount to seven hundred florins, a long arrear was repeatedly incurred by the indigence or policy of the Roman court. 7983 They sighed for a speedy deliverance, but their escape was prevented by a triple chain, a passport from their superiors was required at the gates of Ferrara, the government of Venice had engaged to arrest and send back the fugitives. An inevitable punishment awaited them at Constantinople, excommunication, fines, and a sentence, which did not respect the sacerdotal dignity, that they should be stripped naked and publicly whipped. 7984 It was only by the alternative of hunger or dispute that the Greeks could be persuaded to open the first conference, and they yielded with extreme reluctance to attend from Ferrara to Florence the rear of a flying synod. This new translation was urged by inevitable necessity, the city was visited by the plague, the fidelity of the Marquis might be suspected, the mercenary troops of the Duke of Milan were at the gates. And as they occupied Romagna, it was not without difficulty and danger that the Pope, the Emperor, and the Bishops, explored their way through the unfrequented paths of the Apennine.7985. Yet all these obstacles were surmounted by time and policy. The violence of the Fathers of Basil rather promoted than injured the cause of Eugenius, the nations of Europe abhorred the schism and disowned the election, of Felix V, who was successively a Duke of Savoy, a Hermit, and a Pope. And the great princes were gradually reclaimed by his competitor to a favorable neutrality and a firm attachment. The legates, with some respectable members, deserted to the Roman army, which insensibly rose in numbers and reputation. The Council of Basil was reduced to thirty-nine bishops, and three hundred of the inferior clergy. 7986 While the Latins of Florence could produce the subscriptions of the Pope himself, eight cardinals, two patriarchs, eight archbishops, fifty-two bishops, and forty-five abbots, or chiefs of religious orders. After the labor of nine months, and the debates of twenty-five sessions, they attained the advantage and glory of the reunion of the Greeks. For principal questions had been agitated between the two churches, one. The use of unleavened bread in the communion of Christ's body. 2. The nature of purgatory. 3. The supremacy of the Pope. And, 4. The single or double procession of the Holy Ghost. The cause of either nation was managed by ten theological champions, the Latins were supported by the inexhaustible eloquence of Cardinal Julian, and Mark of Ephesus and Bessarion of Nice were the bold and able leaders of the Greek forces. We may bestow some praise on the progress of human reason, by observing that the first of these questions was now treated as an immaterial right, which might innocently vary with the fashion of the age and country. With regard to the second, both parties were agreed in the belief of an intermediate state of purgation for the venial sins of the faithful. And whether their souls were purified by elemental fire was a doubtful point, which in a few years might be conveniently settled on the spot by the disputants. The claims of supremacy appeared of a more weighty and substantial kind. Yet by the Orientals the Roman bishop had ever been respected as the first of the five patriarchs, nor did they scruple to admit that his jurisdiction should be exercised agreeably to the holy canons. A vague allowance which might be defined or eluded by occasional convenience. The procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father alone, or from the Father and the Son, was an article of faith which had sunk much deeper into the minds of men. And in the sessions of Ferrara and Florence, the Latin edition of Filioque was subdivided into two questions, whether it were legal, and whether it were orthodox. Perhaps it may not be necessary to boast on this subject of my own impartial indifference. 
but I must think that the Greeks were strongly supported by the prohibition of the Council of Chalcedon, against adding any article whatsoever to the Creed of Nice, or rather of Constantinople. 7987 In earthly affairs, it is not easy to conceive how an assembly equal of legislators can bind their successors invested with powers equal to their own. But the dictates of inspiration must be true and unchangeable. Nor should a private bishop, or a provincial synod, have presumed to innovate against the judgment of the Catholic Church. On the substance of the doctrine, the controversy was equal and endless, reason is confounded by the procession of a deity, the gospel, which lay on the altar, was silent. The various texts of the fathers might be corrupted by fraud or entangled by sophistry, and the Greeks were ignorant of the characters and writings of the Latin saints. 7988 Of this at least we may be sure, that neither side could be convinced by the arguments of their opponents. Prejudice may be enlightened by reason, and a superficial glance may be rectified by a clear and more perfect view of an object adapted to our faculties. But the bishops and monks had been taught from their infancy to repeat a form of mysterious words, their national and personal honor depended on the repetition of the same sounds. And their narrow minds were hardened and inflamed by the acrimony of a public dispute. While they were most in a cloud of dust and darkness, the Pope and Emperor were desirous of a seeming union, which could alone accomplish the purposes of their interview. And the obstinacy of public dispute was softened by the arts of private and personal negotiation. The Patriarch Joseph had sunk under the weight of age and infirmities. His dying voice breathed the counsels of charity and concord, and his vacant benefice might tempt the hopes of the ambitious clergy. The ready and active obedience of the archbishops of Russia and Nice, of Isidore and Bessarion, was prompted and recompensed by their speedy promotion to the dignity of cardinals. Bessarion, in the first debates, had stood forth the most strenuous and eloquent champion of the Greek Church. And if the apostate, the bastard, was reprobated by his country, 7989 he appears in ecclesiastical story a rare example of a patriot who was recommended to court favor by loud opposition and well-timed compliance. With the aid of his two spiritual coadjutors, the emperor applied his arguments to the general situation and personal characters of the bishops, and each was successively moved by authority and example. Their revenues were in the hands of the Turks, their persons in those of the Latins, an episcopal treasure, three robes and forty ducats, was soon exhausted, 7990 the hopes of their return still depended on the ships of Venice and the alms of Rome. And such was their indigence, that their arrears, the payment of a debt, would be accepted as a favor, and might operate as a bribe. Point 7991 the danger and relief of Constantinople might excuse some prudent and pious dissimulation. And it was insinuated, that the obstinate heretics who should resist the consent of the East and West would be abandoned in a hostile land to the revenge or justice of the Roman pontiff. 7992 In the first private assembly of the Greeks, the formulary of union was approved by twenty-four, and rejected by twelve, members, but the five cross-bearers of St. Sophia, who aspired to represent the patriarch, were disqualified by ancient discipline, and their right of voting was transferred to the obsequious train of monks, grammarians, and profane laymen. The will of the monarch produced a false and servile unanimity, and no more than two patriots had courage to speak their own sentiments and those of their country. Demetrius, the emperor's brother, retired to Venice, that he might not be witness of the union. And Mark of Ephesus, mistaking perhaps his pride for his conscience, disclaimed all communion with the Latin heretics, and avowed himself the champion and confessor of the Orthodox Creed. 7993 In the treaty between the two nations, several forms of consent were proposed, such as might satisfy the Latins, without dishonoring the Greeks. And they weighed the scruples of words and syllables, till the theological balance trembled with a slight preponderance in favor of the Vatican. It was agreed, I must entreat the attention of the reader, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, as from one principle and one substance. That he proceeds by the Son, being of the same nature and substance, and that he proceeds from the Father and the Son, by one spiration and production. It is less difficult to understand the articles of the preliminary treaty. That the Pope should defray all the expenses of the Greeks in their return home. 
that he should annually maintain two galleys and three hundred soldiers for the defense of Constantinople, that all the ships which transported pilgrims to Jerusalem should be obliged to touch at that port. That as often as they were required, the Pope should furnish ten galleys for a year, or twenty for six months, and that he should powerfully solicit the princes of Europe, if the Emperor had occasion for land forces. The same year, and almost the same day, were marked by the deposition of Eugenius at Basel, and, at Florence, by his reunion of the Greeks and Latins. In the former synod, which he styled indeed an assembly of demons, the Pope was branded with the guilt of simony, perjury, tyranny, heresy, and schism. 7994 and declared to be incorrigible in his vices, unworthy of any title, and incapable of holding any ecclesiastical office. In the latter, he was revered as the true and holy vicar of Christ, who, after a separation of six hundred years, had reconciled the Catholics of the East and West in one fold, and under one shepherd. The act of union was subscribed by the Pope, the Emperor, and the principal members of both churches, even by those who, like Syropolis, 7995 had been deprived of the right of voting. Two copies might have sufficed for the East and West. But Eugenius was not satisfied, unless four authentic and similar transcripts were signed and attested as the monuments of his victory. 7996 on a memorable day, the 6th of July, the successors of St. Peter and Constantine ascended their thrones the two nations assembled in the Cathedral of Florence. Their representatives, Cardinal Julian and Bessarian Archbishop of Nice, appeared in the pulpit, and, after reading in their respective tongues the Act of Union, they mutually embraced, in the name and the presence of their applauding brethren. The Pope and his ministers then officiated according to the Roman liturgy, the creed was chanted with the addition of Filioque, the acquiescence of the Greeks was poorly excused by their ignorance of the harmonious, but inarticulate sounds. 7997 and the more scrupulous Latins refused any public celebration of the Byzantine rite. Yet the emperor and his clergy were not totally unmindful of national honor. The treaty was ratified by their consent, it was tacitly agreed that no innovation should be attempted in their creed or ceremonies, they spared, and secretly respected, the generous firmness of Mark of Ephesus. And, on the decease of the patriarch, they refused to elect his successor, except in the Cathedral of St. Sophia. In the distribution of public and private rewards, the liberal pontiff exceeded their hopes and his promises, the Greeks, with less pomp and pride, returned by the same road of Ferrara and Venice. And their reception at Constantinople was such as will be described in the following chapter. 7998 The success of the first trial encouraged Eugenius to repeat the same edifying scenes. And the deputies of the Armenians, the Maronites, the Jacobites of Syria and Egypt, the Nestorians, and the Ethiopians, were successively introduced, to kiss the feet of the Roman pontiff, and to announce the obedience and the orthodoxy of the East. These Oriental embassies, unknown in the countries which they presumed to represent, 7999 diffused over the West the fame of Eugenius. And a clamor was artfully propagated against the remnant of a schism in Switzerland and Savoy, which alone impeded the harmony of the Christian world. The vigor of opposition was succeeded by the lassitude of despair, the Council of Basel was silently dissolved, and Felix, renouncing the tiara, again withdrew to the devout or delicious hermitage of Ripple. 8000 A general peace was secured by mutual acts of oblivion and indemnity, all ideas of reformation subsided, the popes continued to exercise and abuse their ecclesiastical despotism. Nor has Rome been since disturbed by the mischiefs of a contested election. 8001. The journeys of three emperors were unavailing for their temporal, or perhaps their spiritual, salvation. But they were productive of a beneficial consequence, the revival of the Greek learning in Italy, from whence it was propagated to the last nations of the West and North. In their lowest servitude and depression, the subjects of the Byzantine throne were still possessed of a golden key that could unlock the treasures of antiquity. Of a musical and prolific language, that gives a soul to the objects of sense, and a body to the abstractions of philosophy. Since the barriers of the monarchy, and even of the capital, had been trampled underfoot, the various barbarians had doubtless corrupted the form and substance of the national dialect. 
and ample glossaries have been composed, to interpret a multitude of words, of Arabic, Turkish, Sclavonian, Latin, or French origin. 8002 But a purer idiom was spoken in the court and taught in the college. And the flourishing state of the language is described, and perhaps embellished, by a learned Italian 8003 who, by a long residence and noble marriage 8004 was naturalized at Constantinople about thirty years before the Turkish conquest. The vulgar speech, says Philelphus 8005, has been depraved by the people, and infected by the multitude of strangers and merchants, who every day flock to the city and mingle with the inhabitants. It is from the disciples of such a school that the Latin language received the versions of Aristotle and Plato, so obscure in sense, and in spirit so poor. But the Greeks who have escaped the contagion, are those whom we follow. And they alone are worthy of our imitation. In familiar discourse, they still speak the tongue of Aristophanes and Euripides, of the historians and philosophers of Athens, and the style of their writings is still more elaborate and correct. The persons who, by their birth and offices, are attached to the Byzantine court, are those who maintain, with the least alloy, the ancient standard of elegance and purity. And the native graces of language most conspicuously shine among the noble matrons, who are excluded from all intercourse with foreigners. With foreigners do I say. They live retired and sequestered from the eyes of their fellow citizens. Seldom are they seen in the streets, and when they leave their houses, it is in the dusk of evening, on visits to the churches and their nearest kindred. On these occasions, they are on horseback, covered with a veil, and encompassed by their parents, their husbands, or their servants. 8006. Among the Greeks a numerous and opulent clergy was dedicated to the service of religion, their monks and bishops have ever been distinguished by the gravity and austerity of their manners. Nor were they diverted, like the Latin priests, by the pursuits and pleasures of a secular, and even military, life. After a large deduction for the time and talent that were lost in the devotion, the laziness, and the discord, of the church and cloister. The more inquisitive and ambitious minds would explore the sacred and profane erudition of their native language. The ecclesiastics presided over the education of youth, the schools of philosophy and eloquence were perpetuated till the fall of the empire. And it may be affirmed, that more books and more knowledge were included within the walls of Constantinople, than could be dispersed over the extensive countries of the West. 8007 But an important distinction has been already noticed, the Greeks were stationary or retrograde, while the Latins were advancing with a rapid and progressive motion. The nations were excited by the spirit of independence and emulation. And even the little world of the Italian states contained more people and industry than the decreasing circle of the Byzantine Empire. In Europe, the lower ranks of society were relieved from the yoke of feudal servitude. And freedom is the first step to curiosity and knowledge. The use, however rude and corrupt, of the Latin tongue had been preserved by superstition, the universities, from Bologna to Oxford 8008 were peopled with thousands of scholars. And their misguided ardor might be directed to more liberal and manly studies. In the resurrection of science, Italy was the first that cast away her shroud. And the eloquent Petrarch, by his lessons and his example, may justly be applauded as the first harbinger of day. A purer style of composition, a more generous and rational strain of sentiment, flowed from the study and imitation of the writers of ancient Rome. And the disciples of Cicero and Virgil approached, with reverence and love, the sanctuary of their Grecian masters. In the sack of Constantinople, the French, and even the Venetians, had despised and destroyed the works of Lysippus and Homer, the monuments of art may be annihilated by a single blow. But the immortal mind is renewed and multiplied by the copies of the pen, and such copies it was the ambition of Petrarch and his friends to possess and understand. The arms of the Turks undoubtedly pressed the flight of the muses. Yet we may tremble at the thought, that Greece might have been overwhelmed, with her schools and libraries, before Europe had emerged from the deluge of barbarism. That the seeds of science might have been scattered by the winds, before the Italian soil was prepared for their cultivation. 
The most learned Italians of the 15th century have confessed and applauded the restoration of Greek literature, after a long oblivion of many hundred years. Point eight thousand and nine. yet in that country, and beyond the Alps, some names are quoted. Some profound scholars, who in the darker ages were honorably distinguished by their knowledge of the Greek tongue, and national vanity has been loud in the praise of such rare examples of erudition. Without scrutinizing the merit of individuals, truth must observe, that their science is without a cause, and without an effect, that it was easy for them to satisfy themselves and their more ignorant contemporaries. And that the idiom, which they had so marvelously acquired was transcribed in few manuscripts, and was not taught in any university of the West. In a corner of Italy, it faintly existed as the popular, or at least as the ecclesiastical dialect. 8010 The first impression of the Doric and Ionic colonies has never been completely erased, the Calabrian churches were long attached to the throne of Constantinople, and the monks of Asti. Basil pursued their studies in Mount Athos and the schools of the East. Calabria was the native country of Barlam, who has already appeared as a sectary and an ambassador. And Barlam was the first who revived, beyond the Alps, the memory, or at least the writings, of Homer. 8011 He is described, by Petrarch and Bacchus 8012 as a man of diminutive stature, though truly great in the measure of learning and genius. Of a piercing discernment, though of a slow and painful elocution. For many ages, as they affirm, Greece had not produced his equal in the knowledge of history, grammar, and philosophy. And his merit was celebrated in the attestations of the princes and doctors of Constantinople. One of these attestations is still extant. And the emperor Cantacuzene, the protector of his adversaries, is forced to allow, that Euclid, Aristotle, and Plato, were familiar to that profound and subtle logician. 8013 In the court of Avignon, he formed an intimate connection with Petrarch 8014 the first of the Latin scholars, and the desire of mutual instruction was the principle of their literary commerce. The Tuscan applied himself with eager curiosity and assiduous diligence to the study of the Greek language. And in a laborious struggle with the dryness and difficulty of the first rudiments, he began to reach the sense, and to feel the spirit, of poets and philosophers, whose minds were congenial to his own. But he was soon deprived of the society and lessons of this useful assistant, Barlam relinquished his fruitless embassy. And, on his return to Greece, he rashly provoked the swarms of fanatic monks, by attempting to substitute the light of reason to that of their navel. After a separation of three years, the two friends again met in the court of Naples, but the generous pupil renounced the fairest occasion of improvement. And by his recommendation Barlam was finally settled in a small bishopric of his native Calabria. 8015 The manifold avocations of Petrarch, love and friendship, his various correspondence and frequent journeys, the Roman laurel, and his elaborate compositions in prose and verse, in Latin and Italian, diverted him from a foreign idiom. And as he advanced in life, the attainment of the Greek language was the object of his wishes rather than of his hopes. When he was about fifty years of age, a Byzantine ambassador, his friend, and a master of both tongues, presented him with a copy of Homer, and the answer of Petrarch is at one expressive of his eloquence, gratitude, and regret. After celebrating the generosity of the donor, and the value of a gift more precious in his estimation than gold or rubies, he thus proceeds, your present of the genuine and original text of the divine poet, the fountain of all inventions. Is worthy of yourself and of me, you have fulfilled your promise, and satisfied my desires. Yet your liberality is still imperfect, with Homer you should have given me yourself, a guide, who could lead me into the fields of light, and disclose to my wondering eyes the spacious miracles of the Iliad and Odyssey. But, alas! Homer is dumb, or I am deaf, nor is it in my power to enjoy the beauty which I possess. I have seated him by the side of Plato, the prince of poets near the prince of philosophers, and I glory in the sight of my illustrious guests. Of their immortal writings, whatever had been translated into the Latin idiom, I had already acquired, but, if there be no profit, there is some pleasure, in beholding these venerable Greeks in their proper and national habit. I am delighted with the aspect of Homer, and as often as I embrace the silent volume, I exclaim with a sigh, illustrious bard. With what pleasure should I listen to thy song, 
if my sense of hearing were not obstructed and lost by the death of one friend, and in the much lamented absence of another. Nor do I yet despair. And the example of Cato suggests some comfort and hope, since it was in the last period of age that he attained the knowledge of the Greek letters. 8016. The prize which eluded the efforts of Petrarch, was obtained by the fortune and industry of his friend Bacchus 8017 the father of the Tuscan prose. That popular writer, who derives his reputation from the Decameron, a hundred novels of pleasantry and love, may aspire to the more serious praise of restoring in Italy the study of the Greek language. In the year 1360, a disciple of Barlam, whose name was Leo, or Leontius Pilatus, was detained in his way to Avignon by the advice and hospitality of Bacchus, who lodged the stranger in his house. Prevailed on the Republic of Florence to allow him an annual stipend, and devoted his leisure to the first Greek professor, who taught that language in the western countries of Europe. The appearance of Leo might disgust the most eager disciple, he was clothed in the mantle of a philosopher, or a mendicant, his countenance was hideous, his face was overshadowed with black hair, his beard long and uncombed, his deportment rustic. His temper gloomy and inconstant, nor could he grace his discourse with the ornaments, or even the perspicuity, of Latin elocution. But his mind was stored with a treasure of Greek learning, history and fable, philosophy and grammar, were alike at his command, and he read the poems of Homer in the schools of Florence. It was from his explanation that Bacchus composed 8018 and transcribed a literal prose version of the Iliad and Odyssey, which satisfied the thirst of his friend Petrarch, and which, perhaps, in the succeeding century, was clandestinely used by Laurentius Valla, the Latin interpreter. It was from his narratives that the same Bacchus collected the materials for his treatise on the genealogy of the heathen gods, a work, in that age, of stupendous erudition, and which he ostentatiously sprinkled with Greek characters and passages. To excite the wonder and applause of his more ignorant readers. 8019 The first steps of learning are slow and laborious, no more than ten votaries of Homer could be enumerated in all Italy and neither Rome, nor Venice, nor Naples, could add a single name to this studious catalogue. But their numbers would have multiplied, their progress would have been accelerated, if the inconstant Leo, at the end of three years, had not relinquished an honourable and beneficial station. In his passage, Petrarch entertained him at Padua a short time, he enjoyed the scholar, but was justly offended with the gloomy and unsocial temper of the man. Discontented with the world and with himself, Leo depreciated his present enjoyments, while absent persons and objects were dear to his imagination. In Italy he was a Thessalian, in Greece a native of Calabria, in the company of the Latins he disdained their language, religion, and manners, no sooner was he landed at Constantinople. Then he again sighed for the wealth of Venice and the elegance of Florence. His Italian friends were deaf to his importunity, he depended on their curiosity and indulgence, and embarked on a second voyage. But on his entrance into the Adriatic, the ship was assailed by a tempest, and the unfortunate teacher, who like Ulysses had fastened himself to the mast, was struck dead by a flash of lightning. The humane Petrarch dropped a tear on his disaster. But he was most anxious to learn whether some copy of Euripides or Sophocles might not be saved from the hands of the mariners. 8020. But the faint rudiments of Greek learning, which Petrarch had encouraged and Bacchus had planted, soon withered and expired. The succeeding generation was content for a while with the improvement of Latin eloquence. Nor was it before the end of the fourteenth century that a new and perpetual flame was rekindled in Italy. 8021 Previous to his own journey, the Emperor Manuel dispatched his envoys and orators to implore the compassion of the Western princes. Of these envoys, the most conspicuous, or the most learned, was Manuel Chrysolorus 8022 of noble birth, and whose Roman ancestors are supposed to have migrated with the great Constantine. After visiting the courts of France and England, where he obtained some contributions and more promises, the envoy was invited to assume the office of a professor, and Florence had again the honor of this second invitation. By his knowledge, not only of the Greek, but of the Latin tongue, Chrysolorus deserved the stipend, and surpassed the expectation, of the Republic. His school was frequented by a crowd of disciples of every rank and age. 
And one of these, in a general history, has described his motives and his success. At that time, says Leonard R. Tin, 8023, I was a student of the civil law, but my soul was inflamed with the love of letters. And I bestowed some application on the sciences of logic and rhetoric. On the arrival of Manuel, I hesitated whether I should desert my legal studies, or relinquish this golden opportunity. And thus, in the ardor of youth, I communed with my own mind, Wilt thou be wanting to thyself and thy fortune? Wilt thou refuse to be introduced to a familiar converse with Homer, Plato, and Demosthenes? With those poets, philosophers, and orators, of whom such wonders are related, and who are celebrated by every age as the great masters of human science. Of professors and scholars in civil law, a sufficient supply will always be found in our universities, but a teacher, and such a teacher, of the Greek language, if he once be suffered to escape, may never afterwards be retrieved. Convinced by these reasons, I gave myself to Chrysoloras, and so strong was my passion, that the lessons which I had imbibed in the day were the constant object of my nightly dreams. 8024 At the same time and place, the Latin classics were explained by John of Ravenna, the domestic pupil of Petrarch, 8025 The Italians, who illustrated their age and country, were formed in this double school. And Florence became the fruitful seminary of Greek and Roman erudition. 8026 The presence of the emperor recalled Chrysoloras from the college to the court, but he afterwards taught at Pavia and Rome with equal industry and applause. The remainder of his life, about fifteen years, was divided between Italy and Constantinople, between embassies and lessons. In the noble office of enlightening a foreign nation, the grammarian was not unmindful of a more sacred duty to his prince and country, and Emmanuel Chrysoloras died at Constance on a public mission from the emperor to the council. After his example, the restoration of the Greek letters in Italy was prosecuted by a series of emigrants, who were destitute of fortune, and endowed with learning, or at least with language. From the terror or oppression of the Turkish arms, the natives of Thessalonica and Constantinople escaped to a land of freedom, curiosity, and wealth. The Synod introduced into Florence the lights of the Greek Church, and the oracles of the Platonic philosophy. And the fugitives who adhered to the Union, had the double merit of renouncing their country, not only for the Christian, but for the Catholic cause. A patriot, who sacrifices his party and conscience to the allurements of favor, may be possessed, however, of the private and social virtues, he no longer hears the reproachful epithets of slave and apostate. And the consideration which he acquires among his new associates will restore in his own eyes the dignity of his character. The prudent conformity of Bessarion was rewarded with the Roman purple, he fixed his residence in Italy. And the Greek cardinal, the titular patriarch of Constantinople, was respected as the chief and protector of his nation. 8027 His abilities were exercised in the legations of Bologna, Venice, Germany, and France, and his election to the chair of St. Peter floated for a moment on the uncertain breath of a conclave. 8028 His ecclesiastical honors diffused a splendor and preeminence over his literary merit and service, his palace was a school. As often as the cardinal visited the Vatican, he was attended by a learned train of both nations, 8029 of men applauded by themselves and the public, and whose writings, now overspread with dust, were popular and useful in their own times. I shall not attempt to enumerate the restorers of Grecian literature in the 15th century. And it may be sufficient to mention with gratitude the names of Theodore Gaza, of George of Trebizond, of John Argeropoulos, and Demetrius Calcocondyles, who taught their native language in the schools of Florence and Rome. Their labors were not inferior to those of Bessarion, whose purple they revered, and whose fortune was the secret object of their envy. But the lives of these grammarians were humble and obscure, they had declined the lucrative paths of the church. Their dress and manners secluded them from the commerce of the world, and since they were confined to the merit, they might be content with the rewards of learning. From this character, Janus Lascaris 8030 will deserve an exception. His eloquence, politeness, and imperial descent recommended him to the French monarch, and in the same cities he was alternately employed to teach and to negotiate. Duty and interest prompted them to cultivate the study of the Latin language. 
and the most successful attained the faculty of writing and speaking with fluency and elegance in a foreign idiom. But they ever retained the inveterate vanity of their country, their praise, or at least their esteem, was reserved for the national writers, to whom they owed their fame and subsistence. And they sometimes betrayed their contempt in licentious criticism or satire on Virgil's poetry, and the oratory of Tully.8031 The superiority of these masters arose from the familiar use of a living language. And their first disciples were incapable of discerning how far they had degenerated from the knowledge, and even the practice of their ancestors. A vicious pronunciation 8032 which they introduced, was banished from the schools by the reason of the succeeding age. Of the power of the Greek accents they were ignorant. And those musical notes, which, from an Attic tongue, and to an Attic ear, must have been the secret soul of harmony, were to their eyes, as to our own, no more than minute and unmeaning marks, in prose superfluous and troublesome in verse. The art of grammar they truly possessed, the valuable fragments of Apollonius and Herodian were transfused into their lessons, and their treatises of syntax and etymology, though devoid of philosophic spirit, are still useful to the Greek student. In the shipwreck of the Byzantine libraries, each fugitive seized a fragment of treasure, a copy of some author, who without his industry might have perished, the transcripts were multiplied by an assiduous, and sometimes an elegant pen. And the text was corrected and explained by their own comments, or those of the elder scholiasts. The sense, though not the spirit, of the Greek classics, was interpreted to the Latin world, the beauties of style evaporate in aversion. But the judgment of Theodore Gaza selected the more solid works of Aristotle and Theophrastus, and their natural histories of animals and plants opened a rich fund of genuine and experimental science. Yet the fleeting shadows of metaphysics were pursued with more curiosity and ardor. After a long oblivion, Plato was revived in Italy by a venerable Greek 8033 who taught in the house of Cosmo of Medicis. While the Synod of Florence was involved in theological debate, some beneficial consequences might flow from the study of his elegant philosophy, his style is the purest standard of the Attic dialect. And his sublime thoughts are sometimes adapted to familiar conversation, and sometimes adorned with the richest colors of poetry and eloquence. The dialogues of Plato are a dramatic picture of the life and death of a sage, and, as often as he descends from the clouds, his moral system inculcates the love of truth, of our country, and of mankind. The precept and example of Socrates recommended a modest doubt and liberal inquiry. And if the Platonists, with blind devotion, adored the visions and errors of their divine master, their enthusiasm might correct the dry, dogmatic method of the peripatetic school. So equal, yet so opposite, are the merits of Plato and Aristotle, that they may be balanced in endless controversy, but some spark of freedom may be produced by the collision of adverse servitude. The modern Greeks were divided between the two sects, with more fury than skill they fought under the banner of their leaders, and the field of battle was removed in their flight from Constantinople to Rome. But this philosophical debate soon degenerated into an angry and personal quarrel of grammarians, and Bessarion, though an advocate for Plato, protected the national honor, by interposing the advice and authority of a mediator. In the gardens of the Medici, the academical doctrine was enjoyed by the polite and learned, but their philosophic society was quickly dissolved. And if the writings of the Attic sage were perused in the closet, the more powerful Stagirite continued to reign, the oracle of the church and school. 8034. I have fairly represented the literary merits of the Greeks. Yet it must be confessed, that they were seconded and surpassed by the ardor of the Latins. Italy was divided into many independent states. And at that time it was the ambition of princes and republics to vie with each other in the encouragement and reward of literature. The fame of Nicholas V 8035 has not been adequate to his merits. From a plebeian origin he raised himself by his virtue and learning, the character of the man prevailed over the interest of the Pope, and he sharpened those weapons which were soon pointed against the Roman Church. 8036 He had been the friend of the most eminent scholars of the age, he became their patron, and such was the humility of his manners, that the change was scarcely discernible either to them or to himself. If he pressed the acceptance of a liberal gift, it was not as the measure of desert, but as the proof of benevolence. 
And when modest merit declined his bounty, accept it, would he say, with a consciousness of his own worth, ye will not always have a Nicholas among you. The influence of the Holy See pervaded Christendom. And he exerted that influence in the search, not of benefices, but of books. From the ruins of the Byzantine libraries, from the darkest monasteries of Germany and Britain, he collected the dusty manuscripts of the writers of antiquity. And wherever the original could not be removed, a faithful copy was transcribed and transmitted for his use. The Vatican, the old repository for bulls and legends, for superstition and forgery, was daily replenished with more precious furniture. And such was the industry of Nicholas, that in a reign of eight years he formed a library of five thousand volumes. To his munificence the Latin world was indebted for the versions of Xenophon, Diodorus, Polybius, Thucydides, Herodotus, and Appian. Of Strabo's geography, of the Iliad, of the most valuable works of Plato and Aristotle, of Ptolemy and Theophrastus, and of the fathers of the Greek Church. The example of the Roman pontiff was preceded or imitated by a Florentine merchant, who governed the Republic without arms and without a title. Cosmo of Medici's 8037 was the father of a line of princes, whose name and age are almost synonymous with the restoration of learning, his credit was ennobled into fame, his riches were dedicated to the service of mankind. He corresponded at once with Cairo and London, and a cargo of Indian spices and Greek books was often imported in the same vessel. The genius and education of his grandson Lorenzo rendered him not only a patron, but a judge and candidate, in the literary race. In his palace, distress was entitled to relief, and merit to reward, his leisure hours were delightfully spent in the Platonic Academy, he encouraged the emulation of Demetrius Calcocondyles and Angelo Politian. And his active missionary Janus Lascaris returned from the East with a treasure of two hundred manuscripts, fourscore of which were as yet unknown in the libraries of Europe. Eighty thirty-eight the rest of Italy was animated by a similar spirit, and the progress of the nation repaid the liberality of their princes. The Latins held the exclusive property of their own literature. And these disciples of Greece were soon capable of transmitting and improving the lessons which they had imbibed. After a short succession of foreign teachers, the tide of emigration subsided. But the language of Constantinople was spread beyond the Alps and the natives of France, Germany, and England 8039 imparted to their country the sacred fire which they had kindled in the schools of Florence and Rome. 8040 in the productions of the mind, as in those of the soil, the gifts of nature are excelled by industry and skill, the Greek authors, forgotten on the banks of the Elysus have been illustrated on those of the Elba and the Thames, and Bessarion or Gaza might have envied the superior science of the barbarians. The accuracy of Budeus, the taste of Erasmus, the copiousness of Stevens, the erudition of Scaliger, the discernment of Reisk, or of Bentley. On the side of the Latins, the discovery of printing was a casual advantage, but this useful art has been applied by Aldus, and his innumerable successors, to perpetuate and multiply the works of antiquity. 8041 A single manuscript imported from Greece is revived in 10,000 copies, and each copy is fairer than the original. In this form, Homer and Plato would peruse with more satisfaction their own writings. And their scholiasts must resign the prize to the labors of our Western editors. Before the revival of classic literature, the barbarians in Europe were immersed in ignorance. And their vulgar tongues were marked with the rudeness and poverty of their manners. The students of the more perfect idioms of Rome and Greece were introduced to a new world of light and science. To the society of the free and polished nations of antiquity, and to a familiar converse with those immortal men who spoke the sublime language of eloquence and reason. Such an intercourse must tend to refine the taste, and to elevate the genius, of the moderns, and yet, from the first experiments, it might appear that the study of the ancients had given fetters, rather than wings, to the human mind. However laudable, the spirit of imitation is of a servile caste, and the first disciples of the Greeks and Romans were a colony of strangers in the midst of their age and country. The minute and laborious diligence which explored the antiquities of remote times might have improved or adorned the present state of society, the critic and metaphysician were the slaves of Aristotle. The poets, historians, and orators, 
were proud to repeat the thoughts and words of the Augustan age, the works of nature were observed with the eyes of Pliny and Theophrastus. And some pagan votaries professed a secret devotion to the gods of Homer and Plato. 8042 The Italians were oppressed by the strength and number of their ancient auxiliaries, the century after the deaths of Petrarch and Bacchus was filled with a crowd of Latin imitators, who decently repose on our shelves. But in that era of learning it will not be easy to discern a real discovery of science, a work of invention or eloquence, in the popular language of the country. 8043 But as soon as it had been deeply saturated with the celestial dew, the soil was quickened into vegetation and life, the modern idioms were refined, the classics of Athens and Rome inspired a pure taste and a generous emulation. And in Italy, as afterwards in France and England, the pleasing reign of poetry and fiction was succeeded by the light of speculative and experimental philosophy. Genius may anticipate the season of maturity. But in the education of a people, as in that of an individual, memory must be exercised, before the powers of reason and fancy can be expanded, nor may the artist hope to equal or surpass, till he has learned to imitate. The Works of His Predecessors LXV, Schism of the Greeks and Latins Schism of the Greeks and Latins. Reign and character of Amurath II. Crusade of Ladislaus, King of Hungary. His defeat in death. John Huniades. Skanderbeg. Constantine Paleologus, last emperor of the East. The respective merits of Rome and Constantinople are compared and celebrated by an eloquent Greek, the father of the Italian schools. 8044 The view of the ancient capital, the seat of his ancestors, surpassed the most sanguine expectations of Emmanuel Chrysoloras, and he no longer blamed the exclamation of an old sophist, that Rome was the habitation, not of men, but of gods. Those gods, and those men, had long since vanished, but to the eye of liberal enthusiasm, the majesty of ruin restored the image of her ancient prosperity. The monuments of the consuls and Caesars, of the martyrs and apostles, engaged on all sides the curiosity of the philosopher and the Christian. And he confessed that in every age the arms and the religion of Rome were destined to reign over the earth. While Chrysoloras admired the venerable beauties of the mother, he was not forgetful of his native country, her fairest daughter, her imperial colony. And the Byzantine patriot expatiates with zeal and truth on the eternal advantages of nature, and the more transitory glories of art and dominion, which adorned, or had adorned, the city of Constantine. Yet the perfection of the copy still redounds, as he modestly observes, to the honor of the original, and parents are delighted to be renewed, and even excelled, by the superior merit of their children. Constantinople, says the orator, is situate on a commanding point, between Europe and Asia, between the archipelago and the Euxine. By her interposition, the two seas, and the two continents, are united for the common benefit of nations. And the gates of commerce may be shut or opened at her command. The harbor, encompassed on all sides by the sea, and the continent, is the most secure and capacious in the world. The walls and gates of Constantinople may be compared with those of Babylon, the towers many, each tower is a solid and lofty structure. And the second wall, the outer fortification, would be sufficient for the defense and dignity of an ordinary capital. A broad and rapid stream may be introduced into the ditches and the artificial island may be encompassed, like Athens 8045 by land or water. Two strong and natural causes are alleged for the perfection of the model of New Rome. The royal founder reigned over the most illustrious nations of the globe, and in the accomplishment of his designs, the power of the Romans was combined with the art and science of the Greeks. Other cities have been reared to maturity by accident and time, their beauties are mingled with disorder and deformity. And the inhabitants, unwilling to remove from their natal spot, are incapable of correcting the errors of their ancestors, and the original vices of situation or climate. But the free idea of Constantinople was formed and executed by a single mind. And the primitive model was improved by the obedient zeal of the subjects and successors of the first monarch. The adjacent isles were stored with an inexhaustible supply of marble. But the various materials were transported from the most remote shores of Europe and Asia. And the public and private buildings, the palaces, churches, 
aqueducts, cisterns, porticos, columns, baths, and hippodromes, were adapted to the greatness of the capital of the East. The superfluity of wealth was spread along the shores of Europe and Asia, and the Byzantine territory, as far as the Euxine, the Hellespont, and the Long Wall, might be considered as a populous suburb and a perpetual garden. In this flattering picture, the past and the present, the times of prosperity and decay, are artfully confounded, but a sigh and a confession escape, from the orator, that his wretched country was the shadow and sepulchre of its former self. The works of ancient sculpture had been defaced by Christian zeal or barbaric violence, the fairest structures were demolished, and the marbles of Paros or Numidia were burnt for lime, or applied to the meanest uses. Of many a statue, the place was marked by an empty pedestal, of many a column, the size was determined by a broken capital, the tombs of the emperors were scattered on the ground, the stroke of time was accelerated by storms and earthquakes. And the vacant space was adorned, by vulgar tradition, with fabulous monuments of gold and silver. From these wonders, which lived only in memory or belief, he distinguishes, however, the porphyry pillar, the column and colossus of Justinian 8046 and the church, more especially the dome, of Saint Sophia. The best conclusion, since it could not be described according to its merits, and after it no other object could deserve to be mentioned. But he forgets that, a century before, the trembling fabrics of the Colossus and the Church had been saved and supported by the timely care of Andronicus the Elder. Thirty years after the Emperor had fortified Asti. Sophia with two new buttresses or pyramids, the Eastern Hemisphere suddenly gave way, and the images, the altars, and the sanctuary, were crushed by the falling ruin. The mischief indeed was speedily repaired. The rubbish was cleared by the incessant labor of every rank and age, and the poor remains of riches and industry were consecrated by the Greeks to the most stately and venerable temple of the East. 8047. The last hope of the falling city and empire was placed in the harmony of the mother and daughter, in the maternal tenderness of Rome, and the filial obedience of Constantinople. In the Synod of Florence, the Greeks and Latins had embraced, and subscribed, and promised, but these signs of friendship were perfidious or fruitless, 8048 and the baseless fabric of the Union vanished like a dream. 8049 The Emperor and his prelates returned home in the Venetian galleys, but as they touched at the Moria and the Isles of Corfu and Lesbos, the subjects of the Latins complained that the pretended Union would be an instrument of oppression. No sooner did they land on the Byzantine shore, then they were saluted, or rather assailed, with a general murmur of zeal and discontent. During their absence, above two years, the capital had been deprived of its civil and ecclesiastical rulers. Fanaticism fermented in anarchy, the most furious monks reigned over the conscience of women and bigots, and the hatred of the Latin name was the first principle of nature and religion. Before his departure for Italy, the emperor had flattered the city with the assurance of a prompt relief and a powerful succor. And the clergy, confident in their orthodoxy and science, had promised themselves and their flocks an easy victory over the blind shepherds of the West. The double disappointment exasperated the Greeks. The conscience of the subscribing prelates was awakened, the hour of temptation was past, and they had more to dread from the public resentment, than they could hope from the favor of the emperor or the pope. Instead of justifying their conduct, they deplored their weakness, professed their contrition, and cast themselves on the mercy of God and of their brethren. To the reproachful question, what had been the event or the use of their Italian synod? They answered with sighs and tears, Alas! We have made a new faith, we have exchanged piety for impiety, we have betrayed the Immaculate Sacrifice, and we are become Azimites. The Azimites were those who celebrated the communion with unleavened bread, and I must retract or qualify the praise which I have bestowed on the growing philosophy of the times. Alas! We have been seduced by distress, by fraud, and by the hopes and fears of a transitory life. The hand that has signed the union should be cut off, and the tongue that has pronounced the Latin creed deserves to be torn from the root. The best proof of their repentance was an increase of zeal for the most trivial rites and the most incomprehensible doctrines, and an absolute separation from all, without accepting their prince, who preserved some regard for honor and consistency. After the decease of the patriarch Joseph, 
the archbishops of Heraclea and Trebizond had courage to refuse the vacant office, and Cardinal Bessarion preferred the warm and comfortable shelter of the Vatican. The choice of the emperor and his clergy was confined to metrophanes of Cyzicus, he was consecrated in St. Sophia, but the temple was vacant. The cross-bearers abdicated their service, the infection spread from the city to the villages. And metrophanes discharged, without effect, some ecclesiastical thunders against a nation of schismatics. The eyes of the Greeks were directed to Mark of Ephesus, the champion of his country. And the sufferings of the Holy Confessor were repaid with a tribute of admiration and applause. His example and writings propagated the flame of religious discord, age and infirmity soon removed him from the world. But the Gospel of Mark was not a law of forgiveness, and he requested with his dying breath, that none of the adherents of Rome might attend his obsequies or pray for his soul. The schism was not confined to the narrow limits of the Byzantine Empire. Secure under the Mameluk scepter, the three patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, assembled a numerous synod. Disowned their representatives at Ferrara and Florence, condemned the creed and council of the Latins, and threatened the emperor of Constantinople with the censures of the Eastern Church. Of the sectaries of the Greek communion, the Russians were the most powerful, ignorant, and superstitious. Their primate, the Cardinal Isidore, hastened from Florence to Moscow 8050 to reduce the independent nation under the Roman yoke. But the Russian bishops had been educated at Mount Athos, and the prince and people embraced the theology of their priests. They were scandalized by the title, the pomp, the Latin cross of the legate, the friend of those impious men who shaved their beards, and performed the divine office with gloves on their hands and rings on their fingers, Isidore was condemned by a synod. His person was imprisoned in a monastery, and it was with extreme difficulty that the cardinal could escape from the hands of a fierce and fanatic people. 8051 The Russians refused a passage to the missionaries of Rome who aspired to convert the pagans beyond the Tanais, 8052 and their refusal was justified by the maxim, that the guilt of idolatry is less damnable than that of schism. The errors of the Bohemians were excused by their abhorrence for the Pope, and a deputation of the Greek clergy solicited the friendship of those sanguinary enthusiasts. 8053 While Eugenius triumphed in the union and orthodoxy of the Greeks, his party was contracted to the walls, or rather to the palace of Constantinople. The zeal of Paleologus had been excited by interest. It was soon cooled by opposition, an attempt to violate the national belief might endanger his life and crown, not could the pious rebels be destitute of foreign and domestic aid. The sword of his brother Demetrius, who in Italy had maintained a prudent and popular silence, was half unsheathed in the cause of religion. And Amurath, the Turkish sultan, was displeased and alarmed by the seeming friendship of the Greeks and Latins. Sultan Murad, or Amurath, lived forty-nine, and reigned thirty years, six months, and eight days. He was a just and valiant prince, of a great soul, patient of labors, learned, merciful, religious, charitable, a lover and encourager of the studious, and of all who excelled in any art or science, a good emperor and a great general. No man obtained more or greater victories than Amurath, Belgrade alone withstood his attacks. 8054 Under his reign, the soldier was ever victorious, the citizen rich and secure. If he subdued any country, his first care was to build mosques and caravanserahs, hospitals, and colleges. Every year he gave a thousand pieces of gold to the sons of the Prophet. And sent two thousand five hundred to the religious persons of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. 8055 This portrait is transcribed from the historian of the Othman Empire, but the applause of a servile and superstitious people has been lavished on the worst of tyrants. And the virtues of a sultan are often the vices most useful to himself, or most agreeable to his subjects. A nation ignorant of the equal benefits of liberty and law, must be awed by the flashes of arbitrary power, the cruelty of a despot will assume the character of justice, his profusion, of liberality his obstinacy, of firmness. If the most reasonable excuse be rejected, few acts of obedience will be found impossible, and guilt must tremble, where innocence cannot always be secure. The tranquility of the people, and the discipline of the troops, were best maintained by perpetual action in the field, 
war was the trade of the Janizaries. And those who survived the peril, and divided the spoil, applauded the generous ambition of their sovereign. To propagate the true religion, was the duty of a faithful Muslim, the unbelievers were his enemies, and those of the Prophet. And, in the hands of the Turks, the scimitar was the only instrument of conversion. Under these circumstances, however, the justice and moderation of Amurath are attested by his conduct, and acknowledged by the Christians themselves. Who consider a prosperous reign and a peaceful death as the reward of his singular merits. In the vigor of his age and military power, he seldom engaged in war till he was justified by a previous and adequate provocation, the victorious sultan was disarmed by submission. And in the observance of treaties, his word was inviolate and sacred. 8056 The Hungarians were commonly the aggressors, he was provoked by the revolt of Skanderbeg. And the perfidious Karamanian was twice vanquished, and twice pardoned, by the Ottoman monarch. Before he invaded the Moria, Thebes had been surprised by the despot, in the conquest of Thessalonica, the grandson of Bajaze might dispute the recent purchase of the Venetians. And after the first siege of Constantinople, the Sultan was never tempted, by the distress, the absence, or the injuries of Paleologus, to extinguish the dying light of the Byzantine Empire. But the most striking feature in the life and character of Amurath is the double abdication of the Turkish throne. And, were not his motives debased by an alloy of superstition, we must praise the royal philosopher 8057 who at the age of forty could discern the vanity of human greatness. Resigning the scepter to his son, he retired to the pleasant residence of Magnesia, but he retired to the society of saints and hermits. It was not till the fourth century of the Hijra, that the religion of Muhammad had been corrupted by an institution so adverse to his genius. But in the age of the Crusades, the various orders of Dervises were multiplied by the example of the Christian, and even the Latin, monks. 8058 The Lord of Nations submitted to fast, and pray, and turn round 8059 in endless rotation with the fanatics, who mistook the giddiness of the head for the illumination of the spirit. 8060 But he was soon awakened from his dreams of enthusiasm by the Hungarian invasion, and his obedient son was the foremost to urge the public danger and the wishes of the people. Under the banner of their veteran leader, the Janizaries fought and conquered but he withdrew from the field of Varna, again to pray, to fast, and to turn round with his Magnesian brethren. These pious occupations were again interrupted by the danger of the state. A victorious army disdained the inexperience of their youthful ruler, the city of Adrianople was abandoned to rapine and slaughter. And the unanimous divan implored his presence to appease the tumult, and prevent the rebellion, of the Janizaries. At the well-known voice of their master, they trembled and obeyed. And the reluctant sultan was compelled to support his splendid servitude, till at the end of four years, he was relieved by the angel of death. Age or disease, misfortune or caprice, have tempted several princes to descend from the throne. And they have had leisure to repent of their irretrievable step. But Amurath alone, in the full liberty of choice, after the trial of empire and solitude, has repeated his preference of a private life. After the departure of his Greek brethren, Eugenius had not been unmindful of their temporal interest. And his tender regard for the Byzantine Empire was animated by a just apprehension of the Turks, who approached, and might soon invade, the borders of Italy. But the spirit of the Crusades had expired. And the coldness of the Franks was not less unreasonable than their headlong passion. In the eleventh century, a fanatic monk could precipitate Europe on Asia for the recovery of the Holy Sepulchre. But in the fifteenth, the most pressing motives of religion and policy were insufficient to unite the Latins in the defense of Christendom. Germany was an inexhaustible storehouse of men and arms, 8061 but that complex and languid body required the impulse of a vigorous hand, and Frederick III was alike impotent in his personal character and his imperial dignity. A long war had impaired the strength, without satiating the animosity, of France and England 8062 but Philip Duke of Burgundy was a vain and magnificent prince. And he enjoyed, without danger or expense, the adventurous piety of his subjects, who sailed, in a gallant fleet, from the coast of Flanders to the Hellespont. The maritime republics of Venice and Genoa were less remote from the scene of action. 
and their hostile fleets were associated under the standard of St. Peter. The kingdoms of Hungary and Poland, which covered as it were the interior pale of the Latin Church, were the most nearly concerned to oppose the progress of the Turks. Arms were the patrimony of the Scythians and Sarmatians, and these nations might appear equal to the contest, could they point, against the common foe, those swords that were so wantonly drawn in bloody and domestic quarrels. But the same spirit was adverse to concord and obedience, a poor country and a limited monarch are incapable of maintaining a standing force. And the loose bodies of Polish and Hungarian horse were not armed with the sentiments and weapons which, on some occasions, have given irresistible weight to the French chivalry. Yet, on this side, the designs of the Roman pontiff, and the eloquence of Cardinal Julian, his legate, were promoted by the circumstances of the times 8063 by the union of the two crowns on the head of Ladislas 8064 a young and ambitious soldier. By the valor of a hero, whose name, the name of John Huniades, was already popular among the Christians, and formidable to the Turks. An endless treasure of pardons and indulgences was scattered by the legate. Many private warriors of France and Germany enlisted under the Holy Banner, and the crusade derived some strength, or at least some reputation, from the new allies both of Europe and Asia. A fugitive despot of Serbia exaggerated the distress and ardor of the Christians beyond the Danube, who would unanimously rise to vindicate their religion and liberty. The Greek emperor 8065 with a spirit unknown to his fathers, engaged to guard the Bosphorus, and to sally from Constantinople at the head of his national and mercenary troops. The Sultan of Karamania 8066 announced the retreat of Amurath, and a powerful diversion in the heart of Anatolia. And if the fleets of the West could occupy at the same moment the Straits of the Hellespont, the Ottoman monarchy would be dissevered and destroyed. Heaven and earth must rejoice in the perdition of the miscreants. And the legate, with prudent ambiguity, instilled the opinion of the invisible, perhaps the visible, aid of the Son of God, and his Divine Mother. Of the Polish and Hungarian diets, a religious war was the unanimous cry. And Ladislaus, after passing the Danube, led an army of his Confederate subjects as far as Sofia, the capital of the Bulgarian kingdom. In this expedition they obtained two signal victories, which were justly ascribed to the valor and conduct of Huniades. In the first, with a vanguard of ten thousand men, he surprised the Turkish camp. In the second, he vanquished and made prisoner the most renowned of their generals, who possessed the double advantage of ground and numbers. The approach of winter, and the natural and artificial obstacles of Mount Hemus, arrested the progress of the hero, who measured a narrow interval of six days' march from the foot of the mountains to the hostile towers of Adrianople, and the friendly capital of the Greek Empire. The retreat was undisturbed, and the entrance into Buda was at once a military and religious triumph. An ecclesiastical procession was followed by the king and his warriors on foot, he nicely balanced the merits and rewards of the two nations. And the pride of conquest was blended with the humble temper of Christianity. Thirteen bashaws, nine standards, and four thousand captives, were unquestionable trophies. And as all were willing to believe, and none were present to contradict, the crusaders multiplied, with unblushing confidence, the myriads of Turks whom they had left on the field of battle. 8067 The most solid proof, and the most salutary consequence, of victory, was a deputation from the divan to solicit peace, to restore Serbia, to ransom the prisoners, and to evacuate the Hungarian frontier. By this treaty, the rational objects of the war were obtained, the king, the despot, and Huniades himself, in the Diet of Sejidin, were satisfied with public and private emolument, a truce of ten years was concluded. And the followers of Jesus and Muhammad, who swore on the Gospel and the Quran, attested the Word of God as the guardian of truth and the avenger of perfidy. In the place of the Gospel, the Turkish ministers had proposed to substitute the Eucharist, the real presence of the Catholic deity, but the Christians refused to profane their holy mysteries. And a superstitious conscience is less forcibly bound by the spiritual energy, than by the outward and visible symbols of an oath. 8068. During the whole transaction, the cardinal legate had observed a sullen silence, unwilling to approve, and unable to oppose, the consent of the king and people. 
But the Diet was not dissolved before Julian was fortified by the welcome intelligence, that Anatolia was invaded by the Caramanian, and Thrace by the Greek Emperor, that the fleets of Genoa, Venice, and Burgundy, were masters of the Hellespont. And that the Allies, informed of the victory, and ignorant of the treaty, of Ladislaus, impatiently waited for the return of his victorious army. And is it thus, exclaimed the Cardinal 8069, that you will desert their expectations and your own fortune? It is to them, to your God, and your fellow Christians, that you have pledged your faith. And that prior obligation annihilates a rash and sacrilegious oath to the enemies of Christ. His vicar on earth is the Roman pontiff, without whose sanction you can neither promise nor perform. In his name I absolve your perjury and sanctify your arms, follow my footsteps in the paths of glory and salvation, and if still ye have scruples, devolve on my head the punishment and the sin. This mischievous casuistry was seconded by his respectable character, and the levity of popular assemblies, war was resolved, on the same spot where peace had so lately been sworn. And, in the execution of the treaty, the Turks were assaulted by the Christians, to whom, with some reason, they might apply the epithet of infidels. The falsehood of Ladislaus to his word and oath was palliated by the religion of the times, the most perfect, or at least the most popular, excuse would have been the success of his arms and the deliverance of the Eastern Church. But the same treaty which should have bound his conscience had diminished his strength. On the proclamation of the peace, the French and German volunteers departed with indignant murmurs, the Poles were exhausted by distant warfare, and perhaps disgusted with foreign command. And their palatines accepted the first license, and hastily retired to their provinces and castles. Even Hungary was divided by faction, or restrained by a laudable scruple. And the relics of the crusade that marched in the second expedition were reduced to an inadequate force of twenty thousand men. A Wallachian chief, who joined the royal standard with his vassals, presumed to remark that their numbers did not exceed the hunting retinue that sometimes attended the sultan. And the gift of two horses of matchless speed might admonish Ladislaus of his secret foresight of the event. But the despot of Servia, after the restoration of his country and children, was tempted by the promise of new realms. And the inexperience of the king, the enthusiasm of the legate, and the martial presumption of Huniades himself, were persuaded that every obstacle must yield to the invincible virtue of the sword and the cross. After the passage of the Danube, two roads might lead to Constantinople and the Hellespont, the one direct, abrupt, and difficult through the mountains of Hemus. The other more tedious and secure, over a level country, and along the shores of the Euxine, in which their flanks, according to the Scythian discipline, might always be covered by a movable fortification of wagons. The latter was judiciously preferred, the Catholics marched through the plains of Bulgaria, burning, with wanton cruelty, the churches and villages of the Christian natives, and their last station was at Warna, near the seashore. On which the defeat and death of Ladislaus have bestowed a memorable name. 8070. It was on this fatal spot, that, instead of finding a confederate fleet to second their operations, they were alarmed by the approach of Amurath himself, who had issued from his Magnesian solitude, and transported the forces of Asia to the defense of Europe. According to some writers, the Greek emperor had been awed, or seduced, to grant the passage of the Bosphorus. And an indelible stain of corruption is fixed on the Genoese, or the Pope's nephew, the Catholic admiral, whose mercenary connivance betrayed the guard of the Hellespont. From Adrianople, the Sultan advanced by hasty marches, at the head of sixty thousand men. And when the Cardinal, and Huniades, had taken a nearer survey of the numbers and order of the Turks, these ardent warriors proposed the tardy and impracticable measure of a retreat. The king alone was resolved to conquer or die. And his resolution had almost been crowned with a glorious and salutary victory. The princes were opposite to each other in the center. And the Beglerbegs, or generals of Anatolia and Romania, commanded on the right and left, against the adverse divisions of the despot and Huniades. The Turkish wings were broken on the first onset, but the advantage was fatal. And the rash victors, in the heat of the pursuit, were carried away far from the annoyance of the enemy, or the support of their friends. When Amurath beheld the flight of his squadrons, 
he despaired of his fortune and that of the empire, a veteran Janissary seized his horse's bridle. And he had magnanimity to pardon and reward the soldier who dared to perceive the terror, and arrest the flight, of his sovereign. A copy of the treaty, the monument of Christian perfidy, had been displayed in the front of battle. And it is said, that the sultan in his distress, lifting his eyes and his hands to heaven, implored the protection of the God of truth, and called on the prophet Jesus himself to avenge the impious mockery of his name and religion. 8071 With inferior numbers and disordered ranks, the king of Hungary rushed forward in the confidence of victory, till his career was stopped by the impenetrable phalanx of the Janissaries. If we may credit the Ottoman annals, his horse was pierced by the javelin of Amurath, 8072 He fell among the spears of the infantry, and a Turkish soldier proclaimed with a loud voice, Hungarians, behold the head of your king. The death of Ladislaus was the signal of their defeat. On his return from an intemperate pursuit, Huniades deplored his error, and the public loss. He strove to rescue the royal body, till he was overwhelmed by the tumultuous crowd of the victors and vanquished, and the last efforts of his courage and conduct were exerted to save the remnant of his Wallachian cavalry. Ten thousand Christians were slain in the disastrous Battle of Warna, the loss of the Turks, more considerable in numbers, bore a smaller proportion to their total strength. Yet the philosophic sultan was not ashamed to confess, that his ruin must be the consequence of a second and similar victory. 8073 At his command a column was erected on the spot where Ladislaus had fallen. But the modest inscription, instead of accusing the rashness, recorded the valor, and bewailed the misfortune, of the Hungarian youth. 8074 Before I lose sight of the field of Warna, I am tempted to pause on the character and story of two principal actors, the Cardinal Julian and John Huniates. Julian 8075 Cesarini was born of a noble family of Rome, his studies had embraced both the Latin and Greek learning, both the sciences of divinity and law, and his versatile genius was equally adapted to the schools, the camp, and the court. No sooner had he been invested with the Roman purple, than he was sent into Germany to arm the empire against the rebels and heretics of Bohemia. The spirit of persecution is unworthy of a Christian, the military profession ill becomes a priest. But the former is excused by the times, and the latter was ennobled by the courage of Julian, who stood dauntless and alone in the disgraceful flight of the German host. As the Pope's legate, he opened the Council of Basel. But the President soon appeared the most strenuous champion of ecclesiastical freedom, and an opposition of seven years was conducted by his ability and zeal. After promoting the strongest measures against the authority and person of Eugenius, some secret motive of interest or conscience engaged him to desert on a sudden the popular party. The cardinal withdrew himself from Basel to Ferrara. And, in the debates of the Greeks and Latins, the two nations admired the dexterity of his arguments and the depth of his theological erudition. 8076 In his Hungarian embassy, we have already seen the mischievous effects of his sophistry and eloquence, of which Julian himself was the first victim. The cardinal, who performed the duties of a priest and a soldier, was lost in the defeat of Warna. The circumstances of his death are variously related. But it is believed, that a weighty encumbrance of gold impeded his flight, and tempted the cruel avarice of some Christian fugitives. From an humble, or at least a doubtful origin, the merit of John Huniades promoted him to the command of the Hungarian armies. His father was a Wallachian, his mother a Greek, her unknown race might possibly ascend to the emperors of Constantinople. And the claims of the Wallachians, with the surname of Corvinus, from the place of his nativity, might suggest a thin pretense for mingling his blood with the patricians of ancient Rome. 8077 In his youth he served in the wars of Italy, and was retained, with twelve horsemen, by the Bishop of Zagreb, the valor of the White Knight 8078 was soon conspicuous, he increased his fortunes by a noble and wealthy marriage. And in the defense of the Hungarian borders he won in the same year three battles against the Turks. By his influence, Ladislaus of Poland obtained the crown of Hungary. And the important service was rewarded by the title and office of Wavet of Transylvania. The first of Julian's crusades added two Turkish laurels on his brow, and in the public distress the fatal errors of Warna were forgotten. 
During the absence and minority of Ladislaus of Austria, the titular king, Cuniades was elected supreme captain and governor of Hungary. And if envy at first was silenced by terror, a reign of twelve years supposes the arts of policy as well as of war. Yet the idea of a consummate general is not delineated in his campaigns. The white knight fought with the hand rather than the head, as the chief of desultory barbarians, who attack without fear and fly without shame, and his military life is composed of a romantic alternative of victories and escapes. By the Turks, who employed his name to frighten their perverse children, he was corruptly denominated Jankis Lane, or the wicked, their hatred is the proof of their esteem, the kingdom which he guarded was inaccessible to their arms. And they felt him most daring and formidable, when they fondly believed the captain and his country irrecoverably lost. Instead of confining himself to a defensive war, for years after the defeat of Warna he again penetrated into the heart of Bulgaria, and in the plain of Kosova, sustained, till the third day, the shock of the Ottoman army. For times more numerous than his own. As he fled alone through the woods of Wallachia, the hero was surprised by two robbers. But while they disputed a gold chain that hung at his neck, he recovered his sword, slew the one, terrified the other, and, after new perils of captivity or death, consoled by his presence in afflicted kingdom. But the last and most glorious action of his life was the defense of Belgrade against the powers of Mohammed II in person. After a siege of forty days, the Turks, who had already entered the town, were compelled to retreat. And the joyful nations celebrated Huniades and Belgrade as the bulwarks of Christendom. 8079 About a month after this great deliverance, the champion expired. And his most splendid epitaph is the regret of the Ottoman prince, who sighed that he could no longer hope for revenge against the single antagonist who had triumphed over his arms. On the first vacancy of the throne, Matthias Corvinus, a youth of eighteen years of age, was elected and crowned by the grateful Hungarians. His reign was prosperous and long, Matthias aspired to the glory of a conqueror and a saint, but his purest merit is the encouragement of learning. And the Latin orators and historians, who were invited from Italy by the sun, have shed the luster of their eloquence on the father's character. 8080. In the list of heroes, John Huniades and Skanderbeg are commonly associated. 8081 and they are both entitled to our notice, since their occupation of the Ottoman arms delayed the ruin of the Greek Empire. John Castriot, the father of Skanderbeg 8082 was the hereditary prince of a small district of Epirus or Albania, between the mountains and the Adriatic Sea. Unable to contend with the Sultan's power, Castriot submitted to the hard conditions of peace and tribute, he delivered his four sons as the pledges of his fidelity. And the Christian youths, after receiving the mark of circumcision, were instructed in the Mahometan religion, and trained in the arms and arts of Turkish policy. 8083 The three elder brothers were confounded in the crowd of slaves. And the poison to which their deaths are ascribed cannot be verified or disproved by any positive evidence. Yet the suspicion is in a great measure removed by the kind and paternal treatment of George Castriot, the fourth brother, who, from his tender youth, displayed the strength and spirit of a soldier. The successive overthrow of a Tartar and two Persians, who carried a proud defiance to the Turkish court, recommended him to the favor of Amurath, and his Turkish appellation of Skanderbeg, Iskanderbeg, or the Lord Alexander, is an indelible memorial of his glory and servitude. His father's principality was reduced into a province, but the loss was compensated by the rank and title of Sangiac, a command of five thousand horse, and the prospect of the first dignities of the empire. He served with honor in the wars of Europe and Asia, and we may smile at the art or credulity of the historian, who supposes, that in every encounter he spared the Christians, while he fell with a thundering arm on his Mussulman foes. The glory of Huniades is without reproach. He fought in the defense of his religion and country, but the enemies who applaud the patriot, have branded his rival with the name of traitor and apostate. In the eyes of the Christian, the rebellion of Skanderbeg is justified by his father's wrongs, the ambiguous death of his three brothers, his own degradation, and the slavery of his country. And they adore the generous, though tardy, zeal, with which he asserted the faith and independence of his ancestors. But he had imbibed from his ninth year the doctrines of the Quran, 
he was ignorant of the gospel. The religion of a soldier is determined by authority and habit, nor is it easy to conceive what new illumination at the age of 408084 could be poured into his soul. His motives would be less exposed to the suspicion of interest or revenge, had he broken his chain from the moment that he was sensible of its weight, but a long oblivion had surely impaired his original right. And every year of obedience and reward had cemented the mutual bond of the sultan and his subject. If Skanderbeg had long harbored the belief of Christianity and the intention of revolt, a worthy mind must condemn the base dissimulation, that could serve only to betray, that could promise only to be forsworn. That could actively join in the temporal and spiritual perdition of so many thousands of his unhappy brethren. Shall we praise a secret correspondence with Huniades, while he commanded the vanguard of the Turkish army? Shall we excuse the desertion of his standard, a treacherous desertion which abandoned the victory to the enemies of his benefactor? In the confusion of a defeat, the eye of Skanderbeg was fixed on the Rees Effendi or principal secretary, with the dagger at his breast, he extorted a firman or patent for the government of Albania. And the murder of the guiltless scribe and his train prevented the consequences of an immediate discovery. With some bold companions, to whom he had revealed his design he escaped in the night, by rapid marches, from the field or battle to his paternal mountains. The gates of Croia were open to the royal mandate. And no sooner did he command the fortress, than George Castriot dropped the mask of dissimulation, abjured the prophet and the sultan, and proclaimed himself the avenger of his family and country. The names of religion and liberty provoked a general revolt, the Albanians, a martial race, were unanimous to live and die with their hereditary prince, and the Ottoman garrisons were indulged in the choice of martyrdom or baptism. In the assembly of the states of Epirus, Skanderbeg was elected general of the Turkish war, and each of the allies engaged to furnish his respective proportion of men and money. From these contributions, from his patrimonial estate, and from the valuable salt pits of Selina, he drew an annual revenue of 200,000 ducats. 8085 and the entire sum, exempt from the demands of luxury, was strictly appropriated to the public use. His manners were popular, but his discipline was severe. And every superfluous vice was banished from his camp, his example strengthened his command, and under his conduct, the Albanians were invincible in their own opinion and that of their enemies. The bravest adventurers of France and Germany were allured by his fame and retained in his service, his standing militia consisted of 8,000 horse and 7,000 foot, the horses were small, the men were active. But he viewed with a discerning eye the difficulties and resources of the mountains, and, at the blaze of the beacons, the whole nation was distributed in the strongest posts. With such unequal arms Skanderbeg resisted twenty-three years the powers of the Ottoman Empire. And two conquerors, Amurath II, and his greater son, were repeatedly baffled by a rebel, whom they pursued with seeming contempt and implacable resentment. At the head of sixty thousand horse and forty thousand Janissaries, Amurath entered Albania, he might ravage the open country, occupy the defenseless towns, convert the churches into mosques, circumcise the Christian youths and punish with death his adult and obstinate captives, but the conquests of the sultan were confined to the petty fortress of Svetigrade. And the garrison, invincible to his arms, was oppressed by a paltry artifice and a superstitious scruple. 8086 Amurath retired with shame and loss from the walls of Croia, the castle and residence of the Castriots. The march, the siege, the retreat, were harassed by a vexatious, and almost invisible, adversary, 8087 and the disappointment might tend to embitter, perhaps to shorten, the last days of the Sultan. 8088 in the fullness of conquest, Muhammad II still felt at his bosom this domestic thorn, his lieutenants were permitted to negotiate a truce. And the Albanian prince may justly be praised as a firm and able champion of his national independence. The enthusiasm of chivalry and religion has ranked him with the names of Alexander and Pyrrhus. Nor would they blush to acknowledge their intrepid countrymen, but his narrow dominion, and slender powers, must leave him at an humble distance below the heroes of antiquity, who triumphed over the East and the Roman legions. His splendid achievements, the Bashas whom he encountered, the armies that he discomfited, and the three thousand Turks who were slain by his single hand, 
must be weighed in the scales of suspicious criticism. Against an illiterate enemy, and in the dark solitude of Epirus, his partial biographers may safely indulge the latitude of romance, but their fictions are exposed by the light of Italian history. And they afford a strong presumption against their own truth, by a fabulous tale of his exploits, when he passed the Adriatic with eight hundred horse to the succor of the king of Naples. 8089 Without disparagement to his fame, they might have owned, that he was finally oppressed by the Ottoman powers, in his extreme danger he applied to Pope Pius II for a refuge in the ecclesiastical state. And his resources were almost exhausted, since Skanderbeg died a fugitive at Lissus, on the Venetian territory. 8090 His sepulchre was soon violated by the Turkish conquerors. But the Janissaries, who wore his bones and chased in a bracelet, declared by this superstitious amulet their involuntary reverence for his valor. The instant ruin of his country may redound to the hero's glory. Yet, had he balanced the consequences of submission and resistance, a patriot perhaps would have declined the unequal contest which must depend on the life and genius of one man. Skanderbeg might indeed be supported by the rational, though fallacious, hope, that the Pope, the King of Naples, and the Venetian Republic, would join in the defense of a free and Christian people, who guarded the seacoast of the Adriatic. And the narrow passage from Greece to Italy. His infant son was saved from the national shipwreck, the Castriots 8091 were invested with a Neapolitan dukedom, and their blood continues to flow in the noblest families of the realm. A colony of Albanian fugitives obtained a settlement in Calabria, and they preserve at this day the language and manners of their ancestors. 8092. In the long career of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, I have reached at length the last reign of the princes of Constantinople, who so feebly sustained the name and majesty of the Caesars. On the decease of John Paleologus, who survived about four years the Hungarian Crusade 8093 the royal family, by the death of Andronicus and the monastic profession of Isidore, was reduced to three princes, Constantine, Demetrius, and Thomas. The surviving sons of the Emperor Manuel. Of these the first and the last were far distant in the Moria, but Demetrius, who possessed the domain of Salibria, was in the suburbs, at the head of a party, his ambition was not chilled by the public distress. And his conspiracy with the Turks and the schismatics had already disturbed the peace of his country. The funeral of the late emperor was accelerated with singular and even suspicious haste, the claim of Demetrius to the vacant throne was justified by a trite and flimsy sophism, that he was born in the purple, the eldest son of his father's reign. But the empress mother, the senate and soldiers, the clergy and people, were unanimous in the cause of the lawful successor, and the despot Thomas, who, ignorant of the change, accidentally returned to the capital asserted with becoming zeal the interest of his absent brother. An ambassador, the historian Franza, was immediately dispatched to the court of Adrianople. Amurath received him with honor and dismissed him with gifts. But the gracious approbation of the Turkish sultan announced his supremacy, and the approaching downfall of the Eastern Empire. By the hands of two illustrious deputies, the imperial crown was placed at Sparta on the head of Constantine. In the spring he sailed from the Moria, escaped the encounter of a Turkish squadron, enjoyed the acclamations of his subjects, celebrated the festival of a new reign, and exhausted by his donatives the treasure, or rather the indigence of the state. The emperor immediately resigned to his brothers the possession of the Moria, and the brittle friendship of the two princes, Demetrius and Thomas, was confirmed in their mother's presence by the frail security of oaths and embraces. His next occupation was the choice of a consort. A daughter of the Doge of Venice had been proposed, but the Byzantine nobles objected the distance between an hereditary monarch and an elective magistrate. And in their subsequent distress, the chief of that powerful republic was not unmindful of the affront. Constantine afterwards hesitated between the royal families of Trebizond and Georgia. And the embassy of Franza represents in his public and private life the last days of the Byzantine Empire. 8094. The protovestiaire, or great chamberlain, Franza sailed from Constantinople as the minister of a bridegroom. And the relics of wealth and luxury were applied to his pompous appearance. 
His numerous retinue consisted of nobles and guards, of physicians and monks, he was attended by a band of music. And the term of his costly embassy was protracted above two years. On his arrival in Georgia or Iberia, the natives from the towns and villages flocked around the strangers. And such was their simplicity, that they were delighted with the effects, without understanding the cause, of musical harmony. Among the crowd was an old man, above a hundred years of age, who had formerly been carried away a captive by the barbarians, 8095 and who amused his hearers with a tale of the wonders of India. 8096 from whence he had returned to Portugal by an unknown sea. 8097 from this hospitable land, Franza proceeded to the court of Trebizond, where he was informed by the Greek prince of the recent decease of Amurath. Instead of rejoicing in the deliverance, the experienced statesman expressed his apprehension, that an ambitious youth would not long adhere to the sage and pacific system of his father. After the sultan's decease, his Christian wife, Maria, 8098 the daughter of the Servian despot, had been honorably restored to her parents. On the fame of her beauty and merit, she was recommended by the ambassador as the most worthy object of the royal choice, and Franza recapitulates and refutes the specious objections that might be raised against the proposal. The majesty of the purple would ennoble an unequal alliance, the bar of affinity might be removed by liberal alms and the dispensation of the church, the disgrace of Turkish nuptials had been repeatedly overlooked. And, though the fair Maria was nearly fifty years of age, she might yet hope to give an heir to the empire. Constantine listened to the advice, which was transmitted in the first ship that sailed from Trebizond. But the factions of the court opposed his marriage, and it was finally prevented by the pious vow of the sultana, who ended her days in the monastic profession. Reduced to the first alternative, the choice of Franza was decided in favor of a Georgian princess, and the vanity of her father was dazzled by the glorious alliance. Instead of demanding, according to the primitive and national custom, a price for his daughter, 8099 he offered a portion of 56,000, with an annual pension of 5,000, ducats. And the services of the ambassador were repaid by an assurance, that, as his son had been adopted in baptism by the emperor, the establishment of his daughter should be the peculiar care of the empress of Constantinople. On the return of Franza, the treaty was ratified by the Greek monarch, who with his own hand impressed three vermilion crosses on the golden bull, and assured the Georgian envoy that in the spring his galleys should conduct the bride to her imperial palace. But Constantine embraced his faithful servant, not with the cold approbation of a sovereign, but with the warm confidence of a friend, who, after a long absence, is impatient to pour his secrets into the bosom of his friend. Since the death of my mother and of Cantacuzene, who alone advised me without interest or passion 8100 I am surrounded, said the emperor, by men whom I can neither love nor trust, nor esteem. You are not a stranger to Lucas Notaras, the great admiral, obstinately attached to his own sentiments, he declares, both in private and public, that his sentiments are the absolute measure of my thoughts and actions. The rest of the courtiers are swayed by their personal or factious views, and how can I consult the monks on questions of policy and marriage? I have yet much employment for your diligence and fidelity. In the spring you shall engage one of my brothers to solicit the succor of the western powers, from the Moria you shall sail to Cyprus on a particular commission, and from thence proceed to Georgia to receive and conduct the future empress. Your commands, replied Franza, are irresistible. But deign, great sir, he added, with a serious smile, to consider, that if I am thus perpetually absent from my family, my wife may be tempted either to seek another husband, or to throw herself into a monastery. After laughing at his apprehensions, the emperor more gravely consoled him by the pleasing assurance that this should be his last service abroad, and that he destined for his son a wealthy and noble heiress. For himself, the important office of great logothete, or principal minister of state. The marriage was immediately stipulated, but the office, however incompatible with his own, had been usurped by the ambition of the admiral. Some delay was requisite to negotiate a consent and an equivalent, and the nomination of Franza was half declared, and half suppressed, lest it might be displeasing to an insolent and powerful favorite. The winter was spent in the preparations of his embassy, and Franza had resolved, 
that the youth his son should embrace this opportunity of foreign travel, and be left, on the appearance of danger, with his maternal kindred of the Moria. Such were the private and public designs, which were interrupted by a Turkish war, and finally buried in the ruins of the empire. LXVA, Reign of Muhammad II, Extinction of Eastern Empire Reign and character of Muhammad II. Siege, assault, and final conquest, of Constantinople by the Turks. Death of Constantine Paleologus. Servitude of the Greeks. Extinction of the Roman Empire in the East. Consternation of Europe. Conquests and death of Muhammad II. The siege of Constantinople by the Turks attracts our first attention to the person and character of the great destroyer. Muhammad II 8101 was the son of the second Amurath. And though his mother has been decorated with the titles of Christian and princess, she is more probably confounded with the numerous concubines who peopled from every climate the harem of the sultan. His first education and sentiments were those of a devout Muslim, and as often as he conversed with an infidel, he purified his hands and face by the legal rites of ablution. Age and empire appear to have relaxed this narrow bigotry, his aspiring genius disdained to acknowledge a power above his own, and in his looser hours he presumed, it is said, to brand the prophet of Mecca as a robber and impostor. Yet the Sultan persevered in a decent reverence for the doctrine and discipline of the Quran 8102 his private indiscretion must have been sacred from the vulgar ear. And we should suspect the credulity of strangers and sectaries, so prone to believe that a mind which is hardened against truth must be armed with superior contempt for absurdity and error. Under the tuition of the most skillful masters, Muhammad advanced with an early and rapid progress in the paths of knowledge. And besides his native tongue it is affirmed that he spoke or understood five languages 8103 the Arabic, the Persian, the Chaldean or Hebrew, the Latin, and the Greek. The Persian might indeed contribute to his amusement, and the Arabic to his edification, and such studies are familiar to the Oriental youth. In the intercourse of the Greeks and Turks, a conqueror might wish to converse with the people over which he was ambitious to reign, his own praises in Latin poetry 8104 or prose 8105 might find a passage to the royal ear. But what use or merit could recommend to the statesman or the scholar the uncouth dialect of his Hebrew slaves? The history and geography of the world were familiar to his memory, the lives of the heroes of the East, perhaps of the West 8106 excited his emulation, his skill in astrology is excused by the folly of the times. And supposes some rudiments of mathematical science. And a profane taste for the arts is betrayed in his liberal invitation and reward of the painters of Italy. 8107 But the influence of religion and learning were employed without effect on his savage and licentious nature. I will not transcribe, nor do I firmly believe, the stories of his fourteen pages, whose bellies were ripped open in search of a stolen melon. Or of the beauteous slave, whose head he severed from her body, to convince the Janissaries that their master was not the votary of love. 8108 His sobriety is attested by the silence of the Turkish annals, which accuse three, and three only, of the Ottoman line of the vice of drunkenness. 8109 But it cannot be denied that his passions were at once furious and inexorable. That in the palace, as in the field, a torrent of blood was spilt on the slightest provocation, and that the noblest of the captive youth were often dishonored by his unnatural lust. In the Albanian war he studied the lessons, and soon surpassed the example, of his father, and the conquest of two empires, twelve kingdoms, and two hundred cities, a vain and flattering account, is ascribed to his invincible sword. He was doubtless a soldier, and possibly a general, Constantinople has sealed his glory, but if we compare the means, the obstacles, and the achievements, Muhammad II must blush to sustain a parallel with Alexander or Timur. Under his command, the Ottoman forces were always more numerous than their enemies, yet their progress was bounded by the Euphrates and the Adriatic. And his arms were checked by Huniades and Skanderbeg, by the Rhodian knights and by the Persian king. In the reign of Amurath, he twice tasted of royalty, and twice descended from the throne, his tender age was incapable of opposing his father's restoration, but never could he forgive the viziers who had recommended that salutary measure. His nuptials were celebrated with the daughter of a Turkmen emir, and, after a festival of two months, 
he departed from Adrianople with his bride, to reside in the government of Magnesia. Before the end of six weeks, he was recalled by a sudden message from the Divan, which announced the decease of Amurath, and the mutinous spirit of the Janissaries. His speed and vigor commanded their obedience, he passed the Hellespont with a chosen guard, and at the distance of a mile from Adrianople, the viziers and emirs, the imams and cadis, the soldiers and the people, fell prostrate before the new sultan. They affected to weep, they affected to rejoice, he ascended the throne at the age of twenty-one years, and removed the cause of sedition by the death, the inevitable death, of his infant brothers. 8110-8111 The ambassadors of Europe and Asia soon appeared to congratulate his accession and solicit his friendship, and to all he spoke the language of moderation and peace. The confidence of the Greek emperor was revived by the solemn oaths and fair assurances with which he sealed the ratification of the treaty, and a rich domain on the banks of the Strymon was assigned for the annual payment of 300,000 aspers. The pension of an Ottoman prince, who was detained at his request in the Byzantine court. Yet the neighbors of Mohammed might tremble at the severity with which a youthful monarch reformed the pomp of his father's household, the expenses of luxury were applied to those of ambition. And a useless train of seven thousand falconers was either dismissed from his service, or enlisted in his troops. 8112 In the first summer of his reign, he visited with an army the Asiatic provinces. But after humbling the pride, Muhammad accepted the submission, of the Karamanian, that he might not be diverted by the smallest obstacle from the execution of his great design. 8113. The Mohammedan, and more especially the Turkish casuists, have pronounced that no promise can bind the faithful against the interest and duty of their religion, and that the Sultan may abrogate his own treaties and those of his predecessors. The justice and magnanimity of Amurath had scorned this immoral privilege, but his son, though the proudest of men, could stoop from ambition to the basest arts of dissimulation and deceit. Peace was on his lips, while war was in his heart, he incessantly sighed for the possession of Constantinople, and the Greeks, by their own indiscretion, afforded the first pretense of the fatal rupture. 81.14 Instead of laboring to be forgotten, their ambassadors pursued his camp, to demand the payment, and even the increase, of their annual stipend, the divan was importuned by their complaints, and the vizier, a secret friend of the Christians, was constrained to deliver the sense of his brethren. Ye foolish and miserable Romans, said Callo, we know your devices, and ye are ignorant of your own danger. The scrupulous Amurath is no more. His throne is occupied by a young conqueror, whom no laws can bind, and no obstacles can resist and if you escape from his hands, give praise to the divine clemency, which yet delays the chastisement of your sins. Why do ye seek to affright us by vain and indirect menaces? Release the fugitive Orkin, crown him Sultan of Romania, call the Hungarians from beyond the Danube, arm against us the nations of the West. And be assured, that you will only provoke and precipitate your ruin. But if the fears of the ambassadors were alarmed by the stern language of the vizier, they were soothed by the courteous audience and friendly speeches of the Ottoman prince. And Muhammad assured them that on his return to Adrianople he would redress the grievances, and consult the true interests, of the Greeks. No sooner had he repassed the Hellespont, than he issued a mandate to suppress their pension, and to expel their officers from the banks of the Strymon, in this measure he betrayed a hostile mind. And the second order announced, and in some degree commenced, the siege of Constantinople. In the narrow pass of the Bosphorus, an Asiatic fortress had formerly been raised by his grandfather. In the opposite situation, on the European side, he resolved to erect a more formidable castle, and a thousand masons were commanded to assemble in the spring on a spot named Asomaton, about five miles from the Greek metropolis. 8115 Persuasion is the resource of the feeble, and the feeble can seldom persuade, the ambassadors of the emperor attempted, without success, to divert Muhammad from the execution of his design. They represented, that his grandfather had solicited the permission of Manuel to build a castle on his own territories, but that this double fortification, which would command the strait, could only tend to violate the alliance of the nations. To intercept the Latins who traded in the Black Sea, and perhaps to annihilate the subsistence of the city. I form no enterprise, 
replied the perfidious sultan, against the city, but the empire of Constantinople is measured by her walls. Have you forgot the distress to which my father was reduced when you formed a league with the Hungarians, when they invaded our country by land, and the Hellespont was occupied by the French galleys? Amurath was compelled to force the passage of the Bosphorus, and your strength was not equal to your malevolence. I was then a child at Adrianople, the Moslems trembled, and, for a while, the Gabars 8116 insulted our disgrace. But when my father had triumphed in the field of Warna, he vowed to erect a fort on the western shore, and that vow it is my duty to accomplish. Have ye the right, have ye the power, to control my actions on my own ground? For that ground is my own, as far as the shores of the Bosphorus, Asia is inhabited by the Turks, and Europe is deserted by the Romans. Return, and inform your king, that the present Ottoman is far different from his predecessors. That his resolutions surpass their wishes, and that he performs more than they could resolve. Return in safety, but the next who delivers a similar message may expect to be flayed alive. After this declaration, Constantine, the first of the Greeks in spirit as in rank 8117 had determined to unsheath the sword, and to resist the approach and establishment of the Turks on the Bosphorus. He was disarmed by the advice of his civil and ecclesiastical ministers, who recommended a system less generous, and even less prudent, than his own, to approve their patience and long-suffering. To brand the Ottoman with the name and guilt of an aggressor, and to depend on chance and time for their own safety, and the destruction of a fort which could not long be maintained in the neighborhood of a great and populous city. Amidst hope and fear, the fears of the wise, and the hopes of the credulous, the winter rolled away, the proper business of each man, and each hour, was postponed. And the Greeks shut their eyes against the impending danger, till the arrival of the spring and the sultan decide the assurance of their ruin. Of a master who never forgives, the orders are seldom disobeyed. On the 26th of March, the appointed spot of a somaton was covered with an active swarm of Turkish artificers, and the materials by sea and land were diligently transported from Europe and Asia. 8118 The lime had been burnt in Cataphrygia. The timber was cut down in the woods of Heraclea and Nicomedia, and the stones were dug from the Anatolian quarries. Each of the thousand masons was assisted by two workmen, and a measure of two cubits was marked for their daily task. The fortress 8119 was built in a triangular form, each angle was flanked by a strong and massy tower, one on the declivity of the hill, two along the seashore, a thickness of twenty-two feet was assigned for the walls, thirty for the towers. And the whole building was covered with a solid platform of lead. Muhammad himself pressed and directed the work with indefatigable ardor, his three viziers claimed the honor of finishing their respective towers. The zeal of the cat is emulated that of the Janizaries, the meanest labor was ennobled by the service of God and the Sultan. And the diligence of the multitude was quickened by the eye of a despot, whose smile was the hope of fortune, and whose frown was the messenger of death. The Greek emperor beheld with terror the irresistible progress of the work. And vainly strove, by flattery and gifts, to assuage an implacable foe, who sought, and secretly fomented, the slightest occasion of a quarrel. Such occasions must soon and inevitably be found. The ruins of stately churches, and even the marble columns which had been consecrated to St. Michael the Archangel, were employed without scruple by the profane and rapacious Moslems. And some Christians, who presumed to oppose the removal, received from their hands the crown of martyrdom. Constantine had solicited a Turkish guard to protect the fields and harvests of his subjects, the guard was fixed. But their first order was to allow free pasture to the mules and horses of the camp, and to defend their brethren if they should be molested by the natives. The retinue of an Ottoman chief had left their horses to pass the night among the ripe corn. The damage was felt, the insult was resented, and several of both nations were slain in a tumultuous conflict. Muhammad listened with joy to the complaint, and a detachment was commanded to exterminate the guilty village, the guilty had fled. But forty innocent and unsuspecting reapers were massacred by the soldiers. Till this provocation, Constantinople had been open to the visits of commerce and curiosity, on the first alarm, the gates were shut. But the emperor, still anxious for peace, 
released on the third day his Turkish captives, 8120 and expressed, in a last message, the firm resignation of a Christian and a soldier. Since neither oaths, nor treaty, nor submission, can secure peace, pursue, said he to Muhammad, your impious warfare. My trust is in God alone, if it should please him to mollify your heart, I shall rejoice in the happy change. If he delivers the city into your hands, I submit without a murmur to his holy will. But until the judge of the earth shall pronounce between us, it is my duty to live and die in the defense of my people. The Sultan's answer was hostile and decisive, his fortifications were completed. And before his departure for Adrianople, he stationed a vigilant Aga and four hundred Janissaries, to levy a tribute on the ships of every nation that should pass within the reach of their cannon. A Venetian vessel, refusing obedience to the new lords of the Bosphorus, was sunk with a single bullet. 8121 The master and thirty sailors escaped in the boat, but they were dragged in chains to the port, the chief was impaled. His companions were beheaded, and the historian Ducas 8122 beheld, at Demotica, their bodies exposed to the wild beasts. The siege of Constantinople was deferred till the ensuing spring. But an Ottoman army marched into the Moria to divert the force of the brothers of Constantine. At this era of calamity, one of these princes, the despot Thomas, was blessed or afflicted with the birth of a son. The last heir, says the plaintive Franza, of the last spark of the Roman Empire 8123. The Greeks and the Turks passed an anxious and sleepless winter, the former were kept awake by their fears, the latter by their hopes. Both by the preparations of defense and attack, and the two emperors, who had the most to lose or to gain, were the most deeply affected by the national sentiment. In Muhammad, that sentiment was inflamed by the ardor of his youth and temper, he amused his leisure with building at Adrianople 8120 for the lofty palace of Jahan Numa, the watchtower of the world winky face. But his serious thoughts were irrevocably bent on the conquest of the city of Caesar. At the dead of night, about the second watch, he started from his bed, and commanded the instant attendance of his prime vizier. The message, the hour, the prince, and his own situation, alarmed the guilty conscience of Kaul Basha, who had possessed the confidence, and advised the restoration, of Amurath. On the accession of the sun, the vizier was confirmed in his office and the appearances of favor. But the veteran statesman was not insensible that he trod on a thin and slippery ice, which might break under his footsteps, and plunge him in the abyss. His friendship for the Christians, which might be innocent under the late reign, had stigmatized him with the name of Gabar or Tachi, or foster brother of the infidels. 8125 and his avarice entertained a venal and treasonable correspondence, which was detected and punished after the conclusion of the war. On receiving the royal mandate, he embraced, perhaps for the last time, his wife and children. Filled a cup with pieces of gold, hastened to the palace, adored the sultan, and offered, according to the oriental custom, the slight tribute of his duty in gratitude. 8126 It is not my wish, said Muhammad, to resume my gifts, but rather to heap and multiply them on thy head. In my turn, I ask a present far more valuable and important, Constantinople. As soon as the vizier had recovered from his surprise, the same God, said he, who has already given thee so large a portion of the Roman Empire, will not deny the remnant, and the capital. His providence, and thy power, assure thy success. And myself, with the rest of thy faithful slaves, will sacrifice our lives and fortunes. Lala, 8127, or Preceptor, continued the Sultan, do you see this pillow? All the night, in my agitation, I have pulled it on one side and the other. I have risen from my bed, again have I lain down, yet sleep has not visited these weary eyes. Beware of the gold and silver of the Romans, in arms we are superior. And with the aid of God, and the prayers of the Prophet, we shall speedily become masters of Constantinople. To sound the disposition of his soldiers, he often wandered through the streets alone, and in disguise. And it was fatal to discover the Sultan, when he wished to escape from the vulgar eye. His hours were spent in delineating the plan of the hostile city, in debating with his generals and engineers, on what spot he should erect his batteries. On which side he should assault the walls, 
where he should spring his mines, to what place he should apply his scaling ladders, and the exercises of the day repeated and proved the lucubrations of the night. Among the implements of destruction, he studied with peculiar care the recent and tremendous discovery of the Latins, and his artillery surpassed whatever had yet appeared in the world. A founder of Canon, a Dane 8128 or Hungarian, who had been almost starved in the Greek service, deserted to the Moslems, and was liberally entertained by the Turkish Sultan. Muhammad was satisfied with the answer to his first question, which he eagerly pressed on the artist. Am I able to cast a cannon capable of throwing a ball or stone of sufficient size to batter the walls of Constantinople? I am not ignorant of their strength, but were they more solid than those of Babylon, I could oppose an engine of superior power, the position and management of that engine must be left to your engineers. On this assurance, a foundry was established at Adrianople, the metal was prepared, and at the end of three months, Urban produced a piece of brass ordnance of stupendous, and almost incredible magnitude. A measure of twelve palms is assigned to the bore, and the stone bullet weighed above six hundred pounds. Point eighty one twenty nine eighty one thirty a vacant place before the new palace was chosen for the first experiment. But to prevent the sudden and mischievous effects of astonishment and fear, a proclamation was issued that the cannon would be discharged the ensuing day. The explosion was felt or heard in a circuit of a hundred furlongs, the ball, by the force of gunpowder, was driven above a mile, and on the spot where it fell, it buried itself a fathom deep in the ground. For the conveyance of this destructive engine, a frame or carriage of thirty wagons was linked together and drawn along by a team of sixty oxen, two hundred men on both sides were stationed, to poise and support the rolling weight. Two hundred and fifty workmen marched before to smooth the way and repair the bridges, and near two months were employed in a laborious journey of 150 miles. A lively philosopher 8131 derides on this occasion the credulity of the Greeks, and observes, with much reason, that we should always distrust the exaggerations of a vanquished people. He calculates, that a ball, even of 200 pounds, would require a charge of 150 pounds of powder, and that the stroke would be feeble and impotent, since not a fifteenth part of the mass could be inflamed at the same moment. A stranger as I am to the art of destruction, I can discern that the modern improvements of artillery prefer the number of pieces to the weight of metal, the quickness of the fire to the sound, or even the consequence, of a single explosion. Yet I dare not reject the positive and unanimous evidence of contemporary writers, nor can it seem improbable, that the first artists, in their rude and ambitious efforts, should have transgressed the standard of moderation. A Turkish cannon, more enormous than that of Muhammad, still guards the entrance of the Dardanelles, and if the use be inconvenient, it has been found on a late trial that the effect was far from contemptible. A stone bullet of eleven hundred pounds weight was once discharged with three hundred and thirty pounds of powder, at the distance of six hundred yards it shivered into three rocky fragments, traversed the strait and leaving the waters in a foam, again rose and bounded against the opposite hill. Point eighty one thirty two. While Muhammad threatened the capital of the east, the Greek emperor implored with fervent prayers the assistance of earth and heaven. But the invisible powers were deaf to his supplications, and Christendom beheld with indifference the fall of Constantinople, while she derived at least some promise of supply from the jealous and temporal policy of the Sultan of Egypt. Some states were too weak, and others too remote, by some the danger was considered as imaginary by others as inevitable, the western princes were involved in their endless and domestic quarrels. And the Roman pontiff was exasperated by the falsehood or obstinacy of the Greeks. Instead of employing in their favor the arms and treasures of Italy, Nicholas V had foretold their approaching ruin. And his honor was engaged in the accomplishment of his prophecy. 8133 Perhaps he was softened by the last extremity of their distress, but his compassion was tardy, his efforts were faint and unavailing. And Constantinople had fallen, before the squadrons of Genoa and Venice could sail from their harbors. 8134 Even the princes of the Moria and of the Greek islands affected a cold neutrality, the Genoese colony of Galata negotiated a private treaty. And the Sultan indulged them in the delusive hope, that by his clemency they might survive the ruin of the empire. A plebeian crowd, and some Byzantine nobles basely withdrew from the danger of their country. And the avarice of the rich denied the emperor, 
and reserved for the Turks, the secret treasures which might have raised in their defense whole armies of mercenaries. 8135 The indigent and solitary prince prepared, however, to sustain his formidable adversary, but if his courage were equal to the peril, his strength was inadequate to the contest. In the beginning of the spring, the Turkish vanguard swept the towns and villages as far as the gates of Constantinople, submission was spared and protected, whatever presumed to resist was exterminated with fire and sword. The Greek places on the Black Sea, Mesembria, Achillum, and Bison, surrendered on the first summons, Salibria alone deserved the honors of a siege or blockade. And the bold inhabitants, while they were invested by land, launched their boats, pillaged the opposite coast of Cyzicus, and sold their captives in the public market. But on the approach of Muhammad himself all was silent and prostrate, he first halted at the distance of five miles, and from thence advancing in battle array, planted before the gates of St. Romanus the imperial standard. And on the sixth day of April formed the memorable siege of Constantinople. The troops of Asia and Europe extended on the right and left from the Propontis to the harbour, the Janissaries in the front were stationed before the Sultan's tent. The Ottoman line was covered by a deep entrenchment, and a subordinate army enclosed the suburb of Galata, and watched the doubtful faith of the Genoese. The inquisitive Philelphus, who resided in Greece about thirty years before the siege, is confident, that all the Turkish forces of any name or value could not exceed the number of sixty thousand horse and twenty thousand foot. And he upbraids the pusillanimity of the nations, who had tamely yielded to a handful of barbarians. Such indeed might be the regular establishment of the Capiculi 8136 the troops of the port who marched with the prince, and were paid from his royal treasury. But the Bashaws, in their respective governments, maintained or levied a provincial militia, many lands were held by a military tenure. Many volunteers were attracted by the hope of spoil and the sound of the holy trumpet invited a swarm of hungry and fearless fanatics, who might contribute at least to multiply the terrors, and in a first attack to blunt the swords. Of the Christians The whole mass of the Turkish powers is magnified by Ducas, Calcondiles, and Leonard of Chios, to the amount of three or four hundred thousand men, but Franza was a less remote and more accurate judge. And his precise definition of 258,000 does not exceed the measure of experience and probability. 8137 The navy of the besiegers was less formidable, the Propontis was overspread with 320 sail. But of these no more than 18 could be rated as galleys of war, and the far greater part must be degraded to the condition of storeships and transports, which poured into the camp fresh supplies of men, ammunition, and provisions. In her last decay, Constantinople was still peopled with more than a hundred thousand inhabitants, but these numbers are found in the accounts, not of war, but of captivity. And they mostly consisted of mechanics, of priests, of women, and of men devoid of that spirit which even women have sometimes exerted for the common safety. I can suppose, I could almost excuse, the reluctance of subjects to serve on a distant frontier, at the will of a tyrant. But the man who dares not expose his life in the defense of his children and his property, has lost in society the first and most active energies of nature. By the emperor's command, a particular inquiry had been made through the streets and houses, how many of the citizens, or even of the monks, were able and willing to bear arms for their country. The lists were entrusted to Franza. 8138 and, after a diligent addition, he informed his master, with grief and surprise, that the national defense was reduced to 4,970 Romans. Between Constantine and his faithful minister this comfortless secret was preserved, and a sufficient proportion of shields, crossbows, and muskets, were distributed from the arsenal to the city bands. They derived some accession from a body of 2,000 strangers, under the command of John Justiniani, a noble Genoese, a liberal donative was advanced to these auxiliaries. And a princely recompense, the Isle of Lemnos, was promised to the valor and victory of their chief. A strong chain was drawn across the mouth of the harbor, it was supported by some Greek and Italian vessels of war and merchandise. And the ships of every Christian nation, that successively arrived from Candia and the Black Sea, were detained for the public service. Against the powers of the Ottoman Empire, a city of the extent of thirteen, perhaps of sixteen, 
Miles was defended by a scanty garrison of seven or eight thousand soldiers. Europe and Asia were open to the besiegers. But the strength and provisions of the Greeks must sustain a daily decrease, nor could they indulge the expectation of any foreign succor or supply. The primitive Romans would have drawn their swords in the resolution of death or conquest. The primitive Christians might have embraced each other, and awaited in patience and charity the stroke of martyrdom. But the Greeks of Constantinople were animated only by the spirit of religion, and that spirit was productive only of animosity in discord. Before his death, the Emperor John Paleologus had renounced the unpopular measure of a union with the Latins, nor was the idea revived, till the distress of his brother Constantine imposed a last trial of flattery and dissimulation. 8139 With the demand of temporal aid, his ambassadors were instructed to mingle the assurance of spiritual obedience, his neglect of the church was excused by the urgent cares of the state. And his orthodox wishes solicited the presence of a Roman legate. The Vatican had been too often deluded, yet the signs of repentance could not decently be overlooked, a legate was more easily granted than an army. And about six months before the final destruction, the Cardinal Isidore of Russia appeared in that character with a retinue of priests and soldiers. The Emperor saluted him as a friend and father. Respectfully listened to his public and private sermons, and with the most obsequious of the clergy and laymen subscribed the Act of Union, as it had been ratified in the Council of Florence. On the 12th of December, the two nations, in the Church of St. Sophia, joined in the communion of sacrifice and prayer, and the names of the two pontiffs were solemnly commemorated. The names of Nicholas V, the Vicar of Christ, and of the Patriarch Gregory, who had been driven into exile by a rebellious people. But the dress and language of the Latin priest who officiated at the altar were an object of scandal. And it was observed with horror, that he consecrated a cake or wafer of unleavened bread, and poured cold water into the cup of the sacrament. A national historian acknowledges with a blush, that none of his countrymen, not the emperor himself, were sincere in this occasional conformity. 8140 Their hasty and unconditional submission was palliated by a promise of future revisal. But the best, or the worst, of their excuses was the confession of their own perjury. When they were pressed by the reproaches of their honest brethren, have patience, they whispered, have patience till God shall have delivered the city from the great dragon who seeks to devour us. You shall then perceive whether we are truly reconciled with the Azimites. But patience is not the attribute of zeal, nor can the arts of a court be adapted to the freedom and violence of popular enthusiasm. From the Dome of Esti. Sophia the inhabitants of either sex, and of every degree, rushed in crowds to the cell of the monk Genadius 8141 to consult the oracle of the church. The holy man was invisible. Entranced, as it should seem, in deep meditation, or divine rapture, but he had exposed on the door of his cell a speaking tablet. And they successively withdrew, after reading those tremendous words, O miserable Romans, why will ye abandon the truth? And why, instead of confiding in God, will ye put your trust in the Italians? In losing your faith you will lose your city. Have mercy on me, O Lord. I protest in thy presence that I am innocent of the crime. O miserable Romans, consider, pause, and repent. At the same moment that you renounce the religion of your fathers, by embracing impiety, you submit to a foreign servitude. According to the advice of Genadius, the religious virgins, as pure as angels, and as proud as demons, rejected the act of union, and abjured all communion with the present and future associates of the Latins. And their example was applauded and imitated by the greatest part of the clergy and people. From the monastery, the devout Greeks dispersed themselves in the taverns, drank confusion to the slaves of the Pope, emptied their glasses in honor of the image of the Holy Virgin, and besought her to defend against Mahomet the city which she had formerly saved from Khosros and the Chagan. In the double intoxication of zeal and wine, they valiantly exclaimed, What occasion have we for succor, or union, or Latins? Far from us be the worship of the Azimites. During the winter that preceded the Turkish conquest, the nation was distracted by this epidemical frenzy. And the season of Lent, the approach of Easter, instead of breathing charity and love, 
served only to fortify the obstinacy and influence of the zealots. The confessors scrutinized and alarmed the conscience of their votaries, and a rigorous penance was imposed on those who had received the communion from a priest who had given an express or tacit consent to the union. His service at the altar propagated the infection to the mute and simple spectators of the ceremony, they forfeited, by the impure spectacle, the virtue of the sacerdotal character. Nor was it lawful, even in danger of sudden death, to invoke the assistance of their prayers or absolution. No sooner had the Church of Asti. Sophia been polluted by the Latin sacrifice, than it was deserted as a Jewish synagogue, or a heathen temple, by the clergy and people. And a vast and gloomy silence prevailed in that venerable dome, which had so often smoked with a cloud of incense, blazed with innumerable lights, and resounded with the voice of prayer and thanksgiving. The Latins were the most odious of heretics and infidels, and the first minister of the empire, the great duke, was heard to declare, that he had rather behold in Constantinople the turban of Mohammed, than the Pope's tiara or a cardinal's hat. 8142 A sentiment so unworthy of Christians and patriots was familiar and fatal to the Greeks, the emperor was deprived of the affection and support of his subjects. And their native cowardice was sanctified by resignation to the divine decree, or the visionary hope of a miraculous deliverance. Of the triangle which composes the figure of Constantinople, the two sides along the sea were made inaccessible to an enemy, the propontis by nature, and the harbour by art. Between the two waters, the basis of the triangle, the land side was protected by a double wall, and a deep ditch of the depth of one hundred feet. Against this line of fortification, which Franza, an eyewitness, prolongs to the measure of six miles 8143 the Ottomans directed their principal attack. And the emperor, after distributing the service and command of the most perilous stations, undertook the defense of the external wall. In the first days of the siege the Greek soldiers descended into the ditch, or sallied into the field. But they soon discovered, that, in the proportion of their numbers, one Christian was of more value than twenty Turks, and, after these bold preludes, they were prudently content to maintain the rampart with their missile weapons. Nor should this prudence be accused of pusillanimity. The nation was indeed pusillanimous and base, but the last Constantine deserves the name of a hero, his noble band of volunteers was inspired with Roman virtue. And the foreign auxiliaries supported the honor of the Western chivalry. The incessant volleys of lances and arrows were accompanied with the smoke, the sound, and the fire, of their musketry and cannon. Their small arms discharged at the same time either five, or even ten, balls of lead, of the size of a walnut. And, according to the closeness of the ranks and the force of the powder, several breastplates and bodies were transpierced by the same shot. But the Turkish approaches were soon sunk in trenches, or covered with ruins. Each day added to the science of the Christians, but their inadequate stock of gunpowder was wasted in the operations of each day. Their ordnance was not powerful either in size or number. And if they possessed some heavy cannon, they feared to plant them on the walls, lest the aged structure should be shaken and overthrown by the explosion. 8140 For the same destructive secret had been revealed to the Moslems. By whom it was employed with the superior energy of zeal, riches, and despotism. The great canon of Muhammad has been separately noticed. An important and visible object in the history of the times, but that enormous engine was flanked by two fellows almost of equal magnitude. 8145 The long order of the Turkish artillery was pointed against the walls. Fourteen batteries thundered at once on the most accessible places, and of one of these it is ambiguously expressed, that it was mounted with 130 guns, or that it discharged 130 bullets. Yet in the power and activity of the Sultan, we may discern the infancy of the new science. Under a master who counted the moments, the great cannon could be loaded and fired no more than seven times in one day. 8146 The heated metal unfortunately burst, several workmen were destroyed, and the skill of an artist 8147 was admired who bethought himself of preventing the danger and the accident, by pouring oil, after each explosion, into the mouth of the cannon. The first random shots were productive of more sound than effect, and it was by the advice of a Christian, that the engineers were taught to level their aim against the two opposite sides of the salient angles of a bastion. 
However imperfect, the weight and repetition of the fire made some impression on the walls, and the Turks, pushing their approaches to the edge of the ditch, attempted to fill the enormous chasm, and to build a road to the assault. 8148 innumerable fascines, and hogsheads, and trunks of trees, were heaped on each other. And such was the impetuosity of the throng, that the foremost and the weakest were pushed headlong down the precipice, and instantly buried under the accumulated mass. To fill the ditch was the toil of the besiegers. To clear away the rubbish was the safety of the besieged, and after a long and bloody conflict, the web that had been woven in the day was still unraveled in the night. The next resource of Muhammad was the practice of mines, but the soil was rocky. In every attempt he was stopped and undermined by the Christian engineers, nor had the art been yet invented of replenishing those subterraneous passages with gunpowder, and blowing whole towers and cities into the air. 8149 A circumstance that distinguishes the siege of Constantinople is the reunion of the ancient and modern artillery. The cannon were intermingled with the mechanical engines for casting stones and darts. The bullet and the battering ram 8150 were directed against the same walls, nor had the discovery of gunpowder superseded the use of the liquid and unextinguishable fire. A wooden turret of the largest size was advanced on rollers. This portable magazine of ammunition and fascines was protected by a threefold covering of bull's hides, incessant volleys were securely discharged from the loopholes. In the front, three doors were contrived for the alternate sally and retreat of the soldiers and workmen. They ascended by a staircase to the upper platform, and, as high as the level of that platform, a scaling ladder could be raised by pulleys to form a bridge, and grapple with the adverse rampart. By these various arts of annoyance, some as new as they were pernicious to the Greeks, the Tower of St. Romanus was at length overturned, after a severe struggle, the Turks were repulsed from the breach, and interrupted by darkness. But they trusted that with the return of light they should renew the attack with fresh vigor and decisive success. Of this pause of action, this interval of hope, each moment was improved, by the activity of the Emperor and Justiniani, who passed the night on the spot, and urged the labors which involved the safety of the church and city. At the dawn of day, the impatient Sultan perceived, with astonishment and grief, that his wooden turret had been reduced to ashes, the ditch was cleared and restored, and the tower of St. Romanus was again strong and entire. He deplored the failure of his design. And uttered a profane exclamation, that the word of the thirty-seven thousand prophets should not have compelled him to believe that such a work, in so short a time, could have been accomplished by the infidels. The generosity of the Christian princes was cold and tardy, but in the first apprehension of a siege, Constantine had negotiated, in the isles of the archipelago, the Moria, and Sicily, the most indispensable supplies. As early as the beginning of April, 581 great ships, equipped for merchandise and war, would have sailed from the harbor of Chios, had not the wind blown obstinately from the north point 8152 one of these ships bore the imperial flag. The remaining four belonged to the Genoese, and they were laden with wheat and barley, with wine, oil, and vegetables, and, above all, with soldiers and mariners for the service of the capital. After a tedious delay, a gentle breeze, and, on the second day, a strong gale from the south, carried them through the Hellespont and the Propontis, but the city was already invested by sea and land. And the Turkish fleet, at the entrance of the Bosphorus, was stretched from shore to shore, in the form of a crescent, to intercept, or at least to repel, these bold auxiliaries. The reader who has present to his mind the geographical picture of Constantinople, will conceive and admire the greatness of the spectacle. The five Christian ships continued to advance with joyful shouts, and a full press both of sails and oars, against a hostile fleet of three hundred vessels. And the rampart, the camp, the coasts of Europe and Asia, were lined with innumerable spectators, who anxiously awaited the event of this momentous succor. At the first view that event could not appear doubtful. The superiority of the Moslems was beyond all measure or account, and, in a calm, their numbers and valor must inevitably have prevailed. But their hasty and imperfect navy had been created, not by the genius of the people, but by the will of the Sultan, in the height of their prosperity, the Turks have acknowledged, that if God had given them the earth. 
he had left the sea to the infidels. 8153 in a series of defeats, a rapid progress of decay, has established the truth of their modest confession. Except eighteen galleys of some force, the rest of their fleet consisted of open boats, rudely constructed and awkwardly managed, crowded with troops, and destitute of cannon. And since courage arises in a great measure from the consciousness of strength, the bravest of the Janissaries might tremble on a new element. In the Christian squadron, five stout and lofty ships were guided by skillful pilots, and manned with the veterans of Italy and Greece, long practiced in the arts and perils of the sea. Their weight was directed to sink or scatter the weak obstacles that impeded their passage, their artillery swept the waters, their liquid fire was poured on the heads of the adversaries, who, with the design of boarding, presumed to approach them. And the winds and waves are always on the side of the ablest navigators. In this conflict, the imperial vessel, which had been almost overpowered, was rescued by the Genoese. But the Turks, in a distant and closer attack, were twice repulsed with considerable loss. Muhammad himself sat on horseback on the beach to encourage their valor by his voice and presence, by the promise of reward, and by fear more potent than the fear of the enemy. The passions of his soul, and even the gestures of his body, 8154 seemed to imitate the actions of the combatants, and, as if he had been the lord of nature, he spurred his horse with a fearless and impotent effort into the sea. His loud reproaches, and the clamors of the camp, urged the Ottomans to a third attack, more fatal and bloody than the two former. And I must repeat, though I cannot credit, the evidence of Franza, who affirms, from their own mouth, that they lost above twelve thousand men in the slaughter of the day. They fled in disorder to the shores of Europe and Asia, while the Christian squadron, triumphant and unhurt, steered along the Bosphorus and securely anchored within the chain of the harbor. In the confidence of victory, they boasted that the whole Turkish power must have yielded to their arms. But the admiral, or Captain Bashaw, found some consolation for a painful wound in his eye, by representing that accident as the cause of his defeat. Balti Ogli was a renegade of the race of the Bulgarian princes, his military character was tainted with the unpopular vice of avarice, and under the despotism of the prince or people, misfortune is a sufficient evidence of guilt. 8155 His rank and services were annihilated by the displeasure of Muhammad. In the royal presence, the captain Bashaw was extended on the ground by four slaves, and received one hundred strokes with a golden rod. 8156 His death had been pronounced. And he adored the clemency of the sultan, who was satisfied with the milder punishment of confiscation and exile. The introduction of this supply revived the hopes of the Greeks, and accused the supineness of their western allies. Amidst the deserts of Anatolia and the rocks of Palestine, the millions of the Crusades had buried themselves in a voluntary and inevitable grave, but the situation of the imperial city was strong against her enemies, and accessible to her friends. An irrational and moderate armament of the marine states might have saved the relics of the Roman name, and maintained a Christian fortress in the heart of the Ottoman Empire. Yet this was the sole and feeble attempt for the deliverance of Constantinople, the more distant powers were insensible of its danger. And the ambassador of Hungary, or at least of Huniades, resided in the Turkish camp, to remove the fears, and to direct the operations, of the Sultan.8157. It was difficult for the Greeks to penetrate the secret of the divan. Yet the Greeks are persuaded, that a resistance so obstinate and surprising, had fatigued the perseverance of Muhammad. He began to meditate a retreat. And the siege would have been speedily raised, if the ambition and jealousy of the second vizier had not opposed the perfidious advice of Kalil Basha, who still maintained a secret correspondence with the Byzantine court. The reduction of the city appeared to be hopeless, unless a double attack could be made from the harbor as well as from the land. But the harbor was inaccessible, an impenetrable chain was now defended by eight large ships, more than twenty of a smaller size, with several galleys and sloops. And, instead of forcing this barrier, the Turks might apprehend a naval sally, and a second encounter in the open sea. In this perplexity, the genius of Muhammad conceived and executed a plan of a bold and marvelous cast, of transporting by land his lighter vessels and military stores from the Bosphorus into the higher part of the harbor. The distance is about 1081.58 miles, 
the ground is uneven, and was overspread with thickets, and, as the road must be opened behind the suburb of Galata, their free passage or total destruction must depend on the option of the Genoese. But these selfish merchants were ambitious of the favor of being the last devoured, and the deficiency of art was supplied by the strength of obedient myriads. A level way was covered with a broad platform of strong and solid planks. And to render them more slippery and smooth, they were anointed with the fat of sheep and oxen. Fourscore light galleys and brigantines, of fifty and thirty oars, were disembarked on the Bosphorus shore, arranged successively on rollers. And drawn forwards by the power of men and pulleys. Two guides or pilots were stationed at the helm, and the prow, of each vessel, the sails were unfurled to the winds, and the labor was cheered by song and acclamation. In the course of a single night, this Turkish fleet painfully climbed the hill, steered over the plain, and was launched from the declivity into the shallow waters of the harbor, far above the molestation of the deeper vessels of the Greeks. The real importance of this operation was magnified by the consternation and confidence which it inspired, but the notorious, unquestionable fact was displayed before the eyes, and is recorded by the pens, of the two nations. 8159 A similar stratagem had been repeatedly practiced by the ancients, 8160 The Ottoman galleys, I must again repeat, should be considered as large boats. And, if we compare the magnitude and the distance, the obstacles and the means, the boasted miracle 8161 has perhaps been equaled by the industry of our own times. 8162 As soon as Muhammad had occupied the upper harbor with a fleet and army, he constructed, in the narrowest part, a bridge, or rather mole, of fifty cubits in breadth, and one hundred in length, it was formed of casks and hogsheads. Joined with rafters, linked with iron, and covered with a solid floor. On this floating battery he planted one of his largest cannon, while the fourscore galleys, with troops and scaling ladders, approached the most accessible side, which had formerly been stormed by the Latin conquerors. The indolence of the Christians has been accused for not destroying these unfinished works, 8163 but their fire, by a superior fire, was controlled and silenced. Nor were they wanting in a nocturnal attempt to burn the vessels as well as the bridge of the Sultan. His vigilance prevented their approach, their foremost galeots were sunk or taken. Forty youths, the bravest of Italy and Greece, were inhumanly massacred at his command nor could the emperor's grief be assuaged by the just though cruel retaliation of exposing from the walls the heads of 260 Mussulman captives. After a siege of 40 days, the fate of Constantinople could no longer be averted. The diminutive garrison was exhausted by a double attack, the fortifications, which had stood for ages against hostile violence, were dismantled on all sides by the Ottoman cannon, many breaches were opened, and near the gate of Asti. Romanus, for towers had been leveled with the ground. For the payment of his feeble and mutinous troops, Constantine was compelled to despoil the churches with the promise of a fourfold restitution. And his sacrilege offered a new reproach to the enemies of the Union. A spirit of discord impaired the remnant of the Christian strength, the Genoese and Venetian auxiliaries asserted the preeminence of their respective service. And Justiniani in the great duke, whose ambition was not extinguished by the common danger, accused each other of treachery and cowardice. During the siege of Constantinople, the words of peace and capitulation had been sometimes pronounced. And several embassies had passed between the camp and the city. 8164 The Greek emperor was humbled by adversity, and would have yielded to any terms compatible with religion and royalty. The Turkish sultan was desirous of sparing the blood of his soldiers. Still more desirous of securing for his own use the Byzantine treasures, and he accomplished a sacred duty in presenting to the Gabars the choice of circumcision, of tribute, or of death. The avarice of Muhammad might have been satisfied with an annual sum of 100,000 ducats. But his ambition grasped the capital of the East, to the prince he offered a rich equivalent, to the people a free toleration, or a safe departure, but after some fruitless treaty, he declared his resolution of finding either a throne, or a grave. Under the walls of Constantinople. A sense of honor, and the fear of universal reproach, forbade Paleologus to resign the city into the hands of the Ottomans, and he determined to abide the last extremities of war. 
Several days were employed by the Sultan in the preparations of the assault, and a respite was granted by his favorite science of astrology, which had fixed on the 29th of May, as the fortunate and fatal hour. On the evening of the 27th, he issued his final orders, assembled in his presence the military chiefs, and dispersed his heralds through the camp to proclaim the duty, and the motives, of the perilous enterprise. Fear is the first principle of a despotic government, and his menaces were expressed in the oriental style, that the fugitives and deserters, had they the wings of a bird, 8165 should not escape from his inexorable justice. The greatest part of his bashaws and janissaries were the offspring of Christian parents, but the glories of the Turkish name were perpetuated by successive adoption. And in the gradual change of individuals, the spirit of a legion, a regiment, or an oda, is kept alive by imitation and discipline. In this holy warfare, the Moslems were exhorted to purify their minds with prayer, their bodies with seven ablutions. And to abstain from food till the close of the ensuing day. A crowd of dervises visited the tents, to instill the desire of martyrdom, and the assurance of spending an immortal youth amidst the rivers and gardens of paradise, and in the embraces of the black-eyed virgins. Yet Muhammad principally trusted to the efficacy of temporal and visible rewards. A double pay was promised to the victorious troops, the city and the buildings, said Muhammad, are mine. But I resign to your valor the captives and the spoil, the treasures of gold and beauty, be rich and be happy. Many are the provinces of my empire, the intrepid soldier who first ascends the walls of Constantinople shall be rewarded with the government of the fairest and most wealthy. And my gratitude shall accumulate his honors and fortunes above the measure of his own hopes. Such various and potent motives diffused among the Turks a general ardor, regardless of life and impatient for action the camp re-echoed with the Moslem shouts of, God is God, there is but one God, and Muhammad is the Apostle of God. 8166 and the sea and land, from Galata to the Seven Towers, were illuminated by the blaze of their nocturnal fires. 8167. Far different was the state of the Christians. Who, with loud and impotent complaints, deplored the guilt, or the punishment, of their sins. The celestial image of the Virgin had been exposed in solemn procession. But their divine patroness was deaf to their entreaties, they accused the obstinacy of the Emperor for refusing a timely surrender, anticipated the horrors of their fate, and sighed for the repose and security of Turkish servitude. The noblest of the Greeks, and the bravest of the Allies, were summoned to the palace, to prepare them, on the evening of the 28th, for the duties and dangers of the general assault. The last speech of Paleologus was the funeral oration of the Roman Empire 8168 he promised, he conjured, and he vainly attempted to infuse the hope which was extinguished in his own mind. In this world all was comfortless and gloomy. And neither the Gospel nor the Church have proposed any conspicuous recompense to the heroes who fall in the service of their country. But the example of their prince, and the confinement of a siege, had armed these warriors with the courage of despair, and the pathetic scene is described by the feelings of the historian Franza, who was himself present at this mournful assembly. They wept, they embraced, regardless of their families and fortunes, they devoted their lives, and each commander, departing to his station, maintained all night a vigilant and anxious watch on the rampart. The emperor, and some faithful companions, entered the dome of Saint Sophia, which in a few hours was to be converted into a mosque, and devoutly received, with tears and prayers, the sacrament of the Holy Communion. He reposed some moments in the palace, which resounded with cries and lamentations, solicited the pardon of all whom he might have injured, 8169 and mounted on horseback to visit the guards, and explore the motions of the enemy. The distress and fall of the last Constantine are more glorious than the long prosperity of the Byzantine Caesars. 8170. In the confusion of darkness, an assailant may sometimes succeed. But in this great and general attack, the military judgment and astrological knowledge of Muhammad advised him to expect the morning, the memorable 29th of May, in the 1453rd year of the Christian era. The preceding night had been strenuously employed, the troops, the cannons, and the fascines, were advanced to the edge of the ditch, which in many parts presented a smooth and level passage to the breach. And his fourscore galleys almost touched, 
with the prows and their scaling ladders, the less defensible walls of the harbor. Under pain of death, silence was enjoined, but the physical laws of motion and sound are not obedient to discipline or fear. Each individual might suppress his voice and measure his footsteps, but the march and labor of thousands must inevitably produce a strange confusion of dissonant clamors, which reached the ears of the watchmen of the towers. At daybreak, without the customary signal of the morning gun, the Turks assaulted the city by sea and land, and the similitude of a twined or twisted thread has been applied to the closeness and continuity of their line of attack. 8171 The foremost ranks consisted of the refuse of the host, a voluntary crowd who fought without order or command. Of the feebleness of age or childhood, of peasants and vagrants, and of all who had joined the camp in the blind hope of plunder and martyrdom. The common impulse drove them onwards to the wall. The most audacious to climb were instantly precipitated, and not a dart, not a bullet, of the Christians, was idly wasted on the accumulated throng. But their strength and ammunition were exhausted in this laborious defense, the ditch was filled with the bodies of the slain, they supported the footsteps of their companions. And of this devoted vanguard the death was more serviceable than the life. Under their respective bashaws and sanjaks, the troops of Anatolia and Romania were successively led to the charge, their progress was various and doubtful. But, after a conflict of two hours, the Greeks still maintained, and improved their advantage. And the voice of the emperor was heard, encouraging his soldiers to achieve, by a last effort, the deliverance of their country. In that fatal moment, the Janissaries arose, fresh, vigorous, and invincible. The sultan himself on horseback, with an iron mace in his hand, was the spectator and judge of their valor, he was surrounded by ten thousand of his domestic troops, whom he reserved for the decisive occasion. And the tide of battle was directed and impelled by his voice and eye. His numerous ministers of justice were posted behind the line, to urge, to restrain, and to punish. And if danger was in the front, shame and inevitable death were in the rear, of the fugitives. The cries of fear and of pain were drowned in the martial music of drums, trumpets, and attaballs. And experience has proved, that the mechanical operation of sounds, by quickening the circulation of the blood and spirits, will act on the human machine more forcibly than the eloquence of reason and honor. From the lines, the galleys, and the bridge, the Ottoman artillery thundered on all sides. And the camp and city, the Greeks, and the Turks, were involved in a cloud of smoke which could only be dispelled by the final deliverance or destruction of the Roman Empire. The single combats of the heroes of history or fable amuse our fancy and engage our affections, the skillful evolutions of war may inform the mind, and improve a necessary, though pernicious, science. But in the uniform and odious pictures of a general assault, all is blood, and horror, and confusion. Nor shall I strive, at the distance of three centuries, and a thousand miles, to delineate a scene of which there could be no spectators, and of which the actors themselves were incapable of forming any just or adequate idea. The immediate loss of Constantinople may be ascribed to the bullet, or arrow, which pierced the gauntlet of John Justiniani. The sight of his blood, and the exquisite pain, appalled the courage of the chief, whose arms and counsels were the firmest rampart of the city. As he withdrew from his station in quest of a surgeon, his flight was perceived and stopped by the indefatigable emperor. Your wound, exclaimed Paleologus, is slight, the danger is pressing, your presence is necessary. And whither will you retire? I will retire, said the trembling Genoese, by the same road which God has opened to the Turks, and at these words he hastily passed through one of the breaches of the inner wall. By this pusillanimous act he stained the honours of a military life, and the few days which he survived in Galata, or the Isle of Chios, were embittered by his own and the public reproach. 8172 His example was imitated by the greatest part of the Latin auxiliaries, and the defence began to slacken when the attack was pressed with redoubled vigour. The number of the Ottomans was fifty, perhaps a hundred, times superior to that of the Christians. The double walls were reduced by the cannon to a heap of ruins, in a circuit of several miles, some places must be found more easy of access, or more feebly guarded. And if the besiegers could penetrate in a single point, 
the whole city was irrecoverably lost. The first who deserved the sultan's reward was Hassan the Janizary, of gigantic stature and strength. With his scimitar in one hand and his buckler in the other, he ascended the outward fortification, of the thirty Janizaries, who were emulous of his valor, eighteen perished in the bold adventure. Hassan and his twelve companions had reached the summit, the giant was precipitated from the rampart, he rose on one knee, and was again oppressed by a shower of darts and stones. But his success had proved that the achievement was possible, the walls and towers were instantly covered with a swarm of Turks, and the Greeks, now driven from the vantage ground, were overwhelmed by increasing multitudes. Amidst these multitudes, the Emperor 8173 who accomplished all the duties of a general and a soldier, was long seen and finally lost. The nobles, who fought round his person, sustained, till their last breath, the honourable names of Paleologus and Cantacuzene, his mournful exclamation was heard, cannot there be found a Christian to cut off my head? 8174 and his last fear was that of falling alive into the hands of the infidels. 8175 The prudent despair of Constantine cast away the purple, amidst the tumult he fell by an unknown hand, and his body was buried under a mountain of the slain. After his death, resistance and order were no more, the Greeks fled towards the city, and many were pressed and stifled in the narrow pass of the gate of St. Romanus. The victorious Turks rushed through the breaches of the inner wall. And as they advanced into the streets, they were soon joined by their brethren, who had forced the gate Fener on the side of the harbour. 8176 In the first heat of the pursuit, about two thousand Christians were put to the sword. But avarice soon prevailed over cruelty, and the victors acknowledged, that they should immediately have given quarter if the valour of the emperor and his chosen bands had not prepared them for a similar opposition in every part of the capital. It was thus, after a siege of fifty-three days, that Constantinople, which had defied the power of Khosros, the Chagan, and the Caliphs, was irretrievably subdued by the arms of Mohammed II. Her empire only had been subverted by the Latins, her religion was trampled in the dust by the Moslem conquerors. 8177. The tidings of misfortune fly with a rapid wing. Yet such was the extent of Constantinople, that the more distant quarters might prolong, some moments, the happy ignorance of their ruin. 8178 But in the general consternation, in the feelings of selfish or social anxiety, in the tumult and thunder of the assault, a sleepless night and morning 8179 must have elapsed. Nor can I believe that many Grecian ladies were awakened by the Janissaries from a sound and tranquil slumber. On the assurance of the public calamity, the houses and convents were instantly deserted. And the trembling inhabitants flocked together in the streets, like a herd of timid animals, as if accumulated weakness could be productive of strength, or in the vain hope, that amid the crowd each individual might be safe and invisible. From every part of the capital, they flowed into the church of Esti. Sophia, in the space of an hour, the sanctuary, the choir, the nave, the upper and lower galleries, were filled with the multitudes of fathers and husbands, of women and children, of priests, monks, and religious virgins, the doors were barred on the inside, and they sought protection from the sacred dome, which they had so lately abhorred as a profane and polluted edifice. Their confidence was founded on the prophecy of an enthusiast or impostor, that one day the Turks would enter Constantinople, and pursue the Romans as far as the column of Constantine in the square before St. Sophia, but that this would be the term of their calamities, that an angel would descend from heaven, with a sword in his hand, and would deliver the empire, with that celestial weapon, to a poor man seated at the foot of the column. Take this sword, would he say, and avenge the people of the Lord. At these animating words, the Turks would instantly fly, and the victorious Romans would drive them from the west, and from all Anatolia as far as the frontiers of Persia. It is on this occasion that Ducas, with some fancy and much truth, upbraids the discord and obstinacy of the Greeks. Had that angel appeared, exclaims the historian, had he offered to exterminate your foes if you would consent to the union of the church, even event then, in that fatal moment, you would have rejected your safety, or have deceived your God. 8180. While they expected the descent of the tardy angel, the doors were broken with axes, 
and as the Turks encountered no resistance, their bloodless hands were employed in selecting and securing the multitude of their prisoners. Youth, beauty, and the appearance of wealth attracted their choice, and the right of property was decided among themselves by a prior seizure, by personal strength, and by the authority of command. In the space of an hour, the male captives were bound with cords, the females with their veils and girdles. The senators were linked with their slaves, the prelates, with the porters of the church. And young men of the plebeian class, with noble maids, whose faces had been invisible to the sun and their nearest kindred. In this common captivity, the ranks of society were confounded, the ties of nature were cut asunder. And the inexorable soldier was careless of the father's groans, the tears of the mother, and the lamentations of the children. The loudest in their wailings were the nuns, who were torn from the altar with naked bosoms, outstretched hands, and disheveled hair. And we should piously believe that few could be tempted to prefer the vigils of the harem to those of the monastery. Of these unfortunate Greeks, of these domestic animals, whole strings were rudely driven through the streets. And as the conquerors were eager to return for more prey, their trembling pace was quickened with menaces and blows. At the same hour, a similar rapine was exercised in all the churches and monasteries, in all the palaces and habitations, of the capital, nor could any place, however sacred or sequestered, protect the persons or the property of the Greeks. Above sixty thousand of this devoted people were transported from the city to the camp and fleet, exchanged or sold according to the caprice or interest of their masters, and dispersed in remote servitude through the provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Among these we may notice some remarkable characters. The historian Franza, first chamberlain and principal secretary, was involved with his family in the common lot. After suffering four months the hardships of slavery, he recovered his freedom, in the ensuing winter he ventured to Adrianople, and ransomed his wife from the Mir Bashi, or master of the horse. But his two children, in the flower of youth and beauty, had been seized for the use of Muhammad himself. The daughter of Franza died in the Siralio, perhaps a virgin, his son, in the fifteenth year of his age, preferred death to infamy, and was stabbed by the hand of the royal lover. 8181 A deed thus inhuman cannot surely be expiated by the taste and liberality with which he released a Grecian matron and her two daughters, on receiving a Latin doe from Ode from Philelphus, who had chosen a wife in that noble family. 8182 The pride or cruelty of Muhammad would have been most sensibly gratified by the capture of a Roman legate, but the dexterity of Cardinal Isidore eluded the search, and he escaped from Galata in a plebeian habit. 8183 The chain and entrance of the outward harbour was still occupied by the Italian ships of merchandise and war. They had signalized their valour in the siege, they embraced the moment of retreat, while the Turkish mariners were dissipated in the pillage of the city. When they hoisted sail, the beach was covered with a suppliant and lamentable crowd. But the means of transportation were scanty, the Venetians and Genoese selected their countrymen. And, notwithstanding the fairest promises of the Sultan, the inhabitants of Galata evacuated their houses, and embarked with their most precious effects. In the fall and the sack of great cities, an historian is condemned to repeat the tale of uniform calamity, the same effects must be produced by the same passions, and when those passions may be indulged without control, small, alas! is the difference between civilized and savage man. Amidst the vague exclamations of bigotry and hatred, the Turks are not accused of a wanton or immoderate effusion of Christian blood, but according to their maxims, the maxims of antiquity, the lives of the vanquished were forfeited. And the legitimate reward of the conqueror was derived from the service, the sale, or the ransom, of his captives of both sexes. 8184 The wealth of Constantinople had been granted by the Sultan to his victorious troops. And the rapine of an hour is more productive than the industry of years. But as no regular division was attempted of the spoil, the respective shares were not determined by merit. And the rewards of valor were stolen away by the followers of the camp, who had declined the toil and danger of the battle. The narrative of their depredations could not afford either amusement or instruction, the total amount, in the last poverty of the empire, has been valued at four millions of ducats. 
8185 and of this sum a small part was the property of the Venetians, the Genoese, the Florentines, and the merchants of Ancona. Of these foreigners, the stock was improved in quick and perpetual circulation, but the riches of the Greeks were displayed in the idle ostentation of palaces and wardrobes, or deeply buried in treasures of ingots and old coin. Lest it should be demanded at their hands for the defense of their country. The profanation and plunder of the monasteries and churches excited the most tragic complaints. The Dome of Esti. Sophia itself, the earthly heaven, the second firmament, the vehicle of the cherubim, the throne of the glory of God, 8186 was despoiled of the oblation of ages. And the gold and silver, the pearls and jewels, the vases and sacerdotal ornaments, were most wickedly converted to the service of mankind. After the divine images had been stripped of all that could be valuable to a profane eye, the canvas, or the wood, was torn, or broken, or burnt, or trod underfoot, or applied, in the stables or the kitchen, to the vilest uses. The example of sacrilege was imitated, however, from the Latin conquerors of Constantinople. And the treatment which Christ, the Virgin, and the Saints, had sustained from the guilty Catholic, might be inflicted by the zealous Mussulman on the monuments of idolatry. Perhaps, instead of joining the public clamor, a philosopher will observe, that in the decline of the arts the workmanship could not be more valuable than the work. And that a fresh supply of visions and miracles would speedily be renewed by the craft of the priests and the credulity of the people. He will more seriously deplore the loss of the Byzantine libraries, which were destroyed or scattered in the general confusion, 120,000 manuscripts are said to have disappeared. 8,187 ten volumes might be purchased for a single ducat. And the same ignominious price, too high perhaps for a shelf of theology, included the whole works of Aristotle and Homer, the noblest productions of the science and literature of ancient Greece. We may reflect with pleasure that an inestimable portion of our classic treasures was safely deposited in Italy, and that the mechanics of a German town had invented an art which derides the havoc of time and barbarism. From the first hour 8188 of the memorable 29th of May, disorder and rapine prevailed in Constantinople, till the eighth hour of the same day, when the Sultan himself passed in triumph through the gate of St. Romanus. He was attended by his viziers, bashaws, and guards, each of whom, says a Byzantine historian, was robust as Hercules, dexterous as Apollo, and equal in battle to any ten of the race of ordinary mortals. The conqueror 8189 gazed with satisfaction and wonder on the strange, though splendid, appearance of the domes and palaces, so dissimilar from the style of oriental architecture. In the Hippodrome, or at Maiden, his eye was attracted by the twisted column of the three serpents. And, as a trial of his strength, he shattered with his iron mace or battle-axe the under jaw of one of these monsters 8190 which in the eyes of the Turks were the idols or talismans of the city. Point 8191 at the principal door of Asti. Sophia, he alighted from his horse, and entered the dome. And such was his jealous regard for that monument of his glory, that on observing a zealous Mussulman in the act of breaking the marble pavement, he admonished him with his scimitar, that, if the spoil and captives were granted to the soldiers. The public and private buildings had been reserved for the prince. By his command the metropolis of the Eastern Church was transformed into a mosque, the rich and portable instruments of superstition had been removed, the crosses were thrown down. And the walls, which were covered with images and mosaics, were washed and purified, and restored to a state of naked simplicity. On the same day, or on the ensuing Friday, the musen, or crier, ascended the most lofty turret, and proclaimed the Ezen, or public invitation in the name of God and his prophet, the Imam preached. And Muhammad and second performed the namaz of prayer and thanksgiving on the great altar, where the Christian mysteries had so lately been celebrated before the last of the Caesars. 8192 from St. Sophia he proceeded to the august, but desolate mansion of a hundred successors of the great Constantine, but which in a few hours had been stripped of the pomp of royalty. A melancholy reflection on the vicissitudes of human greatness forced itself on his mind, and he repeated an elegant distich of Persian poetry, The spider has wove his web in the imperial palace. And the owl hath sung her watch song on the towers of Aphrasiab 8193. Yet his mind was not satisfied, 
nor did the victory seem complete, till he was informed of the fate of Constantine. Whether he had escaped, or been made prisoner, or had fallen in the battle. Two Janissaries claimed the honor and reward of his death, the body, under a heap of slain, was discovered by the golden eagles embroidered on his shoes. The Greeks acknowledged, with tears, the head of their late emperor, and, after exposing the bloody trophy 8194 Muhammad bestowed on his rival the honors of a decent funeral. After his decease, Lucas Notaras, great duke 8195 and first minister of the empire, was the most important prisoner. When he offered his person and his treasures at the foot of the throne, and why, said the indignant sultan, did you not employ these treasures in the defense of your prince and country? They were yours, answered the slave. God had reserved them for your hands. If he reserved them for me, replied the despot, how have you presumed to withhold them so long by a fruitless and fatal resistance? The great duke alleged the obstinacy of the strangers, and some secret encouragement from the Turkish vizier, and from this perilous interview he was at length dismissed with the assurance of pardon and protection. Muhammad condescended to visit his wife, a venerable princess oppressed with sickness and grief, and his consolation for her misfortunes was in the most tender strain of humanity and filial reverence. A similar clemency was extended to the principal officers of state, of whom several were ransomed at his expense, and during some days he declared himself the friend and father of the vanquished people. But the scene was soon changed. And before his departure, the hippodrome streamed with the blood of his noblest captives. His perfidious cruelty is execrated by the Christians, they adorn with the colors of heroic martyrdom the execution of the great duke and his two sons. And his death is ascribed to the generous refusal of delivering his children to the tyrant's lust. 8196 Yet a Byzantine historian has dropped an unguarded word of conspiracy, deliverance, and Italian succor, such treason may be glorious. But the rebel who bravely ventures, has justly forfeited his life. Nor should we blame a conqueror for destroying the enemies whom he can no longer trust. On the 18th of June the victorious Sultan returned to Adrianople. And smiled at the base and hollow embassies of the Christian princes, who viewed their approaching ruin in the fall of the Eastern Empire. Constantinople had been left naked and desolate, without a prince or a people. But she could not be despoiled of the incomparable situation which marks her for the metropolis of a great empire, and the genius of the place will ever triumph over the accidents of time and fortune. Bursa and Adrianople, the ancient seats of the Ottomans, sunk into provincial towns, and Mohammed II established his own residence, and that of his successors, on the same commanding spot which had been chosen by Constantine. 8197 The fortifications of Galata, which might afford a shelter to the Latins, were prudently destroyed, but the damage of the Turkish cannon was soon repaired. And before the month of August, great quantities of lime had been burnt for the restoration of the walls of the capital. As the entire property of the soil and buildings, whether public or private, or profane or sacred, was now transferred to the conqueror. He first separated a space of eight furlongs from the point of the triangle for the establishment of his seraglio or palace. It is here, in the bosom of luxury, that the Grand Signor, as he has been emphatically named by the Italians, appears to reign over Europe and Asia. But his person on the shores of the Bosphorus may not always be secure from the insults of a hostile navy. In the new character of a mosque, the Cathedral of Asti, Sophia was endowed with an ample revenue, crowned with lofty minarets, and surrounded with groves and fountains, for the devotion and refreshment of the Moslems. The same model was imitated in the Jaime, or royal mosques. And the first of these was built, by Muhammad himself, on the ruins of the Church of the Holy Apostles, and the tombs of the Greek emperors. On the third day after the conquest, the grave of Abu Ayyub, or Jab, who had fallen in the first siege of the Arabs, was revealed in a vision, and it is before the sepulchre of the martyr that the new sultans are girded with the sword of empire. 8198 Constantinople no longer appertains to the Roman historian, nor shall I enumerate the civil and religious edifices that were profaned or erected by its Turkish masters, the population was speedily renewed. And before the end of September, five thousand families of Anatolia and Romania had obeyed the royal mandate, which enjoined them, under pain of death, 
to occupy their new habitations in the capital. The throne of Muhammad was guarded by the numbers and fidelity of his Muslim subjects, but his rational policy aspired to collect the remnant of the Greeks. And they returned in crowds, as soon as they were assured of their lives, their liberties, and the free exercise of their religion. In the election and investiture of a patriarch, the ceremonial of the Byzantine court was revived and imitated. With a mixture of satisfaction and horror, they beheld the sultan on his throne, who delivered into the hands of Genadius the crozier or pastoral staff, the symbol of his ecclesiastical office. Who conducted the patriarch to the gate of the Siralio, presented him with a horse richly caparisoned, and directed the viziers and bashaws to lead him to the palace which had been allotted for his residence. 8199 The churches of Constantinople were shared between the two religions, their limits were marked, and, till it was infringed by Selim, the grandson of Muhammad, the Greeks 8200 enjoyed above sixty years the benefit of this equal partition. Encouraged by the ministers of the divan, who wished to elude the fanaticism of the sultan, the Christian advocates presumed to allege that this division had been an act, not of generosity, but of justice, not a concession, but a compact. And that if one half of the city had been taken by storm, the other moiety had surrendered on the faith of a sacred capitulation. The original grant had indeed been consumed by fire, but the loss was supplied by the testimony of three aged Janissaries who remembered the transaction. And their venal oaths are of more weight in the opinion of Cantemir, than the positive and unanimous consent of the history of the times.8201. The remaining fragments of the Greek kingdom in Europe and Asia I shall abandon to the Turkish arms. But the final extinction of the two last dynasties 8202 which have reigned in Constantinople should terminate the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the East. The despots of the Moria, Demetrius and Thomas 8203 the two surviving brothers of the name of Paleologus, were astonished by the death of the Emperor Constantine, and the ruin of the monarchy. Hopeless of defense, they prepared, with the noble Greeks who adhered to their fortune, to seek a refuge in Italy, beyond the reach of the Ottoman thunder. Their first apprehensions were dispelled by the victorious sultan, who contented himself with a tribute of twelve thousand ducats. And while his ambition explored the continent and the islands, in search of prey, he indulged the Moria in a respite of seven years. But this respite was a period of grief, discord, and misery. The Hexamillion, the rampart of the Isthmus, so often raised and so often subverted, could not long be defended by three hundred Italian archers, the keys of Corinth were seized by the Turks, they returned from their summer excursions with a train of captives and spoil. And the complaints of the injured Greeks were heard with indifference and disdain. The Albanians, a vagrant tribe of shepherds and robbers, filled the peninsula with rapine and murder, the two despots implored the dangerous and humiliating aid of a neighboring Bashaw. And when he had quelled the revolt, his lessons inculcated the rule of their future conduct. Neither the ties of blood, nor the oaths which they repeatedly pledged in the communion and before the altar, nor the stronger pressure of necessity, could reconcile or suspend their domestic quarrels. They ravaged each other's patrimony with fire and sword, the alms and succors of the West were consumed in civil hostility, and their power was only exerted in savage and arbitrary executions. The distress and revenge of the weaker rival invoked their supreme lord, and, in the season of maturity and revenge, Muhammad declared himself the friend of Demetrius, and marched into the Moria with an irresistible force. When he had taken possession of Sparta, you are too weak, said the sultan, to control this turbulent province, I will take your daughter to my bed, and you shall pass the remainder of your life in security and honor. Demetrius sighed and obeyed. Surrendered his daughter and his castles, followed to Adrianople his sovereign and his son, and received for his own maintenance, and that of his followers, a city in Thrace and the adjacent isles of Imbrus, Lemnos, and Samothrace. He was joined the next year by a companion 8204 of misfortune, the last of the Comnenian race, who, after the taking of Constantinople by the Latins, had founded a new empire on the coast of the Black Sea. 8205 In the progress of his Anatolian conquest, Muhammad invested with a fleet and army the capital of David, who presumed to style himself Emperor of Trebizond. 8206 And the negotiation was comprised in a short and peremptory question, 
will you secure your life and treasures by resigning your kingdom? Or had you rather forfeit your kingdom, your treasures, and your life? The feeble calmness was subdued by his own fears, 8207 and the example of a Muslim neighbor, the Prince of Sinope 8208 who, on a similar summons, had yielded a fortified city, with 400 cannon and 10 or 12,000 soldiers. The capitulation of Trebizond was faithfully performed, 8209 and the emperor, with his family, was transported to a castle in Romania. But on a slight suspicion of corresponding with the Persian king, David, and the whole Comnenian race, were sacrificed to the jealousy or avarice of the conqueror. 8210 Nor could the name of Father Long protect the unfortunate Demetrius from exile and confiscation, his abject submission moved the pity and contempt of the Sultan, his followers were transplanted to Constantinople. And his poverty was alleviated by a pension of 50,000 aspers, till a monastic habit and a tardy death released Paleologus from an earthly master. It is not easy to pronounce whether the servitude of Demetrius, or the exile of his brother Thomas, 8211 be the most inglorious. On the conquest of the Moria, the despot escaped to Corfu, and from thence to Italy, with some naked adherents, his name, his sufferings, and the head of the Apostle St. Andrew, entitled him to the hospitality of the Vatican. And his misery was prolonged by a pension of six thousand ducats from the Pope and Cardinals. His two sons, Andrew and Manuel, were educated in Italy. But the eldest, contemptible to his enemies and burdensome to his friends, was degraded by the baseness of his life and marriage. A title was his sole inheritance, and that inheritance he successively sold to the kings of France and Aragon. 8212 During his transient prosperity, Charles VIII was ambitious of joining the Empire of the East with the Kingdom of Naples, in a public festival. He assumed the appellation and the purple of Augustus, the Greeks rejoiced and the Ottoman already trembled, at the approach of the French chivalry. 8213 Manuel Paleologus, the second son, was tempted to revisit his native country, his return might be grateful, and could not be dangerous, to the port, he was maintained at Constantinople in safety and ease. And an honorable train of Christians and Moslems attended him to the grave. If there be some animals of so generous a nature that they refuse to propagate in a domestic state, the last of the imperial race must be ascribed to an inferior kind, he accepted from the Sultan's liberality two beautiful females. And his surviving son was lost in the habit and religion of a Turkish slave. The importance of Constantinople was felt and magnified in its loss, the pontificate of Nicholas V, however peaceful and prosperous, was dishonored by the fall of the Eastern Empire. And the grief and terror of the Latins revived, or seemed to revive, the old enthusiasm of the Crusades. In one of the most distant countries of the West, Philip Duke of Burgundy entertained, at Lyle and Flanders, an assembly of his nobles. And the pompous pageants of the feast were skillfully adapted to their fancy and feelings. 8214 In the midst of the banquet a gigantic Saracen entered the hall, leading a fictitious elephant with a castle on his back, a matron in a mourning robe, the symbol of religion, was seen to issue from the castle, she deplored her oppression. And accused the slowness of her champions, the principal herald of the Golden Fleece advanced, bearing on his fist a live pheasant, which, according to the rites of chivalry, he presented to the duke. At this extraordinary summons, Philip, a wise and aged prince, engaged his person and powers in the holy war against the Turks, his example was imitated by the barons and knights of the assembly, they swore to God, the Virgin, the ladies and the pheasant. And their particular vows were not less extravagant than the general sanction of their oath. But the performance was made to depend on some future and foreign contingency. And during twelve years, till the last hour of his life, the Duke of Burgundy might be scrupulously, and perhaps sincerely, on the eve of his departure. Had every breast glowed with the same ardor. Had the union of the Christians corresponded with their bravery. Had every country, from Sweden 8215 to Naples, supplied a just proportion of cavalry and infantry, of men and money, it is indeed probable that Constantinople would have been delivered. And that the Turks might have been chased beyond the Hellespont or the Euphrates. But the secretary of the emperor, who composed every epistle, and attended every meeting, 
Aeneas Silvius 82-16 a statesman and orator, describes from his own experience the repugnant state and spirit of Christendom. It is a body, says he, without a head, a republic without laws or magistrates. The Pope and the Emperor may shine as lofty titles, as splendid images. But they are unable to command, and none are willing to obey, every state has a separate prince, and every prince has a separate interest. What eloquence could unite so many discordant and hostile powers under the same standard? Could they be assembled in arms, who would dare to assume the office of general? What order could be maintained, what military discipline? Who would undertake to feed such an enormous multitude? Who would understand their various languages, or direct their stranger and incompatible manners? What mortal could reconcile the Germans with the French, Genoa with Aragon, the Germans with the natives of Hungary and Bohemia? If a small number enlisted in the Holy War, they must be overthrown by the infidels, if many, by their own weight and confusion. Yet the same Aeneas, when he was raised to the papal throne, under the name of Pius II, devoted his life to the prosecution of the Turkish War. In the Council of Mantua he excited some sparks of a false or feeble enthusiasm. But when the pontiff appeared at Ancona, to embark in person with the troops, engagements vanished in excuses, a precise day was adjourned to an indefinite term. And his effective army consisted of some German pilgrims, whom he was obliged to disband with indulgences and arms. Regardless of futurity, his successors and the powers of Italy were involved in the schemes of present and domestic ambition. And the distance or proximity of each object determined in their eyes its apparent magnitude. A more enlarged view of their interest would have taught them to maintain a defensive and naval war against the common enemy. And the support of Skanderbeg and his brave Albanians might have prevented the subsequent invasion of the Kingdom of Naples. The siege and sack of Otranto by the Turks diffused a general consternation. And Pope Sixtus was preparing to fly beyond the Alps, when the storm was instantly dispelled by the death of Mohammed II, in the fifty-first year of his age. 8217 His lofty genius aspired to the conquest of Italy, he was possessed of a strong city and a capacious harbour, and the same reign might have been decorated with the trophies of the new and the ancient Rome. 8218 LXAX, State of Rome from the 12th century. State of Rome from the 12th century. Temporal dominion of the popes. Seditions of the city. Political heresy of Arnold of Brescia. Restoration of the Republic. The senators. Pride of the Romans. Their wars. They are deprived of the election and presence of the popes, who retire to Avignon. The Jubilee. Noble families of Rome. Feud of the Colonna and Ursini. In the first ages of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, our eye is invariably fixed on the royal city, which had given laws to the fairest portion of the globe. We contemplate her fortunes, at first with admiration, at length with pity, always with attention, and when that attention is diverted from the capital to the provinces. They are considered as so many branches which have been successively severed from the imperial trunk. The foundation of a second Rome, on the shores of the Bosphorus, has compelled the historian to follow the successors of Constantine. And our curiosity has been tempted to visit the most remote countries of Europe and Asia, to explore the causes and the authors of the long decay of the Byzantine monarchy. By the conquest of Justinian, we have been recalled to the banks of the Tiber, to the deliverance of the ancient metropolis, but that deliverance was a change, or perhaps an aggravation, of servitude. Rome had been already stripped of her trophies, her gods, and her Caesars, nor was the Gothic dominion more inglorious and oppressive than the tyranny of the Greeks. In the eighth century of the Christian era, a religious quarrel, the worship of images, provoked the Romans to assert their independence, their bishop became the temporal, as well as the spiritual, father of a free people. And of the Western Empire, which was restored by Charlemagne, the title and image still decorate the singular constitution of modern Germany. The name of Rome must yet command our involuntary respect, the climate, whatsoever may be its influence, was no longer the same 8219 the purity of blood had been contaminated through a thousand channels. But the venerable aspect of her ruins, and the memory of past greatness, rekindled a spark of the national character. 
The darkness of the Middle Ages exhibits some scenes not unworthy of our notice. Nor shall I dismiss the present work till I have reviewed the state and revolutions of the Roman city, which acquiesced under the absolute dominion of the popes, about the same time that Constantinople was enslaved by the Turkish arms. In the beginning of the 12th century, 8220 the era of the First Crusade, Rome was revered by the Latins, as the metropolis of the world, as the throne of the Pope and the Emperor, who, from the Eternal City, derived their title, their honors, and the right or exercise of temporal dominion. After so long an interruption, it may not be useless to repeat that the successors of Charlemagne and the Othos were chosen beyond the Rhine in a national diet. But that these princes were content with the humble names of kings of Germany and Italy, till they had passed the Alps and the Apennine, to seek their imperial crown on the banks of the Tiber. 8221 At some distance from the city, their approach was saluted by a long procession of the clergy and people with palms and crosses. And the terrific emblems of wolves and lions, of dragons and eagles, that floated in the military banners, represented the departed legions and cohorts of the Republic. The royal path to maintain the liberties of Rome was thrice reiterated, at the bridge, the gate, and on the stairs of the Vatican, and the distribution of a customary donative feebly imitated the magnificence of the first Caesars. In the church of St. Peter, the coronation was performed by his successor, the voice of God was confounded with that of the people, and the public consent was declared in the acclamations of long life and victory to our Lord the Pope. Long life and victory to our Lord the Emperor. Long life and victory to the Roman and Teutonic armies. 8222 The names of Caesar and Augustus, the laws of Constantine and Justinian, the example of Charlemagne and Otho, established the supreme dominion of the emperors, their title and image was engraved on the papal coins. 8223 And their jurisdiction was marked by the sword of justice, which they delivered to the prefect of the city. But every Roman prejudice was awakened by the name, the language, and the manners, of a barbarian lord. The Caesars of Saxony or Franconia were the chiefs of a feudal aristocracy. Nor could they exercise the discipline of civil and military power, which alone secures the obedience of a distant people, impatient of servitude, though perhaps incapable of freedom. Once, and once only, in his life, each emperor, with an army of Teutonic vassals, descended from the Alps. I have described the peaceful order of his entry and coronation. But that order was commonly disturbed by the clamor and sedition of the Romans, who encountered their sovereign as a foreign invader, his departure was always speedy, and often shameful. And, in the absence of a long reign, his authority was insulted, and his name was forgotten. The progress of independence in Germany and Italy undermined the foundations of the imperial sovereignty, and the triumph of the popes was the deliverance of Rome. Of her two sovereigns, the emperor had precariously reigned by the right of conquest, but the authority of the pope was founded on the soft, though more solid, basis of opinion and habit. The removal of a foreign influence restored and endeared the shepherd to his flock. Instead of the arbitrary or venal nomination of a German court, the vicar of Christ was freely chosen by the College of Cardinals, most of whom were either natives or inhabitants of the city. The applause of the magistrates and people confirmed his election, and the ecclesiastical power that was obeyed in Sweden and Britain had been ultimately derived from the suffrage of the Romans. The same suffrage gave a prince, as well as a pontiff, to the capital. It was universally believed, that Constantine had invested the popes with the temporal dominion of Rome. And the boldest civilians, the most profane skeptics, were satisfied with disputing the right of the emperor and the validity of his gift. The truth of the fact, the authenticity of his donation, was deeply rooted in the ignorance and tradition of four centuries, and the fabulous origin was lost in the real and permanent effects. The name of Dominus or Lord was inscribed on the coin of the bishops, their title was acknowledged by acclamations and oaths of allegiance, and with the free, or reluctant, consent of the German Caesars. They had long exercised a supreme or subordinate jurisdiction over the city and patrimony of Esti. Peter. The reign of the popes, which gratified the prejudices, was not incompatible with the liberties, of Rome, and a more critical inquiry would have revealed a still nobler source of their power. The gratitude of a nation, 
whom they had rescued from the heresy and oppression of the Greek tyrant. In an age of superstition, it should seem that the union of the royal and sacerdotal characters would mutually fortify each other. And that the keys of paradise would be the surest pledge of earthly obedience. The sanctity of the office might indeed be degraded by the personal vices of the man. But the scandals of the tenth century were obliterated by the austere and more dangerous virtues of Gregory the Seventh and his successors. And in the ambitious contests which they maintained for the rights of the Church, their sufferings or their success must equally tend to increase the popular veneration. They sometimes wandered in poverty and exile, the victims of persecution. And the apostolic zeal with which they offered themselves to martyrdom must engage the favor and sympathy of every Catholic breast. And sometimes, thundering from the Vatican, they created, judged, and deposed the kings of the world. Nor could the proudest Roman be disgraced by submitting to a priest, whose feet were kissed, and whose stirrup was held, by the successors of Charlemagne. 8224 Even the temporal interest of the city should have protected in peace and honor the residence of the popes, from whence a vain and lazy people derived the greatest part of their subsistence and riches. The fixed revenue of the popes was probably impaired, many of the old patrimonial estates, both in Italy and the provinces, had been invaded by sacrilegious hands. Nor could the loss be compensated by the claim, rather than the possession, of the more ample gifts of Pepin and his descendants. But the Vatican and capital were nourished by the incessant and increasing swarms of pilgrims and suppliants, the pale of Christianity was enlarged, and the Pope and Cardinals were overwhelmed by the judgment of ecclesiastical and secular causes. A new jurisprudence had established in the Latin Church the right and practice of appeals. 8225 And from the north and west the bishops and abbots were invited or summoned to solicit, to complain, to accuse, or to justify, before the threshold of the apostles. A rare prodigy is once recorded, that two horses, belonging to the archbishops of Mentz and Cologne, repassed the Alps, yet laden with gold and silver 8226 but it was soon understood, that the success, both of the pilgrims and clients, depended much less on the justice of their cause than on the value of their offering. The wealth and piety of these strangers were ostentatiously displayed, and their expenses, sacred or profane, circulated in various channels for the emolument of the Romans. Such powerful motives should have firmly attached the voluntary and pious obedience of the Roman people to their spiritual and temporal father. But the operation of prejudice and interest is often disturbed by the sallies of ungovernable passion. The Indian who fells the tree, that he may gather the fruit, 8227 and the Arab who plunders the caravans of commerce, are actuated by the same impulse of savage nature, which overlooks the future and the present and relinquishes for momentary rap in the long and secure possession of the most important blessings. And it was thus, that the shrine of St. Peter was profaned by the thoughtless Romans, who pillaged the offerings, and wounded the pilgrims, without computing the number and value of similar visits, which they prevented by their inhospitable sacrilege. Even the influence of superstition is fluctuating and precarious. And the slave, whose reason is subdued, will often be delivered by his avarice or pride. A credulous devotion for the fables and oracles of the priesthood most powerfully acts on the mind of a barbarian. Yet such a mind is the least capable of preferring imagination to sense, of sacrificing to a distant motive, to an invisible, perhaps an ideal, object, the appetites and interests of the present world. In the vigor of health and youth, his practice will perpetually contradict his belief, till the pressure of age, or sickness, or calamity, awakens his terrors, and compels him to satisfy the double debt of piety in remorse. I have already observed, that the modern times of religious indifference are the most favorable to the peace and security of the clergy. Under the reign of superstition, they had much to hope from the ignorance, and much to fear from the violence, of mankind. The wealth, whose constant increase must have rendered them the sole proprietors of the earth, was alternately bestowed by the repentant father and plundered by the rapacious son, their persons were adored or violated. And the same idol, by the hands of the same votaries, was placed on the altar, or trampled in the dust. In the feudal system of Europe, arms were the title of distinction and the measure of allegiance. 
and amidst their tumult, the still voice of law and reason was seldom heard or obeyed. The turbulent Romans disdained the yoke, and insulted the impotence, of their bishop, 8228 nor would his education or character allow him to exercise, with decency or effect, the power of the sword. The motives of his election and the frailties of his life were exposed to their familiar observation, and proximity must diminish the reverence which his name and his decrees impressed on a barbarous world. This difference has not escaped the notice of our philosophic historian, though the name and authority of the court of Rome were so terrible in the remote countries of Europe, which were sunk in profound ignorance. And were entirely unacquainted with its character and conduct, the Pope was so little revered at home, that his inveterate enemies surrounded the gates of Rome itself, and even controlled his government in that city. And the ambassadors, who, from a distant extremity of Europe, carried to him the humble, or rather abject, submissions of the greatest potentate of the age, found the utmost difficulty to make their way to him, and to throw themselves at his feet. 8229. Since the primitive times, the wealth of the popes was exposed to envy, their powers to opposition, and their persons to violence. But the long hostility of the mitre and the crown increased the numbers, and inflamed the passions, of their enemies. The deadly factions of the Guelphs and Guidelines, so fatal to Italy, could never be embraced with truth or constancy by the Romans, the subjects and adversaries both of the bishop and emperor. But their support was solicited by both parties, and they alternately displayed in their banners the keys of St. Peter and the German eagle. Gregory VII, who may be adored or detested as the founder of the papal monarchy, was driven from Rome, and died in exile at Salerno. Six and thirty of his successors, eighty-two thirty till their retreat to Avignon, maintained an unequal contest with the Romans, their age and dignity were often violated, and the churches, in the solemn rites of religion, were polluted with sedition and murder. A repetition 8231 of such capricious brutality, without connection or design, would be tedious and disgusting, and I shall content myself with some events of the twelfth century, which represent the state of the popes and the city. On Holy Thursday, while Paschal officiated before the altar, he was interrupted by the clamors of the multitude, who imperiously demanded the confirmation of a favorite magistrate. His silence exasperated their fury. His pious refusal to mingle the affairs of earth and heaven was encountered with menaces, and oaths, that he should be the cause and the witness of the public ruin. During the festival of Easter, while the bishop and the clergy, barefooted and in procession, visited the tombs of the martyrs, they were twice assaulted, at the bridge of St. Angelo, and before the capital, with volleys of stones and darts. The houses of his adherents were leveled with the ground, Pascal escaped with difficulty and danger, he levied an army in the patrimony of St. Peter, and his last days were embittered by suffering and inflicting the calamities of civil war. The scenes that followed the election of his successor Gelasius II were still more scandalous to the church and city. Sencio Frangipani 8232 a potent and factious baron, burst into the assembly furious and in arms, the cardinals were stripped, beaten, and trampled underfoot, and he seized, without pity or respect, the vicar of Christ by the throat. Gelasius was dragged by the hair along the ground, buffeted with blows, wounded with spurs, and bound with an iron chain in the house of his brutal tyrant. An insurrection of the people delivered their bishop, the rival families opposed the violence of the Frangipani, and Sencio, who sued for pardon, repented of the failure, rather than of the guilt, of his enterprise. Not many days had elapsed, when the Pope was again assaulted at the altar. While his friends and enemies were engaged in a bloody contest, he escaped in his sacerdotal garments. In this unworthy flight, which excited the compassion of the Roman matrons, his attendants were scattered or unhorsed, and, in the fields behind the church of St. Peter, his successor was found alone and half dead with fear and fatigue. Shaking the dust from his feet, the apostle withdrew from a city in which his dignity was insulted and his person was endangered. And the vanity of sacerdotal ambition is revealed in the involuntary confession, that one emperor was more tolerable than 20.8233 these examples might suffice. But I cannot forget the sufferings of two pontiffs of the same age, the second and third of the name of Lucius. The former, as he ascended in battle array to assault the capital, 
was struck on the temple by a stone, and expired in a few days. The latter was severely wounded in the person of his servants. In a civil commotion, several of his priests had been made prisoners. And the inhuman Romans, reserving one as a guide for his brethren, put out their eyes, crowned them with ludicrous mitres, mounted them on asses with their faces towards the tail, and extorted an oath, that, in this wretched condition, they should offer themselves as a lesson to the head of the church. Hope or fear, lassitude or remorse, the characters of the men, and the circumstances of the times, might sometimes obtain an interval of peace and obedience. And the Pope was restored with joyful acclamations to the Lateran or Vatican, from whence he had been driven with threats and violence. But the root of mischief was deep and perennial. And a momentary calm was preceded and followed by such tempests as had almost sunk the bark of St. Peter. Rome continually presented the aspect of war and discord, the churches and palaces were fortified and assaulted by the factions and families. And, after giving peace to Europe, Callistus II alone had resolution and power to prohibit the use of private arms in the metropolis. Among the nations who revered the apostolic throne, the tumults of Rome provoked a general indignation. And in a letter to his disciple Eugenius III, St. Bernard, with the sharpness of his wit and zeal, has stigmatized the vices of the rebellious people. 8234, who is ignorant, says the monk of Clairvaux, of the vanity and arrogance of the Romans. A nation nursed in sedition, untractable, and scorning to obey, unless they are too feeble to resist. When they promise to serve, they aspire to reign. If they swear allegiance, they watch the opportunity of revolt, yet they vent their discontent in loud clamors, if your doors, or your counsels, are shut against them. Dexterous in mischief, they have never learned the science of doing good. Odious to earth and heaven, impious to God, seditious among themselves, jealous of their neighbors, inhuman to strangers, they love no one, by no one are they beloved. And while they wish to inspire fear, they live in base and continual apprehension. They will not submit. They know not how to govern faithless to their superiors, intolerable to their equals, ungrateful to their benefactors, and alike impudent in their demands and their refusals. Lofty in promise, poor in execution. Adulation and calumny, perfidy and treason, are the familiar arts of their policy. Surely this dark portrait is not colored by the pencil of Christian charity. 8235 Yet the features, however harsh or ugly, express a lively resemblance of the Roman of the 12th century. 8236. The Jews had rejected the Christ when he appeared among them in a plebeian character. And the Romans might plead their ignorance of his vicar when he assumed the pomp and pride of a temporal sovereign. In the busy age of the Crusades, some sparks of curiosity and reason were rekindled in the Western world, the heresy of Bulgaria, the Paulician sect, was successfully transplanted into the soil of Italy and France. The Gnostic visions were mingled with the simplicity of the Gospel, and the enemies of the clergy reconciled their passions with their conscience, the desire of freedom with the profession of piety. 8237 The trumpet of Roman liberty was first sounded by Arnold of Brescia 8238 whose promotion in the church was confined to the lowest rank, and who wore the monastic habit rather as a garb of poverty than as a uniform of obedience. His adversaries could not deny the wit and eloquence which they severely felt, they confess with reluctance the specious purity of his morals, and his errors were recommended to the public by a mixture of important and beneficial truths. In his theological studies, he had been the disciple of the famous and unfortunate Abelard 8239 who was likewise involved in the suspicion of heresy, but the lover of Eloisa was of a soft and flexible nature. And his ecclesiastic judges were edified and disarmed by the humility of his repentance. From this master, Arnold most probably imbibed some metaphysical definitions of the Trinity, repugnant to the taste of the times, his ideas of baptism and the Eucharist are loosely censured. But a political heresy was the source of his fame and misfortunes. He presumed to quote the declaration of Christ, that his kingdom is not of this world, he boldly maintained, that the sword and the scepter were entrusted to the civil magistrate. That temporal honors and possessions were lawfully vested in secular persons, that the abbots, the bishops, and the pope himself, 
must renounce either their state or their salvation. And that after the loss of their revenues, the voluntary tithes and oblations of the faithful would suffice, not indeed for luxury and avarice, but for a frugal life in the exercise of spiritual labors. During a short time, the preacher was revered as a patriot, and the discontent, or revolt, of Brescia against her bishop, was the first fruits of his dangerous lessons. But the favor of the people is less permanent than the resentment of the priest. And after the heresy of Arnold had been condemned by Innocent II 8240 in the General Council of the Lateran, the magistrates themselves were urged by prejudice and fear to execute the sentence of the Church. Italy could no longer afford a refuge, and the disciple of Abelard escaped beyond the Alps, till he found a safe and hospitable shelter in Zurich, now the first of the Swiss cantons. From a Roman station 8241 a royal villa, a chapter of noble virgins, Zurich had gradually increased to a free and flourishing city, where the appeals of the Milanese were sometimes tried by the imperial commissaries. 8242 In an age less ripe for reformation, the precursor of Zuinglius was heard with applause, a brave and simple people imbibed, and long retained, the color of his opinions. And his art, or merit, seduced the Bishop of Constance, and even the Pope's legate, who forgot, for his sake, the interest of their master and their order. Their tardy zeal was quickened by the fierce exhortations of St. Bernard. 8243 And the enemy of the Church was driven by persecution to the desperate measures of erecting his standard in Rome itself, in the face of the successor of St. Peter. Yet the courage of Arnold was not devoid of discretion, he was protected, and had perhaps been invited, by the nobles and people, and in the service of freedom, his eloquence thundered over the seven hills. Blending in the same discourse the texts of Livy and St. Paul, uniting the motives of gospel, and of classic, enthusiasm, he admonished the Romans, how strangely their patience and the vices of the clergy had degenerated from the primitive times of the church and the city. He exhorted them to assert the inalienable rights of men and Christians, to restore the laws and magistrates of the Republic, to respect the name of the Emperor, but to confine their shepherd to the spiritual government of his flock. 8244 Nor could his spiritual government escape the censure and control of the Reformer, and the inferior clergy were taught by his lessons to resist the cardinals, who had usurped a despotic command over the twenty-eight regions or parishes of Rome. 8245 The revolution was not accomplished without rapine and violence, the diffusion of blood and the demolition of houses, the victorious faction was enriched with the spoils of the clergy and the adverse nobles. Arnold of Brescia enjoyed, or deplored, the effects of his mission, his reign continued above ten years, while two popes, Innocent II and Anastasius IV, either trembled in the Vatican, or wandered as exiles in the adjacent cities. They were succeeded by a more vigorous and fortunate pontiff. Adrian IV, 8246 The only Englishman who has ascended the throne of St. Peter. And whose merit emerged from the mean condition of a monk, and almost a beggar, in the monastery of St. Albans. On the first provocation, of a cardinal killed or wounded in the streets, he cast an interdict on the guilty people. And from Christmas to Easter, Rome was deprived of the real or imaginary comforts of religious worship. The Romans had despised their temporal prince, they submitted with grief and terror to the censures of their spiritual father, their guilt was expiated by penance, and the banishment of the seditious preacher was the price of their absolution. But the revenge of Adrian was yet unsatisfied, and the approaching coronation of Frederick Barbarossa was fatal to the bold reformer, who had offended, though not in an equal degree, the heads of the church and state. In their interview at Viterbo, the Pope represented to the Emperor the furious, ungovernable spirit of the Romans, the insults, the injuries, the fears, to which his person and his clergy were continually exposed. And the pernicious tendency of the heresy of Arnold, which must subvert the principles of civil, as well as ecclesiastical, subordination. Frederick was convinced by these arguments or tempted by the desire of the imperial crown, in the balance of ambition, the innocence or life of an individual is of small account. And their common enemy was sacrificed to a moment of political concord. After his retreat from Rome, Arnold had been protected by the Viscounts of Campania, from whom he was extorted by the power of Caesar, the prefect of the city pronounced his sentence, 
the martyr of freedom was burned alive in the presence of a careless and ungrateful people. And his ashes were cast into the Tiber, lest the heretics should collect and worship the relics of their master. 8247 The clergy triumphed in his death, with his ashes, his sect was dispersed, his memory still lived in the minds of the Romans. From his school they had probably derived a new article of faith, that the metropolis of the Catholic Church is exempt from the penalties of excommunication and interdict. Their bishops might argue, that the supreme jurisdiction, which they exercised over kings and nations, more especially embraced the city and diocese of the Prince of the Apostles. But they preached to the winds, and the same principle that weakened the effect, must temper the abuse, of the thunders of the Vatican. The love of ancient freedom has encouraged a belief that as early as the 10th century, in their first struggles against the Saxon Othos, the Commonwealth was vindicated and restored by the Senate and people of Rome. That two consuls were annually elected among the nobles, and that ten or twelve plebeian magistrates revived the name and office of the tribunes of the commons. 8248 But this venerable structure disappears before the light of criticism. In the darkness of the Middle Ages, the appellations of senators, of consuls, of the sons of consuls, may sometimes be discovered. 8249 They were bestowed by the emperors, or assumed by the most powerful citizens, to denote their rank, their honors. 8250 In perhaps the claim of a pure and patrician descent, but they float on the surface, without a series or a substance. The titles of men, not the orders of government. 8251 And it is only from the year of Christ 1144 that the establishment of the Senate is dated, as a glorious era, in the acts of the city. A new constitution was hastily framed by private ambition or popular enthusiasm, nor could Rome, in the twelfth century, produce an antiquary to explain, or a legislator to restore, the harmony and proportions of the ancient model. The assembly of a free, of an armed, people, will ever speak in loud and weighty acclamations. But the regular distribution of the thirty-five tribes, the nice balance of the wealth and numbers of the centuries, the debates of the adverse orders, and the slow operations of votes and ballots, could not easily be adapted by a blind multitude. Ignorant of the arts, and insensible of the benefits, of legal government. It was proposed by Arnold to revive and discriminate the equestrian order, but what could be the motive or measure of such distinction? 8252 The pecuniary qualification of the knights must have been reduced to the poverty of the times, those times no longer required their civil functions of judges and farmers of the revenue. And their primitive duty, their military service on horseback, was more nobly supplied by feudal tenures and the spirit of chivalry. The jurisprudence of the Republic was useless and unknown, the nations and families of Italy who lived under the Roman and barbaric laws were insensibly mingled in a common mass. And some faint tradition, some imperfect fragments, preserved the memory of the Code and Pandex of Justinian. With their liberty the Romans might doubtless have restored the appellation and office of consuls. Had they not disdained a title so promiscuously adopted in the Italian cities, that it has finally settled on the humble station of the agents of commerce in a foreign land. But the rights of the tribunes, the formidable word that arrested the public councils, suppose or must produce a legitimate democracy. The old patricians were the subjects, the modern barons the tyrants, of the state. Nor would the enemies of peace and order, who insulted the vicar of Christ, have long respected the unarmed sanctity of a plebeian magistrate. 8253. In the revolution of the twelfth century, which gave a new existence and era to Rome, we may observe the real and important events that marked or confirmed her political independence. I. The Capitoline Hill, one of her seven eminences 8254 is about 400 yards in length, and 200 in breadth. A flight of a hundred steps led to the summit of the Tarpeian Rock. And far steeper was the ascent before the declivities had been smoothed and the precipices filled by the ruins of fallen edifices. From the earliest ages, the capital had been used as a temple in peace, a fortress in war, after the loss of the city, it maintained a siege against the victorious Gauls, and the sanctuary of the empire was occupied, assaulted, and burnt. In the civil wars of Vitellius and Vespasian. 
8255 The temples of Jupiter and his kindred deities had crumbled into dust, their place was supplied by monasteries and houses, and the solid walls, the long and shelving porticos, were decayed or ruined by the lapse of time. It was the first act of the Romans, an act of freedom, to restore the strength, though not the beauty, of the capital, to fortify the seat of their arms and councils. And as often as they ascended the hill, the coldest minds must have glowed with the remembrance of their ancestors. 2. The first Caesars had been invested with the exclusive coinage of the gold and silver. To the Senate they abandoned the baser metal of bronze or copper. 8256 The emblems and legends were inscribed on a more ample field by the genius of flattery, and the prince was relieved from the care of celebrating his own virtues. The successors of Diocletian despised even the flattery of the Senate, their royal officers at Rome, and in the provinces, assumed the sole direction of the mint. And the same prerogative was inherited by the Gothic kings of Italy, and the long series of the Greek, the French, and the German dynasties. After an abdication of eight hundred years, the Roman Senate asserted this honorable and lucrative privilege, which was tacitly renounced by the popes, from Paschal II to the establishment of their residence beyond the Alps. Some of these republican coins of the 12th and 13th centuries are shown in the cabinets of the curious. On one of these, a gold medal, Christ is depictured holding in his left hand a book with this inscription, the vow of the Roman Senate and people, Rome the capital of the world, on the reverse, st. Peter delivering a banner to a kneeling senator in his cap and gown, with the name and arms of his family impressed on a shield. 82573. With the empire, the prefect of the city had declined to a municipal officer. Yet he still exercised in the last appeal the civil and criminal jurisdiction, and a drawn sword, which he received from the successors of Otho, was the mode of his investiture and the emblem of his functions. 8258 The dignity was confined to the noble families of Rome, the choice of the people was ratified by the Pope, but a triple oath of fidelity must have often embarrassed the prefect in the conflict of adverse duties. 8259 A servant, in whom they possessed but a third share, was dismissed by the independent Romans, in his place they elected a patrician, but this title, which Charlemagne had not disdained, was too lofty for a citizen or a subject. And, after the first fervor of rebellion, they consented without reluctance to the restoration of the prefect. About fifty years after this event, Innocent III, the most ambitious, or at least the most fortunate, of the pontiffs delivered the Romans and himself from this badge of foreign dominion, he invested the prefect with a banner instead of a sword, and absolved him from all dependence of oaths or service to the German emperors. 8260 In his place an ecclesiastic, a present or future cardinal, was named by the Pope to the civil government of Rome, but his jurisdiction has been reduced to a narrow compass. And in the days of freedom, the right or exercise was derived from the Senate and people. 4. After the revival of the Senate 8261 the conscript fathers, if I may use the expression, were invested with the legislative and executive power. But their views seldom reached beyond the present day, and that day was most frequently disturbed by violence and tumult. In its utmost plenitude, the order or assembly consisted of fifty-six senators 8262 the most eminent of whom were distinguished by the title of councillors, they were nominated, perhaps annually, by the people. And a previous choice of their electors, ten persons in each region, or parish, might afford a basis for a free and permanent constitution. The popes, who in this tempest submitted rather to bend than to break, confirmed by treaty the establishment and privileges of the Senate, and expected from time, peace, and religion, the restoration of their government. The motives of public and private interest might sometimes draw from the Romans an occasional and temporary sacrifice of their claims and they renewed their oath of allegiance to the successor of Asti. Peter and Constantine, the lawful head of the Church and the Republic. 8263. The union and vigor of a public council was dissolved in a lawless city, and the Romans soon adopted a more strong and simple mode of administration. They condensed the name and authority of the Senate in a single magistrate, or two colleagues, and as they were changed at the end of a year, or of six months, the greatness of the trust was compensated by the shortness of the term. But in this transient reign, the senators of Rome indulged their avarice and ambition, 
their justice was perverted by the interest of their family and faction, and as they punished only their enemies, they were obeyed only by their adherents. Anarchy, no longer tempered by the pastoral care of their bishop, admonished the Romans that they were incapable of governing themselves, and they sought abroad those blessings which they were hopeless of finding at home. In the same age, and from the same motives, most of the Italian republics were prompted to embrace a measure, which, however strange it may seem, was adapted to their situation, and productive of the most salutary effects. 8264 They chose, in some foreign but friendly city, an impartial magistrate of noble birth and unblemished character, a soldier and a statesman, recommended by the voice of fame and his country. To whom they delegated for a time the supreme administration of peace and war. The compact between the governor and the governed was sealed with oaths and subscriptions, and the duration of his power, the measure of his stipend, the nature of their mutual obligations, were defined with scrupulous precision. They swore to obey him as their lawful superior, he pledged his faith to unite the indifference of a stranger with the zeal of a patriot. At his choice, four or six knights and civilians, his assessors in arms and justice, attended the Podesta 8265 who maintained at his own expense a decent retinue of servants and horses, his wife, his son, his brother. Who might bias the affections of the judge, were left behind, during the exercise of his office he was not permitted to purchase land, to contract an alliance, or even to accept an invitation in the house of a citizen. Nor could he honorably depart till he had satisfied the complaints that might be urged against his government. It was thus, about the middle of the 13th century, that the Romans called from Bologna the senator Brancaleone 8266 whose fame and merit have been rescued from oblivion by the pen of an English historian. A just anxiety for his reputation, a clear foresight of the difficulties of the task, had engaged him to refuse the honor of their choice, the statutes of Rome were suspended, and his office prolonged to the term of three years. By the guilty and licentious he was accused as cruel, by the clergy he was suspected as partial, but the friends of peace and order applauded the firm and upright magistrate by whom those blessings were restored. No criminals were so powerful as to brave, so obscure as to elude, the justice of the senator. By his sentence two nobles of the Annibaldi family were executed on a gibbet. And he inexorably demolished, in the city and neighborhood, 140 towers, the strong shelters of rapine and mischief. The bishop, as a simple bishop, was compelled to reside in his diocese. And the standard of Brancaleon was displayed in the field with terror and effect. His services were repaid by the ingratitude of a people unworthy of the happiness which they enjoyed. By the public robbers, whom he had provoked for their sake, the Romans were excited to depose and imprison their benefactor, nor would his life have been spared, if Bologna had not possessed a pledge for his safety. Before his departure, the prudent senator had required the exchange of thirty hostages of the noblest families of Rome, on the news of his danger, and at the prayer of his wife, they were more strictly guarded. And Bologna, in the cause of honor, sustained the thunders of a papal interdict. This generous resistance allowed the Romans to compare the present with the past. And Brancaleone was conducted from the prison to the capital amidst the acclamations of a repentant people. The remainder of his government was firm and fortunate. And as soon as envy was appeased by death, his head, enclosed in a precious vase, was deposited on a lofty column of marble. 8267. The impotence of reason and virtue recommended in Italy a more effectual choice, instead of a private citizen, to whom they yielded a voluntary and precarious obedience, the Romans elected for their senator some prince of independent power who could defend them from their enemies and themselves. Charles of Anjou and Provence, the most ambitious and warlike monarch of the age, accepted at the same time the kingdom of Naples from the Pope, and the office of senator from the Roman people. 8268 As he passed through the city, in his road to victory, he received their oath of allegiance, lodged in the Lateran Palace, and smoothed in a short visit the harsh features of his despotic character. Yet even Charles was exposed to the inconstancy of the people, who saluted with the same acclamations the passage of his rival, the unfortunate Conradin. And a powerful avenger, who reigned in the capital, alarmed the fears and jealousy of the popes. The absolute term of his life was superseded by a renewal every third year. 
and the enmity of Nicholas III obliged the Sicilian king to abdicate the government of Rome. In his bull, A Perpetual Law, the imperious pontiff asserts the truth, validity, and use of the donation of Constantine, not less essential to the peace of the city than to the independence of the church. Establishes the annual election of the senator, and formally disqualifies all emperors, kings, princes, and persons of an eminent and conspicuous rank. 8269 This prohibitory clause was repealed in his own behalf by Martin IV, who humbly solicited the suffrage of the Romans. In the presence, and by the authority, of the people, two electors conferred, not on the Pope, but on the noble and faithful Martin, the dignity of senator, and the supreme administration of the Republic 8270 to hold during his natural life. And to exercise at pleasure by himself or his deputies. About fifty years afterwards, the same title was granted to the Emperor Louis of Bavaria, and the liberty of Rome was acknowledged by her two sovereigns, who accepted a municipal office in the government of their own metropolis. In the first moments of rebellion, when Arnold of Brescia had inflamed their minds against the Church, the Romans artfully labored to conciliate the favor of the Empire, and to recommend their merit and services in the cause of Caesar. The style of their ambassadors to Conrad III and Frederick I is a mixture of flattery and pride, the tradition and the ignorance of their own history. 8271 After some complaint of his silence and neglect, they exhort the former of these princes to pass the Alps, and assume from their hands the imperial crown. We beseech your majesty not to disdain the humility of your sons and vassals, not to listen to the accusations of our common enemies. Who calumniate the senate as hostile to your throne, who sow the seeds of discord, that they may reap the harvest of destruction. The Pope and the Sicilian are united in an impious league to oppose our liberty and your coronation. With the blessing of God, our zeal and courage has hitherto defeated their attempts. Of their powerful and factious adherents, more especially the Frangipani, we have taken by assault the houses and turrets, some of these are occupied by our troops, and some are leveled with the ground. The Milvian Bridge, which they had broken, is restored and fortified for your safe passage, and your army may enter the city without being annoyed from the castle of St. Angelo. All that we have done, and all that we design, is for your honor and service, in the loyal hope, that you will speedily appear in person, to vindicate those rights which have been invaded by the clergy, to revive the dignity of the empire. And to surpass the fame and glory of your predecessors. May you fix your residence in Rome, the capital of the world, give laws to Italy, and the Teutonic Kingdom, and imitate the example of Constantine and Justinian 8272 who, by the vigor of the Senate and people, obtained the scepter of the earth. 8273 But these splendid and fallacious wishes were not cherished by Conrad the Franconian, whose eyes were fixed on the Holy Land, and who died without visiting Rome soon after his return from the Holy Land. His nephew and successor, Frederick Barbarossa, was more ambitious of the imperial crown, nor had any of the successors of Otho acquired such absolute sway over the kingdom of Italy. Surrounded by his ecclesiastical and secular princes, he gave audience in his camp at Sutri to the ambassadors of Rome, who thus addressed him in a free and florid oration, Incline your ear to the Queen of Cities. Approach with a peaceful and friendly mind the precincts of Rome, which has cast away the yoke of the clergy, and is impatient to crown her legitimate emperor. Under your auspicious influence, may the primitive times be restored. Assert the prerogatives of the eternal city, and reduce under her monarchy the insolence of the world. You are not ignorant, that, in former ages, by the wisdom of the Senate, by the valor and discipline of the equestrian order, she extended her victorious arms to the east and west, beyond the Alps, and over the islands of the ocean. By our sins, in the absence of our princes, the noble institution of the Senate has sunk in oblivion, and with our prudence, our strength has likewise decreased. We have revived the Senate, and the equestrian order, the counsels of the one, the arms of the other, will be devoted to your person and the service of the Empire. Do you not hear the language of the Roman matron? You were a guest, I have adopted you as a citizen, a Transalpine stranger, I have elected you for my sovereign, 8274 and given you myself, and all that is mine. Your first and most sacred duty is to swear and subscribe, that you will shed your blood for the Republic, 
that you will maintain in peace and justice the laws of the city and the charters of your predecessors. And that you will reward with five thousand pounds of silver the faithful senators who shall proclaim your titles in the capital. With the name, assume the character, of Augustus. The flowers of Latin rhetoric were not yet exhausted. But Frederick, impatient of their vanity, interrupted the orators in the high tone of royalty in conquest. Famous indeed have been the fortitude and wisdom of the ancient Romans. But your speech is not seasoned with wisdom, and I could wish that fortitude were conspicuous in your actions. Like all sublunary things, Rome has felt the vicissitudes of time and fortune. Your noblest families were translated to the east, to the royal city of Constantine, and the remains of your strength and freedom have long since been exhausted by the Greeks and Franks. Are you desirous of beholding the ancient glory of Rome, the gravity of the Senate, the spirit of the knights, the discipline of the camp, the valor of the legions? You will find them in the German Republic. It is not empire, naked and alone, the ornaments and virtues of empire have likewise migrated beyond the Alps to a more deserving people, 8275 they will be employed in your defense, but they claim your obedience. You pretend that myself or my predecessors have been invited by the Romans, you mistake the word, they were not invited, they were implored. From its foreign and domestic tyrants, the city was rescued by Charlemagne and Otho, whose ashes repose in our country, and their dominion was the price of your deliverance. Under that dominion your ancestors lived and died. I claim by the right of inheritance and possession, and who shall dare to extort you from my hands? Is the hand of the Franks 8276 and Germans enfeebled by age? Am I vanquished? Am I a captive? Am I not encompassed with the banners of a potent and invincible army? You impose conditions on your master, you require oaths, if the conditions are just, an oath is superfluous, if unjust, it is criminal. Can you doubt my equity? It is extended to the meanest of my subjects. Will not my sword be unsheathed in the defense of the capital? By that sword the northern kingdom of Denmark has been restored to the Roman Empire. You prescribe the measure and the objects of my bounty, which flows in a copious but a voluntary stream. All will be given to patient merit, all will be denied to rude importunity. 8277 Neither the Emperor or the Senate could maintain these lofty pretensions of dominion and liberty. United with the Pope, and suspicious of the Romans, Frederick continued his march to the Vatican. His coronation was disturbed by a sally from the capital, and if the numbers and valor of the Germans prevailed in the bloody conflict, he could not safely encamp in the presence of a city of which he styled himself the sovereign. About twelve years afterwards, he besieged Rome, to seat an antipope in the chair of St. Peter, and twelve Pisan galleys were introduced into the Tiber, but the Senate and people were saved by the arts of negotiation and the progress of disease. Nor did Frederick or his successors reiterate the hostile attempt. Their laborious reigns were exercised by the popes, the Crusades, and the independence of Lombardy in Germany, they courted the alliance of the Romans. And Frederick II offered in the capital the great standard, the Carocho of Milan. 8278 After the extinction of the House of Swabia, they were banished beyond the Alps, and their last coronations betrayed the impotence and poverty of the Teutonic Caesars. 8279 under the reign of Adrian, when the empire extended from the Euphrates to the ocean, from Mount Atlas to the Grampian Hills, a fanciful historian 8280 amused the Romans with the picture of their ancient wars. There was a time, says Florus, when Tiber and Prenest, our summer retreats, were the objects of hostile vows in the capital, when we dreaded the shades of the Arician groves. When we could triumph without a blush over the nameless villages of the Sabines and Latins, and even Corioli could afford a title not unworthy of a victorious general. The pride of his contemporaries was gratified by the contrast of the past and the present, they would have been humbled by the prospect of futurity. By the prediction, that after a thousand years, Rome, despoiled of empire, and contracted to her primeval limits, would renew the same hostilities, on the same ground which was then decorated with her villas and gardens. The adjacent territory on either side of the Tiber was always claimed, and sometimes possessed, as the patrimony of St. Peter. But the barons assumed a lawless independence, 
and the cities too faithfully copied the revolt and discord of the metropolis. In the 12th and 13th centuries the Romans incessantly labored to reduce or destroy the contumacious vassals of the church and senate. And if their headstrong and selfish ambition was moderated by the Pope, he often encouraged their zeal by the alliance of his spiritual arms. Their warfare was that of the first consuls and dictators, who were taken from the plow. The assembled in arms at the foot of the capital, sallied from the gates, plundered or burnt the harvests of their neighbors, engaged in tumultuary conflict, and returned home after an expedition of fifteen or twenty days. Their sieges were tedious and unskillful, in the use of victory, they indulged the meaner passions of jealousy and revenge, and instead of adopting the valor, they trampled on the misfortunes, of their adversaries. The captives, in their shirts, with a rope round their necks, solicited their pardon, the fortifications, and even the buildings, of the rival cities, were demolished, and the inhabitants were scattered in the adjacent villages. It was thus that the seats of the cardinal bishops, Porto, Ostia, Albanum, Tusculum, Prenest, and Tiber or Tivoli, were successively overthrown by the ferocious hostility of the Romans. 8281 of these, 8282 Porto and Ostia, the two keys of the Tiber, are still vacant and desolate, the marshy and unwholesome banks are peopled with herds of buffaloes, and the river is lost to every purpose of navigation and trade. The hills, which afford a shady retirement from the autumnal heats, have again smiled with the blessings of peace, Frascati has arisen near the ruins of Tusculum. Tiber or Tivoli has resumed the honors of a city 8283 and the meaner towns of Albano and Palestrina are decorated with the villas of the cardinals and princes of Rome. In the work of destruction, the ambition of the Romans was often checked and repulsed by the neighboring cities and their allies, in the first siege of Tiber, they were driven from their camp. And the battles of Tusculum 8284 and Viterbo 8285 might be compared in their relative state to the memorable fields of Thracimene and Cannae. In the first of these petty wars, 30,000 Romans were overthrown by a thousand German horse, whom Frederick Barbarossa had detached to the relief of Tusculum, and if we number the slain at three, the prisoners at two, thousand. We shall embrace the most authentic and moderate account. Sixty-eight years afterwards they marched against Viterbo in the ecclesiastical state with the whole force of the city, by a rare coalition the Teutonic Eagle was blended, in the adverse banners, with the keys of St. Peter. And the Pope's auxiliaries were commanded by a Count of Tholaus and a Bishop of Winchester. The Romans were discomfited with shame and slaughter, but the English prelate must have indulged the vanity of a pilgrim, if he multiplied their numbers to one hundred, and their loss in the field to thirty, thousand men. Had the policy of the Senate and the discipline of the legions been restored with the capital, the divided condition of Italy would have offered the fairest opportunity of a second conquest. But in arms, the modern Romans were not above, and in arts, they were far below, the common level of the neighboring republics. Nor was their warlike spirit of any long continuance. After some irregular sallies, they subsided in the national apathy, in the neglect of military institutions, and in the disgraceful and dangerous use of foreign mercenaries. Ambition is a weed of quick and early vegetation in the vineyard of Christ. Under the first Christian princes, the chair of Esti. Peter was disputed by the votes, the venality, the violence, of a popular election, the sanctuaries of Rome were polluted with blood, and, from the third to the twelfth century, the church was distracted by the mischief of frequent schisms. As long as the final appeal was determined by the civil magistrate, these mischiefs were transient and local, the merits were tried by equity or favor, nor could the unsuccessful competitor long disturb the triumph of his rival. But after the emperors had been divested of their prerogatives, after a maxim had been established that the vicar of Christ is amenable to no earthly tribunal, each vacancy of the Holy See might involve Christendom in controversy and war. The claims of the cardinals and inferior clergy, of the nobles and people, were vague and litigious, the freedom of choice was overruled by the tumults of a city that no longer owned or obeyed a superior. On the decease of a pope, two factions proceeded in different churches to a double election, the number and weight of votes, the priority of time, the merit of the candidates. Might balance each other, the most respectable of the clergy were divided. 
and the distant princes, who bowed before the spiritual throne, could not distinguish the spurious, from the legitimate, idol. The emperors were often the authors of the schism, from the political motive of opposing a friendly to a hostile pontiff. And each of the competitors was reduced to suffer the insults of his enemies, who were not awed by conscience, and to purchase the support of his adherents. Who were instigated by avarice or ambition a peaceful and perpetual succession was ascertained by Alexander III, 8286 who finally abolished the tumultuary votes of the clergy in people and defined the right of election in the sole college of cardinals. 8287 The three orders of bishops, priests, and deacons, were assimilated to each other by this important privilege. The parochial clergy of Rome obtained the first rank in the hierarchy, they were indifferently chosen among the nations of Christendom. And the possession of the richest benefices, of the most important bishoprics, was not incompatible with their title and office. The senators of the Catholic Church, the coadjutors and legates of the Supreme Pontiff, were robed in purple, the symbol of martyrdom or royalty, they claimed a proud equality with kings. And their dignity was enhanced by the smallness of their number, which, till the reign of Leo X, seldom exceeded twenty or twenty-five persons. By this wise regulation, all doubt and scandal were removed, and the root of schism was so effectually destroyed, that in a period of six hundred years a double choice has only once divided the unity of the sacred college. But as the concurrence of two-thirds of the votes had been made necessary, the election was often delayed by the private interest and passions of the cardinals. And while they prolonged their independent reign, the Christian world was left destitute of a head. A vacancy of almost three years had preceded the elevation of George X, who resolved to prevent the future abuse. And his bull, after some opposition, has been consecrated in the Code of the Canon Law. 8288 Nine days are allowed for the obsequies of the deceased Pope, and the arrival of the absent cardinals. On the tenth, they are imprisoned, each with one domestic, in a common apartment or conclave, without any separation of walls or curtains, a small window is reserved for the introduction of necessaries. But the door is locked on both sides and guarded by the magistrates of the city, to seclude them from all correspondence with the world. If the election be not consummated in three days, the luxury of their table is contracted to a single dish at dinner and supper, and after the eighth day, they are reduced to a scanty allowance of bread, water, and wine. During the vacancy of the Holy See, the cardinals are prohibited from touching the revenues, or assuming, unless in some rare emergency, the government of the Church, all agreements and promises among the electors are formally annulled. And their integrity is fortified by their solemn oath and the prayers of the Catholics. Some articles of inconvenient or superfluous rigor have been gradually relaxed, but the principle of confinement is vigorous and entire, they are still urged, by the personal motives of health and freedom. To accelerate the moment of their deliverance. And the improvement of ballot or secret votes has wrapped the struggles of the conclave 8289 in the silky veil of charity and politeness. 8290 By these institutions, the Romans were excluded from the election of their prince and bishop. And in the fever of wild and precarious liberty, they seemed insensible of the loss of this inestimable privilege. The Emperor Louis of Bavaria revived the example of the great Otho. After some negotiation with the magistrates, the Roman people were assembled 8291 in the square before St. Peter's, the Pope of Avignon, John XXII, was deposed, the choice of his successor was ratified by their consent and applause. They freely voted for a new law, that their bishop should never be absent more than three months in the year, and two days' journey from the city. And that if he neglected to return on the third summons, the public servant should be degraded and dismissed. 8292 But Louis forgot his own debility and the prejudices of the times, beyond the precincts of a German camp, his useless phantom was rejected, the Romans despised their own workmanship, the antipope implored the mercy of his lawful sovereign. 8293 And the exclusive right of the cardinals was more firmly established by this unseasonable attack. Had the election been always held in the Vatican, the rights of the Senate and people would not have been violated with impunity. But the Romans forgot, and were forgotten. In the absence of the successors of Gregory VII, 
who did not keep as a divine precept their ordinary residence in the city and diocese. The care of that diocese was less important than the government of the universal church, nor could the popes delight in a city in which their authority was always opposed, and their person was often endangered. From the persecution of the emperors, and the wars of Italy, they escaped beyond the Alps into the hospitable bosom of France. From the tumults of Rome they prudently withdrew to live and die in the more tranquil stations of Anagni, Perugia, Viterbo, and the adjacent cities. When the flock was offended or impoverished by the absence of the shepherd, they were recalled by a stern admonition, that St. Peter had fixed his chair, not in an obscure village, but in the capital of the world. By a ferocious menace, that the Romans would march in arms to destroy the place and people that should dare to afford them a retreat. They returned with timorous obedience. And were saluted with the account of a heavy debt, of all the losses which their desertion had occasioned, the hire of lodgings, the sale of provisions, and the various expenses of servants and strangers who attended the court. 8294 After a short interval of peace, and perhaps of authority, they were again banished by new tumults, and again summoned by the imperious or respectful invitation of the Senate. In these occasional retreats, the exiles and fugitives of the Vatican were seldom long, or far, distant from the metropolis. But in the beginning of the fourteenth century, the apostolic throne was transported, as it might seem forever, from the Tiber to the Rhone. And the cause of the transmigration may be deduced from the furious contest between Boniface VIII and the King of France. 8295 The spiritual arms of excommunication and interdict were repulsed by the union of the three estates, and the privileges of the Gallican Church, but the Pope was not prepared against the carnal weapons which Philip the Fair had courage to employ. As the Pope resided at Anagni, without the suspicion of danger, his palace and person were assaulted by three hundred horse, who had been secretly levied by William of Nogaret, a French minister, and Chiara Colonna of a noble but hostile family of Rome. The cardinals fled, the inhabitants of Anagni were seduced from their allegiance and gratitude, but the dauntless Boniface, unarmed and alone, seated himself in his chair, and awaited, like the conscript fathers of old, the swords of the Gauls. Nogaret, a foreign adversary, was content to execute the orders of his master, by the domestic enmity of Kalana, he was insulted with words and blows. And during a confinement of three days his life was threatened by the hardships which they inflicted on the obstinacy which they provoked. Their strange delay gave time and courage to the adherents of the church, who rescued him from sacrilegious violence, but his imperious soul was wounded in the vital part, and Boniface expired at Rome in a frenzy of rage and revenge. His memory is stained with the glaring vices of avarice and pride, nor has the courage of a martyr promoted this ecclesiastical champion to the honours of a saint. A magnanimous sinner, say the chronicles of the times, who entered like a fox, reigned like a lion, and died like a dog. He was succeeded by Benedict XI, the mildest of mankind. Yet he excommunicated the impious emissaries of Philip, and devoted the city and people of Anagni by a tremendous curse, whose effects are still visible to the eyes of superstition. 8296. After his decease, the tedious and equal suspense of the conclave was fixed by the dexterity of the French faction. A specious offer was made and accepted, that, in the term of forty days, they would elect one of the three candidates who should be named by their opponents. The Archbishop of Bordeaux, a furious enemy of his king and country, was the first on the list, but his ambition was known and his conscience obeyed the calls of fortune and the commands of a benefactor, who had been informed by a swift messenger that the choice of a pope was now in his hands. The terms were regulated in a private interview. And with such speed and secrecy was the business transacted, that the unanimous conclave applauded the elevation of Clement V.8297 The cardinals of both parties were soon astonished by a summons to attend him beyond the Alps. From whence, as they soon discovered, they must never hope to return. He was engaged, by promise and affection, to prefer the residence of France. And, after dragging his court through Poitou and Gascony, and devouring, by his expense, the cities and convents on the road, he finally reposed at Avignon. 
8298 which flourished above 70 years 8299 the seat of the Roman Pontiff and the metropolis of Christendom. By land, by sea, by the Rhone, the position of Avignon was on all sides accessible, the southern provinces of France do not yield to Italy itself, new palaces arose for the accommodation of the Pope and Cardinals. And the arts of luxury were soon attracted by the treasures of the Church. They were already possessed of the adjacent territory, the Venaissin County 8300 a populous and fertile spot. And the sovereignty of Avignon was afterwards purchased from the youth and distress of Jane, the first queen of Naples and Countess of Provence, for the inadequate price of fourscore thousand florins. 8301 Under the shadow of a French monarchy, amidst an obedient people, the popes enjoyed an honourable and tranquil state, to which they long had been strangers, but Italy deplored their absence. And Rome, in solitude and poverty, might repent of the ungovernable freedom which had driven from the Vatican the successor of St. Peter. Her repentance was tardy and fruitless, after the death of the old members, the sacred college was filled with French cardinals 8302 who beheld Rome and Italy with abhorrence and contempt and perpetuated a series of national, and even provincial. Popes, attached by the most indissoluble ties to their native country. The progress of industry had produced and enriched the Italian republics, the era of their liberty is the most flourishing period of population and agriculture, of manufactures and commerce. And their mechanic labors were gradually refined into the arts of elegance and genius. But the position of Rome was less favorable, the territory less fruitful, the character of the inhabitants was debased by indolence and elated by pride. And they fondly conceived that the tribute of subjects must forever nourish the metropolis of the church and empire. This prejudice was encouraged in some degree by the resort of pilgrims to the shrines of the apostles. And the last legacy of the popes, the institution of the holy year 8303 was not less beneficial to the people than to the clergy. Since the loss of Palestine, the gift of plenary indulgences, which had been applied to the Crusades, remained without an object, and the most valuable treasure of the Church was sequestered above eight years from public circulation. A new channel was opened by the diligence of Boniface VIII, who reconciled the vices of ambition and avarice. And the Pope had sufficient learning to recollect and revive the secular games which were celebrated in Rome at the conclusion of every century. To sound without danger the depth of popular credulity, a sermon was seasonably pronounced, a report was artfully scattered, some aged witnesses were produced, and on the 1st of January of the year 1300, the Church of Asti. Peter was crowded with the faithful, who demanded the customary indulgence of the holy time. The pontiff, who watched and irritated their devout impatience, was soon persuaded by ancient testimony of the justice of their claim. And he proclaimed a plenary absolution to all Catholics who, in the course of that year, and at every similar period, should respectfully visit the apostolic churches of St. Peter and St. Paul. The welcome sound was propagated through Christendom. And at first from the nearest provinces of Italy, and at length from the remote kingdoms of Hungary and Britain, the highways were thronged with a swarm of pilgrims who sought to expiate their sins in a journey, however costly or laborious, which was exempt from the perils of military service. All exceptions of rank or sex, of age or infirmity, were forgotten in the common transport, and in the streets and churches many persons were trampled to death by the eagerness of devotion. The calculation of their numbers could not be easy nor accurate. And they have probably been magnified by a dexterous clergy, well apprised of the contagion of example, yet we are assured by a judicious historian, who assisted at the ceremony. That Rome was never replenished with less than 200,000 strangers. And another spectator has fixed at two millions the total concourse of the year. A trifling oblation from each individual would accumulate a royal treasure. And two priests stood night and day, with rakes in their hands, to collect, without counting, the heaps of gold and silver that were poured on the altar of St. Paul. 8304 It was fortunately a season of peace and plenty. And if forage was scarce, if inns and lodgings were extravagantly dear, an inexhaustible supply of bread and wine, of meat and fish, was provided by the policy of Boniface and the venal hospitality of the Romans. From a city without trade or industry, all casual riches will speedily evaporate, 
but the avarice and envy of the next generation solicited Clement VI 8305 to anticipate the distant period of the century. The gracious pontiff complied with their wishes, afforded Rome this poor consolation for his loss, and justified the change by the name and practice of the Mosaic Jubilee. 8306 His summons was obeyed. And the number, zeal, and liberality of the pilgrims did not yield to the primitive festival. But they encountered the triple scourge of war, pestilence, and famine, many wives and virgins were violated in the castles of Italy. And many strangers were pillaged or murdered by the savage Romans, no longer moderated by the presence of their bishops. 8307 To the impatience of the popes we may ascribe the successive reduction to fifty, thirty-three, and twenty-five years. Although the second of these terms is commensurate with the life of Christ. The profusion of indulgences, the revolt of the Protestants, and the decline of superstition, have much diminished the value of the Jubilee. Yet even the nineteenth and last festival was a year of pleasure and profit to the Romans, and a philosophic smile will not disturb the triumph of the priest or the happiness of the people. 8308. In the beginning of the eleventh century, Italy was exposed to the feudal tyranny, alike oppressive to the sovereign and the people. The rights of human nature were vindicated by her numerous republics, who soon extended their liberty and dominion from the city to the adjacent country. The sword of the nobles was broken, their slaves were enfranchised. Their castles were demolished, they assumed the habits of society and obedience, their ambition was confined to municipal honors, and in the proudest aristocracy of Venice on Genoa, each patrician was subject to the laws. 8309 But the feeble and disorderly government of Rome was unequal to the task of curbing her rebellious sons, who scorned the authority of the magistrate within and without the walls. It was no longer a civil contention between the nobles and plebeians for the government of the state, the barons asserted in arms their personal independence, their palaces and castles were fortified against a siege. And their private quarrels were maintained by the numbers of their vassals and retainers. In origin and affection, they were aliens to their country 8310 and a genuine Roman, could such have been produced, might have renounced these haughty strangers, who disdained the appellation of citizens, and proudly styled themselves the princes. Of Rome. 8311 After a dark series of revolutions, all records of pedigree were lost, the distinction of surnames was abolished, the blood of the nations was mingled in a thousand channels. And the Goths and Lombards, the Greeks and Franks, the Germans and Normans, had obtained the fairest possessions by royal bounty, or the prerogative of valor. These examples might be readily presumed. But the elevation of a Hebrew race to the rank of senators and consuls is an event without a parallel in the long captivity of these miserable exiles. 8312 In the time of Leo IX, a wealthy and learned Jew was converted to Christianity, and honored at his baptism with the name of his godfather, the reigning Pope. The zeal and courage of Peter the son of Leo were signalized in the cause of Gregory VII, who entrusted his faithful adherent with the government of Adrian's Mole, the Tower of Crescentius, or, as it is now called, the Castle of St. Angelo. Both the father and the son were the parents of a numerous progeny, their riches, the fruits of usury, were shared with the noblest families of the city. And so extensive was their alliance, that the grandson of the proselyte was exalted by the weight of his kindred to the throne of St. Peter. A majority of the clergy and people supported his cause, he reigned several years in the Vatican. And it is only the eloquence of St. Bernard, and the final triumph of Innocence II, that has branded Anacletus with the epithet of Antipope. After his defeat and death, the posterity of Leo is no longer conspicuous. And none will be found of the modern nobles ambitious of descending from a Jewish stock. It is not my design to enumerate the Roman families which have failed at different periods, or those which are continued in different degrees of splendor to the present time. 8313 The old consular line of the Frangipani discover their name in the generous act of breaking or dividing bread in a time of famine. And such benevolence is more truly glorious than to have enclosed, with their allies the Corsi, a spacious quarter of the city in the chains of their fortifications. The Savelli, as it should seem a Sabine race, have maintained their original dignity, 
The obsolete surname of the Kapazaki is inscribed on the coins of the first senators, the Conti preserve the honor, without the estate, of the Counts of Signia. And the Anibaldi must have been very ignorant, or very modest, if they had not descended from the Carthaginian hero. 8314. But among, perhaps above, the peers and princes of the city, I distinguish the rival houses of Colonna and Ursini, whose private story is an essential part of the annals of modern Rome. I. The name and arms of Colonna 8315 have been the theme of much doubtful etymology. Nor have the orators and antiquarians overlooked either Trajan's pillar, or the columns of Hercules, or the pillar of Christ's flagellation, or the luminous column that guided the Israelites in the desert. Their first historical appearance in the year 1104 attests the power and antiquity, while it explains the simple meaning, of the name. By the usurpation of Cavi, the Kalana provoked the arms of Paschal II. But they lawfully held in the Campania of Rome the hereditary fiefs of Zagarola and Kalana, and the latter of these towns was probably adorned with some lofty pillar, the relic of a villa or temple. 8316 They likewise possessed one moiety of the neighboring city of Tusculum, a strong presumption of their descent from the counts of Tusculum, who in the 10th century were the tyrants of the Apostolic See. According to their own and the public opinion, the primitive and remote source was derived from the banks of the Rhine. 8317 And the sovereigns of Germany were not ashamed of a real or fabulous affinity with a noble race, which in the revolutions of seven hundred years has been often illustrated by merit and always by fortune. 8318 About the end of the thirteenth century, the most powerful branch was composed of an uncle and six fathers, all conspicuous in arms, or in the honors of the church. Of these, Peter was elected senator of Rome, introduced to the capital in a triumphal car, and hailed in some vain acclamations with the title of Caesar. While John and Stephen were declared Marquis of Ancona and Count of Romagna, by Nicholas IV, a patron so partial to their family, that he has been delineated in satirical portraits, imprisoned as it were in a hollow pillar. 8319 After his decease their haughty behavior provoked the displeasure of the most implacable of mankind. The two cardinals, the uncle and the nephew, denied the election of Boniface VIII. And the Kalana were oppressed for a moment by his temporal and spiritual arms. 8320 He proclaimed a crusade against his personal enemies, their estates were confiscated, their fortresses on either side of the Tiber were besieged by the troops of Asti. Peter and those of the rival nobles, and after the ruin of Palestrina or Prenest, their principal seat, the ground was marked with a plowshare, the emblem of perpetual desolation. Degraded, banished, proscribed, the six brothers, in disguise and danger, wandered over Europe without renouncing the hope of deliverance and revenge. In this double hope, the French court was their surest asylum. They prompted and directed the enterprise of Philip, and I should praise their magnanimity, had they respected the misfortune and courage of the captive tyrant. His civil acts were annulled by the Roman people, who restored the honors and possessions of the Kalana and some estimate may be formed of their wealth by their losses, of their losses by the damages of one hundred thousand gold florins which were granted them against the accomplices and heirs of the deceased Pope. All the spiritual censures and disqualifications were abolished 8321 by his prudent successors, and the fortune of the house was more firmly established by this transient hurricane. The boldness of Shiara Kalana was signalized in the captivity of Boniface, and long afterwards in the coronation of Louis of Bavaria, and by the gratitude of the emperor, the pillar in their arms was encircled with a royal crown. But the first of the family in fame and merit was the elder Stephen, whom Petrarch loved and esteemed as a hero superior to his own times, and not unworthy of ancient Rome. Persecution and exile displayed to the nations his abilities in peace and war, in his distress he was an object, not of pity, but of reverence, the aspect of danger provoked him to avow his name and country. And when he was asked, Where is now your fortress? He laid his hand on his heart, and answered, Here. He supported with the same virtue the return of prosperity. And, till the ruin of his declining age, the ancestors, the character, and the children of Stephen Colonna, exalted his dignity in the Roman Republic, and at the court of Avignon. 2. The Ursini migrated from Spoleto. 
8,322 the sons of Ursus, as they are styled in the 12th century, from some eminent person, who is only known as the father of their race. But they were soon distinguished among the nobles of Rome, by the number and bravery of their kinsmen, the strength of their towers, the honours of the senate and sacred college, and the elevation of two popes. Celestin III and Nicholas III, of their name and lineage. 8323 Their riches may be accused as an early abuse of nepotism, the estates of St. Peter were alienated in their favour by the liberal Celestin, 8324 and Nicholas was ambitious for their sake to solicit the alliance of monarchs. To found new kingdoms in Lombardy and Tuscany, and to invest them with the perpetual office of senators of Rome. All that has been observed of the greatness of the Colonna will likewise redound to the glory of the Ursini, their constant and equal antagonists in the long hereditary feud, which distracted above 250 years the ecclesiastical state. The jealousy of preeminence and power was the true ground of their quarrel, but as a specious badge of distinction, the Colonna embraced the name of Guidelines and the party of the Empire. The Ursini espoused the title of Guelphs and the cause of the Church. The Eagle and the Keys were displayed in their adverse banners. And the two factions of Italy most furiously raged when the origin and nature of the dispute were long since forgotten. 8325 After the retreat of the popes to Avignon, they disputed in arms the vacant republic. And the mischiefs of discord were perpetuated by the wretched compromise of electing each year two rival senators. By their private hostilities, the city and country were desolated, and the fluctuating balance inclined with their alternate success. But none of either family had fallen by the sword, till the most renowned champion of the Ursini was surprised and slain by the younger Stephen Colonna. 8326 His triumph is stained with the reproach of violating the truce. Their defeat was basely avenged by the assassination, before the church door, of an innocent boy and his two servants. Yet the victorious Colonna, with an annual colleague, was declared senator of Rome during the term of five years. And the muse of Petrarch inspired a wish, a hope, a prediction, that the generous youth, the son of his venerable hero, would restore Rome and Italy to their pristine glory. That his justice would extirpate the wolves and lions, the serpents and bears, who labored to subvert the eternal basis of the marble column. 8327. LXX, Final Settlement of the Ecclesiastical State. Character and Coronation of Petrarch. Restoration of the freedom and government of Rome by the Tribune Rienzi. His virtues and vices, his expulsion and death. Return of the popes from Avignon. Great Schism of the West. Reunion of the Latin Church. Last struggles of Roman liberty. Statutes of Rome. Final settlement of the ecclesiastical state. In the apprehension of modern times, Petrarch 8328 is the Italian songster of Laura and Love. In the harmony of his Tuscan rhymes, Italy applauds, or rather adores, the father of her lyric poetry, and his verse, or at least his name, is repeated by the enthusiasm, or affectation, of amorous sensibility. Whatever may be the private taste of a stranger, his slight and superficial knowledge should humbly acquiesce in the judgment of a learned nation. Yet I may hope or presume, that the Italians do not compare the tedious uniformity of sonnets and elegies with the sublime compositions of their epic muse, the original wildness of Dante, the regular beauties of Tasso, and the boundless variety of the incomparable Ariosto. The merits of the lover I am still less qualified to appreciate, nor am I deeply interested in a metaphysical passion for a nymph so shadowy, that her existence has been questioned. 8329 For a matron so prolific 8330 that she was delivered of eleven legitimate children 8331 While her amorous swain sighed and sung at the fountain of Vaucluse. 8332 But in the eyes of Petrarch, and those of his graver contemporaries, his love was a sin, an Italian verse a frivolous amusement. His Latin works of philosophy, poetry, and eloquence, established his serious reputation, which was soon diffused from Avignon over France and Italy, his friends and disciples were multiplied in every city. And if the ponderous volume of his writings 8333 be now abandoned to a long repose, our gratitude must applaud the man, who by precept and example revived the spirit and study of the Augustan age. From his earliest youth, 
Petrarch aspired to the poetic crown. The academical honors of the three faculties had introduced a royal degree of master or doctor in the art of poetry. 8334 and the title of poet laureate, which custom, rather than vanity, perpetuates in the English court, 8335 was first invented by the Caesars of Germany. In the musical games of antiquity, a prize was bestowed on the victor, 8336 the belief that Virgil and Horace had been crowned in the capital inflamed the emulation of a Latin bard. 8337 and the laurel 8338 was endeared to the lover by a verbal resemblance with the name of his mistress. The value of either object was enhanced by the difficulties of the pursuit. And if the virtue or prudence of Laura was inexorable, 8339 he enjoyed, and might boast of enjoying, the nymph of poetry. His vanity was not of the most delicate kind, since he applauds the success of his own labors, his name was popular. His friends were active, the open or secret opposition of envy and prejudice was surmounted by the dexterity of patient merit. In the thirty-sixth year of his age, he was solicited to accept the object of his wishes. And on the same day, in the solitude of Vaucluse, he received a similar and solemn invitation from the Senate of Rome and the University of Paris. The learning of a theological school, and the ignorance of a lawless city were alike unqualified to bestow the ideal though immortal wreath which genius may obtain from the free applause of the public and of posterity, but the candidate dismissed this troublesome reflection. And after some moments of complacency and suspense, preferred the summons of the metropolis of the world. The ceremony of his coronation 8340 was performed in the capital, by his friend and patron the Supreme Magistrate of the Republic. Twelve patrician youths were arrayed in scarlet, six representatives of the most illustrious families, in green robes, with garlands of flowers, accompanied the procession. In the midst of the princes and nobles, the senator, Count of Anguillara, a kinsman of the Kalana, assumed his throne, and at the voice of a herald Petrarch arose. After discoursing on a text of Virgil, and thrice repeating his vows for the prosperity of Rome, he knelt before the throne, and received from the senator a laurel crown, with a more precious declaration, this is the reward of merit. The people shouted, Long life to the capital and the poet. A sonnet in praise of Rome was accepted as the effusion of genius and gratitude. And after the whole procession had visited the Vatican, the profane wreath was suspended before the shrine of St. Peter. In the Act or Diploma 8341 which was presented to Petrarch, the title and prerogatives of poet laureate are revived in the capital, after the lapse of thirteen hundred years. And he receives the perpetual privilege of wearing, at his choice, a crown of laurel, ivy, or myrtle, of assuming the poetic habit, and of teaching, disputing, interpreting, and composing, in all places whatsoever, and on all subjects of literature. The grant was ratified by the authority of the Senate and people, and the character of citizen was the recompense of his affection for the Roman name. They did him honor, but they did him justice. In the familiar society of Cicero and Livy, he had imbibed the ideas of an ancient patriot, and his ardent fancy kindled every idea to a sentiment, and every sentiment to a passion. The aspect of the seven hills and their majestic ruins confirmed these lively impressions, and he loved a country by whose liberal spirit he had been crowned and adopted. The poverty and debasement of Rome excited the indignation and pity of her grateful son, he dissembled the faults of his fellow citizens, applauded with partial fondness the last of their heroes and matrons. And in the remembrance of the past, in the hopes of the future, was pleased to forget the miseries of the present time. Rome was still the lawful mistress of the world, the Pope and the Emperor, the Bishop and General, had abdicated their station by an inglorious retreat to the Rhone and the Danube. But if she could resume her virtue, the Republic might again vindicate her liberty and dominion. Amidst the indulgence of enthusiasm and eloquence 8342 Petrarch, Italy, and Europe, were astonished by a revolution which realized for a moment his most splendid visions. The rise and fall of the Tribune Rienzi will occupy the following pages 8343 The subject is interesting, the materials are rich, and the glance of a patriot bard 8344 will sometimes vivify the copious, but simple, narrative of the Florentine. 8345 and more especially of the Roman, historian. 8346. 
In a quarter of the city which was inhabited only by mechanics and Jews, the marriage of an innkeeper and a washerwoman produced the future deliverer of Rome. 8347-8348 From such parents Nicholas Rienzi Gabrini could inherit neither dignity nor fortune, and the gift of a liberal education, which they painfully bestowed, was the cause of his glory and untimely end. The study of history in eloquence, the writings of Cicero, Seneca, Livy, Caesar, and Valerius Maximus. Elevated above his equals and contemporaries the genius of the young plebeian, he perused with indefatigable diligence the manuscripts and marbles of antiquity. Loved to dispense his knowledge in familiar language, and was often provoked to exclaim, Where are now these Romans? Their virtue, their justice, their power. Why was I not born in those happy times? 8349 When the Republic addressed to the throne of Avignon an embassy of the three orders, the spirit and eloquence of Rienzi recommended him to a place among the thirteen deputies of the commons. The orator had the honor of haranguing Pope Clement VI, and the satisfaction of conversing with Petrarch. A congenial mind, but his aspiring hopes were chilled by disgrace and poverty and the patriot was reduced to a single garment and the charity of the hospital. 8350 From this misery he was relieved by the sense of merit or the smile of favor. And the employment of apostolic notary afforded him a daily stipend of five gold florins, a more honorable and extensive connection, and the right of contrasting, both in words and actions, his own integrity with the vices of the state. The eloquence of Rienzi was prompt and persuasive, the multitude is always prone to envy and censure, he was stimulated by the loss of a brother and the impunity of the assassins, nor was it possible to excuse or exaggerate the public calamities. The blessings of peace and justice, for which civil society has been instituted, were banished from Rome, the jealous citizens, who might have endured every personal or pecuniary injury were most deeply wounded in the dishonor of their wives and daughters, 8351 they were equally oppressed by the arrogance of the nobles and the corruption of the magistrates. 8352 and the abuse of arms or of laws was the only circumstance that distinguished the lions from the dogs and serpents of the capital. These allegorical emblems were variously repeated in the pictures which Rienzi exhibited in the streets and churches. And while the spectators gazed with curious wonder, the bold and ready orator unfolded the meaning, applied the satire, inflamed their passions, and announced a distant hope of comfort and deliverance. The privileges of Rome, her eternal sovereignty over her princes and provinces, was the theme of his public and private discourse, and a monument of servitude became in his hands a title and incentive of liberty. The decree of the Senate, which granted the most ample prerogatives to the Emperor Vespasian, had been inscribed on a copper plate still extant in the choir of the Church of St. John Lateran. 8353 A numerous assembly of nobles and plebeians was invited to this political lecture, and a convenient theatre was erected for their reception. The notary appeared in a magnificent and mysterious habit, explained the inscription by a version and commentary 8354 and descanted with eloquence and zeal on the ancient glories of the Senate and people, from whom all legal authority was derived. The supine ignorance of the nobles was incapable of discerning the serious tendency of such representations, they might sometimes chastise with words and blows the plebeian reformer. But he was often suffered in the Kalana Palace to amuse the company with his threats and predictions, and the modern Brutus 8355 was concealed under the mask of folly and the character of a buffoon. While they indulged their contempt, the restoration of the good estate, his favorite expression, was entertained among the people as a desirable, a possible, and at length as an approaching, event. And while all had the disposition to applaud, some had the courage to assist, their promised deliverer. A prophecy, or rather a summons, affixed on the church door of St. George, was the first public evidence of his designs. A nocturnal assembly of a hundred citizens on Mount Aventine, the first step to their execution. After an oath of secrecy and aid, he represented to the conspirators the importance and facility of their enterprise. That the nobles, without union or resources, were strong only in the fear nobles, of their imaginary strength, that all power, as well as right, was in the hands of the people. That the revenues of the apostolical chamber might relieve the public distress, 
and that the Pope himself would approve their victory over the common enemies of government and freedom. After securing a faithful band to protect his first declaration, he proclaimed through the city, by sound of trumpet, that on the evening of the following day, all persons should assemble without arms before the Church of Esti. Angelo, to provide for the re-establishment of the good estate. The whole night was employed in the celebration of thirty masses of the Holy Ghost. And in the morning, Rienzi, bareheaded, but in complete armor, issued from the church, encompassed by the hundred conspirators. The Pope's vicar, the simple Bishop of Orvieto, who had been persuaded to sustain a part in this singular ceremony, marched on his right hand, and three great standards were borne aloft as the emblems of their design. In the first, the banner of liberty, Rome was seated on two lions, with a palm in one hand and a globe in the other, St. Paul, with a drawn sword, was delineated in the banner of justice, and in the third, St. Peter held the keys of concord and peace. Rienzi was encouraged by the presence and applause of an innumerable crowd, who understood little, and hoped much, and the procession slowly rolled forwards from the castle of St. Angelo to the capital. His triumph was disturbed by some secret emotions which he labored to suppress, he ascended without opposition, and with seeming confidence, the citadel of the Republic, harangued the people from the balcony, and received the most flattering confirmation of his acts and laws. The nobles, as if destitute of arms and councils, beheld in silent consternation this strange revolution. And the moment had been prudently chosen, when the most formidable, Stephen Colonna, was absent from the city. On the first rumor, he returned to his palace, affected to despise this plebeian tumult, and declared to the messenger of Rienzi, that at his leisure he would cast the madman from the windows of the capital. The great bell instantly rang an alarm, and so rapid was the tide, so urgent was the danger, that Kalana escaped with precipitation to the suburb of Esti. Lawrence, from thence, after a moment's refreshment, he continued the same speedy career till he reached in safety his castle of Palestrina, lamenting his own imprudence, which had not trampled the spark of this mighty conflagration. A general and peremptory order was issued from the capital to all the nobles, that they should peaceably retire to their estates, they obeyed, and their departure secured the tranquillity of the free and obedient citizens of Rome. But such voluntary obedience evaporates with the first transports of zeal, and Rienzi felt the importance of justifying his usurpation by a regular form and a legal title. At his own choice, the Roman people would have displayed their attachment and authority, by lavishing on his head the names of senator or consul, of king or emperor, he preferred the ancient and modest appellation of tribune. 8356 The protection of the commons was the essence of that sacred office, and they were ignorant, that it had never been invested with any share in the legislative or executive powers of the Republic. In this character, and with the consent of the Roman, the tribune enacted the most salutary laws for the restoration and maintenance of the good estate. By the first he fulfills the wish of honesty and inexperience, that no civil suit should be protracted beyond the term of fifteen days. The danger of frequent perjury might justify the pronouncing against a false accuser the same penalty which his evidence would have inflicted, the disorders of the times might compel the legislator to punish every homicide with death and every injury with equal retaliation. But the execution of justice was hopeless till he had previously abolished the tyranny of the nobles. It was formally provided, that none, except the supreme magistrate, should possess or command the gates, bridges, or towers of the state. That no private garrisons should be introduced into the towns or castles of the Roman territory, that none should bear arms, or presume to fortify their houses in the city or country that the barons should be responsible for the safety of the highways, and the free passage of provisions, and that the protection of malefactors and robbers should be expiated by a fine of a thousand marks of silver. But these regulations would have been impotent and nugatory, had not the licentious nobles been awed by the sword of the civil power. A sudden alarm from the bell of the capital could still summon to the standard above twenty thousand volunteers, the support of the tribune and the laws required a more regular and permanent force. In each harbour of the coast a vessel was stationed for the assurance of commerce. A standing militia of 360 horse and 1300 foot was levied, clothed, and paid in the thirteen quarters of the city, 
and the spirit of a commonwealth may be traced in the grateful allowance of one hundred florins or pounds to the heirs of every soldier who lost his life in the service of his country. For the maintenance of the public defense, for the establishment of granaries, for the relief of widows, orphans, and indigent convents, Rienzi applied, without fear of sacrilege. The revenues of the apostolic chamber, the three branches of hearth money, the salt duty, and the customs, were each of the annual produce of one hundred thousand florins. 8357 and scandalous were the abuses, if in four or five months the amount of the salt duty could be trebled by his judicious economy. After thus restoring the forces and finances of the Republic, the Tribune recalled the nobles from their solitary independence, required their personal appearance in the capital, and imposed an oath of allegiance to the new government, and of submission to the laws of the good estate. Apprehensive for their safety, but still more apprehensive of the danger of a refusal, the princes and barons returned to their houses at Rome in the garb of simple and peaceful citizens, the Colonna and Ursini, the Savelli and Frangipani, were confounded before the tribunal of a plebeian, of the vile buffoon whom they had so often derided, and their disgrace was aggravated by the indignation which they vainly struggled to disguise. The same oath was successively pronounced by the several orders of society, the clergy and gentlemen, the judges and notaries, the merchants and artisans, and the gradual descent was marked by the increase of sincerity and zeal. They swore to live and die with the Republic and the Church, whose interest was artfully united by the nominal association of the Bishop of Orvieto, the Pope's vicar, to the office of Tribune. It was the boast of Rienzi, that he had delivered the throne and patrimony of St. Peter from a rebellious aristocracy. And Clement VI, who rejoiced in its fall, affected to believe the professions, to applaud the merits, and to confirm the title, of his trusty servant. The speech, perhaps the mind, of the tribune, was inspired with a lively regard for the purity of the faith, he insinuated his claim to a supernatural mission from the Holy Ghost. Enforced by a heavy forfeiture the annual duty of confession and communion, and strictly guarded the spiritual as well as temporal welfare of his faithful people. 8358. Never perhaps has the energy and effect of a single mind been more remarkably felt than in the sudden, though transient, reformation of Rome by the Tribune Rienzi. A den of robbers was converted to the discipline of a camp or convent, patient to hear, swift to redress, inexorable to punish, his tribunal was always accessible to the poor and stranger. Nor could birth, or dignity, or the immunities of the church, protect the offender or his accomplices. The privileged houses, the private sanctuaries in Rome, on which no officer of justice would presume to trespass, were abolished. And he applied the timber and iron of their barricades in the fortifications of the capital. The venerable father of the Colonna was exposed in his own palace to the double shame of being desirous, and of being unable, to protect a criminal. A mule, with a jar of oil, had been stolen near Capranica. And the lord of the Ursini family was condemned to restore the damage, and to discharge a fine of four hundred florins for his negligence in guarding the highways. Nor were the persons of the barons more inviolate than their lands or houses, and, either from accident or design, the same impartial rigor was exercised against the heads of the adverse factions. Peter Agapet Colonna, who had himself been senator of Rome, was arrested in the street for injury or debt. And justice was appeased by the tardy execution of Martin Ursini, who, among his various acts of violence and rapine, had pillaged a shipwrecked vessel at the mouth of the Tiber. 8359 His name, the purple of two cardinals, his uncles, a recent marriage, and a mortal disease were disregarded by the inflexible tribune, who had chosen his victim. The public officers dragged him from his palace and nuptial bed, his trial was short and satisfactory. The bell of the capital convened the people, stripped of his mantle, on his knees, with his hands bound behind his back. He heard the sentence of death. And after a brief confession, Ursini was led away to the gallows. After such an example, none who were conscious of guilt could hope for impunity, and the flight of the wicked, the licentious, and the idle, soon purified the city and territory of Rome. In this time, says the historian, the woods began to rejoice that they were no longer infested with robbers, the oxen began to plough, 
the pilgrims visited the sanctuaries, the roads and inns were replenished with travelers. Trade, plenty, and good faith, were restored in the markets, and a purse of gold might be exposed without danger in the midst of the highway. As soon as the life and property of the subject are secure, the labors and rewards of industry spontaneously revive, Rome was still the metropolis of the Christian world. And the fame and fortunes of the tribune were diffused in every country by the strangers who had enjoyed the blessings of his government. The deliverance of his country inspired Rienzi with a vast, and perhaps visionary, idea of uniting Italy in a great federative republic, of which Rome should be the ancient and lawful head. And the free cities and princes the members and associates. His pen was not less eloquent than his tongue, and his numerous epistles were delivered to swift and trusty messengers. On foot, with a white wand in their hand, they traversed the forests and mountains. Enjoyed, in the most hostile states, the sacred security of ambassadors. And reported, in the style of flattery or truth, that the highways along their passage were lined with kneeling multitudes, who implored heaven for the success of their undertaking. Could passion have listened to reason? Could private interest have yielded to the public welfare, the Supreme Tribunal and Confederate Union of the Italian Republic might have healed their intestine discord, and closed the Alps against the barbarians of the North. But the propitious season had elapsed. And if Venice, Florence, Siena, Perugia, and many inferior cities offered their lives and fortunes to the good estate, the tyrants of Lombardy and Tuscany must despise, or hate, the plebeian author of a free constitution. From them, however, and from every part of Italy, the tribune received the most friendly and respectful answers, they were followed by the ambassadors of the princes and republics. And in this foreign conflux, on all the occasions of pleasure or business, the low-born notary could assume the familiar or majestic courtesy of a sovereign. 8360 The most glorious circumstance of his reign was an appeal to his justice from Louis, King of Hungary, who complained, that his brother and her husband had been perfidiously strangled by Jane. Queen of Naples 8361 Her guilt or innocence was pleaded in a solemn trial at Rome. But after hearing the advocates 8362 the tribune adjourned this weighty and invidious cause, which was soon determined by the sword of the Hungarian. Beyond the Alps, more especially at Avignon, the revolution was the theme of curiosity, wonder, and applause. 8363 Petrarch had been the private friend, perhaps the secret counselor, of Rienzi, his writings breathed the most ardent spirit of patriotism and joy. And all respect for the Pope, all gratitude for the Kalana, was lost in the superior duties of a Roman citizen. The poet laureate of the capital maintains the act, applauds the hero, and mingles with some apprehension and advice, the most lofty hopes of the permanent and rising greatness of the Republic. 8364. While Petrarch indulged these prophetic visions, the Roman hero was fast declining from the meridian of fame and power. And the people, who had gazed with astonishment on the ascending meteor, began to mark the irregularity of its course, and the vicissitudes of light and obscurity. More eloquent than judicious, more enterprising than resolute, the faculties of Rienzi were not balanced by cool and commanding reason, he magnified in a tenfold proportion the objects of hope and fear. And prudence, which could not have erected, did not presume to fortify, his throne. In the blaze of prosperity, his virtues were insensibly tinctured with the adjacent vices. Justice with cruelty, liberality with profusion, and the desire of fame with puerile and ostentatious vanity. 8365 He might have learned, that the ancient tribunes, so strong and sacred in the public opinion, were not distinguished in style, habit, or appearance, from an ordinary plebeian. 8366 And that as often as they visited the city on foot, a single viator, or beetle, attended the exercise of their office. The Gracchi would have frowned or smiled, could they have read the sonorous titles and epithets of their successor, Nicholas, severe and merciful, deliverer of Rome, defender of Italy, 8367 friend of mankind, and of liberty, peace, and justice. Tribune August, his theatrical pageants had prepared the revolution, but Rienzi abused, in luxury and pride, the political maxim of speaking to the eyes, as well as the understanding, of the multitude. 
From nature he had received the gift of a handsome person 8368 till it was swelled and disfigured by intemperance, and his propensity to laughter was corrected in the magistrate by the affectation of gravity and sternness. He was clothed, at least on public occasions, in a party-colored robe of velvet or satin, lined with fur, and embroidered with gold, the rod of justice, which he carried in his hand, was a scepter of polished steel. Crowned with a globe and cross of gold, and enclosing a small fragment of the true and holy wood. In his civil and religious processions through the city, he rode on a white steed, the symbol of royalty, the great banner of the republic, a sun with a circle of stars, a dove with an olive branch, was displayed over his head. A shower of gold and silver was scattered among the populace, fifty guards with halberds encompassed his person, a troop of horse preceded his march, and their timbals and trumpets were of massy silver. The ambition of the honours of chivalry 8369 betrayed the meanness of his birth, and degraded the importance of his office, and the equestrian tribune was not less odious to the nobles, whom he adopted, than to the plebeians, whom he deserted. All that yet remained of treasure, or luxury, or art, was exhausted on that solemn day. Rienzi led the procession from the capital to the Lateran, the tediousness of the way was relieved with decorations and games. The ecclesiastical, civil, and military orders marched under their various banners, the Roman ladies attended his wife, and the ambassadors of Italy might loudly applaud or secretly deride the novelty of the pomp. In the evening, which they had reached the church and palace of Constantine, he thanked and dismissed the numerous assembly, with an invitation to the festival of the ensuing day. From the hands of a venerable knight he received the order of the Holy Ghost, the purification of the bath was a previous ceremony. But in no step of his life did Rienzi excite such scandal and censure as by the profane use of the porphyry vase, in which Constantine, a foolish legend, had been healed of his leprosy by Pope Sylvester. 8370 With equal presumption the tribune watched or reposed within the consecrated precincts of the baptistry, and the failure of his state bed was interpreted as an omen of his approaching downfall. At the hour of worship, he showed himself to the returning crowds in a majestic attitude, with a robe of purple, his sword, and gilt spurs, but the holy rites were soon interrupted by his levity and insolence. Rising from his throne, and advancing towards the congregation, he proclaimed in a loud voice, We summon to our tribunal Pope Clement, and command him to reside in his diocese of Rome, we also summon the sacred college of cardinals. 8371 We again summon the two pretenders, Charles of Bohemia and Louis of Bavaria, who style themselves emperors, we likewise summon all the electors of Germany. To inform us on what pretense they have usurped the inalienable right of the Roman people, the ancient and lawful sovereigns of the empire. 8372 Unsheathing his maiden sword, he thrice brandished it to the three parts of the world, and thrice repeated the extravagant declaration, and this too is mine. The Pope's vicar, the Bishop of Orvieto, attempted to check this career of folly. But his feeble protest was silenced by martial music, and instead of withdrawing from the assembly, he consented to dine with his brother tribune, at a table which had hitherto been reserved for the supreme pontiff. A banquet, such as the Caesars had given, was prepared for the Romans. The apartments, porticos, and courts of the Lateran were spread with innumerable tables for either sex and every condition. A stream of wine flowed from the nostrils of Constantine's brazen horse, no complaint, except of the scarcity of water, could be heard, and the licentiousness of the multitude was curbed by discipline and fear. A subsequent day was appointed for the coronation of Rienzi, 8373 Seven crowns of different leaves or medals were successively placed on his head by the most eminent of the Roman clergy, they represented the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. And he still professed to imitate the example of the ancient tribunes. 8374 These extraordinary spectacles might deceive or flatter the people, and their own vanity was gratified in the vanity of their leader. But in his private life he soon deviated from the strict rule of frugality and abstinence, and the plebeians, who were awed by the splendor of the nobles, were provoked by the luxury of their equal. His wife, his son, his uncle, a barber in name and profession, exposed the contrast of vulgar manners and princely expense, and without acquiring the majesty, Rienzi degenerated into the vices, of a king. 
a simple citizen describes with pity, or perhaps with pleasure, the humiliation of the barons of Rome. Bareheaded, their hands crossed on their breast, they stood with downcast looks in the presence of the tribune. And they trembled, good God, how they trembled. 8375 As long as the yoke of Rienzi was that of justice and their country, their conscience forced them to esteem the man, whom pride and interest provoked them to hate, his extravagant conduct soon fortified their hatred by contempt. And they conceived the hope of subverting a power which was no longer so deeply rooted in the public confidence. The old animosity of the Kalana and Ursini was suspended for a moment by their common disgrace, they associated their wishes, and perhaps their designs, an assassin was seized and tortured, he accused the nobles. And as soon as Rienzi deserved the fate, he adopted the suspicions and maxims of a tyrant. On the same day, under various pretenses, he invited to the capital his principal enemies, among whom were five members of the Ursini and three of the Kalana name. But instead of a council or a banquet, they found themselves prisoners under the sword of despotism or justice, and the consciousness of innocence or guilt might inspire them with equal apprehensions of danger. At the sound of the great bell the people assembled, they were arraigned for a conspiracy against the tribune's life. And though some might sympathize in their distress, not a hand, nor a voice, was raised to rescue the first of the nobility from their impending doom. Their apparent boldness was prompted by despair. They passed in separate chambers a sleepless and painful night, and the venerable hero, Stephen Kalana, striking against the door of his prison, repeatedly urged his guards to deliver him by a speedy death from such ignominious servitude. In the morning they understood their sentence from the visit of a confessor and the tolling of the bell. The great hall of the capital had been decorated for the bloody scene with red and white hangings, the countenance of the tribune was dark and severe, the swords of the executioners were unsheathed. And the barons were interrupted in their dying speeches by the sound of trumpets. But in this decisive moment, Rienzi was not less anxious or apprehensive than his captives, he dreaded the splendor of their names, their surviving kinsmen, the inconstancy of the people, the reproaches of the world, and, after rashly offering a mortal injury, he vainly presumed that, if he could forgive, he might himself be forgiven. His elaborate oration was that of a Christian and a suppliant, and, as the humble minister of the commons, he entreated his masters to pardon these noble criminals, for whose repentance and future service he pledged his faith and authority. If you are spared, said the tribune, by the mercy of the Romans, will you not promise to support the good estate with your lives and fortunes? Astonished by this marvellous clemency, the barons bowed their heads. And while they devoutly repeated the oath of allegiance, might whisper a secret, and more sincere, assurance of revenge. A priest, in the name of the people, pronounced their absolution, they received the communion with the tribune, assisted at the banquet, followed the procession. And, after every spiritual and temporal sign of reconciliation, were dismissed in safety to their respective homes, with the new honors and titles of generals, consuls, and patricians. 8376. During some weeks they were checked by the memory of their danger, rather than of their deliverance, till the most powerful of the Ursini, escaping with the Kalana from the city, erected at Marino the standard of rebellion. The fortifications of the castle were instantly restored, the vassals attended their lord, the outlaws armed against the magistrate, the flocks and herds, the harvests and vineyards, from Marino to the gates of Rome, were swept away or destroyed. And the people arraigned Rienzi as the author of the calamities which his government had taught them to forget. In the camp, Rienzi appeared to less advantage than in the rostrum. And he neglected the progress of the rebel barons till their numbers were strong, and their castles impregnable. From the pages of Livy he had not imbibed the art, or even the courage, of a general, an army of twenty thousand Romans returned without honor or effect from the attack of Marino. And his vengeance was amused by painting his enemies, their heads downwards, and drowning two dogs, at least they should have been bears, as the representatives of the Ursini. The belief of his incapacity encouraged their operations, they were invited by their secret adherents, and the barons attempted, with four thousand foot and sixteen hundred horse, to enter Rome by force or surprise. The city was prepared for their reception, the alarm bell rung all night, 
the gates were strictly guarded, or insolently open, and after some hesitation they sounded a retreat. The two first divisions had passed along the walls, but the prospect of a free entrance tempted the headstrong valor of the nobles in the rear. And after a successful skirmish, they were overthrown and massacred without quarter by the crowds of the Roman people. Stephen Colonna the Younger, the noble spirit to whom Petrarch ascribed the restoration of Italy, was preceded or accompanied in death by his son John, a gallant youth, by his brother Peter, who might regret the ease and honors of the church. By a nephew of legitimate birth, and by two bastards of the Colonna race. And the number of seven, the seven crowns, as Rienzi styled them, of the Holy Ghost, was completed by the agony of the deplorable parent, and the veteran chief, who had survived the hope and fortune of his house. The Vision and Prophecies of Esti Martin and Pope Boniface had been used by the Tribune to animate his troops. 8377 he displayed, at least in the pursuit, the spirit of a hero, but he forgot the maxims of the ancient Romans, who abhorred the triumphs of civil war. The conqueror ascended the capital, deposited his crown and scepter on the altar, and boasted, with some truth, that he had cut off an ear, which neither pope nor emperor had been able to amputate. 8378 His base and implacable revenge denied the honors of burial, and the bodies of the Kalana, which he threatened to expose with those of the vilest malefactors, were secretly interred by the holy virgins of their name and family. 8379 The people sympathized in their grief, repented of their own fury, and detested the indecent joy of Rienzi, who visited the spot where these illustrious victims had fallen. It was on that fatal spot that he conferred on his son the honor of knighthood, and the ceremony was accomplished by a slight blow from each of the horsemen of the guard, and by a ridiculous and inhuman ablution from a pool of water, which was yet polluted with patrician blood. 8380. A short delay would have saved the Kalana, the delay of a single month, which elapsed between the triumph and the exile of Rienzi. In the pride of victory, he forfeited what yet remained of his civil virtues, without acquiring the fame of military prowess. A free and vigorous opposition was formed in the city. And when the tribune proposed in the public council 8381 to impose a new tax, and to regulate the government of Perugia, thirty-nine members voted against his measures, repelled the injurious charge of treachery and corruption. And urged him to prove, by their forcible exclusion, that if the populace adhered to his cause, it was already disclaimed by the most respectable citizens. The Pope and the Sacred College had never been dazzled by his specious professions. They were justly offended by the insolence of his conduct. A cardinal legate was sent to Italy, and after some fruitless treaty, and two personal interviews, he fulminated a bull of excommunication, in which the tribune is degraded from his office, and branded with the guilt of rebellion, sacrilege and heresy. 8382 The surviving barons of Rome were now humbled to a sense of allegiance, their interest and revenge engaged them in the service of the church. But as the fate of the Kalana was before their eyes, they abandoned to a private adventurer the peril and glory of the revolution. John Pepin, Count of Minorbino 8383 in the Kingdom of Naples, had been condemned for his crimes, or his riches, to perpetual imprisonment, in Petrarch, by soliciting his release, indirectly contributed to the ruin of his friend. At the head of 150 soldiers, the Count of Minorbino introduced himself into Rome, barricaded the quarter of the Colonna, and found the enterprise as easy as it had seemed impossible. From the first alarm, the bell of the capital incessantly tolled. But, instead of repairing to the well-known sound, the people were silent and inactive. And the pusillanimous Rienzi, deploring their ingratitude with sighs and tears, abdicated the government and palace of the Republic. Without drawing his sword, Count Pepin restored the aristocracy and the church. Three senators were chosen, and the legate, assuming the first rank, accepted his two colleagues from the rival families of Colonna and Ursini. The acts of the tribune were abolished, his head was proscribed. Yet such was the terror of his name, that the barons hesitated three days before they would trust themselves in the city, and Rienzi was left above a month in the castle of Asti. Angelo, from whence he peaceably withdrew, after laboring, without effect, to revive the affection and courage of the Romans. 
the vision of freedom and empire had vanished, their fallen spirit would have acquiesced in servitude, had it been smoothed by tranquility and order. And it was scarcely observed, that the new senators derived their authority from the apostolic see, that four cardinals were appointed to reform, with dictatorial power, the state of the republic. Rome was again agitated by the bloody feuds of the barons, who detested each other, and despised the commons, their hostile fortresses, both in town and country, again rose, and were again demolished, and the peaceful citizens, a flock of sheep, were devoured, says the Florentine historian, by these rapacious wolves. But when their pride and avarice had exhausted the patience of the Romans, a confraternity of the Virgin Mary protected or avenged the Republic, the bell of the capital was again tolled. The nobles in arms trembled in the presence of an unarmed multitude. And of the two senators, Colonna escaped from the window of the palace, and Ursini was stoned at the foot of the altar. The dangerous office of tribune was successively occupied by two plebeians, Cerrone and Baroncelli. The mildness of Cerrone was unequal to the times, and after a faint struggle, he retired with a fair reputation and a decent fortune to the comforts of rural life. Devoid of eloquence or genius, Baroncelli was distinguished by a resolute spirit, he spoke the language of a patriot, and trod in the footsteps of tyrants, his suspicion was a sentence of death, and his own death was the reward of his cruelties. Amidst the public misfortunes, the faults of Rienzi were forgotten, and the Romans sighed for the peace and prosperity of their good estate. 8384. After an exile of seven years, the first deliverer was again restored to his country. In the disguise of a monk or a pilgrim, he escaped from the castle of Esti. Angelo, implored the friendship of the King of Hungary at Naples, tempted the ambition of every bold adventurer, mingled at Rome with the pilgrims of the Jubilee, lay concealed among the hermits of the Apennine, and wandered through the cities of Italy, Germany, and Bohemia. His person was invisible, his name was yet formidable, and the anxiety of the court of Avignon supposes, and even magnifies, his personal merit. The Emperor Charles IV gave audience to a stranger, who frankly revealed himself as the tribune of the Republic. And astonished an assembly of ambassadors and princes, by the eloquence of a patriot and the visions of a prophet, the downfall of tyranny and the kingdom of the Holy Ghost. 8385 Whatever had been his hopes, Rienzi found himself a captive. But he supported a character of independence and dignity, and obeyed, as his own choice, the irresistible summons of the Supreme Pontiff. The zeal of Petrarch, which had been cooled by the unworthy conduct, was rekindled by the sufferings and the presence, of his friend. And he boldly complains of the times, in which the Saviour of Rome was delivered by her emperor into the hands of her bishop. Rienzi was transported slowly, but in safe custody, from Prague to Avignon, his entrance into the city was that of a malefactor, in his prison he was chained by the leg and four cardinals were named to inquire into the crimes of heresy and rebellion. But his trial and condemnation would have involved some questions, which it was more prudent to leave under the veil of mystery, the temporal supremacy of the popes. The duty of residence, the civil and ecclesiastical privileges of the clergy and people of Rome. The reigning pontiff well deserved the appellation of Clement, the strange vicissitudes and magnanimous spirit of the captive excited his pity and esteem, and Petrarch believes that he respected in the hero the name and sacred character of a poet. 8386 Rienzi was indulged with an easy confinement and the use of books, and in the assiduous study of Livy and the Bible, he sought the cause and the consolation of his misfortunes. The succeeding pontificate of Innocent VI opened a new prospect of his deliverance and restoration, and the court of Avignon was persuaded, that the successful rebel could alone appease and reform the anarchy of the metropolis. After a solemn profession of fidelity, the Roman tribune was sent into Italy, with the title of senator, but the death of Baroncelli appeared to supersede the use of his mission. And the legate, Cardinal Albornoz 8387 a consummate statesman, allowed him with reluctance, and without aid, to undertake the perilous experiment. His first reception was equal to his wishes, the day of his entrance was a public festival. And his eloquence and authority revived the laws of the good estate. But this momentary sunshine was soon clouded by his own vices and those of the people, in the capital, 
he might often regret the prison of Avignon. And after a second administration of four months, Rienzi was massacred in a tumult which had been fomented by the Roman barons. In the society of the Germans and Bohemians, he is said to have contracted the habits of intemperance and cruelty, adversity had chilled his enthusiasm, without fortifying his reason or virtue. And that youthful hope, that lively assurance, which is the pledge of success, was now succeeded by the cold impotence of distrust and despair. The tribune had reigned with absolute dominion, by the choice, and in the hearts, of the Romans, the senator was the servile minister of a foreign court, and while he was suspected by the people, he was abandoned by the prince. The legate Albornoz, who seemed desirous of his ruin, inflexibly refused all supplies of men and money, a faithful subject could no longer presume to touch the revenues of the apostolical chamber. And the first idea of a tax was the signal of clamor and sedition. Even his justice was tainted with the guilt or reproach of selfish cruelty, the most virtuous citizen of Rome was sacrificed to his jealousy. And in the execution of a public robber, from whose purse he had been assisted, the magistrate too much forgot, or too much remembered, the obligations of the debtor. 8388 A civil war exhausted his treasures, and the patience of the city, the Kalana maintained their hostile station at Palestrina, and his mercenaries soon despised a leader whose ignorance and fear were envious of all subordinate merit. In the death, as in the life, of Rienzi, the hero and the coward were strangely mingled. When the capital was invested by a furious multitude, when he was basely deserted by his civil and military servants, the intrepid senator, waving the banner of liberty, presented himself on the balcony, addressed his eloquence to the various passions of the Romans, and labored to persuade them, that in the same cause himself and the Republic must either stand or fall. His oration was interrupted by a volley of imprecations and stones. And after an arrow had transpierced his hand, he sunk into abject despair, and fled weeping to the inner chambers, from whence he was let down by a sheet before the windows of the prison. Destitute of aid or hope, he was besieged till the evening, the doors of the capital were destroyed with axes and fire. And while the senator attempted to escape in a plebeian habit, he was discovered and dragged to the platform of the palace, the fatal scene of his judgments and executions. A whole hour, without voice or motion, he stood amidst the multitude half naked and half dead, their rage was hushed into curiosity and wonder, the last feelings of reverence and compassion yet struggled in his favor. And they might have prevailed, if a bold assassin had not plunged a dagger in his breast. He fell senseless with the first stroke, the impotent revenge of his enemies inflicted a thousand wounds, and the senator's body was abandoned to the dogs, to the Jews, and to the flames. Posterity will compare the virtues and failings of this extraordinary man, but in a long period of anarchine servitude, the name of Rienzi has often been celebrated as the deliverer of his country, and the last of the Roman patriots. 8389. The first and most generous wish of Petrarch was the restoration of a free republic, but after the exile and death of his plebeian hero, he turned his eyes from the tribune, to the king, of the Romans. The capital was yet stained with the blood of Rienzi, when Charles IV descended from the Alps to obtain the Italian and imperial crowns. In his passage through Milan he received the visit, and repaid the flattery, of the poet laureate. Accepted a medal of Augustus, and promised, without a smile, to imitate the founder of the Roman monarchy. A false application of the name and maxims of antiquity was the source of the hopes and disappointments of Petrarch. Yet he could not overlook the difference of times and characters, the immeasurable distance between the first Caesars and a Bohemian prince, who by the favor of the clergy had been elected the titular head of the German aristocracy. Instead of restoring to Rome her glory and her provinces, he had bound himself by a secret treaty with the Pope, to evacuate the city on the day of his coronation, and his shameful retreat was pursued by the reproaches of the Patriot Bard. 8390 after the loss of liberty and empire, his third and more humble wish was to reconcile the shepherd with his flock, to recall the Roman bishop to his ancient and peculiar diocese. In the fervor of youth, with the authority of age, P. 
Petrarch addressed his exhortations to five successive popes, and his eloquence was always inspired by the enthusiasm of sentiment and the freedom of language. 8391 The son of a citizen of Florence invariably preferred the country of his birth to that of his education, and Italy, in his eyes, was the queen and garden of the world. Amidst her domestic factions, she was doubtless superior to France both in art and science, in wealth and politeness. But the difference could scarcely support the epithet of barbarous, which he promiscuously bestows on the countries beyond the Alps. Avignon, the mystic Babylon, the sink of vice and corruption, was the object of his hatred and contempt. But he forgets that her scandalous vices were not the growth of the soil, and that in every residence they would adhere to the power and luxury of the papal court. He confesses that the successor of St. Peter is the bishop of the universal church. Yet it was not on the banks of the Rhone, but of the Tiber, that the apostle had fixed his everlasting throne, and while every city in the Christian world was blessed with a bishop, the metropolis alone was desolate and forlorn. Since the removal of the Holy See, the sacred buildings of the Lateran and the Vatican, their altars, and their saints, were left in a state of poverty and decay. And Rome was often painted under the image of a disconsolate matron, as if the wandering husband could be reclaimed by the homely portrait of the age and infirmities of his weeping spouse. 8392 But the cloud which hung over the seven hills would be dispelled by the presence of their lawful sovereign, eternal fame, the prosperity of Rome, and the peace of Italy. Would be the recompense of the Pope who should dare to embrace this generous resolution. Of the five whom Petrarch exhorted, the three first, John the Twenty Second, Benedict the Twelfth, and Clement the Sixth, were importuned or amused by the boldness of the orator. But the memorable change which had been attempted by Urban V was finally accomplished by Gregory XI. The execution of their design was opposed by weighty and almost insuperable obstacles. A king of France, who has deserved the epithet of wise, was unwilling to release them from a local dependence, the cardinals, for the most part his subjects, were attached to the language, manners, and climate of Avignon, to their stately palaces. Above all, to the wines of Burgundy. In their eyes, Italy was foreign or hostile, and they reluctantly embarked at Marseilles, as if they had been sold or banished into the land of the Saracens. Urban V resided three years in the Vatican with safety and honor, his sanctity was protected by a guard of two thousand horse. And the King of Cyprus, the Queen of Naples, and the emperors of the East and West, devoutly saluted their common father in the chair of St. Peter. But the joy of Petrarch and the Italians was soon turned into grief and indignation. Some reasons of public or private moment, his own impatience or the prayers of the cardinals, recalled Urban to France, and the approaching election was saved from the tyrannic patriotism of the Romans. The powers of heaven were interested in their cause, Bridget of Sweden, a saint and pilgrim, disapproved the return, and foretold the death, of Urban V, the migration of Gregory XI was encouraged by St. Catherine of Siena, the spouse of Christ and ambassadress of the Florentines, and the popes themselves, the great masters of human credulity, appear to have listened to these visionary females. 8393 Yet those celestial admonitions were supported by some arguments of temporal policy. The residents of Avignon had been invaded by hostile violence, at the head of thirty thousand robbers, a hero had extorted ransom and absolution from the Vicar of Christ and the Sacred College. And the maxim of the French warriors, to spare the people and plunder the church, was a new heresy of the most dangerous import. 8394 While the Pope was driven from Avignon, he was strenuously invited to Rome. The Senate and people acknowledged him as their lawful sovereign, and laid at his feet the keys of the gates, the bridges, and the fortresses, of the quarter at least beyond the Tiber. 8395 But this loyal offer was accompanied by a declaration, that they could no longer suffer the scandal and calamity of his absence, and that his obstinacy would finally provoke them to revive and assert the primitive right of election. The abbot of Mount Cassin had been consulted, whether he would accept the triple crown 8396 from the clergy and people, I am a citizen of Rome, 8397 replied that venerable ecclesiastic, and my first law is, the voice of my country. 8398. 
If superstition will interpret an untimely death 8399 if the merit of counsels be judged from the event, the heavens may seem to frown on a measure of such apparent season in propriety. Gregory XI did not survive above fourteen months his return to the Vatican, and his decease was followed by the Great Schism of the West, which distracted the Latin Church above forty years. The Sacred College was then composed of twenty-two cardinals, six of these had remained at Avignon, eleven Frenchmen, one Spaniard, and four Italians, entered the conclave in the usual form. Their choice was not yet limited to the purple. And their unanimous votes acquiesced in the Archbishop of Bari, a subject of Naples, conspicuous for his zeal and learning, who ascended the throne of St. Peter under the name of Urban VI. The Epistle of the Sacred College affirms his free, and regular, election, which had been inspired, as usual, by the Holy Ghost, he was adored, invested, and crowned, with the customary rites. His temporal authority was obeyed at Rome and Avignon, and his ecclesiastical supremacy was acknowledged in the Latin world. During several weeks, the cardinals attended their new master with the fairest professions of attachment and loyalty. Till the summer heats permitted a decent escape from the city. But as soon as they were united at Anani and Fundi, in a place of security, they cast aside the mask, accused their own falsehood and hypocrisy, excommunicated the apostate and antichrist of Rome, and proceeded to a new election of Robert of Geneva, Clement VII, whom they announced to the nations as the true and rightful vicar of Christ. Their first choice, an involuntary and illegal act, was annulled by fear of death and the menaces of the Romans, and their complaint is justified by the strong evidence of probability and fact. The twelve French cardinals, above two-thirds of the votes, were masters of the election. And whatever might be their provincial jealousies, it cannot fairly be presumed that they would have sacrificed their right and interest to a foreign candidate, who would never restore them to their native country. In the various, and often inconsistent, narratives 8400 the shades of popular violence are more darkly or faintly colored, but the licentiousness of the seditious Romans was inflamed by a sense of their privileges and the danger of a second emigration. The conclave was intimidated by the shouts, and encompassed by the arms, of thirty thousand rebels, the bells of the capital and St. Peter's rang an alarm, death, or an Italian pope, was the universal cry. The same threat was repeated by the twelve bannerets or chiefs of the quarters, in the form of charitable advice, some preparations were made for burning the obstinate cardinals. And had they chosen a Transalpine subject, it is probable that they would never have departed alive from the Vatican. The same constraint imposed the necessity of dissembling in the eyes of Rome and of the world. The pride and cruelty of Urban presented a more inevitable danger, and they soon discovered the features of the tyrant, who could walk in his garden and recite his breviary, while he heard from an adjacent chamber six cardinals groaning on the rack. His inflexible zeal, which loudly censured their luxury and vice, would have attached them to the stations and duties of their parishes at Rome. And had he not fatally delayed a new promotion, the French cardinals would have been reduced to a helpless minority in the sacred college. For these reasons, and the hope of repassing the Alps, they rashly violated the peace and unity of the Church. And the merits of their double choice are yet agitated in the Catholic schools. 8401 The Vanity rather than the interest, of the nation determined the court and clergy of France. 8402 The states of Savoy, Sicily, Cyprus, Aragon, Castile, Navarre, and Scotland were inclined by their example and authority to the obedience of Clement VII, and after his decease, of Benedict XIII. Rome and the principal states of Italy, Germany, Portugal, England, 8403 The Low Countries, and the kingdoms of the north, adhered to the prior election of Urban VI, who was succeeded by Boniface IX, Innocent VII, and Gregory XII. From the banks of the Tiber and the Rhone, the hostile pontiffs encountered each other with the pen and the sword, the civil and ecclesiastical order of society was disturbed. And the Romans had their full share of the mischiefs of which they may be arraigned as the primary authors. 8404 They had vainly flattered themselves with the hope of restoring the seat of the ecclesiastical monarchy, and of relieving their poverty with the tributes and offerings of the nations. But the separation of France and Spain diverted the stream of lucrative devotion, 
nor could the loss be compensated by the two jubilees which were crowded into the space of ten years. By the avocations of the schism, by foreign arms, and popular tumults, Urban VI and his three successors were often compelled to interrupt their residence in the Vatican. The Colonna and Ursini still exercised their deadly feuds, the Bannerets of Rome asserted and abused the privileges of a republic, the Vicars of Christ, who had levied a military force, chastised their rebellion with the gibbet, the sword, and the dagger. And, in a friendly conference, eleven deputies of the people were perfidiously murdered and cast into the street. Since the invasion of Robert the Norman, the Romans had pursued their domestic quarrels without the dangerous interposition of a stranger. But in the disorders of the schism, an aspiring neighbor, Ladislaus King of Naples, alternately supported and betrayed the Pope and the people. By the former he was declared gonfalonier, or general, of the Church, while the latter submitted to his choice the nomination of their magistrates. Besieging Rome by land and water, he thrice entered the gates as a barbarian conqueror. Profaned the altars, violated the virgins, pillaged the merchants, performed his devotions at St. Peter's, and left a garrison in the castle of St. Angelo. His arms were sometimes unfortunate, and to a delay of three days he was indebted for his life and crown, but Ladislaus triumphed in his turn. And it was only his premature death that could save the metropolis and the ecclesiastical state from the ambitious conqueror, who had assumed the title, or at least the powers, of King of Rome. 8405. I have not undertaken the ecclesiastical history of the schism, but Rome, the object of these last chapters, is deeply interested in the disputed succession of her sovereigns. The first councils for the peace and union of Christendom arose from the University of Paris, from the faculty of the Sorbonne, whose doctors were esteemed, at least in the Gallican Church, as the most consummate masters of theological science. 8406 Prudently waiving all invidious inquiry into the origin and merits of the dispute, they proposed, as a healing measure, that the two pretenders of Rome and Avignon should abdicate at the same time. After qualifying the cardinals of the adverse factions to join in a legitimate election, and that the nations should subtract 8407 their obedience, if either of the competitor preferred his own interest to that of the public. At each vacancy, these physicians of the church deprecated the mischiefs of a hasty choice. But the policy of the conclave and the ambition of its members were deaf to reason and entreaties, and whatsoever promises were made, the Pope could never be bound by the oaths of the Cardinal. During fifteen years, the pacific designs of the university were eluded by the arts of the rival pontiffs, the scruples or passions of their adherents, and the vicissitudes of French factions, that ruled the insanity of Charles VI. At length a vigorous resolution was embraced. And a solemn embassy, of the titular patriarch of Alexandria, two archbishops, five bishops, five abbots, three knights, and twenty doctors, was sent to the courts of Avignon and Rome, to require, in the name of the church and king. The abdication of the two pretenders, of Peter de Luna, who styled himself Benedict XIII, and of Angelo Carrario, who assumed the name of Gregory XII. For the ancient honor of Rome, and the success of their commission, the ambassadors solicited a conference with the magistrates of the city, whom they gratified by a positive declaration. That the most Christian king did not entertain a wish of transporting the Holy See from the Vatican, which he considered as the genuine and proper seat of the successor of St. Peter. In the name of the Senate and people, an eloquent Roman asserted their desire to cooperate in the union of the Church, deplored the temporal and spiritual calamities of the long schism, and requested the protection of France against the arms of the King of Naples. The answers of Benedict and Gregory were alike edifying and alike deceitful, and, in evading the demand of their abdication, the two rivals were animated by a common spirit. They agreed on the necessity of a previous interview. But the time, the place, and the manner, could never be ascertained by mutual consent. If the one advances, says a servant of Gregory, the other retreats. The one appears an animal fearful of the land, the other a creature apprehensive of the water. And thus, for a short remnant of life and power, will these aged priests endanger the peace and salvation of the Christian world. 8408 
the Christian world was at length provoked by their obstinacy and fraud, they were deserted by their cardinals, who embraced each other as friends and colleagues. And their revolt was supported by a numerous assembly of prelates and ambassadors. With equal justice, the Council of Pisa deposed the popes of Rome and Avignon. The conclave was unanimous in the choice of Alexander V, and his vacant seat was soon filled by a similar election of John XXIII, the most profligate of mankind. But instead of extinguishing the schism, the rashness of the French and Italians had given a third pretender to the chair of St. Peter. Such new claims of the synod and conclave were disputed. Three kings, of Germany, Hungary, and Naples, adhered to the cause of Gregory XII, and Benedict XIII, himself a Spaniard, was acknowledged by the devotion and patriotism of that powerful nation. The rash proceedings of Pisa were corrected by the Council of Constance, the Emperor Sigismund acted a conspicuous part as the advocate or protector of the Catholic Church. And the number and weight of civil and ecclesiastical members might seem to constitute the States General of Europe. Of the three popes, John XXIII was the first victim, he fled and was brought back a prisoner, the most scandalous charges were suppressed, the Vicar of Christ was only accused of piracy, murder, rape, sodomy, and incest. And after subscribing his own condemnation, he expiated in prison the imprudence of trusting his person to a free city beyond the Alps. Gregory XII, whose obedience was reduced to the narrow precincts of Rimini, descended with more honor from the throne, and his ambassador convened the session, in which he renounced the title and authority of lawful pope. To vanquish the obstinacy of Benedict XIII or his adherents, the emperor in person undertook a journey from Constance to Perpignan. The kings of Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and Scotland, obtained an equal and honorable treaty. With the concurrence of the Spaniards, Benedict was deposed by the council, but the harmless old man was left in a solitary castle to excommunicate twice each day the rebel kingdoms which had deserted his cause. After thus eradicating the remains of the schism, the Synod of Constance proceeded with slow and cautious steps to elect the sovereign of Rome and the head of the church. On this momentous occasion, the College of Twenty-Three Cardinals was fortified with thirty deputies. Six of whom were chosen in each of the five great nations of Christendom, the Italian, the German, the French, the Spanish, and the English. 8409 The interference of strangers was softened by their generous preference of an Italian and a Roman. And the hereditary, as well as personal, merit of Otho Colonna recommended him to the conclave. Rome accepted with joy and obedience the noblest of her sons, the ecclesiastical state was defended by his powerful family. And the elevation of Martin V is the era of the restoration and establishment of the popes in the Vatican. 8410. The royal prerogative of coining money, which had been exercised near 300 years by the Senate, was first resumed by Martin V, 8411 in his image and superscription introduced the series of the papal medals. Of his two immediate successors, Eugenius IV was the last pope expelled by the tumults of the Roman people 8412 and Nicholas V, the last who was importuned by the presence of a Roman emperor. 8413 I. The conflict of Eugenius with the fathers of Basil, and the weight or apprehension of a new excise, emboldened and provoked the Romans to usurp the temporal government of the city. They rose in arms, elected seven governors of the Republic, and a constable of the capital, imprisoned the Pope's nephew, besieged his person in the palace, and shot volleys of arrows into his bark as he escaped down the Tiber in the habit of a monk. But he still possessed in the castle of Asti. Angelo a faithful garrison and a train of artillery, their batteries incessantly thundered on the city, and a bullet more dexterously pointed broke down the barricade of the bridge, and scattered with a single shot the heroes of the Republic. Their constancy was exhausted by a rebellion of five months. Under the tyranny of the guy-blind nobles, the wisest patriots regretted the dominion of the Church, and their repentance was unanimous and effectual. The Troops of Asti Peter again occupied the capital, the magistrates departed to their homes, the most guilty were executed or exiled, and the legate, at the head of two thousand foot and four thousand horse, was saluted as the father of the city. The synods of Ferrara and Florence, the fear or resentment of Eugenius, prolonged his absence, 
he was received by a submissive people. But the pontiff understood from the acclamations of his triumphal entry, that to secure their loyalty and his own repose, he must grant without delay the abolition of the odious excise. 2. Rome was restored, adorned, and enlightened, by the peaceful reign of Nicholas V. In the midst of these laudable occupations, the Pope was alarmed by the approach of Frederick III of Austria. Though his fears could not be justified by the character or the power of the imperial candidate. After drawing his military force to the metropolis, and imposing the best security of oaths 8414 and treaties, Nicholas received with a smiling countenance the faithful advocate and vassal of the church. So tame were the times, so feeble was the Austrian, that the pomp of his coronation was accomplished with order and harmony, but the superfluous honor was so disgraceful to an independent nation that his successors have excused themselves from the toilsome pilgrimage to the Vatican, and rest their imperial title on the choice of the electors of Germany. A citizen has remarked, with pride and pleasure, that the king of the Romans, after passing with a slight salute the cardinals and prelates who met him at the gate, distinguished the dress and person of the senator of Rome. And in this last farewell, the pageants of the empire and the republic were clasped in a friendly embrace. 84.15 According to the laws of Rome 84.16 Her first magistrate was required to be a doctor of laws, an alien, of a place at least forty miles from the city. With whose inhabitants he must not be connected in the third canonical degree of blood or alliance. The election was annual, a severe scrutiny was instituted into the conduct of the departing senator. Nor could he be recalled to the same office till after the expiration of two years. A liberal salary of 3,000 florins was assigned for his expense and reward, and his public appearance represented the majesty of the Republic. His robes were of gold brocade or crimson velvet, or in the summer season of a lighter silk, he bore in his hand an ivory scepter, the sound of trumpets announced his approach. And his solemn steps were preceded at least by four lictors or attendants, whose red wands were enveloped with bands or streamers of the golden color or livery of the city. His oath in the capital proclaims his right and duty to observe and assert the laws, to control the proud, to protect the poor, and to exercise justice and mercy within the extent of his jurisdiction. In these useful functions he was assisted by three learned strangers, the two collaterals, and the judge of criminal appeals, their frequent trials of robberies, rapes, and murders, are attested by the laws. And the weakness of these laws connives at the licentiousness of private feuds and armed associations for mutual defense. But the senator was confined to the administration of justice, the capital, the treasury, and the government of the city and its territory, were entrusted to the three conservators. Who were changed four times in each year, the militia of the thirteen regions assembled under the banners of their respective chiefs, or caporioni. And the first of these was distinguished by the name and dignity of the prior. The popular legislature consisted of the secret and the common councils of the Romans. The former was composed of the magistrates and their immediate predecessors, with some fiscal and legal officers, and three classes of thirteen, twenty-six, and forty, councillors, amounting in the whole to about one hundred and twenty persons. In the common council all male citizens had a right to vote, and the value of their privilege was enhanced by the care with which any foreigners were prevented from usurping the title and character of Romans. The tumult of a democracy was checked by wise and jealous precautions, except the magistrates, none could propose a question, none were permitted to speak, except from an open pulpit or tribunal, all disorderly acclamations were suppressed. The sense of the majority was decided by a secret ballot, and their decrees were promulgated in the venerable name of the Roman Senate and people. It would not be easy to assign a period in which this theory of government has been reduced to accurate and constant practice, since the establishment of order has been gradually connected with the decay of liberty. But in the year 1580 the ancient statutes were collected, methodized in three books, and adapted to present use, under the pontificate, and with the approbation. Of Gregory the Thirteenth, eighty-four seventeen, this civil and criminal code is the modern law of the city. And, if the popular assemblies have been abolished, a foreign senator, 
with the three conservators, still resides in the palace of the capital. 8418 The policy of the Caesars has been repeated by the popes. And the Bishop of Rome affected to maintain the form of a republic, while he reigned with the absolute powers of a temporal, as well as a spiritual, monarch. It is an obvious truth, that the times must be suited to extraordinary characters, and that the genius of Cromwell or Retz might now expire in obscurity. The political enthusiasm of Rienzi had exalted him to a throne. The same enthusiasm, in the next century, conducted his imitator to the gallows. The birth of Stephen Porcaro was noble, his reputation spotless, his tongue was armed with eloquence, his mind was enlightened with learning. And he aspired, beyond the aim of vulgar ambition, to free his country and immortalize his name. The dominion of priests is most odious to a liberal spirit, every scruple was removed by the recent knowledge of the fable and forgery of Constantine's donation, Petrarch was now the oracle of the Italians. And as often as Porcaro revolved the ode which describes the patriot and hero of Rome, he applied to himself the visions of the prophetic bard. His first trial of the popular feelings was at the funeral of Eugenius IV, in an elaborate speech he called the Romans to liberty and arms. And they listened with apparent pleasure, till Porcaro was interrupted and answered by a grave advocate, who pleaded for the church and state. By every law the seditious orator was guilty of treason. But the benevolence of the new pontiff, who viewed his character with pity and esteem, attempted by an honorable office to convert the patriot into a friend. The inflexible Roman returned from Anagni with an increase of reputation and zeal. And, on the first opportunity, the games of the place Navona, he tried to inflame the casual dispute of some boys and mechanics into a general rising of the people. Yet the humane Nicholas was still averse to accept the forfeit of his life. And the traitor was removed from the scene of temptation to Bologna, with a liberal allowance for his support, and the easy obligation of presenting himself each day before the governor of the city. But Porcaro had learned from the younger Brutus, that with tyrants no faith or gratitude should be observed, the exile declaimed against the arbitrary sentence. A party and a conspiracy were gradually formed, his nephew, a daring youth, assembled a band of volunteers, and on the appointed evening a feast was prepared at his house for the friends of the Republic. Their leader, who had escaped from Bologna, appeared among them in a robe of purple and gold, his voice, his countenance, his gestures, bespoke the man who had devoted his life or death to the glorious cause. In a studied oration, he expiated on the motives and the means of their enterprise, the name and liberties of Rome, the sloth and pride of their ecclesiastical tyrants, the active or passive consent of their fellow citizens. Three hundred soldiers, and four hundred exiles, long exercised in arms or in wrongs, the license of revenge to edge their swords, and a million of ducats to reward their victory. It would be easy, he said, on the next day, the festival of the Epiphany, to seize the Pope and his cardinals, before the doors, or at the altar, of St. Peter's, to lead them in chains under the walls of St. Angelo. To extort by the threat of their instant death a surrender of the castle, to ascend the vacant capital, to ring the alarm bell, and to restore in a popular assembly the ancient Republic of Rome. While he triumphed, he was already betrayed. The senator, with a strong guard, invested the house, the nephew of Porcaro cut his way through the crowd, but the unfortunate Stephen was drawn from a chest, lamenting that his enemies had anticipated by three hours the execution of his design. After such manifest and repeated guilt, even the mercy of Nicholas was silent. Porcaro, and nine of his accomplices, were hanged without the benefit of the sacraments. And, amidst the fears and invectives of the papal court, the Romans pitted, and almost applauded, these martyrs of their country. 8419 But their applause was mute, their pity ineffectual, their liberty forever extinct. And, if they have since risen in a vacancy of the throne or a scarcity of bread, such accidental tumults may be found in the bosom of the most abject servitude. But the independence of the nobles, which was fomented by discord, survived the freedom of the commons, which must be founded in union. A privilege of rapine and oppression was long maintained by the barons of Rome. Their houses were a fortress and a sanctuary, and the ferocious train of banditti and criminals whom they protected from the law repaid the hospitality with the service of their swords and daggers. 
The private interest of the pontiffs, or their nephews, sometimes involved them in these domestic feuds. Under the reign of Sixtus IV, Rome was distracted by the battles and sieges of the rival houses, after the conflagration of his palace, the protonotary Colonna was tortured and beheaded. And Savelli, his captive friend, was murdered on the spot, for refusing to join in the acclamations of the victorious Ursini. 8420 But the popes no longer trembled in the Vatican, they had strength to command, if they had resolution to claim, the obedience of their subjects. And the strangers, who observed these partial disorders, admired the easy taxes and wise administration of the ecclesiastical state. 8421 The spiritual thunders of the Vatican depend on the force of opinion. And if that opinion be supplanted by reason or passion, the sound may idly waste itself in the air, and the helpless priest is exposed to the brutal violence of a noble or a plebeian adversary. But after their return from Avignon, the keys of Esti. Peter were guarded by the sword of St. Paul. Rome was commanded by an impregnable citadel, the use of cannon is a powerful engine against popular seditions, a regular force of cavalry and infantry was enlisted under the banners of the Pope, his ample revenues supplied the resources of war, and from the extent of his domain, he could bring down on a rebellious city an army of hostile neighbors and loyal subjects. 8422 Since the union of the duchies of Ferrara and Urbino, the ecclesiastical state extends from the Mediterranean to the Adriatic, and from the confines of Naples to the banks of the Po. And as early as the 16th century, the greater part of that spacious and fruitful country acknowledged the lawful claims and temporal sovereignty of the Roman pontiffs. Their claims were readily deduced from the genuine, or fabulous, donations of the darker ages, the successive steps of their final settlement would engage us too far in the transactions of Italy, and even of Europe. The crimes of Alexander VI, the martial operations of Julius II, and the liberal policy of Leo X, a theme which has been adorned by the pens of the noblest historians of the times. 8423 In the first period of their conquests, Till the expedition of Charles VIII, the popes might successfully wrestle with the adjacent princes and states, whose military force was equal, or inferior, to their own. But as soon as the monarchs of France, Germany and Spain, contended with gigantic arms for the dominion of Italy, they supplied with art the deficiency of strength. And concealed, in a labyrinth of wars and treaties, their aspiring views, and the immortal hope of chasing the barbarians beyond the Alps. The nice balance of the Vatican was often subverted by the soldiers of the North and West. Who were united under the standard of Charles V, the feeble and fluctuating policy of Clement VII exposed his person and dominions to the conqueror. And Rome was abandoned seven months to a lawless army, more cruel and rapacious than the Goths and Vandals. 8424 After this severe lesson, the popes contracted their ambition, which was almost satisfied, resumed the character of a common parent, and abstained from all offensive hostilities, except in a hasty quarrel. When the Vicar of Christ and the Turkish Sultan were armed at the same time against the Kingdom of Naples. 8425 The French and Germans at length withdrew from the field of battle, Milan, Naples, Sicily, Sardinia, and the sea coast of Tuscany, were firmly possessed by the Spaniards. And it became their interest to maintain the peace and dependence of Italy, which continued almost without disturbance from the middle of the 16th to the opening of the 18th century. The Vatican was swayed and protected by the religious policy of the Catholic king, his prejudice and interest disposed him in every dispute to support the prince against the people. And instead of the encouragement, the aid, and the asylum, which they obtained from the adjacent states, the friends of liberty, or the enemies of law, were enclosed on all sides within the iron circle of despotism. The long habits of obedience and education subdued the turbulent spirit of the nobles and commons of Rome. The barons forgot the arms and factions of their ancestors, and insensibly became the servants of luxury and government. Instead of maintaining a crowd of tenants and followers, the produce of their estates was consumed in the private expenses which multiply the pleasures, and diminish the power, of the Lord. 8426 The Colonna and Ursini vied with each other in the decoration of their palaces and chapels, and their antique splendor was rivaled or surpassed by the sudden opulence of the papal families. 
In Rome the voice of freedom and discord is no longer heard, and, instead of the foaming torrent, a smooth and stagnant lake reflects the image of idleness and servitude. A Christian, a philosopher 8427 and a patriot, will be equally scandalized by the temporal kingdom of the clergy. And the local majesty of Rome, the remembrance of her consuls and triumphs, may seem to embitter the sense, and aggravate the shame, of her slavery. If we calmly weigh the merits and defects of the ecclesiastical government, it may be praised in its present state, as a mild, decent, and tranquil system, exempt from the dangers of a minority, the sallies of youth, the expenses of luxury, and the calamities of war. But these advantages are overbalanced by a frequent, perhaps a septennial, election of a sovereign, who is seldom a native of the country. The reign of a young statesman of threescore, in the decline of his life and abilities, without hope to accomplish, and without children to inherit, the labors of his transitory reign. The successful candidate is drawn from the church, and even the convent, from the mode of education and life the most adverse to reason, humanity, and freedom. In the trammels of servile faith, he has learned to believe because it is absurd, to revere all that is contemptible, and to despise whatever might deserve the esteem of a rational being. To punish error as a crime, to reward mortification and celibacy as the first of virtues, to place the saints of the calendar 8428 above the heroes of Rome and the sages of Athens. And to consider the missal, or the crucifix, as more useful instruments than the plough or the loom. In the office of nuncio, or the rank of cardinal, he may acquire some knowledge of the world, but the primitive stain will adhere to his mind and manners, from study and experience he may suspect the mystery of his profession. But the sacerdotal artist will imbibe some portion of the bigotry which he inculcates. The genius of Sixtus V 8429 burst from the gloom of a Franciscan cloister. In a reign of five years, he exterminated the outlaws and banditti, abolished the profane sanctuaries of Rome 8430 formed a naval and military force, restored and emulated the monuments of antiquity. And after a liberal use and large increase of the revenue, left five millions of crowns in the castle of Esti. Angelo. But his justice was sullied with cruelty, his activity was prompted by the ambition of conquest, after his decease the abuses revived, the treasure was dissipated, he entailed on posterity thirty-five new taxes and the venality of offices. And, after his death, his statue was demolished by an ungrateful, or an injured, people. 8431 The wild and original character of Sixtus V stands alone in the series of the pontiffs. The maxims and effects of their temporal government may be collected from the positive and comparative view of the arts and philosophy, the agriculture and trade, the wealth and population, of the ecclesiastical state. For myself, it is my wish to depart in charity with all mankind, nor am I willing, in these last moments, to offend even the Pope and clergy of Rome. 8432.